The story begins with So Moon, a small feeble boy born to the greatest archer family that now lives in the High Plain Mountains. With the help of his ever strong grandfather, So Moon comes out to be one of the strongest ever warriors to grace the earth. To follow the story of this weak little kid into the strongest man alive, watch the video till the end with us. As this new story unfolds, we get brief introduction to one of the most used weapons in Warcraft, the bow. A weapon that is faster than lightning, stronger than thunder, and sharper than a serpent's fangs. Guys, don't take this literally, it's a metaphor. So what could be scarier than a weapon you can't see? Probably a sniper. Now finding ourselves in the foothills of the Pale High Mountain, we see a young black-haired kid, So Moon, polishing his archery skills. Right alongside him stands an old yet strong man, who happens to be his grandfather. I think we all can collectively agree that 60-year-old grandpas and 16-year-old teenagers are the most OP characters to exist in the shonen genres. So let's see what this old man has got. With his hands behind his back, he analyzes his grandson's skill and explains that archery is the act of shooting an arrow. Being somewhat of a prodigy so moon as he shoots, the arrow hits exactly in the middle of the target. Taking another shot this time, the kid raises the bow above his shoulders and shoots another arrow from an uncomfortable position. While the grandpa explains that a standard shot comes from standard archery. But when there are multiple enemies or you're crunched then, there won't be enough time for you to take a calculated shot. So in that case, you have to use the rapid fire technique, in which arrows are shot in quick succession. Next up is the multi-shot, a technique that allows you to shoot multiple arrows simultaneously. The grandpa further goes on to mention that one isn't worthy of calling himself an archer unless he's able to use the multi-shot. Now taking the aim himself, the grandpa sizes up his target and tells the kid that he can use up to three arrows at once for the multi-shot. Saying this, he shoots the arrows that strikes into three different trees. He further goes on to explain that he can either aim at a single point or have different targets, allowing him to kill two birds with one stone. And lastly, there's the hardest technique, the key guided arrow. To give a demonstration, he sets his eyes on a small bunny hopping around. As the cute cud the creature turns around the tree going out of sight, the old man shoots the arrow. Unexpected by both the rabbit and us, the arrow swishes around the tree and strikes right into the rabbit's heart. Can you guys guess what these two will be having for dinner? Oh, I know, rabbit stew. Showing some more of his cool moves, the grandpa dashes forward and then diving to his left hits a multi-shot using the key guided technique. The three arrows simultaneously hit some birds flying in the air, sending them to their demise. Guess they'll also be having some bird meat. Look at the falling birds, the grandpa mentions that this technique of his is called the head hunter, a combination of all the archery techniques. Later in the day, as the grandpa is catching some sleep, he's suddenly woken up by his grandson. Speaking in a muffled voice, he asks, what is it? Excited, so Moon yells ecstatically that he'd like him to assess his archery since he's found a way to overcome the wind. But instead of getting praised, the kid is struck on his head. As the grandpa tells him that he just interrupted his meditation and he was just about to figure a way to fly. Bro, what is this grandpa smoking? Not giving up, the kid also argues back and tells him that he was drooling all over the place instead of meditating. Finally giving up on his grandson's requests, he finally goes to assess him. Just as So Moon is sizing up his target, the grandfather walks up to it and stands right beside it. Having a questioning look on his face, the kid wonders if his grandfather has finally lost it. However, the old man asks him to hit the target, worrying that he might end up hitting his grandpa. So Moon hesitates. Looking at this grandpa yells as he asks him to be confident since a man needs to have courage. But despite the verbal motivation, he ends up putting his bow down. As the day passes by, the kid suddenly runs up to his grandfather bringing a wounded pigeon. The grandfather asks the kid to show it to him. But running past him, the kid tells him that this is a gift from the gods, so he'll be eating it alone. Oh man, the vegans won't like this. But the grandfather once again hits him and tells him that it's not just a mere pigeon, but instead a jur falcon, a sacred animal known as the king of the skies. Still not getting the point, the kid tells his grandpa that the animal is grub as long as it's dead. But the grandfather makes him realize that a jur falcon is a loyal falcon that follows its owner to death if it has to. So will he starve for some time and save a life? Or shall he eat the falcon? Making the right decision. So Moo decides to save the animal. Following his grandpa's instructions, the kid begins preparing herbal medicine and then applying it to jur falcon's wound. And just like that, within a few days, the king of the skies returns to soaring high on the horizon. Pleading its loyalty to the kid, the falcon sits on his hands Ecstatic to see the coolness of the bird, 
the kid decides to give it a name. Recalling their first meeting, he remembers that the first time he saw the bird, it had blood running through its iron-like face. So he'll name him Iron Blood. As some days pass by, the old man tells the kid that now that he's quite proficient in archery, they should practice a new technique called Wolf Steps. This is a technique that has been passed down to their family for generations. As the name suggests, the technique is inspired by wolves. Curious. The kid asks if there are plenty of other techniques too. To answer that, the grandpa tells him that there's the defensive technique, Cloud Step that is used by the Mudang faction. Then there's also the offensive technique, Frostbite Step used by the Amy faction. Now taking a few steps back, the grandpa asks So Moon to watch closely. Following this statement, standing in a frog-like stance, he's able to cover all the distance between himself and his grandson in one jump. Giving some more demonstration, the grandpa uses this technique and hops around the place. However, So Moon isn't too excited about learning this technique as he feels embarrassed to see his grandfather jump here and there like a frog. After giving the demonstration, he asks his grandson about how it is. Giving a fake reaction, the kid smiles and tells his grandpa that it's great. But catching on to his lie, the grandfather decides to give it another way so that he can understand the practicality of this skill. Once again, stepping into his stance, the grandfather jumps right at the kid. Scared by the sheer amount of intimidating force, he's left too stunned to even react, not realizing that he's peed himself. Not gonna lie, if I saw a wolf-like shadow jumping at me, I'd piss myself too. Grunting, the grandpa yells at the kid to stop acting so cocky if he's scared by something like this. Coming back to his senses, baffled, so Moon asks what that was. Having his interest piqued, he decides to give it a shot and asks his grandfather what that was. Looking at him with a serious expression, he explains that wolf's step not only imitates a wolf's movement, but also its vigor. If a wolf's hunting technique would be observed, you'd notice that a wolf first paralyzes its enemy's movements through his bloodlust. Once within attacking range, in one clean attack, the wolf strikes its prey in its vital region, rendering it incapable of escaping or countering. The grandpa further goes on to tell the kid that when he emitted a little bloodlust at him, he couldn't move. So if it was to be an actual fight, he'd be already dead by now. Awestruck, the kid looks on at his grandfather with starry eyes. To further emphasize the benefit of using this technique, the grandfather questions what was the distance between him and the kid before he jumped. Not paying much attention, he answers that it was approximately 30 feet. And then, it suddenly hits him that since he was so focused on his frog-like stance, he completely dismissed the fact that he just covered 30 feet in a single jump. Giving more information, the grandpa tells him that a wolf step is something that should be used defensively. Surprise, so Moon questions if it should only be used for running away. Responding in a scolding tone, he asks the kid what he's going to do with a bow by running after the enemy. Smack him with the bow or stab him with the arrow. Since the wolf step allows its user to travel at super speed, it can be used to either increase the said distance between the user and the enemy or decrease the distance. He further explains to his grandson that if he chased an enemy whilst emitting bloodlust, he'd be scared. So the wolf step is an effective way to maintain a safe distance while also being in attacking range. Telling his grandson that to see is to believe, he asks him to watch closely his footsteps and ingrain it into his body. Following that, the old man begins to move around the kid and his footwork seems like flowing water. Watching this, the kid wonders how every time he takes a step, a footstep is left. 180 steps in different directions, seeing this, the kid is impressed. Now, following his grandfather's instruction, so Moon begins stepping in the same direction. However, getting confused by the extravagant amount of instructions being thrown his way, he keeps failing. But not giving up at any cost, the kid keeps training till evening. After spending countless nights in training after about a week, at last, he's able to successfully do the wolf step once. Seeing this, the grandfather is absolutely amazed as he realizes his grandson's prodigal talent. Since he recalls that it took him a month and a half and his father one month to master this technique. But not going easy on him, he still scolds him and tells him that it's pathetic that such an easy technique took him a week. Asian Parenting 101 Never show your son that you're proud. Continuing his training in the mountains, so Moon begins practicing a new technique. Just then, the grandfather slips up about how amazed he is with the kid's skill, since he's doing so well despite having his inner key limited by him. Reminds me of when Goku would wear clothes that weighed a ton just so he can kick some enemy butt without M. Let's see how OP this MC gets. Hearing that the kid quickly raises an eyebrow. However, 
Using his sweet talk, the old man subverts the topic and makes the kid believe that he finds it hard to master mental cultivation, because his heart sutra visualization isn't being utilized. Getting lost in the big words, the kid continues to focus on his training. Now standing in a shallow flowing river, he balances some rocks on his shoulders and head whilst walking slower than a snail. Despite failing many times, he stays at it and at last is finally able to balance everything without fail. Having mastered the mind cultivation, the grandpa takes him to a vast place, and as the autumn wind blows past them, he asks his grandchild to use the wolf step. Taking heed to his orders, the kid quickly does so. Seeing his skills have improved so much with key limitation, the grandpa becomes certain that it's time his training was turned up a notch. Taking him to a seemingly harmless cave, the grandpa tells him that this is where they'll train from now on. Whilst, so Moon will be trapped inside trying to survive against the beasts, the grandpa will take the responsibility of feeding him. However, seeing a chained up wolf growling at him, he is overtaken by fear. But not going easy on his grandson, the old man reminds him that he has wolf step and much more techniques in his disposal. It's time that he learned the difference between reality and training. Saying this, the grandpa shoots a key blast at wolf's chain, freeing the beast and closing the door for good. I'm sure the old man is trying to kill his grandson. As the door closes, so Moon panics as it's too dark for him to see anything. Continuously knocking on the door, he asks his granddad to let him out. However, simply looking forth, the granddad thinks to himself that even though it's hard, he must endure it. Feeling violent gaze at him, the kid turns back suddenly, only to find that the wolf has gotten a lot more closer. Once again, hitting the door as hard as he can, he asks his grandfather to open the door, since what kind of a granddad feeds his only family to wolves? Trust me, dude, there are people doing way crazier stuff. However, it's too late now, and the kid is now in the wolf's range, as the furious beast jumps at him. Scared, he has no option but to escape using the wolf's step. However, one dodge isn't enough to keep the persistent animal away. Jumping from side to side, the kid keeps on dodging. But soon enough he realizes that he needs to find an opening and deal some real damage since at the rate things are going. He'll be dog food in a few seconds. Denji would be proud to be that as long as it's from Akima. So this time, taking a firm stance, the kid stands right in front of harm's way, and as the vile beast jumps to sink its teeth in his skin, he is finally able to find an opening and land a clean palm strike. Getting hit like that, the wolf too realizes that the kid is no joke, and for the time being, takes a step back. Now using the free time he has, the kid sits down and begins practicing his cultivation technique to regain stamina. Dying of thirst, the only source of water he's left with is a water seepage in the roof of the cave. And after a long wait, finally, the light shines on our MC, as a small part of the door opens and his grandfather throws him the meal. Unfortunately, before So Moon can get to it, the wolf jumps at it and gouges it down. Pouting at the animal's selfish act, the kid tells it that it must feel great eating such a delicious meal all alone. Since then, Four days have passed, and the only thing that the kid has been able to consume is tiny droplets of water falling from the roof. Finally, acknowledging that he has to be faster than the wolf to survive, the kid begins to materialize his plan. Playing possum, he acts to fall asleep while practicing his usual cultivation technique, not using much of its brain as the wolf sneaks up to So Moon in hopes of devouring him. He suddenly jumps and manages to gain a lot of distance between them. Just then, the small door is opened again and the food is thrown inside. This time, being closer to the meal, he at once jumps at it and begins gouging it down. Observing the scenario from outside, the grandfather appreciates his grandchild for accomplishing this task. Just as he opens the door, he finds his grandkid sleeping on top of the wolf's belly, whilst the growling beast is left tied up in ropes, unable to do anything. Please, nobody asked me in the comments that does it hurt the animal. Waking up. The kid complains to his grandpa that he left him alone. However, the grandpa replies that it was fruitful training and nothing more. Well, at least the kid can call his grandpa out. If it was mine here, right now, he'd be using all the techniques on me as demonstration. Not paying much attention to his grandfather's message, the kid dismisses everything and tries to leave. However, the grandfather then tells him that it's only the start of his training. After having acknowledged him for mastering the wolf's step, his grandfather then tells him that he must also master the psych now. While he did use the wolf's step, he didn't immobilize his enemies with striking fear in their hearts. So for the next 100 days, he'll stay here with wolves and every day a new wolf will be sent in along with no food. So he must survive on his own and fight to the best of his capabilities. 
Leaving him with only a dagger, the old man once again leaves. Old man really does want his grandson eaten as it appears so. Taking on the challenge, the kid sits in there with Bravo. Just like that four days pass by and four wolves enter the cave. Sitting there with his eyes peeled, so Moon wonders how he's going to tackle this obstacle. Just then the four wolves run towards him. However, using his intimidating aura the kid pushes them back. Seeing as to there is no other option, the wolves decide to attack the weakest among them and feast on it. Looking on, the kid wonders if this is the battle key his grandfather mentioned. Too hungry to even think straight, the kid dashes towards the wolves, so that he can also have some wolf meat. Once again, the vegans aren't gonna like this one. Seeing the kid try and take away their meal, the wolves lash out too and jump towards him. Not being able to catch up to the wolf's speed, he's bit on his arm. However, remaining calm, he pushes off the wolf and grunts in pain. But there isn't enough time for him to deal with his wounds, as the bloodthirsty wolves are still in pursuit of his flesh. Now taking a solid stance once again this time. So Moon lets the wolf make the first move, and just as the creature's horrifying teeth are about to sink deep into his arm, he plunges his dagger right into its neck, killing it for good. Too hungry to explore other options, he immediately skins the wolf and begins devouring its meat. Since then, a 100 days have passed by and only five wolves remain, because some were killed by the pack of wolves, while other by none other than our protagonist. But now to make it out of here alive, he must kill the leader of the pack, the Red-Eyed Wolf. Taking on this challenge, the Red-Eyed Wolf charges towards So Moon, and manages to ground him with his teeth sunken deep into his left arm. However, not giving up into the pain and fear, So Moon plunges his dagger right into the wolf's skull. As blood seeps out of it, so does the wolf's soul leaves his body. Now up on his feet once again, So Moon looks at the remaining wolves with bloodthirsty eyes. Not wasting any time, he leaps into the air and unleashes a powerful attack, sending all the wolves to their demise. Worried about the sudden silence in the cave, his grandfather calls out to him trying to make sure his grandson is alright. Upon getting the confirmation, he takes a sigh of relief and wipes off his tears. Oh, now you're worried. Taking his grandson back to their place, he patches up his wounds and gives him medicines to drink. However, a new issue arises when So Moon realizes that Iron Blood isn't coming near him due to his consistent blood lust. So in hopes of controlling it, he asks his grandfather about it, realizing that he must limit his key. So Moon once again undergoes training under the dimly lit sky with a cold atmosphere. Sitting underneath the waterfall, he calms his mind as he tries to cultivate his heart sutra. Sitting under the cold water, So Moon tries to empty his head from all thoughts. However, unable to do so, he loses control of his key and begins to go into shock due to sheer cold from the waterfall. Scared, his grandfather begins to worry if So Moon is going to fall ill. However, not wasting another second, So Moon decides to go all out. Upon hearing his grandfather's advice of letting his key flow rather than forcing it, he's able to take control of himself. Now, after having completed the training session, the two return home. Going into his sensei mode, the grandfather explains to the kid that the Heart Sutra virtualization was a technique formed and perfected by monks instead of warriors. They would focus on emptying their thoughts because the things we own, end up owning us. Moving forth, the grandfather then tells, back when the monks used this technique for the first time, they came out to be far stronger than the warriors who had been drowning in lust for power. So that's why his grandfather wanted to make sure he trained the Heart Sutra virtualization at a young age, before the worldly desires could take over his heart. Continuing his practice, one fine day, his grandfather notices So Moon not only attaining the triple apex flower, but also the five key awakening the highest power there is within the Heart Sutra virtualization. Seeing this, he begins to cry tears of joy, as he realizes that all of the training has led to this fruitful result. Now as the two take a walk under the fleeting sun, So Moon's grandfather tells him that even though he was thinking of starting his proper training from now on, there wouldn't be any need. But being the idiot he is, So Moon asks confusedly about what does he mean. To answer that, the grandpa tells him that he's learned everything there was to teach, Besides, he was able to achieve something that people can't do even after training all their lives. Hearing this at last, So Moon jumps in happiness. Several years pass by then, and So Moon continues to polish his archery skill. Sitting with his grandfather, he mentions of how he's never missed a shot in his entire life. However, his grandfather replies back that the pinnacle of archery is formless archery and a key guided arrow. But So Moon only takes it as a joke since the idea sounds ridiculous to him. 
However, his grandfather then mentions an interesting fact that the 17th archer in their ancestry was able to master the bow to perfection. After asking So Moon of his age, which turns out to be 17, he asks him to travel to their patriarch village hidden high in the mountains. There he must find the secrets to the art of Wu Wei in triple unity sword style, leaving him with a book about inner key cultivation written by their ancestors. His grandfather asks him to leave. Damn, man I feel like my life will end before So Moon's training does. Now standing on top of the hill at his patriarch village, So Moon prostrates and asks his ancestors for their continued guidance before jumping off of it whilst holding a rope. As he's scaling down the ginormous mountain, he comes across a small entrance. Jumping into it, he immediately senses an overwhelming amount of bloodlust. However, not giving in to the intimidation, he replies with some bloodlust enhanced by the Heart Sutra virtualization itself. Getting closer and closer to the source, he suddenly feels a blast of Kia and pushing him back. After several attempts at pushing through it, he at last sits down in despair thinking about his next move. Just then a light shines from the entrance further into the cave. Following the light, So Moon enters into a room with three drawings hanging from the ceiling. Surprised by the amount of ki that was flowing from them, So Moon takes cautious steps as he stumbles upon a small wooden trunk. Opening it, he finds in there a wooden bow that although may seem light, it weighs nothing less than a hundred pounds. Putting the weapon aside for a while since it's too heavy to use, So Moon finds a catalog. Reading through the pages, he finds his ancestor addressing to the reader of the diary, introducing himself as Yul Ji Hyuk, a 40-year-old man at the time of writing this. Even though he was proficient in archery, he ended up loving swords more than a bow. Since then, he spent 20 years learning the blade, and at the end of all this time, he was able to finally create the triple unity sword style, which he believed to be the strongest sword style ever. Reading this, So Moon mentions, What an egotistical guy. But I think we can agree that ego is something that runs in his family. Flipping through the page, So Moon suddenly notices a change in handwriting. Reading through the text, a new character is introduced, Yolju Mujiak. Unlike his grandfather, who happened to be the creator of the triple unity sword style, he didn't share the love for the sword, or rather a bow. Thus, following his own path, he made his own sword style, and tried taking on the first scroll that included the key for path to Wu Wei. However, when matched up against it, he couldn't deal any damage and realized that the sword style had transcended to divinity, and had become the peerless unity style. Hence impressed by it, he perfected his archery and taking inspiration from the sword style, he was able to create his own technique, formless firing, a technique that allows you to combine key with the arrow and shoot it, ridding you free of carrying any arrows. Hearing this, So Moon is baffled, as he realizes that his grandfather wasn't bluffing to him but actually serious. You gotta start putting some respect on your grandfather's name, boy. Continuing his reading, So Moon finally realizes that three scroll are a combination of all the techniques that his ancestors came up with. So to leave the cave stronger and more OP than ever, he has to make sure all three scrolls are destroyed. Picking up the bow, So Moon decides to give Formless Firing a shot first. However, unable to handle its weight, he decides to learn the path to Wu Wei first. So sitting in the cave, he begins to meditate, and after some days have passed by, he's finally able to get a hang of it. Gathering the two keys that he's learned, the Heart Sutra Cultivation and Wu Wei. So Moon sits patiently. However, this suddenly goes wrong for him as soon the kids begin colliding his body. Realizing that this is bad, he wonders if he should quit training for now or keep going on. As he recalls his grandpa's advice telling him to quit whenever the two key clash, since many of his ancestors were crippled due to this but still not giving into the risk of death or lifelong injury. So Moon continues to try and control the keys, but realizing there's no other way to go, he raises his Heart Sutra visualization key and circulates the path to Wu Wei, allowing the two to merge with each other. The sheer amount of key suddenly begins emitting an aura of red and blue from So Moon's eyes and body, making him scream out in pain as he yells that his body is about to burst. For a moment, the negativity gets to him as he thinks that this was a bad idea. However, reminding himself that it's do or die at this point. He continues finally managing to overcome the obstacle and carry two keys simultaneously. Taking a sigh of relief, suddenly So Moon realizes that he's floating in the air now just by thinking of standing up. My man bat skills. Now getting on with the next step, he begins training formless firing as he picks up the heavy bow and goes outside. Spending a fortnight in the forest, So Moon quickly gets a hang of the technique and advances onto the next step, peerless sword style. Going back into the cave, he carves out a wooden sword and tries to understand how to use it. Despite not touching a sword his entire life, wondering what to do, he looks at the scrolls for an explanation. 
Just then, the sword comes flying out of it right in his direction, dodging it at the last second. So Moon lives to breathe another day. However, followed in quick succession, a second sword comes for his head from the second scroll, barely managing to dodge it. So Moon stands cautiously as he waits for the third scroll that happens to release electrifying key that So Moon is able to block using his wooden sword. Remember, guys, that's because wood is an insulator. Seeing this, So Moon concludes that the first scroll portrays swiftness, the second deception, and the third one is the key of the full moon, and all these three scrolls were set here by his ancestors. Man, seems like his ancestors were really hell-bent on killing their offsprings. Seeing his reaction to all these attacks, So Moon realizes that it's the sky-high blade form for which the path to Wu Wei was created in the first place. Now knowing what to do, so Moon spends countless night honing his skills and just like that, a year and four months pass by. After all this time, he's only able to cut down two of the scrolls, leaving only the third, but still unable to do so. So Moon keeps on practicing the peerless blade technique and at last two years and three months later, he challenges himself again. Using the first step of the peerless sword style, he initiates the thoughtless blade cutting through the first scroll cleanly. Then, using the second step, Loveless Blade, he's able to cut through the second scroll and at last, using the third step, Endless Blade. He slashes all of the three scrolls, finally ending his journey, paying his respects to his ancestors. So Moon once again heads back to his grandfather. Now, after getting back home, So Moon simply lies down and rests. Seeing this, his grandfather scolds him and tells him to have aspirations. However, So Moon replies that his aspiration is to spend life this way by basking in the sun all day and eating to the fullest. Damn, never have I felt more relatable than MC before. Hearing this, the grandfather gets furious and brings down his stick upon So Moon. But things are different now, as So Moon easily dodges his attacks and is also able to block with a mere finger. Oh, how the tables have turned. Later at night, as the two sit in silence inside of their home, So Moon's grandfather tells him that he won't tell him what to do anymore, but he should at least get a wife and then settle down. This man's 20 and talks of him getting married had already begun. Meanwhile, I'm here narrating man was at 20. Ah oh man, I'm sobbing. However, sighing in despair, So Moon replies that there aren't any women in this mountain. But to his surprise, his grandfather informs him that his wife is in Zhang Yuan. Further explaining his statement, his grandfather tells him that a long time ago when So Moon was only four, he made acquaintance with the head of the Sichuan family, the strongest family in the Sichuan region and one of the five mightiest families in Zhang Yuan. Providing So Moon with an artifact known as the Jade Plaque, his grandfather asks him to show this to the Sichuan family, so they can know he's their son-in-law. Imagine have Riz so bad, your grandson arranges your marriage. After that, his grandfather also gives him a book by the name of Tom of the Head Sutra, and asks him to return it back to Shaolin Temple on the way back. Now finding ourselves back in the forest, we find a young warrior trying to get away from a crowd of soldiers at full speed. However, Unable to keep up with the fatigue and wounds, his course collapses down. With no other option in sight, the soldier decides to put down his course. R.I.P. horse, you'll be missed. Now surrounded with no escape, the warrior finds himself in the presence of Taru, the chief of Bay tribe. Being merciful, Taru offers the warrior the option of surrendering, so that he may be spared. However, the young warrior immediately rejects that offer and pulls out his sword. Without fear, he charges at the Taru and the two clash swords. Taru then takes another powerful swing that the warrior is barely able to dodge. But before the realization of death looming around him can set in, Taru knocks the sword out of his hands, leaving him defenseless. Praising the young warrior for his skills, he asks his name. In response, the young warrior introduces himself as the Yaku tribe's vice chief, Guyuk. Ashamed of failing his duties, Guyuk asks Taru for an honorable death. Upholding his honor, Taru also agrees. Kind of feel like Taru is a good man. Sitting prepared for his demise, Guyuk sits calmly as Taru pulls his blade back to behead him. Just then, an arrow comes flying at Taru, striking him right in the shoulder. Enraged, he yells and questions who is there, jumping out of the shadows. So Moon stands in front of him as he tells him that it's not good for so many people to attack a single person. Introducing himself, Taru asks So Moon who he is. However, giving a vague response, he simply tells the group that he's just a sleepy man awoken by this ruckus. Angry at this blasphemous comment, Taru's underlings ask So Moon to kneel. But being the badass he is, he shoots an arrow right into the guy's knee asking him to kneel himself. Pretty savage, standing firm and strong. 
So Moon, with his bloodlust rising by the moment, asks Taru to stand down, or else everyone dies. A couple of moments later, all of the attackers are left tied up with a tree. Now finally out of harm's way, Guyak thanks So Moon, curious as to the situation. So Moon asks him why they were trying to kill him since they seem to be from the same tribe. To explain that Guyak responds that he's a part of the Jianzhou Jurchens, while the others were a part of the Hiaxi Jurchens. Since there have some intertribal battles, the relationships are complicated. Guyak then asks So Moon where he's headed, and after hearing that, he'll be heading to the Shaolin Temple and then Sichuan. He tells So Moon that it'll take five to six months to get there. Hearing this, So Moon yells in frustration as he recalls his grandfather telling that it'll only take a couple of months. I feel like everything this grandfather tells him is a lie. To repay So Moon for his kindness, he asks him to visit their village first to Ristok before heading out. Riding through the forest, So Moon and Gu Yuk exchanges pleasantries. Just then, a battalion of soldiers comes running straight at them, preparing for battle. So Moon asks Gu Yuk if they're his enemies. However, upon hearing that it's just his men that were looking for him, So Moon calms down. Calling out to the chief, Gu Yuk bows down in embarrassment as he apologizes for the death of the hundred men due to him. However, without putting the blame on anyone, the chief tells him that they all died an honorable death since they died for their tribe. Taking notice of So Moon standing right next to him, he asks who he is. Answering the question, Gu Yuk tells him that it's the guy who saved his life, with his perfect archery skills. The way So Moon's becoming a celebrity here, he may just find a wife at Gu Yuk's camp. Hearing this, the chief introduces himself as Marinanta, and shows his gratitude for saving Gu Yuk's life. Heading back to the tribe's camp, Gu Yuk assigns one of his soldiers, Masad, to serve So Moon the time he's here. Keeping a formal attitude, Masad keeps addressing So Moon as Mr. However, annoyed by the formalities, he asks Masad to keep it cool and only call him Young Nim, since he's younger than him. Now resting in a camp, Masad and So Moon exchange words. The conversation allows him to learn that there are two authorities in Zhang Yuan. One of them is ruled by the Emperor, while the other is ruled by a society of Murim warriors known as the Gang Ho. But of course, our dumb So Moon isn't able to understand the concept fully and thinks that Zhang Yin is divided by a country by the name of Gang Ho in the Ming Dynasty. However, Masad reiterates himself and tells that Gang Ho is actually just a group of Murim warriors in the Ming Dynasty. Just then, with a serious expression on his face, Gu Yuk enters inside of the tent and tells So Moon that he believes war is about to rage again. Unfazed by the dreadful news, So Moon turns back slowly and asks if it's actually true since it's been quiet for a few months. Famous last words, Guyak then responds that the Bahi tribe has already reached Mount Meta, that happens to be only 20 miles away. As Guyak heads out to certain death, So Mu stoically advises him to come back in one piece. Wow, Sherlock. I thought he must have been dying to come back in pieces. Literally. Worried about Guyak, So Moon asks Masad if the Bahi tribe is strong. In response, Masad answers that it is three times stronger than the Yakuo, so in an all-out war, it would be a huge disadvantage. As the two armies stand against each other, staring at their deaths, So Moon mentions that the Bahi being this strong doesn't sound good. Then in just one flash, the armies begins charging towards each other. Still confident in their ability, Wu Yuk's tribe mentions that even though they are lesser in number, they're still more skilled. Well, famous last words, because Wu Yuk's tribe start to get absolutely massacred in the start of the battle. Realizing that the situation is grim, So Moon asks Masad to bring some branches and begins carving them out in the shape of an arrow, standing on top of a cliff. So Moon takes aim and even though he didn't want to kill anyone to prevent any more deaths, he snags the arrow right into an enemy soldier's arm that was about to kill Guyak. Noticing the wounded soldier, Guyak reverts his attention to him and strikes him with his sword, assessing the situation. So Moon then notices another fierce warrior of the enemy forces, who sitting on top of a horse is massacring several men of Gu Yuk's army, thinking to himself that to kill a serpent, his head must be cut. So Mu takes aim and then shoots his arrow in his direction. As the vile warrior raises his blade to cut through the several foot soldiers, suddenly, So Moon's arrow strikes him right in the heart, sending him to his demise. Seeing this, enemy soldiers are left shocked. I think we should name So Moon the White Death. If you guys don't know who he is, search it up, you'll be shocked. However, not giving the enemy a chance to settle, So Moon hits a multi-shot killing several soldiers simultaneously. Noticing the blistering speed of the arrows, Masad is left shocked and impressed, while several of the enemy soldiers fall down injured or dead. Gumyuk's army suddenly get a boost of morale when they realize that the reinforcements are here. 
Seeing the now fired up army charging at them at full speed, the Bagi tribe chief gives a frightened yet furious expression as he takes notice of So Moon. Standing next to him, the vice chief, Babu tells him that he's the guy that single handedly defeated all his battalion. Hearing this, even the chief accepts that he's never seen such a powerful and frightening display with the bow. However, Baba reminds him that he must not get impressed right now since their cavalry must fall back and rally them. But in a disappointed voice, the chief tells him that there will be no need for that, since they've already lost the battle due to their soldiers' low morale. So with no other option left, the best tactic right now is to simply retreat. Hearing this, Bahu gives his men the order to retreat, whilst the Baha'i tribe chief is left thinking how terrifying the idea of a single archer changing the outcome of the war is. It's the first time ever that I've seen a character that actually takes the first cue not to mess with an overpowered protagonist. Good going, mate. Yes, he heard the boss music playing when So Mu showed up. Trumpets are then blown from the enemy's side, signifying defeat and retreat. Hearing the sweet sound of victory, all the soldiers scream out in happiness. Whilst Masad also happily tells So Moon that they've been keeping a stoic voice, So Moon simply tells him that they should get back now. Now back at the camp, soldiers begin drinking and feasting, as they describe the victory as one of the most exhilarating experience of their life due to how the enemies were panicking. Meanwhile, as So Moon enters the camp, Guyuk with a wide smile comes out running to So Moon and calls out his name. Seeing his friend alive, So Moon smiles and tells him he's glad to see him back in one piece. But kneeling down, Guyuk tells him that it's all thanks to his archery and that his father and the other war generals are waiting for him at the celebratory party. However, too tired after shooting so many arrows, So Moon tells him that he'll visit them later as he'd like to rest now. Dang, I guess when So Moon was born, it was the doctor that got spanked. Respecting So Moon's wishes, he lets him go. But as So Moon walks, he notices all of the village being burned down and several women being lashed by soldiers as they are left defenseless. Seeing this with an enraged expression, So Moon asks who these guys are, to which Masa replies that they are the Yaku soldiers, grunting. So Moon asks that why are they taking the villagers captive and burning their house if they've already won the battle. In response, Masa tells him that apparently someone from the village helped the Bahi tribe. Still not seeing the point, So Moon tells Mossad that they should only capture the person that helped the Bahi and not those that were innocent. Why are they being captured? In response, Masa tells So Moon that it's so that they can be enslaved and then sold. Hearing this, So Moon's anger increases even more after realizing how cruel this is. Admitting his bloodlust, he tells Mossad that they are heading to the party after all. As So Moon heads into the party, he finds several villagers tied up there and one that's about to be beheaded. But before the sword can cut through the villagers' head, So Moon asks the soldier to stop that. Alerted by this insolent tone, the generals look in the direction the voice came from only to find So Moon there. Not realizing the situation, they welcome him with open arms and show gratitude for helping them win the battle. But not paying attention to their words nor caring about them. So Moon asks the higher-ups why they are killing and enslaving innocent people when the war is over. They should let them go at once. But the war chief hearing that simply laughs as he claims that even though So Moon's skill with the bow is excellent, he lacks a firm heart. That's because he has no enemies, guys. Comment down below where this reference is from. In a mocking tone, he tells So Moon he understands where he's coming from but nothing can be done, so he should sit with them and have a drink. Not finding anything funny, So Moon this time with I will rip your throat out with my teeth looks at the general and says that he beseeches that these people must be given freedom. Just then a sword is plunged into the ground at that very moment and a guy yells how dare he say something like that, does he not know who he's standing in front of? However, not intimidated in slightest, So Moon just gives a bombastic side eye. Looking in his direction, So Moon sees a gigantic and muscular man who happens to be a general of the Yakuo tribe. Carrying his berserker style sword, he gives So Moon the criminal offensive side eye and tells him that his achievements don't mean that he has to be pardoned for such modesty. So he asks him to leave at once. Calming down the situation, the chief tells him to let it be since So Moon is the one due to who they won this battle. However, letting his sense of pride and ego take over, he curses So Moon and tells him that his unremarkable archery isn't something he should be proud of. Some people just really want to get whooped. Guyuk also intervenes as he reminds the general that it was due to So Moon that they came out as the victors today. However, the general asks Guyuk to stay out of this since according to him, disrespecting the chief team means to disrespect all of the Yaku tribe. Acting more and more out of control by the moment, the general orders his men to capture So Moon and take him away. As the men approach So Moon armed till the teeth, he 
He's simply emitting his bloodlust and tells them to screw off. This mere statement is enough to send a shiver down the soldiers' spines and make them rethink their decision. So the general decides to take matters into his own hands, as he claims that he's just as good with the dagger, as So Moon is with the bow. Taking out of the daggers from his armor, he throws it at So Moon. Seeing this, the chief immediately get frightened, as they realize that the general has crossed a line he shouldn't have. However, unfazed by the dagger coming straight for his chest, So Moon simply stares down his opponents. Just then, fearing for his master's life, Masa jumps in front of the dagger and gets struck right in the middle of his chest. Going limp, he falls into So Moon's arms, while So Moon yells out of worry and asks Masa to keep it together. In a muffled whisper-like voice, Masad laughs and tells So Moon that his body just moved on his own. Seeing his friend bleeding to death, So Moon screams out in pain. However, being the kind soul that he is, as tears drip down from Masad's eyes, he tells So Moon to keep smiling, since he looks best when he's smiling. Giving into his request, So Moon tells him that he'll smile as long as he doesn't die. However, the light quickly begins to fade away from Masad's eyes as he utters his last words. It's been a pleasure knowing you, R.I.P. Mossad. You were a good friend and an even better human. Seeing one of his first ever friends pass away, So Moon yells out his name looking at the heavens. However, that is soon followed out by fury and rage, emitting bloodlust to his maximum capability. He takes out the dagger from Mossad's heart and tells the general, let's see you catch this. And before the general can react, the dagger is taken across the general's skull, all the way down to his legs, cutting him in half like a torn paper. However, still not having his wrath fully unleashed, So Moon yells that he's going to end all of the Yaku tribe, saying that he unleashes the peerless triple unity blade, endless blade, and kills all those he opposes, leaving only Guyuk. Seeing this, Guyuk falls to his knees as he cries and calls out So Moon. Hearing his saddened voice, So Moon looks back and tells him that he'll never forget him and was sad. Saying this, he bids farewell to him and heads out once again as a solo player, whilst Gu Yuk on his knees cries and tells So Moon that he'll always be waiting for his return. Four days later, as So Moon is traveling all alone, he comes across none other than Iron Blood. Seeing a message with him, he opens the small paper and reads it out. The message is none other than from his beloved lion grandfather, mentioning that since Iron Blood was getting lonely, he's sending him, and he also mentions that. So Moon needs to get back as soon as possible, since he can't be bothered cooking for himself. Reading this with frustration, So Moon throws the letter away and carries on with his journey. Now inside of a jungle, he decides to hunt down a tiger. However, as he's taking aim to put it down, the tiger takes notice of So Moon's presence and comes running at him. Not afraid of the deadly tiger, using his formless firing technique, So Moon shoots a key arrow at it, killing the tiger instantly, carrying the heavy tiger corpse. So Moon is able to reach Beijing. However, hidden under the gigantic tiger, it seems as the animal is walking on two feet. All the shoppers stand in horror, fearing for their life, until So Moon finally drops the corpse and shouts out that the dead tiger is for sale. Without wasting a moment, the people gather around it and start bidding for the fresh tiger. The price starts from 10 gold coins until it goes higher and higher. Grinning, So Moon thinks to himself that he just wanted to make a little money to cover his food expenses but it's going a lot better than he had expected. Suddenly, an old man takes notice of the tiger and observes it closely. After confirming the tiger to be in good condition, he offers So Moon a whopping amount of 200 gold coins. Hearing this, So Moon's eyes bulge out in shock. When is this gonna happen with my broke ass? I'm sobbing right now, guys. However, before So Moon can process this information, the old man throws the gold coin in his direction and heads off with the tiger. Having earned a pretty good amount of money, so Moon goes to Man Inlu, a high-end restaurant. But judging So Moon from his rugged clothes, the waiter at the door asks So Moon to go away, since he thinks it isn't a place that he'll be able to afford. However, he's left shocked when So Moon hands him the gold coin. Seeing this much money, the waiter immediately changes his attitude and begins addressing him as Sir and seats him, offering him a wide variety of food. The waiter informs So Moon of the delicacies that are best served at Man Inlu. Just then, Sto Moon, while ripping through duck meat, asks the waiter to bring him some new clothes. Damn, even narrating this is making me hungry. As he comes off to buy some clothes for So Moon, he hands him another gold coin. Having earned two years' worth of salary in a year, the waiter ecstatically goes to buy clothes. So Moon really out here flexing his wealth. 
After a while of surfing through the finest materials, the waiter brings out clothes made of pure silk that are best attributed to a warrior. Now sitting with the waiter, So Moon asks him if Sichuan is far from here. In response, the waiter tells him that the road there is long and very harsh, and especially difficult for those that are heading there for the first time. However, there are certain people that frequently travel there. Having his curiosity piqued, So Moon immediately questions who these people are. So the waiter tells him that it's an escort agency that often guard high authority personnel, navigate through such difficult areas or carry important goods. So no matter how dangerous it is, as long as it is within the bounds of Zhang Yun, those guys will go anywhere. Suddenly, the waiter asks So Moon if he's a martial artist himself. After getting a confirmation from him, he then suggests that he should apply for the role of a warden, since all the expenses for a warden are covered. Now once again out in the market, So Moon walks around in his new clothes, and boy oh boy, is our So Moon looking hot. Looking for the Thousand Mile Escort Agency, So Moon looks here and there but being the big dummy he is, he forgets the directions for it. So calling out to Iron Blood, he asks him to search for the agency. Fortunately, since Iron Blood isn't as stupid as So Moon, he quickly finds out where the agency is and helps So Moon get there. As So Moon enters the agency, he's suddenly stopped by the receptionist who asks him what he's doing here. Ignorant of what's going on, So Moon simply tells him that he's here for a job. However, the receptionist tells him that the trials for wardens are already over, so he'll just have to come at another time. Talking in an apologetic tone, So Moon tries to bargain with him by telling him that he's come from a really far place, so he can't go back. But not giving in to So Moon's tactics, he simply tells him that he should have come earlier then. However, still not giving up, So Moon asks him when the next trials will take place. Keeping a stern attitude, the guy tells him that there's no set date, since more wardens will only be needed when there will be more jobs. But staying persistent, So Moon asks the guy to let him help out with odd tasks until then. Seeing So Moon's desperation, he at last offers him the work of a handyman. Even though So Moon isn't very pleased with that position, he has no option but to accept it. Well, beggars can't be choosers. Two months pass since then, and before So Moon heads out on his tenth journey, one of his senior handymen asks him why he's always carrying a bow, but keeping his proficiency with a bow a secret. He simply tells that it is just a heirloom. Now as the escort agency travels through the beautifully snow-capped mountains, one of the wardens warns his colleague. Warden So it cautions him to be extra careful. However, So mentions that, since they have over 30 experienced wardens, there's no need to worry. Once again, I'll say famous last words. As the caravan travels deeper into the forest, one of the warden asks the caravan captain regarding what is the shortest path. In response, he tells him that if they were to keep heading south, then they'd reach precipitous cliffs of Mount Changam. However, there's also a different path through Hanum that will take four days. Seeing the shortage of time, the warden decides that they must keep heading south so that they can travel in time. However, the caravan captain tells them that the only problem that lies on this path is a place called the Tiger's Mouth Den. The last warden that traveled through here had some complications. Taking heed from the captain's advice, the warden leader asks everyone to be on guard as they enter the Tiger's Mouth Den. Two of the wardens talking with each other mention how it would be better if bandits showed up, since it would make the journey interesting at least. Just then, So Moon takes notice of bloodlust coming from his left side. Quickly anticipating the size of the bandit fleet, So Moon realizes that they are twice the number of the wardens. Suddenly, the warden leader asks the caravan to stop and a horde of men block their path. The leader of the bandits takes notice that the Thousand Mile Agency is traveling through. In response, the warden leader introduces himself as Li Jin. Giving back the warm gesture, the bandit leader showing his respects, introduces himself as Jiu Ria Wong. Noticing that he's a man of respect, Li Jin asks why he blocked his path then. To answer that, Wom replies that recently due to the heavy rain their fences have broken down. So they didn't come to block their path but rather check who it is. Hearing that, Li Jin being the respectable man he is, pulls out some gold coins to help out Wom fix the fence. Just then a commotion occurs and an all-out fight breaks out between the bandits and the wardens. Seeing as how the fighting has already started, the leaders too begins fighting from their respective groups. The wardens wonder who attacked first, however it doesn't matter now since the fight has already started, so all they have to do is win. Swords, spikes and weapons of all kinds clash with each other. And while the wardens may have been more experienced and formally trained for battle, due to the overwhelming number of the bandits, more and more of them were getting injured, or far worse killed. Sighing at the situation, 
So Moon thinks to himself that all this happened due to one inexperienced warden only. Since moments earlier a bandit had approached a warden with a friendly intent. The bandit mentioned that since the talks between his boss and the warden's boss are going smoothly, perhaps they should introduce themselves too. However, scared by the bandit's intimidating aura, the warden asked him not to get any closer while gripping his sword, but still not taking the cue and keeping a friendly demeanor. The bandit introduces himself as Crimson Wolf, Hong rang and imitates to growl at the warden. Scared of the bandit, the warden instantly swung his sword, which slashes through poor Hong Rang's chest. People screw me like the warden screw Hong Rang, feeling sad for my G. R.I.P. Bud. Now coming back into the present, seeing as how the situation is only getting worse, So Moon climbs on top of the carriage and readies his bow. Unaware of the sheer talent and skill standing in front of him, the caravan captain asks him to come down and not attract any attention, since bandits let the handyman live most of the time. However, in response, so Moon only gives the captain a huge smile and proceeds to take aim. Taking his first shot, he manages to get one guy in the throat. Proceeding, he uses his infamous multi-shot killing several of Wong's men that were guarding him. Distracted by the arrow, Wong asks who is the one shooting these arrows. But just then, Li Jin swoops in close and cuts Wong down. Poor Wong seemed like a good guy. Seeing their leader fall, the bandits decide to do a tactical retreat and run back to where they came from. One of the wardens reports 11 casualties and 17 deaths to Li Jin, who feels disappointed about how the outcome of that negotiation turned out. Asking the injured wardens to travel in the wheelbarrow, Li Jin shows his gratitude to So Mu and compliments his archery skills. After asking his name, Li Jin tells him that being a handyman for someone with his caliber of skills is a disgrace. But moving forth with the journey, at last the agency finally reaches their destination and decides to rest up there, until all the wardens are completely healed from their wounds. Now at the agency's residency, as So Moon is passing by, he hears two men talking about the Shaolin Temple. Interrupting their interaction, he asks him if the Shaolin Temple is nearby. One of the workers pointing to a mountain in sight, known as Mount Song, tells So Moon that the Shaolin Temple is there. After inquiring of the distance between Song and the agency's residency, which happens to be 50 miles. So Moon goes and asks his higher-ups permission to travel to the Shaolin Temple. This might just be the first MC, who is so OP yet he still follows the rules. After getting permission from Li Jin, So Moon immediately heads out and reaches Mount Song before nightfall. Sitting on top of a beautiful hill, he notices that the kids play sports here using the Shaolin Temple technique. Now as the sun slowly fades into the horizon, So Moon finally reaches the Shaolin Temple. However, just as he's going to enter the temple, two monks stop him and ask him to come tomorrow, since the time for service is up once the sun is down. Why is So Moon late to everything? Stammering and confused, So Moon tells them that he isn't here to attend the service, but rather to see the Patriarch. With a stern expression on his face, one of the monks asks him what his purpose to see the Patriarch is. Still not having coming up with an excuse, So Moon replies he simply wants to greet him. Taking notice of So Moon's casual attitude, the monk straight up tells him that the Patriarch is no ordinary guy, and doesn't meet someone without any concrete reason. Realizing that there's no going past this monk, So Moon with the stern expression on his face, tells him that he's Yolji So Moon, and he's here regarding the Tom of Heart Sutra. Never having heard of such a Tom, the monk asks his fellow if he's ever heard of something like that. However, his answer is also no. Seeing as the matter is something beyond their understanding, they call a senior member who happens to be Yang Gak, the monk responsible for attending to the guests. Conversing with So Moon, he asks if he knows anything regarding the disappearance of the Tome of Heart Sutra. In response, So Moon tells him that yes, he's here regarding the very matter he's speaking about. Hearing this, Yang yells at the top of his lungs, Thank the gods. At last, there is some information on the Tome of the Heart Sutra that was stolen from the Shaolin Temple 50 years ago. Hearing the word stolen, So Moon has his senses blown out as he thinks that his grandfather told him that he had borrowed the Tome. This guy, man. I swear to God, everything that has come out So Moon's grandfather's mouth has been a lie, and he keeps on setting up his grandchild on it. Ecstatic, Yang asks the other monks to bring in the patriarch. Sweating profusely, So Moon then realizes that his grandfather did indeed steal the Tom, since what faction would just give away their greatest treasure? Now having no option, So Moon follows Yang to meet the patriarch. Now sitting with a panel of monks, So Moon is greeted by the patriarch Yango who asks him about the information regarding the disappearance of the Tome of Heart Sutra. Nervous, So Moon thinks to himself that they kill him, if they learned that they were responsible for stealing it. 
Intruding his thought, Yango asks So Moon about it. In response, So Moon tells him that, yes, he indeed does have information about the book. Hearing all the monk praise Budha in joy and asks him where it is, taking out the book from his bag. So Moon places it on the table. Seeing the book, Yango and all the monks once again begin praising Budha. Too happy to even think about where So Moon found this book from. They begin thanking him for it and ask him how they could repay him. Since taking this opportunity, So Moon quickly twists the story and tells the monks that they don't need to do anything since he only found the book in a cave when he got lost whilst traveling with Thousand Mile Escort Agency. In the cave, he found a wooden box in which he found the book that said it belonged to the Shulin Temple. Guess So Moon is as good of a liar as his grandfather. Hearing the name of the Thousand Mile Escort Agency, Yamgo asks him what he's doing there. In response, so Moon tells him that he's working there as a handyman. Consequently, Yango tells him that the leader of that agency is also one of the Shaolin Temple, John Won Sam. Bowing down, So Moon tells the monks that he must take his leave now, since his work here is done. However, the monks start begging So Moon to stay, so that they can repay their debt to him. But trying to leave there as soon as possible, So Moon remains firm in his stance. Just then, the eldest monk of the temple joins the meeting. Standing up in honor and respect, all the monks bow down and inform him that the Tome of Heart Sutra has been retrieved. Taking a close look at So Moon, he asked the other monk if So Moon was the young man who brought it. After getting confirmation, he stares him down and then introduces himself as Sanjay. Following that, he tells the other monks that he'll have a word with So Moon alone, so they'll be going to the Sutra Depository. Before leaving, he also asks the monk to send Mumu, the practicing monk, to him. Now, as Sanjay walks with So Moon, he thanks him for returning the book. Keeping on his act, So Moon tells him that he just happened to find it, so there's no need to thank him. However, smiling after hearing that, Xianjie tells So Moon that he lies well. Hearing this, So Moon is immediately taken aback, and with a surprised look says, Liar. Xianjie then asks him if it was he who brought back or was it on Joe or Bo's order. Hearing his grandfather's name, So Moon pretends to not know who it is. Funny enough, even we are hearing his name for the first time. However, Seonje with a serious look asks if he's still gonna continue lying. Accepting that he's been caught, so Mu shyly tells him that it was Bo, after all. Hearing that name again, Seonje gives the reaction of something similar to what you give after learning how your old friend is doing. However, once again giving a suspicious look, he asks So Moon about his relationship with Bo. This time truthfully answers that Bo is his grandfather. Hearing that Seonje rests easy, as he recalls his encounter with So Moon's grandfather. Putting on heaps of praises on him, he tells So Moon that his grandfather was simply amazing, and that he was able to dodge all of his attack using a simple movement technique. After all that he was only able to get in one attack using the consecutive 9 order and 100 divine steps technique. However, Seonjae also admits that he believed that Bo let himself deliberately get hit, and before he left he promised to return the Tome of Heart Sutra back. Thinking about this conversation, So Moon deduces that Seonjae must be talking about the wolf step, since it is on par with the 100 Divine Steps technique. However, putting a halt to his thoughts for a second, so Moon tells CMJ, since they have no use for it anymore, he's here to return it back. Just then, CMJ asks him if he's mastered the Heart Sutra, and as he gets confirmation, one of his disciples, Mumu shows up and greets him. Now talking to So Moon, CMJ tells him that only the Patriarch here could beat Mumu, since he's too strong at this point and he's also in line to become the next generation's Sholin guardian deity. Guys, this is what Krillin would have looked like if he had grown any taller than two feet tall. But still my guy is winning, despite being the short king, since he did end up bagging Android 18. Now narrating the legends of Shaolin, Seven J tells So Moon that, in history, there are two great Shaolin legends. One of them that is known by everyone, the legend of the Shaolin's 108 Nahan army. That army comprised of the greatest 108 monks at the time and had never lost a battle. When a great evil such as Gum, the Man Butcher, befell the planet and formed the Blood Clan, nobody was able to stop his march but the Nahan 108 army, and that too without being touched. Then there was also the demon that conquered all of Jainman. However, he fell to the Nahan 108 army too. Then around 40 years ago another warrior rose. He beheaded the Blood Priest who was known as the Lord of Death. However, following that he killed the devil of nine schools, Thunder God and Yalsa. You know, after that, he traveled three years around Zhang Yuan to defeat the martial artists of the Dark Path. And after having won 477 battle, the man was known to be a god amongst men. 
Gu Yang Pong the Celestial Destruction Blade. Then one day, he entered the Shaolin Temple and defeated all of the 108 Nahan army himself. Damn talk about a one-man army. But just as he thought that Zhang Yuan had fallen under his control, one of the monks told him to follow him so that he can see the true power of the Shaolin Temple. Following behind Gu Yang was met by none other than young Xianjie. Showing some mercy, Yu Yang then asked Xianjie to move out of his way if he doesn't want to get killed. However, taking notice of this benevolency, Xianjie tells him that he'll attack him three times, so try dodging that. Now enraged, Gu Yang yelled that he won't tolerate such jokes, but by then he had already been attacked once. Realizing that, since he didn't see the attack coming, then Xianjie must be the real deal. Taking a few steps back, Gu Yang takes his stance as Xianjie tries to hit him with multiple shots. However, barely managing to dodge all of them, Gu Yang falls for feint and is left open. This makes him realize that he'd have been dead if Xianjie wanted. We've been thinking so Moon is the overpowered one all along, but it has been Xianjie all along. It's probably because of that old man strength. Now stopping the fight, Gu Yang showed his respect to Xianjie's skill level and told him how he's made himself realizes that there's still more to improve. Bowing down out of curiosity, he asks what martial arts this is and in response, Xianjie tells that this is the Triple Dharma Blade, a move only taught to the Guardian Deity. Now back to the issue at hand, Xianjie tells So Moon that he's passed the reins now to Mumu. However, since he's gotten too prideful, his skills have gotten stagnant. Looking at So Moon with daring eyes, he then asks him to humble Mumu for him. Hearing this, So Moon immediately begins questioning his existence. Hashtag relatable, whilst Mumu looks on with sheer fury. Throwing So Moon under the bus, Xianjie asks him to teach Mumu a lesson in battle. However, with a frightened expression and twitching eyes, So Moon tells Xianjie that he is incapable enough. Hearing that, Xianjie looks down with a disappointed look on his face. As he brushes his beard with his hands, he says out loud that perhaps it can't be helped then. However, giving So Moon the criminal offensive side eye, he mentions that the other elders of the temple don't know that his grandfather was the one who stole the Tome of the Heart Sutra. Sweating profusely, so Moon turns his head and begins to grasp his situation, as he realizes that he's screwed because all old men are the same. Sly and crook. Still giving an intense stare, Mumu wonders how strong So Moon actually is, since Xiongjie talks about him as if he'll defeat him no matter what. So slightly bowing his head, Mumu tells Xiongjie that he understands his worries. However, he's confident that he isn't so weak that he'll lose to So Moon. Pleading, he asks Xiongjie not to make them fight. However, not listening to a word he had to say, Sionje tells Mumu to simply follow his commands and asks So Moon if he'll fight or if he would like the leader to find out the truth. Having no other option at last, So Moon agrees to the battle. Now as the two square off, Mumu thinks that he'll immediately destroy So Moon. However, our boy So Moon on the other hand is too lazy to even do anything and thinks to himself that he'll let Mumu land a hit and wrap this up. Well, in the famous words of Shikamaru, this is a drag. As the battle is about to begin, the two bow down their head in respect. Now taking a stance, Mumu begins to do some circular hand motions and tries to come after So Moon with a thousand palm strikes. However, before So Moon can do anything about it, the attack hits him full force, sending him flying into the concrete temple wall. Biting his fingers out of worry, Mumu realizes that he put in some extra strength since he thought So Moon was an expert. Oh boy, he's an expert, just wait. Grunting, after experiencing the life threatening attack, so Moon frustratedly thinks to himself that he was going to let himself get hit anyways, but why did this monk have to hit him so hard? Wiping the nosebleed from his head, he tells Mumu then fine if a real battle is something he wants then let's have a real battle. Now taking his stance, So Moon begins channeling his key. Looking at this intimidating sight, Mumu also realizes that So Moon is giving off a different vibe altogether. However, before he can process his thoughts, So Moon yells, Here I come and at blistering speed punches Mumu right in the solar plexus. Being pushed back from the sheer force of the punch, Mumu to his surprise coughs up blood and mentions that he's never seen such speed. Standing aside, Xianjie with a furious yet determined look on his face yells at Mumu and tells him that didn't he say that So Moon will break his pride. I guess Mumu's been getting the So Moon upbringing too. Asian Parenting 101. However, showing his mental fortitude, Mumu tells Xianjie that he isn't done yet. Now taking the Cobra stance from Karat Kid, Mumu tries on a new technique, the indestructible defensive stance. Not realizing the stance's defensive abilities, So Moon throws a flurry of punches. However, using the 12 enlightenments of the Golden Dragon, 
Moo Moo is able to block all of So Moon's punches using the Seizing Palm. At last, finding an opening amongst the flurry, Moo Moo finally counters with the unparalleled kick. As the kick brushes past So Moon's face, he sees his life flashing before him and is forced to take a step back. Using the momentum, Mumu proceeds to attack with the Divine Finger snap that So Moon barely manages to evade. And at last, finally finding a moment to breathe, So Moon pulls out his bow and tells Mumu that he has something up his sleeve too. Drawing the bow, So Moon tells Mumu that this is his specialty. And as Mumu looks unbaffled, So Moon uses the formless firing technique. Not expecting such an attack, the key blast hits Mumu right in his gut. Now paying respect to So Moon's power, he realizes that he wouldn't be able to stand another attack like that since his body isn't indestructible. As So Moon begins shooting several key arrows at once, Mumu has no other choice but to keep dodging them. Just then, Seon Jae shouts and tells the two that the battle is over. Hearing this, So Moon stops midway of firing a shot, whilst Mumu, tired and horrified, simply stands there. Now walking up to Mumu, Seon Jae tells him that this experience must have made him realize how vast the world is so this must be a lesson to continue training. However, instead of accepting defeat, Mumu tells Seon Jae that there was one technique he wasn't able to use and if possible he'd like to try it out. Gotta give our boy Mumu props. Immediately understanding what Mumu means, Seon Jae asks him if he's talking about Dharma's triple blade. After getting confirmation from Mumu that this is indeed what he's referring to, Seon Jae tells him that he wouldn't be able to handle it so he shouldn't try it. Plus, he also tells Mumu that this wasn't so Mu's full strength anyways. Responding to that, So Moon gives the Seon Jae the confirmation that he does in fact have a sword style with three unities. So in layman's terms, Seon Jae is telling Moo Moo that he's a new in comparison to So Moon. Seon Jae then asks So Moon to give a small demonstration of that technique as Moo Moo refuses to admit his loss. So after requesting to borrow Seon Jae's cane, So Moon begins to demonstrate the peerless sword style. Referring to the first step, So Moon tells the two monks that since the first step has a very heavy bloodlust, it's unfit for a temple such as this. So he'll begin with the second step. Now taking a firm stance, So Moon begins to give a small demonstration. Looking at this, Seon Jae is absolutely stunned whilst Moo Moo has a confused look on his face, bowing his head. So Moon gives Seon Jae back his cane. Whilst Seon Jae asks what the name of this technique is, giving a slight smirk. So Moon tells that it is the second step of the peerless triple unity blade, the Loveless Blade. Hearing this name, Seon Jae tells him he's never seen such a magnificent technique in his entire life. Still not grasping the concept, Mumu asks Seon Jae what he's missing since it seemed like a rather soft technique. Replying to that, Seon Jae tells Mumu that perhaps there's still a long way to go for him for not noticing the technique's power because no other martial art could come close to it. Shocked to hear that Mumu asks Seon Jae if the Dharma Triple Blade isn't strong enough either. In response, Seon Jae tells him that the third step of the Dharma Triple Blade might have a chance of blocking it. However, it still wouldn't be able to defeat it. Baffled to his core, Mumu asks Seon Jae if So Moon is stronger than even him. Laughing, Seon Jae tells Mumu that So Moon indeed is stronger than him. Now, as night approaches, Seon Jae asks So Moon if he's working as a warden. However, Upon hearing that he's actually working as a handyman, Seon Jae laughs and tells him that he sure is one powerful handyman. Later when the sun has finally set, So Moon says his goodbye and heads back to Joy in the Thousand Miles Escort Agency. Now under the full moon, we find ourselves elsewhere, following several soldiers carrying a wounded leader. The leader apologizes as he mentions that he put everyone else through a lot of trouble. One of the soldiers, Doc Gojek, mentions that if they hadn't been fooled by the lies and sent the patient guards somewhere else, they'd have still been in good shape. Giving up hope, the leader mentions that he doubts they'll be able to make it. However, his faithful soldiers tell him that Mount Soon is just a little far, and with the Shaolin Temple's protection, there's no way their enemies will be able to mess with them. Just then, the rustling of the trees is heard, and standing before them is Blood Flow Blade Nangak. The soldier carrying the leader frustratedly asks Nangak about his betrayal. However, in response, he simply addresses the leader and tells him that he shall escort the Lord to heaven without any pain. Damn, that's kind of a badass line. Stingling to his henchmen, Nangak calls all of them to surround the group. Looking around as Gojik realizes their hopeless situation, he furiously asks the Blood Slasher Corp if they are betraying him too. Just then, Nangak tells Gojik to hand over his Lord without any struggle. However, Gojik tells him to shut up and tells everyone that anyone who'll get any closer will be sent straight to hell. After sending everyone a threatening message, he asks who amongst the enemy wants to taste his steel. Why are you being sis Gojik? But anyways enough being distracted by Gojik's steel. 
Realizing that the situation is grim, Gojek asks Shun Leong to take the Lord to the Shaolin Temple while he takes on the enemies. And even though Leong feels humiliated by the idea of relying on the Shaolin, he has no option but to go there. Now running towards his death, Gojek asks Leong to run with the Lord since he won't be able to hold them off for too long. After briefly thanking Gojek for his sacrifice, Leong finally heads off deep into the forest. Somewhere else within the forest, as the sun finally comes out over the horizon, we find our boy So Moon resting under the shade of a tree. However, due to sheer hunger, he's unable to sleep all night. Being the lazy bum he is like us, he asks Iron Blood to catch him a rabbit. But Iron Blood turns his head away in rejection and frustration. Being desperate, So Moon has no other option but to apologize to Iron Blood for scolding him. It seems that Iron Blood had hunted down a rabbit in front of the monk, which came as disrespectful. So So Moon scolded him for it. However, now extremely hungry, So Moon pleads with Iron Blood to forgive him and catch some rabbits. But being the stubborn and moody bird he is, Iron Blood pretends as if it's asleep. This is me when I get whooped by my parents. Just as So Moon is sulking about the situation, he suddenly comes across Leon carrying his lord behind his back. Looking at Leon, So Moon wonders why he's carrying a corpse on his back. As Leon walks by So Moon, he alarms him of the danger approaching. Upon being asked what danger, Leon tells So Moon that there will be some men coming here with murderous intentions, so he should be careful and leave at once. But hearing that So Moon lets out a cackle as he asks Leon why they'd attack an innocent bystander. Not stopping in his path, Leon once again warns So Moon that it doesn't matter and that they'll still try to kill him. Just then jumping out of the trees in front, Nangak and the blood slasher corpse surround Leon and tell him that it's time to end this cat and mouse chase, grinding his teeth in frustration. Leon sets down his lord and mentions how close the Shulin is. Taking off his robe and getting into a battle stance, Leon asks Nangak to at least spare the life of So Moon since he's only an innocent bystander with life ahead of him. However, Nangak tells Leon that So Moon's life was jeopardized the moment he laid eyes on him and the blood slasher corpse. Staying persistent, Leon asks Nangak that since when his tribe, the Patient Clan, started killing untrained men, does he have no pride? However, keeping a cold attitude in his subtle voice, Nangak tells Leon that there's nothing related to pride in this scenario. They simply can't leave any witnesses. Worried. So Moon finally gets up and realizes that the two are negotiating over his life. He then walks up to the Lord's body and checks it out. That came out wrong. Meanwhile, Leong at last calls out Nangak to come at him. Accepting the challenge blood flow blade, Nangak dashes toward Leong and their swords clash together. Being pushed back by the sheer force of the clash, Leong can't help but praise blood flow blade Nangak's dancing butterfly blade technique. Blocking Nangak's move, Leong analyzes his sword style to be the Blood Rain sword style, a style that's equally powerful when it comes to offense and defense. Paying respect to Nangak, Leong mentions that something like this is expected of the patient guardian commander. He tells Nangak that his skill lives up to his reputation and in response, Nangak sends his respect back. Looking from the side, so Moon acknowledges the fact that both of them are very good. However, it seems that Leong is even stronger than the monk, Mumu. Getting things from Mangak's perspective, we find him planning to gang up on Leon as long as he's able to land the killing blow. However, before Mangak can put any of his thoughts into action, he finds Leon jumping at him at supersonic speed, whilst his body moves like a whirlwind. Using the blood drain invincibility technique, Leon goes straight for Mangak's head. However, evading the attack, Mangak is able to put in a last minute counter slashing Leon right in the back. Falling near the resting body of his lord, Leon with a saddened expression apologizes to him for not being able to protect him and take him to the Shaolin. Now bowing down to the Lord, Nangak tells him that it's time he also moved on to the other plane of existence. Hearing this, So Moon wonders if Nangak and Leon have the same Lord. Using that logic, he concludes that Nangak is a traitor after all. Big brain moment lad, as Nangak pulls his blade back to swiftly slash it through his Lord's neck. He suddenly feels an insane amount of bloodlust directed at him. Distracted by the bloodlust, Nangak immediately starts looking around to find the source of it whilst also commanding his troops to be on guard since there's no telling what can happen. At last, finally taking notice of So Moon, he realizes that the bloodlust is coming from him. As Nangak looks at So Moon, he sees his bloodthirsty gaze set on him. So Moon with a deadly stare tells Nangak that he's no man if he betrays someone's trust. Guess we're about to see Super Saiyan So Moon again. Furthermore, he tells Nangak that a beast such as him shouldn't be swinging a sword. Now pulling out his bow, 
So Moon uses the formless firing technique and strikes a key arrow right into Nangak's shoulder. Growling in pain, Nangak places his hand on his shoulder and asks the Blood Slasher Cork to kill So Moon at once. Now, as the Cork jumps to attack So Moon, he takes on the challenge and using his wolf step, easily evades all of their attacks. Now at a distance, using the formless firing technique and multi-shot, So Moon fires several key arrows at the Corp, knocking out multiple enemies. Frustrated at this, Nangak watching from afar commands the corpse to get in formation and attack simultaneously. However, iterating his techniques once again, So Moon shoots multiple key arrows with such power that not only elite assassins are left humble, but a giant tree is also uprooted due to the sheer force of the attack. Looking at this, Mangak is left with a horrified expression on his face since he realizes that the patient clan's strongest and most elite corp wasn't able to land a single hit on So Moon. With a bewildered yet terrifying expression, he wonders who So Moon is since he's never heard of someone using a steel bow with no arrows. Well, Nangak now you have. Seeing as how the Lord should die from his wounds anyway. Nangak commands the surviving corp member to retreat. One of the few times when an enemy has actually used his brain and tried not to go up against the MC when his background music spawns in. As all the enemies turn their back and run away. So Moon is finally able to pay attention to the Lord. Whilst the Lord is barely able to express his gratitude and surprise for So Moon's skill due to his wounds, he still thinks to himself about how much of an unbelievable feat it was to defeat the patient clan so easily. Just then, So Moon sitting close to the Lord inquires about his wounds. The Lord now hanging on to dear life by a thread, replies that it's terrible. However, still not giving up, So Moon asks him if there's any way to keep him alive. The Lord barely managing to form his sentence replies that even though he may be able to repair the damage to his key, his wounds are too deep and there's no medicine out here, so he'll probably die. Asking the Lord to wait for some time, So Moon sprints to the Shaolin Temple to get some medicine. Speeding past the guards, So Moon goes straight to Mu Mu and asks him to arrange a meeting with Xian Jie. Confused, Mu Mu asks So Moon why he needs to meet the master. In response, So Moon joining his hands requests him and tells him that it's an urgent matter, sensing So Moon's key. Seon Jae comes to welcome So Moon by himself and asks what the matter is. In response, So Moon tells Seon Jae that there's a wounded person on the mountain foot and he's here to find some medicine in order to save his life. Brushing his beard, Seon Jae tells So Moon that a medicine is nothing compared to a person's life. Having understood the situation's severity, he asks Moo Moo to bring the celestial pellet from the elders. Just as So Moon gets the medicine, he rushes back to Lord and hands him the celestial pellet. Seeing it, the Lord is left stunned as he asks So Moon if it's really the celestial pellet in front of him. Responding to that, So Moon tells him that yes is indeed a very valuable medicine. However, as the Lord gulps down the medicine, he tells So Moon that the word valuable doesn't even begin to describe its worth. Since this medicine can't be found anywhere but in the Shaolin Temple. Now as the sun has fully risen, So Moon introduces himself to the injured lord, who seems to be out of harm's way for the time being. Lying on a stretcher, he asks So Moon if they are still far from Zhengzhou. In response, So Moon tells him that it'll take another day for them to arrive there. Not moving a muscle, nor showing any gratitude, the lord complains about So Moon going slower. This is me when interacting with my mom. Letting out a sigh of frustration, So Moon tells him that the reason he isn't going faster is because the stretcher gets rickety. Due to this, the Lord complains about his wounds hurting. With an expressionless face, the Lord then asks So Moon if that's the case, then he should go quickly and smoothly. Bewildered, So Moon wonders if the old man is thinking of him as his servant. I guess he should have just thrown this Lord at a riverbank or something. But keeping this thought aside, So Moon then asks why he was betrayed by his men. In response, the Lord tells him that even the most loyal dogs will turn savage if they are leashed up for too long. So in the end, it's all his fault. Give him the Lord a nod. So Moon asks him what he'll do now. However, the Lord has no answer to that question and mentions that he'll just have to think about it carefully. On the other hand, So Moon isn't satisfied with that answer and explains to him that he's talking about where will he be going after this. The Lord being unbothered tells So Moon that he doesn't have anywhere to go either, making sure the old man doesn't get too reliant on him. So Moon tells him that he's a handyman for an escort agency, so once they reach Zhengzhou, their paths will be separate. Hearing that the old lord immediately breaks into a smile and says that perhaps he can work there for a while. Surprised to hear that, So Moon immediately shuts down the old man with reality and tells him that no escort agency would ever hire a wounded man. But still in high spirits, the old man tells So Moon that he has a very good grasp of Zhang Yuan's geography. 
so he's sure he'll get hired by the escort agency. Wow, I need this type of confidence in my life. Here I am worrying if you guys will like this video or not. Hearing that So Moon is also amazed to see his confidence as he thinks that the old man is so full of himself to think that the escort agency exists for his own convenience. I'm starting to see a trend here that our boy might have started this journey to meet his wife, but he keeps on running into the old men. Poor guy. Wouldn't want to be So Moon right now. Trying to get the old back man off of his back. So Moon tells him that agencies don't just hire random people. However, the old man tells him that he's not some random person after all then, since he has him. Hearing this, So Moon looks back to ask what the old man means by that. In response, he tells So Moon that he can just tell the agency that he's his distant relative. Frustratedly sighing, So Moon thinks to himself that the old man is totally getting ahead of himself. He has no intention of doing something like that for him. But trying to be respectful, he tells the old man that it isn't possible for him to do such a thing, since he needs to leave for Sichuan at once. So even though he'd like to be of help, there isn't anything that he can do. Now, with somewhat of a sad and yet serious expression, the old man tells So Moon that he must help him no matter what the cost. He further goes on to explain that he had given up on living even back then. Hearing this, So Moon wonders what the old man is reaching. The old man further goes on to explain that he wanted to die like a proud man. However, since he was saved by So Moon, his will has gone. So if the damage to his key isn't restored, then all the training he's done throughout his life will go to waste, and he'll die like a regular old man. Furthermore, he tells So Moon that he's never relied on others for anything, but since So Moon has put him in this condition, it's now an obligation for So Moon to help him get back to normal. Thick face old man. Before So Moon can give any argument against the old man's reasoning, the old man tells him to kill him right here and right now if he can't help him. Frustrated, So Moon looks at the old man and tells him that it's ridiculous. Pouting, the old man tells So Moon that if he can't do that, then he can find the men who came to take his life. So Moon being the Giga Chad asks the old men if he knows where they went. My guy was actually considering that option. However, ignoring that question, the old man tells So Moon that this is the only way to uphold his honor. This guy is more manipulative than freaking Johan Libert. Grinding his teeth, So Moon is left grunting as he finally understands why people say no good deeds go unpunished. However, not worrying too much about it, So Moon concludes that even if he takes him over to the agency, there's no way they will hire an injured man. A day later, So Moon finally reaches the agency's headquarters. After exchanging pleasantries with his boss, So Moon is asked who the old man lying on the floor is. But before So Moon can answer, the old man speaks up and tells the agency that he's Yulji Going, a distant relative of So Moon, so kind of his grandfather. He further goes on to tell the agency employee that he lives near Zhang Zhao and So Moon came to visit him yesterday. After he saw So Moon's face once again, he was reminded of his hometown, so he thought of traveling there. However, he then slipped from a cliff and grievously injured himself. So he thought of traveling with So Moon. Hearing this, the employee worriedly tells Going that So Moon still has work over here. However, keeping a friendly smile on his face, Going tells the employee that it's okay since he can wait. Giving some thought to the request, the employee decides to talk to the boss since something like this is out of his jurisdiction. Now finally alone with Going, So Moon with an angered expression tells him that he's certainly good at lying through his teeth. But unbothered by So Moon's harsh words, he tells him that a little white lie doesn't hurt anyone. Still confident in his theory, So Moon tells Going that the rules for this agency are very strict, so he's doubtful that they'll allow it. Well, famous last words. Because moments later, the employee comes running back, telling So Moon and Going that the permission was granted. Now headed on another journey, as So Moon is sitting bummed out by the old man's presence, all the other employees of the agency seem to be entertained by his jokes. Whilst the agency and its members were being entertained by going elsewhere, Nangbak was meeting up with his superior, Guan Pei. Sitting on the throne, hearing that going had gotten away, the Guan Pei simply laughed in awe of his master. Standing in front, Nangbak gets worried as he fails to understand why Guan Pei is laughing. With a sadistic look on his face, the Guan Pei asks Nangak if he isn't able to understand why he's laughing. Upon getting a confirmation, he tells Nangak that it was expected that his master wouldn't be captured so easily since he's one of the strongest men of this era. With a smirk on his face, the guy gets up from his throne and tells Nangak since he's the guy who raised him, he deserves to at least get a second chance. However, Nangak respectfully counters that argument as he mentions if his master's supporters in the Peishin Palace consolidate, then there might be trouble. Before I reveal who going actually is, try guessing for a second. However, in an unbothered yet authoritative tone, the guy tells Nangak that the palace was formed by his men who admired his master's unparalleled strength. 
However, they are old and feeble now. Plus, the ones that remain anyway want the successors to brandish their power. Once again, Smile and the guy mentions that everything going tried to restrain will flare up. So whether the master is dead or alive, the plan to control all of Zhang Yuan will be continued as it was supposed to. With no one to stop him, the Guan Pei announces throughout Patient Village that Gu Yang Peng is dead. The man who assembled the Dark Path when he was only 30 is dead already. You guys remember now he's the guy that fought with Xiang Jie back when he was young in the previous part. Hearing this, all of Patient breaks out into murmurs of worry as they aren't able to believe what they heard. A false story is then spread throughout the land that Gu Yang Peng and the Blood Slasher Corp were all killed when a masked man attacked them in Mount Sung. Furthermore, the identity of the masked men is still unknown. However, they use the martial arts of the Light Path Clan. As this news spreads throughout the land, the people of Patient get riled up and ready for taking revenge on the Light Path clans. Now addressing the Patient's best soldiers, the guy tells them that the reason they never fought with the Light Path wasn't that they were scared of them, nor that they were too weak, but rather it was because they respected the Lord Gu Yang Pung's wish to avoid harmony and live in harmony. Lying through his teeth, the guy enrages all of Patient's soldiers by riling them up with emotions. As he tells them that since the Light Path scorned Gu Yang's grace and killed him, they now must seek revenge. Ordering every man to avenge Gu Yang Pung, Wan Pei swears to this oath with his own blood and cuts his arm slightly. Following that, all of the soldiers begin their battle cry and the march to Shaolin Temple begins. This is a manual representation of how all the governments of the world work. Now, getting a look at the situation in the Shaolin Temple, we see eight captains of different Light Path sects gathered together. One of the monks sitting there, worriedly asks who's doing this was, because nobody seems to be involved in this incident. However, Wun Gumja, the Wudang sex representative, tells him that the mini details are unimportant now, since they've already declared war. So they first have to figure out how to defend themselves. Sitting next to him, Huak Muan, who happens to be Mount Wa's captain, also agrees with Wun Gumja. The rest sect leaders, Wan Chung, Siak Buzang, and Mak Inyang also agree to that. Then again, the monk mentions how strange the phenomenon of Bu Yang Pung's death is, even though his hometown is in Fusion, he was still killed at Mount Sung, which happens to be thousands of miles away from Fusion. Giving a piece of his thought, Wun Gumdra tells everyone that he's also skeptical of the nature of his death. What person can possibly kill him? Answering his question, the monk says that Gu Yang has done a good job of repressing the Dark Path's evil intentions, However, if he's truly dead as they claim then they will surely try to conquer Zhang Yuan under the guise of revenge. But diverting the focus back to the matter at hand, Wak Muang reminds the Light Path Sex that the Dark Path Sex have already begun gathering in Patient Palace, so they must quickly decide their countermeasure too. After several exchanges between the sect captains, it is decided that they will all form a coalition. Pigeons with letters tied to them are sent to several clans' headquarters from the Shaolin Temple the preceding day. The Namgong clan is the first to receive the letter. As he reads through the letter, says the following. To oppose Patient Palace, the nine sects will do as follows. First, the Righteous Coalition will be formed to fight against the Patient Palace. The coalition is only a temporary arrangement and it will dismantle once the danger had subsided. Somewhere else, another captain receives the letter and reads the rest to his wife telling her the second requirement. The Shaolin will head the coalition and their Grandmaster Yando will fulfill the role of chief. The leaders of each sect and the great warriors of Murin will all be elders. Third, each sect must choose disciples to send to the coalition. Fourth, each sect will obey the coalition's decisions without any objection. Reading through this letter, as one of the sect leaders looks onto the horizon, with agony in his voice, he mentions that perhaps there is going to be a bloodbath in Gangho. Hurriedly, the sect's successor comes into the room and asks his father what's going on. With a serious look on his face, the father asks him to gather around the finest warriors of their sect at once. Worried, the son asks his father if the patient palace has already started moving or not. In explanation, the father tells him that the righteous coalition has already been formed and each sect is required to send some disciples. The coalition plans on stopping the patient palace before they can even move. Despite knowing the dangers, the faithful son tells his father that he's ready to go. However, a daddy's gonna remain a daddy. So he asks his son to protect the clan as the head and since he doesn't have anything better to do, he'll be the one heading into battle. Before the guy and his father can argue regarding who will go, the thudding of a horse's foot is heard in quick succession, followed by a loud intense yell, emergency. Falling down to the ground, the messenger informs that Patient Palace has begun to make its moves. 
it seems that the war is approaching quicker than ever. Worried by the anxiety and the voice of the messenger to clan's successor comes out and asks him where. Now finding ourselves amongst a rocky plain, we see a dry land engulfed by rocky mountains. Amidst this rocky plain, it seems that soldiers from one of the five strongest families are moving at full speed to begin their attack. Riding their horses at full speed, the fleet leader tells their soldiers that they must reach Noun Gun before the patient palace does, even if they have to travel all night without any rest. And once they've joined up with the Zood family, then they'll be heading straight for the Nam Gun family. Elsewhere, we find ourselves sharing the same scene as another sex leader, standing on top of a bridge with clean blue water and pink sakura trees all around. His wife right behind him, calls out to him and shares a piece of her mind with him, telling him that things have been very scary due to the chaotic rumors around the Sky Clan. Laughing freakishly, the guy tells her that there's nothing to worry about. Famous last words, guys, I'm telling you the famous last words. Still not assured. She tells her husband that they don't know when the patient palace will attack. However, the husband tells her that the patient palace wouldn't dare to make all of Zhang Yuan's light path their enemies. No matter how strong they are, the light path still has the power of the nine united sects and the eight of the five strongest families. The lady further goes on to address the horrifying rumor that their Sky Clan will be Patient's first target, since they are the closest in terms of territory. Unworried, the husband tells her that it's certainly possible since the Sky Clan is the greatest clan in the region. However, they don't have to worry because, suddenly, a childish scream is heard. With their senses alerted, the two look in the direction of the scream only to find their child running towards them, calling out to his father. However, before the poor kid can reach the warmth of their parents, he's slashed right through the spine killing the kid immediately and making his lifeless body fall right in front of the mother. Not being able to see her son's dead body, the mother immediately faints. Furious and out for blood, the father bites his lips and asks who the assassin is. However, the assassin first praises the guy for being so cool-headed when his son had just died. Losing his patience, the guy shouts and asks the assassin once more who he is. With a cold expression, the assassin breaks into a smirk and tells him that he's from the Blood Shadow Corp, a part of the Blood Shadow Clan. Picking out a spear, the guy stabs it into the chest of her wife and apologizes to her for troubling her without returning the favor. However, he'll be united with her and his son soon, he tells her as he takes her life. Looking at this, the assassin has no option but to admit how extraordinary of man Sabung Myung is, since he was ordered to face Sabung himself if he fears for the lives of his subordinates. Now collecting their keys, the two get ready for battle and Sabung is the first to strike. However, deflecting the spear with his sword, the assassin easily manages to evade the attack. Staying persistent, Sabung tries to stab the spear into the assassin's neck. However, weaving past that strike, the assassin counters with his own strike, barely getting Sobung on the left shoulder. Not being able to land a single strike, Sobung curses himself, as he thinks of how he'll be able to face off his relatives that have died. Just as he's thinking that the assassin leans in close and almost gets Sobung in the heart. However, showing a resolve of steel, Sobung puts his arm in front, as the sword pierces the arm, it gets stuck within the bone. With no weapon, the assassin is left in harm's way. Taking advantage of the situation, Sobong thrusts his spear toward the assassin's neck. However, he barely moves out of position, leaving him with a mere cut. As the assassin takes a few steps back holding his injury, Sobong pulls out the sword from his arms and hands it over to the assassin, telling him that it's for one warrior to another. Don't warriors have honor? The guy just killed his wife, Perfect place for me to quote this, you have no honor, and you are a slave to it. Let me know what I'm referring to here, guys. Collecting his mana, the assassin takes up his stance and decides to use the wide flash strike. Meanwhile, Sobung also realizes that he can't let the fight drag on since he's sustained several internal injuries. Twirling the spear, Sobung uses the whirling edge, a technique that creates several after images of the weapon, not allowing the enemy to judge where the real spear is coming from. As the spears come close to the assassin at supersonic speed, he jumps upwards and counters with the wide flash strike. With no answers left to the assassin's attack, Sabung is slashed by the sword and falls next to his wife's dead body. Now finally taking a breather, the assassin reminds himself that if he was even a second late, then he would have the one that died. Paying respect to Sabung, he admits defeat as he acknowledges the fact that if Sabung had returned his sword during their duel, he would have never had a fighting chance. R.I.P. Sabung, you are a fair man, perhaps too fair for the world. Now back at the Patient Palace, we see Gokja informing Guanpei that the Patient has taken control of all Light Path sects near Fusion. He then mentions that the Light Path Coalition still most likely doesn't have any information regarding the villages up north. 
Hearing this, Guan Pei questions that wouldn't the beggar's sect have already delivered this news. However, Gokja tells Guan Pei that since they had already anticipated something like this, the beggar's sect was annihilated first. Furthermore, the Peixian soldiers use the homing pigeons of their sect to spread false information and create confusion. This will buy the Peixian time since the Light Path will have to investigate and then confirm the information. Plus, the South has also fallen into the hand of the Peixian Palace. Hearing this, Guan Pei stops the Gokja and tells him that there is still a beast in Hunan. Gokja replies that he understands, but that beast will soon fall as well, since his plan to exterminate the Light Path is going smoothly. With a scary look on his face, Guan Pei asks Gokja if he'll be able to demolish all five of the mighty families at once. In response, he tells Guan Pei that if four of them come to help the beast at once, then it's possible. Hearing that, Guan Pei laughs out of excitement and tells the man that he can't wait to see the outcome. However, he's more interested in seeing how the future plans play out. In a sly manner, Gokja assures Guan Pei that they'll succeed too. As the two ominous men enjoy their momentary victory, elsewhere we find a young guy who very much looks like So Moon's younger brother training in a bamboo forest. Let's call this guy So Moon Jr. for now. Honing his sword skills, the kid practices the first of the infinite blue sky sword arts, the blue sky flying falcon. Then the second, unlimited blue sky, and the third, harmony of the blue sky. Now taking a breather, the kid sits down to rest, and just then, an old man shows up calling out the kid to be Jinna. Well, there goes my chance to call him So Moon Jr. Perhaps I'll use it for So Moon's kid. Jin Ah addresses the old man as his grandfather and bows down in respect. Whereas the grandfather mentions to him that since he's sweating and breathing unevenly, his intrinsic key is disturbed. Hearing this, Jin Ah makes a pained expression. However, his grandfather reminds him that he himself and Jin Ah's father both hadn't even mastered the infinite blue sky arts at his age. So he doesn't need to be so hard on himself. I'm convinced that this is So Moon and his grandfather in an alternate world. Passionate Jin Ah mentions that he wants to master his grandfather's imperial sword arts as soon as possible. Giving an understanding note, the grandfather tells him that he'll teach him the imperial sword's arts even if he doesn't want to learn it. Once he's mastered the infinite blue sky sword arts completely. Scratching his head, Jin Ah complains that he isn't making any significant progress despite training continuously. However, his grandfather explains to him that the pain he's experiencing right now is so that he can reach his zenith. He further goes on to explain that an elite is someone that can continuously practice the same techniques over and over and make an attack their own whilst overcoming any obstacles. So before becoming a master, Jin Ah must first strive to be an elite. However, practically speaking, there aren't many who can be called a master. Since having the skill and will to surpass the standard of an elite is called the zenith, and having the zenith is what makes one capable of becoming a clan elder. Tightening his yukata, Jin Ah asks what the state beyond zenith is, and his grandfather explains that beyond zenith is absolute zenith. It's for those with some extra key and skill in martial arts along with experience. However, the true state beyond zenith is sublimation or divine sublimation. It allows the user to reach a state of divinity, and once that is done, one can begin learning the key guided sword. Key guided sword? Jin Ah asks in confusion. So the grandfather explains to him that it's the art of controlling the blade with your hands. There's another art that allows the user to control the blade as far as he can see, known as the Sight Blade Art. However, the Slight Blade Art is something that is achieved beyond sublimation in the void state. Curious Jinna asks what level his grandfather is at. However, not giving a concrete answer, the grandfather tells him that once he's mastered the first stages of the Infinite Blue Sky Sword, he'll have entered the first stages of sublimation. Still not having understood the power scaling, Jinna asks his grandfather what it means. So the grandfather repeats himself and then further goes on to mention that if Jin Ah were to master the imperial sword arts, then he'll be at the peak of sublimation. Hearing this, Jin Ah finally understands that his grandfather is at the peak of sublimation. The grandfather then tells Jin Ah that many people in the central district have reached the same stage as he has. However, among those people, the select few that are masters of the void stage are Gu Yang Pong and Sun Jae. Fascinated, Jin Ah asks if there are stages higher than the void stage. In response, the grandfather tells that it is called the life and death state, and it is said that it allows you to hurt people with mere thoughts. However, no one has been able to reach it. Bro, at that point, are you even human? Fortunately, according to the grandfather's knowledge, no one has reached that stage. Now looking at his grandson with hope, he suggests him to try to reach for the life and death state, even though it may seem unreachable. Bowing down, 
Jin Ah nods his head and tells his grandfather that he understands and will try to achieve that state. Now at the Nam Gung household, we find the senior family members sitting together in unison for discussion regarding the patient palace situation. One of the guys mentions that they've been extremely quiet, which is very odd. Pitching and the rest of the members in the meeting agree as they understand the Pachian aren't scared of the light path. One of the guys is asked for his opinion on the matter. He mentions that there's definitely going to be some movement. However, either their eyes have been blinded or their ears have been blocked, so they can't take notice of Pachian Palace's moves. I like this guy. He's smart. He further goes on to mention that it wouldn't be weird if they received news of the Patient Palace attacking somewhere right now. However, until they can be sure of the situation, they have to fortify their defenses as if the enemy is right next to them. The best thing to do is to gather all the Light Path clans in the Hunan province, so even if the enemy suddenly invaded them, they'd be prepared. Honestly, what a Chad. He's seen through all of Patient Palace's moves. Take that tattooed man. One of the members then asked about the situation regarding the four mightiest families, and he's informed that the North's Huangbo family and the Habak family have united with the Zhu family and have crossed the Yangtze River. Whilst the Sichuan family elder, Dang Qian Ho, is making his way here directly along with a troop of elite soldiers. It's our boy So Moon's father in law. Then, one of the Namgung family members asks about the nine great factions. However, there isn't much information on them. One of the brothers in his stupid confidence tells everyone that everything will be fine, so there's no need to worry. Guys, what do we say in these situations? Well, famous last words. However, the Chad guy once again brings everyone to their senses as he tells them that the strength of the factions will be needed when going up against the Patient Palace. He further goes on to mention that they have to assume the possibility that all of the Dark Path has already gathered in the Patient Palace. So if the Patient Palace moves then the Dark Path moves too. The eldest Namgung brother asks him then, what his suggestion to handle the situation will be. Looking down with shame, the guy mentions that in all honesty, he believes that it would be best if the Namgung family took cover in the north. Hearing this, all the brothers scold him for such a suggestion, as it's something dishonorable that would shame the Namgung family. The oldest brother in response tells everyone that they simply have to wait until masters from the righteous coalitions arrive to meet them all. Just then, a guy comes running into the palace hall and tells everyone, that it's an emergency, upon being asked what it is. He answers that the Patient Palace have provoked them since they've made all the clans near Fusion surrender and are charging toward the Hunan province. Hearing this, all the brothers are shocked as they can't believe what they've just heard. To solidify this claim, a surviving member from the Beggar's sect is also brought in, who tells everyone the truth regarding the homing pigeons. The Chad guy, at first calms everyone down and tells them that since they have a faster network than the Beggar's sect and the farthest in Hunan, They'll probably be attacked last. Just then the grandfather, along with Jin Ah, enters the palace and asks his kid if they come up with a solution. The Chad guy goes on to explain that they'll have to hold their ground for at least five days or else they'll lose. In the unfortunate situation that the patient palace heads straight for them, the Nam Gung family collapse before reinforcements can even arrive. Silently murmuring, he also mentions that all of the family can also run to the north just in case. However, the grandfather angrily refuses as he vows to protect his family's honor till the end. There we go talking about honor again. Now back at the Shaolin Temple, we find the coalition leaders once again meeting with each other and discussing their current obstacles and the measures to tackle them. At first, the meeting leaders have a hard time believing that the South has fallen since no news of it has been heard up until recently. However, suddenly in the span of one night, homing pigeons came informing of the South's defeat. Even though it was a dirty tactic, God admit it was a boss move from Patient Palace. Plus, everything is fair in love and war. After connecting the gods, one of the commanders tells everyone that they were probably deceived since the beggar's sect must have fallen already. Hearing this, the other commanders can't believe it. However, after finding that Hunan is still standing, the commanders fall into a dilemma regarding whether to help the Namgung family or not. While some are in favor, due to the Namgung family's symbolic and strategic position in the Light Path world, some commanders don't want to waste any more time since sending warriors from there may take more than half a month. Confused, the monk after taking the opinions of all the commanders at last decided that disciples will be sent first to the Nam Gung family's aid. And whilst the disciples buy them some time, proper reinforcements will be sent. Now back at the escort agency, Gu Biang Pung or Going as we know him is taking a bath. He eavesdrops on a conversation between two employees that mention that the agency no longer travels to the south. Ever since Du Yang Poon's death, Gangho has been an uneasy place. And whilst there's no open threat to travelers, 
there can be no confirmation of a person's safety in the South either. Hearing this conversation right by the side of the two handymen, so Moon begins pulling out his hair out of frustration. He wonders why he's been working so hard at the agency if he can't travel to Sichuan in the South. He asks his superiors about when he'll reach Sichuan. Seeing as how much of a bad time So Moon has had ever since he left his grandfather, I'm beginning to wonder if he's even the main character at this point. In response, one of the handymen tells him that after a few months of travel experience, he should be good enough to travel there alone. The journey may seem hard, but it isn't impossible now. Hearing this, So Moon understands that he can't keep waiting anymore since he has the money and the experience. He should head out. As So Moon is bidding farewell to the agency, his boss hands him some money to cover the travel expenses and informs him of the best route to take to Sichuan. After saying his farewell, So Moon finally heads out. However, it seems that Gu Yang Pung also follows right behind him. Traumatized by his last experience, So Moon asks him what he's doing and he answers that he'll be following him. Furious, So Moon tells him that since his body isn't fully healed, he won't be able to make the journey. Plus, since he can walk now, the two of them should go their separate ways. Saying this, So Moon runs as if he's going out to buy some milk. However, Gu Yang also runs behind him and tells him that since they are family, they have to stick together. Now in the open fields, once more Gu Yang holds his stomach and asks So Mu to go slow since walking fast will reopen his wounds. However, So Mu tells Gu Yang that he shouldn't follow and annoy him then. Out of breath, Gu Yang mentions to So Moon that it would be nice if he takes him on a stretcher again. With no other option, So Moon is once left dragging Gu Yang through the journey. I swear Gu Yang is the visual representation of I was only lending you a hand but you just had to grab the whole arm. Whilst also listening to his complaints, looking up to the sky, So Moon wonders what sin he did that he deserved such a punishment for. Now as So Moon is traveling through the market, the old man complains about being hungry and asks him to stop and grab a bite with him since the journey is going to be long. However, So Moon ignores this ordeal and keeps on going. Still speaking, Gu Yang Poon tells him that he shouldn't be skipping on meals since it isn't good for his health. However, So Moon denies having any money. But Gu Yang immediately calls So Moon out for that as he already saw him receiving the money from the agency. Acting like a proper gentleman, So Moon blushes slightly and tells Gu Yang that he's saving the money so that he can buy a potential gift for a bride. What a gentleman So Moon is, take notes guys, this is how you riz up a girl. Buy something for their parents too, and the daughter is practically yours. Dating advice with Manga Otaku 101. However, Gu Yang doesn't show any sign of happiness upon hearing that and begins yelling in the market. Addressing So Moon as his nephew, he shouts that he's so hungry that the stomach of his skin has stuck to his back. This man, Gu Yang, got no shame or self-respect. Hearing this, the people around So Moon and Gu Yang begin giving him the bombastic side-eye. Overacting, Gu Yang puts his hands up in the sky and asks So Moon to feed him some dumplings at least before he dies. Having no other option, So Moon once again has to follow Gu Yang's orders. Now, at a restaurant, as Gu Yang is devouring the dumplings, he overhears a conversation in which the people mention that there have been rumors that the Light Path clans are all gathering at the Nam Gung family's place. It seems that Gango is about to be sucked into a war once more. Now as the two head out on the journey once more, as So Moon turns to head in the direction of the Sichuan province, Gu Yang stops So Moon and tells him that he's going the wrong direction. However, So Moon tells him that the board simply says that Sichuan is to the left. Worried, Gu Yang asks So Moon if he didn't hear their fight will be taking place soon in Sichuan. However, So Moon turning his head away tells the old man that he doesn't care about the fight, since it's got nothing to do with him. Furious, Yu Yang yells at him and asks why doesn't something so big concern him. In response, So Moon tells him that his only goal to go there is to find a wife. Looking at So Moon with a serious expression, Du Yang asks him what he'll do if his wife is fighting in that battle too. Hearing that So Moon asks what's that supposed to mean and Gu Yang begins educating So Moon on the matters of Gang Ho. He tells So Moon that the Nam Gung family is situated in the Hunan province and is one of the five mightiest families. So when the Dark Path Patian Palace attacks them, without a doubt the Sichuan family and the others will send the reinforcements. So could it be that So Moon's prospective bride is a part of those reinforcements? Hearing that So Moon tries to brush this idea away. However, guilt tripping So Moon, Hu Yang asks him if he's okay with a person who might be his bride getting hurt or even worse killed. If that happens, is he simply going to turn a blind eye? Confused, So Moon asks Hu Yang then what he should do. In response, Hu Yang advises So Moon to head to the Shaolin Temple first, still not getting this method of reaching Sichuan. 
So Moon asks why he should reach the Shaolin Temple first. Once again with a serious look on his face, Wu Yang looks at So Moon and tells him to listen closely. He then goes on to say that the Patian Palace, the head of the Dark Path, is trying to take over all of Zhang Yuan. And without a doubt, the Light Path will respond back. Most likely the coalition is already formed and the coalition is debating whether to send reinforcements to the Nam Gung family or not. Just as Du Yang mentions to So Moon that if he were to join the reinforcement, So Moon stops him and asks why he'd do that. In response, Du Yang tells him that he'll be able to meet his bride this way. Plus, traveling with the reinforcements will reduce the risk of danger for him as well. Finally, asking an actually good question. So Moon questions what he'll do if his wife isn't there. However, being the witty old man Gu Yang is, he tells him that if he were to take a boat to the south and a horse to the north to reach Sichuan, he'd reach quicker from the south since there's a waterway. So even if his wife isn't there, he'll still be able to complete the journey back quickly. Plus, it's 100% expected that So Moon will be meeting the members of the Sichuan Dang family there, so he can at least introduce himself. Pouting, So Moon questions why they'd simply let him join the reinforcements. Smirking, like a true dark path lord, Gu Yang asks So Moon doesn't he have a strong background, since he was able to give him the celestial pellet so casually it must mean that he's acquainted with someone of high status in the Shaolin Temple. So using his recommendations, he'll easily be able to get in the Light Path army. For someone so lazy, Gu Yang sure can use his brain when it's time to. Hearing all of this, even So Moon is left sweating as he accepts that for an old geezer. Gu Yang's senses are quite amazing. Now heading to the Shaolin. So Moon greets the monk at the door and informs them that he has to meet the master. Whereas, the old geezer introduces himself as a relative of So Moon. As the two are taken to the Grandmaster Sionje, he exchanges pleasantries with So Moon. Standing next to So Moon, Hu Yang thinks of how much time has passed and how painful it was to be defeated just by a stick. However, keeping the past in the past, he bows down and tells Sionje that it's been a while since they last met. Hearing the tone of his voice and his mannerism, Xiong Jie immediately takes Gu Yang to the side and the two begin discussing the current rumors and the situations regarding the Dark Path. Gu Yang tells Xiong Jie that all those years ago, he had mentioned that the next time he visited the Shaolin Temple, he'll have mastered Dharma's Triple Blade. Hearing this, Xiong Jie curiously asks if that's the case. However, holding his battered body, Gu Yang tells him that he isn't in great shape, but his disciple despite his young age has already surpassed him. Damn. I wonder if Wan Pei will finally be the one to give So Moon a challenge. Furthermore, his ability to command his forces is multiple levels ahead of Gu Yang. Realizing the threat that's coming the Light Path's way, Gu Yang tells Xion Jie that the Light Path will lose, as they won't be able to stand against Guan Pei. Now as the sun is setting standing on the Sholin Temple grounds along with the reinforcements, the leader of the coalition announces that due to the shortage of time, they won't be sending any more reinforcement and this advanced party will be the last stand of the Nam Gung family. The advanced party will include the King of Arahat, the 18 Arahat, the Mount Wa sect along with the leader Guak Mu Ung and his 26 disciples. From the beggar's sect, the elder Gu Yuk and 13 disciples will be fighting. And finally, the North will be sending five martial experts, inclusive of So Moon and Gu Yang. So in total, the party will have 67 people and will join up with the muting forces on the path to the Nam Gung family palace. Now as the advanced party is marching through the forest, the party leaders estimate that it would take them three days to reach Nam Gung without rest. However, if they were to do that, they'd be too tired to fight against the dark path. So it's best if rest is taken occasionally on this journey. One of the warriors, Ha Hu, asks if it would be too late, and the leader tells him that it's better to be well rested than not being able to fight at all. Plus, it seems that reinforcements from the four mighty families have already arrived, so that should buy them some time. Within the advanced party, a beautiful woman pouts as she looks at So Moon and Gu Yang. The beautiful woman happens to be the daughter of Wak Muang, Wak Yang. Giving So Moon a stare, she asks her brother, Wak Jian Myung, why people like him and Gu Yang are in the advanced party. Being a chill dude, Myung simply says who knows and goes on with the journey. However, a simp from the sides, Hajiga begins to take Wak Yang's side. Still having her gaze locked on So Moon, she tells Jigjuk that the old man is glowing with the color of disease, plus So Moon isn't even from the clan. Now looking away, she once again tells her brother So Moon isn't even a warrior, but a handyman. Such things will ruin the quality of the advance party. Hearing all of this conversation, So Moon is left embarrassed and kind of flustered too. Oh, I see so you're in that type of girls, so Moon. Well, no judgment here because I'm into the same type of girls too. 
Looking at her from afar, So Moon acknowledges that Guac Yong is definitely blessed when it comes to the looks department. However, her mouth seems to be just as cursed. Calming himself, So Moon at last is able to get a hold of his emotions, fuming with anger and thinking to himself. So Moon tells Guac Yong that she's lucky that he's evaded murder or else she'd be dead. For some reason, I can sense the passion between these two. Traveling at full speed, the advanced party is able to meet up with the muting reinforcements before nightfall. After Mount Wa's Wak Muam and the muting reinforcements leader Yoon Gyung exchange pleasantries, the respective group immediately set out on the journey to Nam Gung. As night falls, So Moon sits with his brothers in arms, Dan Gyun, the platoon leader of the beggars sect, and Yun Jo Mun of the Mount Wa faction feast on the meals together. Dan Gaida mentions how good the food is, and Yun Jo Min also mentions how grateful he is to So Moon for hunting down the rabbits, since they have to survive on just dry fruits otherwise. Taking notice of So Moon's effort, even Guac Mu Wang thanks So Moon and tells him that if he could do this for every meal, then the advanced party's stamina would remain great. Giving a humble response, So Moon says that even though his skill is lacking when it comes to the bow, he'll still try his best. Sitting a little far, Guac Yang once again pouts and complains about the fact that even though they are going to battle, the boys are more obsessed with food. Being the simp he is, Hajuk agrees to every word she says. Sitting around So Moon, Wak Jiang Myung suddenly yells that since the Sam Wang is here, they should drink. The guy sitting next to him tells So Moon that the Sam Wang means three maniacs. The first brother, Yun Jo Mun, is a maniac for women. If he stops by a brothel, all the women there stop their business and gather around him. Yun Jo Mun is known for mastering the path of pleasure at the age of 27. I need to learn this path too, bro. Then the second brother is Jiang Myung, who happens to be crazy about swords. Once not only did he challenge the Shaolin and the great Buddhist priest to a fight, but was also beaten to the brink of death by his father. The third brother is Dan Gyun, a maniac for alcohol. In the beggar's sect, there's a saying that Dan Gyun would sell the sect to buy alcohol if he had to, since he's proficient in using the drunken arts. It's a sight to behold when he drinks and fights. The three of these met at a brothel in Beijing and became friends with each other. Leading in close to So Moon, Yoon Jo Mun tells him that women are the pleasures and joy of living life, and if he'd like to learn the path of pleasure, then the opportunity is there. Why do I hear the Andrew Tate theme music? However, Jiu Myung stops Jo Mun since he doesn't want another maniac to be created. I was kinda hoping to see the path of pleasure and activities, stad life. Anyhow, Jo Mun mentions that So Moon was talking about finding a bride in Sichuan. He goes on to tell So Moon that if he wants to find the perfect woman, then he has several of them. However, So Moon tells Jo Mun that from where he belongs that there's a saying that a wife must follow her husband no matter what, so how could he leave such a wife for another woman in the first? Hearing this conversation, Wak Yang mentions that despite the way So Moon looks, he at least talks politely. However, focusing on the how I look part, So Moon gets offended as he should. Wak Yang then proceeds to stop Jo Mun from talking about women as she states that even a hillbilly like So Moon knows how to respect women. Damn, this is like Conor McGregor and Dustin's fight. Hearing Hillbilly. So Moon decides that he's finally had enough and speaking loudly himself mentions that there's another saying in his village that a misbehaving calf will grow its horns on its butt. He further goes on to explain the saying refers to people who act high and mighty without any manners. Understanding that So Moon was referring to her, Wak Yang tells him that she feels sorry for whoever his wife is going to be. Smirking So Moon tells her that he won't ask her to be his bride so she doesn't need to worry. Losing patience, Wak Yang asks him who is asking to be the wife of the barbarian. To further salt the wound, So Moon tells her that he wouldn't accept a girl like her even if she came on a wagon. Heck, he'd bite his tongue off and die if that were to happen. Being too butt hurt, at last Wak Yang draws her sword to So Moon's neck and threatens to kill him. Taking notice of the commotion, Jia Myung scolds Wak Yang and tells her to sheathe her sword at once. Feeling embarrassed, Wak Yang runs away as she cries. So Moon, on the other hand, also apologizes for saying something he shouldn't have. However, the older brother tells him that he doesn't need to apologize since it was Guac Yang's fault from the start. Once alone, So Moon thinks to himself that he won't let things go easy like this if Guac Yang is rude to him again. He'll stomp her over and over so that she can't say things like that anymore. Thinking about this, So Moon begins laughing. Damn, our boy is heartless, and just because of that. He'll end up getting the girl since nice guys finish last and you know that, oh sorry I'm getting distracted recalling the song. The next morning as the advance party is traveling through the ship, So Moon asks how long it will take to reach the Nam Gung family. In response, he's told that it will take three days by ship and a day on horseback. 
Just then, iron blood flying over So Moon begins chirping. At first, So Moon asks him to sit on his shoulder if he's bored. However, taking notice of his strange behavior, he asks the ship to be stopped since he senses something must have happened in the area. All passengers on the boat begin looking for an enemy or an accident. Just then, Guak Yang screams as she notices several dead bodies floating in the river. Taking a closer look at the dead bodies, Guak Muang realizes that they're all bodies of the Light Path soldiers. Taking this into account, he confidently concludes that there's been a battle upstream of the Sangria River. So the Nambung family may already be fighting against the Patient Palace or even worse it might have fallen. Guak Muang calms everyone down and tells them that they can't be hasty about this until they've reached Namgun themselves. Caressing Iron Blood, So Mu tells him to look out for anything weird in their path, and if there happens to be anything then immediately alert him. Standing next to So Moon, Jo Mun compliments Iron Blood for being an intelligent animal that understands their language and warns them about danger. In a proud tone, So Mu tells Jo Mun that ever since Iron Blood was a baby in the mountains, he's been with him. So at this point, he's both a friend and a family. I think I want Iron Blood too. Now at the Heijang headquarters, the Dark Path Alliance sits together to discuss the first battle of the war. Gui Gakja, the Gakja sits there along with Gung Se Hyun, Patient Palace's superior elder, Hyun Won Gang, Patient Palace's guardian, two ghastly faced brothers, and Mok Se Hyuk. Before the meeting can begin, a messenger tells Wei Gakja that 30 men from the black faced sword Li Jui, along with 30 men, have been defeated. Hearing this, both Gakja and Se Hyun are amazed, since they weren't expecting the light path to ambush them. Not phased too much by the loss. Se Yuan mentions that the Light Path must be cornered to use such tactics. However, being a strategist, Gokja mentions that they must not lose any more forces since the forces might lose their morale and end up losing. After a few exchanges between the different elders, Gokja agrees that they should attack as soon as possible and suggests that they do it tonight at midnight. However, the smaller groups that are traveling must be taken care of first. In response, Hyun Won Gang tells that he'll take care of those groups. When asked how he plans on doing that, he and one gang responds that he'll use their ambush tactics to lure them into a trap and then crush them. Whereas fighting with the Nam Gung family head-on will be a problem since there is a camp set up by the Zhu family. So Yun asks Gokja what they should do about it. At first, Gokja mentions that solving this problem will take some time. However, breaking into an ominous grin, he then tells Se Yun that he has a secret plan to take care of the Zhu family at once. It seems a big clash is coming our way. Stay tuned to see So Moon whoop some more Dark Path soldiers. Taking out a box of explosives, Gukja reveals it to be his secret plan. Seeing such a horrifying sight, Gung Se Yum is left shocked to his core and asks Gukja how he was able to acquire something like this. Staying calm and collected, he answers that when he learned about the camps of the mighty families near the Nam Gung family, he desperately acquired them. Still stuck in his thoughts, So Yun mentions that according to federal law aren't explosives something that only the military can use. In response, Gukja tells him that it may be forbidden by law, but a small amount wouldn't matter much. I like Gukja as an antagonist. My man can do anything to assure his victory. With a shrewd smile on his face, Gukja tells Se Yun that the officials have already taken the necessary measures. Going into deep thought for a moment, Se Yun mentions to Gukja that the explosives won't be enough since the camp is so big. However, Gukja responds that if one part of the camp is down and out for the count, the rest won't be able to adapt. Furthermore, Gokja tells Se Yuan that even after all of this, he still can't guarantee victory but only higher odds of conquest. As some time passes by, Nangak is called in and told about the plan. With a serious expression, Nangak tells Se Yuan that the Namgung family won't go down easy since their reputation isn't there for nothing. So the Patient Palace and the Dark Path are bound to take a huge hit to their numbers by participating in this battle. And whilst it is the sour truth, Se Yun has no other option but to admit the Nam Gung family's status as a noble family with some of the most powerful martial artists in the world. Just then, Mok Se Hyuk intervenes and tells everyone in the meeting that he'll be the one to lead the army from the front lines. Whilst the Ghastly brothers agree on controlling the left, Nam Gak decides to lead from the right. But objecting to this strategy, Gokja raises his hand and tells everyone that the Blood Slasher Corp as the Patient Palace's main force will be the one leading the attack. So there's no need for anyone to participate in the beginning. Before the meeting can continue any further, just then, Gokja receives a message from the North from a bloodless agent. Upon reading it, Gokja is shocked and frightened at the same time, since the letter contains information regarding the advanced party having left the Yangtze River. 
brushing his beard with his hands, Sae so Yuan mentions that it wouldn't matter much, however, it could still be annoying to deal with in the battle. In response to that, Gukja suggests the Dark Path leaders gathered there to wait and ambush the advance party on their way to the Namgong family. Hearing that, Sae Yuan mentions how much of a good idea it is. Sae Yuan, once again with a tense look on his face, tells Mok Sae Hyuk that the advance party will be formidable, so is he confident that he'll be able to take them on. In response with a determined expression, Mok Sae Hyuk tells Sae Yuan that he isn't confident, rather he's certain. I think I'd like some lessons in self-belief from Mok Sae Hyuk, because the guy seems to have a ton of it. As Mok Sae Hyuk is leaving, Gaksha asks him to take the Blood Bow group along with him. The Blood Bow group is a collection of several archers of the Dark Path. They dress themselves in red armor and use powerful five-feet bows and steel arrows. With ten archers in each group, they can freely use rapid fire or burst fire, making them an invincible long-distance battalion. Oh, archer versus archer. So Moon versus the Bull Blood group is about to be fire. Bowing to the Dark Path leaders in the meeting, Mok Se Hyuk heads out to slaughter the advance party. Now elsewhere, as the sun is setting, one of Dark Path's platoon leaders poisonous ghost hand, Mamu Beck, along with his group is running full speed to reach the military headquarters before nightfall. Bro, what are you poor? Why are you running on foot when you can just use horses? As the group is hurrying back, suddenly a large shriek of pain is heard. As Maimu Beck looks back in the direction of the scream, he finds some of his men slaughtered, whilst another man is killed when something stabs right into his neck. Realizing that it's an enemy attack, Mu Beck yells for his group to remain calm and form a circle. Whilst Mu Beck looks around to locate the position of the enemy troops, his subordinate quickly checks on the corpse and informs Mu Beck that the guy was killed by an unknown weapon covered in poison. Furious, Mu Beck shouts out to his enemy to stop sneak attacks like cowards and rather show themselves. Just then, once again, several weapons come flying at Mubek, but unlike his subordinates, he's able to deflect all of the weapons using merely his sword. Now riled up to the point that his veins are about to pop out of his forehead, he once again asks his enemy to stop with these cheap tricks and come out, so they can fight fair and square. Finally, showing themselves from amongst the forest trees, Jinnah, as the soldier on the front line, comes out with a horrifying look on his face and asks Mubek, since when did people of the Dark Path start looking for fair and square? Even a stray dog would laugh after hearing that. Jin Ah looks like he's about to be on demon time. As the two commanders of their respective groups come face to face, Mu Bek asks Jin Ah who he is. In response, he introduces himself as Nam Gung Jin, the person to make sure that this place is Mu Bek's grave. He then further goes to tell Mu Bek, whilst pointing his sword at him, that he shouldn't worry as he'll make sure he isn't lonely when he buries all of his platoon together. Well, don't know about the physical battle, but seems Jinna has already won in Badassery. Mu Beck in response tells Jin to say all of these things again when his face is on the ground. Riling up his army, Mu Beck tells them that Light Path are simply wolves in sheep's clothing and today they must die fighting. As the two groups are rushed with adrenaline, they dash at each other and the groups finally begin their skirmish. Collecting his key, Huang Bo Jang from the Huang Bo family is the first to inflict damage on Mu Beck's troops. Using his Thunderbolt palm arts, he smashes the key into the enemy, sending them all flying away. This isn't Thunderbolt palm arts, this is straight up Goku's specialty. Witnessing the magnificently powerful art in person, even Mu Beck accepts that it is extremely frightening. Holding off the opposing forces of the Light Path, Mu Beck asks his soldiers to create an escape path to the left. Following his command as the Dark Path soldiers run to their left, they are stopped by Huang Bo Yang a beautiful woman and the younger sister of Huan Bojan. Stopping the enemies in their tracks, she tells them that they are all just rats trapped inside of a jar. Following this dialogue, she initiates her attack, easily cutting through all of the Dark Path soldiers standing in her way. Aiding the Huang family, the two brothers from the Hibai Peng clan also arrive at the battlefield and using their respective techniques, take down a large number of the Dark Path soldiers, seeing the lifeless body of his soldiers crumble to the ground. Mu Beck finally realizes that he and his troops are the underdogs in this battle, and it seems that they all will truly be buried here. Several moments later in the battle, only Mu Beck is left standing. Slowly walking towards him like the badass he is, Jenna tells him that his subordinates have already passed on and are waiting for Mu Beck to join them, so they should finish this. Enraged at his desperate situation, Mu Beck yells and dashes at Jin Ah while utilizing the technique Human Hellblade. However, Jin Ah sees right through it as he conveniently dodges the first attack whilst reading it to be a false attack. Similarly, the second strike is also a false luring strike. 
Thinking Jinnah has fallen for his traps, Mubek in hopes of victory smirks and tells him that he's done. However, using the infinite heaven's sword arts, Jinnah jumps right behind Mubek and in one clean strike sends him to join his subordinates. The long-haired brother from the Peng clan tells everyone that it was a job well done since they finish early. Adding to the comment, Jin Ah mentions that it was all due to the cooperation of others. However, giving respect where respect is due, Huang Bo Yang mentions that it was only easy because the enemy was tired else they were quite formidable opponents. Getting all flustered, the long-haired brother immediately agrees with Huang Bo Yang. Taking notice of this, the younger brother mentions that if it's Huang Bo Yang, then of course his elder brother isn't even going to move. He further goes on to mention that seeing as how flustered his brother is, could it be that he has a crush on Huang Bo Yang? Hearing this, Huang Bo Yang immediately says, Ara Ara o Kawai Kodo. However, deflecting the question like Shiro Gain, the elder brother from the Hibai Peng clan denies it. Hearing this blatant lie, the young brother has a yeah, I totally believe you expression. Classic sibling relationship like I would kill for you, I will also kill you. Hearing this conversation, the rest of the soldiers laugh as they mention how could they blame pure love. Just then, an intimidating voice is heard that says, Laugh all you want. It will be the last time you laugh in this lifetime. Being alerted by the voice, the warriors start searching its source. Just then, walking out of the shadows, Hyun Won Gang shows up along with his troops. With a scary look on his face, he tells the mighty family's allegiance that he's been scaring for them since the middle of the night and boy. Oh boy, finding them like this makes it totally worth it. Recognizing the intimidating aura, Wan Bo Yang asks the guy in front of her if he's really he on one gang. Hearing this, all the other members of the mighty families are alerted, smirking. After getting the recognition, he mentions that he wasn't expecting that. Thinking to herself, Huan Bo Yang reminds herself that Hyun Won Gang is the person that grew up in the Dark Paths Blade Restoration Group and was exiled from Gang Ho at the age of 20. He is a warrior that only answered to Gu Yang Pung. Furthermore, his Yan Luo Wang sword arts even awed Gu Yang Pung himself. Now getting a look into Jin An's thoughts, we find him reminding himself that even though he and Wan Gang belongs to the Dark Path, his magnanimous and loyal nature earned him the status of a true warrior even in the Light Path. Plus, his overflowing spirit is also suffocating. Showing mercy, he and Wan Gang tells the Mighty Family's allegiance to surrender since he doesn't want to kill or hurt such young fellows. So if they do surrender, then he promises to personally take the responsibility of their lives. However, clenching his sword, Jiona tells him that even if they might die, they won't surrender. Sighing, Hyun Won Gang then tells them that he can't do anything if they choose death. Now preparing for battle, Hyun Won Gang asks who will be taking him on first because personally, he doesn't care if all of them attack simultaneously too. I don't know why, but this guy is giving me Madara Uchiha vibes, mentally readying himself for battle. Jinna tells himself that he too is the descendant of the great Myung Mun faction, so he'll surely be able to take on Hyun Won Gang. Bowing in respect, he tells Hyun Won Gang that he'll be the first to battle him as the eldest son of the Nam Gun family. Hearing this, Hyun Won Gang realizes that Jin Ah is the grandson of Jiam Song. Giving Jiam Song his due respect as his secret admirer, Hyun Won Gang wishes to see the extent of Jin Ah's skill. Now, as the two get into their battle stance, Jinnah reminds himself that he can't make even the smallest of mistakes against one of the greatest warriors of his times. Followed by this thought, Jin Ah initiates his first attack, the Infinite Heaven Sword Arts. First strike, Heavenly Leaping Kite. Jumping into the sky, Jin Ah comes crashing down at blistering speed to impale Hyun Won Gang. However, Hyun Won Gang easily dodges it. Without giving his opponent any chance to settle, Jin Ah then uses the second strike of the Infinite Heaven Sword Art heavenly limitless strike, and once again tries to jump at Heeman Won Gang. However, this time instead of evading his attack, Heeman Won Gang replies with his own counter that sends Jin Ah flying away. Being pushed back so easily, Jin Ah wonders if it is impossible to be Heeman Won Gang. But pushing these negative thoughts aside, Jin Ah goes for his trump card despite not having mastered it fully. Taking his stance, Jin Ah yells out the infinite heaven sword art's third strike. Heavenly Harmony. A whirlwind of key goes straight at Hyun Won Gang. However, in response, he simply gives a Santa laugh and tells Jin Ah that his technique is very good. Following this praise and encouraging words for the youngster, he brings down his sword staff and cuts through the key whirlwind with his own overwhelming key that heavily injures Jin Ah. Despite the sheer force of the attack being enough to uproot trees, Jin Ah is somehow able to withstand it. However, 
By the end of it, his body is weakened. As Jinnah costs blood, he realizes that Heon Won Gang does live up to his reputation. Watching from the side, all of the other Allegiance members are worried about Jinnah's condition. Still untouched, Heon Won Gang stands tall and tells Jinnah that the skill he just performed was Yan Lu Wang's presence. Having barely any strength to say anything, Jinnah thanks Heon Won Gang for showing him such a powerful move. In response, Hyun Won Gang also praises Jin Ah's spectacular sword play but also reminds him that he fell short in this duel because he couldn't keep up with his endurance and skill. As Jin Ah is about to fall, Wang Bo Jang catches him from behind and tells him that they've met too powerful of a foe. However, they can't die like this. So he suggests to everyone to escape whilst he takes on Hyun Won Gang himself. Unsheathing her sword, Huan Bo Yang tells her brother that she'll stay here too. However, Bojang tells her not to move, since it may be difficult for him to win, but that doesn't mean he's going to lose easily. After telling Wan Ho to take care of his little brother, Wan Bojang heads into battle and tells Hyun Won Gang that he'll be fighting him in Nam Gung Jin's place. In response, Hyun Won Gang tells him that he doesn't plan on going as easy on him as he did with Jin Ah, still unintimidated by these words. Wan Bojang tells Hyun Won Gang that he'll start first, taking his stance, Bo Jang begins to gather his key into his palm and strike with the Thousand Palms. Just as he's about to attack, he asks the other Allegiance member to hurry and run away. Following his commands, divided into groups of two of the Allegiance breaks off and heads into different parts of the forest. To stop them from fleeing, Hyun Won Gang's troops are sent behind them. With a tense look on his face, Hyun Won Gang asked Bo Jang if this was the reason that he was being sluggish. In response, Bojang tells him that they weren't confident they could defeat him so they had no other choice but to retreat. Understanding their tactics, Hyun Won Gang tells them that he gets it. However, will all of them really be able to escape? Confident in his fellows, Bojang tells Hyun Won Gang that he leaves it up to them totally. Hearing this, Hyun Won Gang tells Bojang that he understands what he means and asks him to do what he must. Taking heed to his elder's command, Bojang begins to gather his key in his hands. As he does this, he thinks to himself that he has no confidence that he'll be able to beat he and Won Gang in a fight. In fact, he isn't confident enough to know if he can break his stance. However, putting all of these overwhelming thoughts aside, it's time that he uses his strongest art. Taking a deep breath in, Bo Jang goes in for the Thunderbolt Sky Destroyer. As the key blast travels towards he and Won Gang at blistering speed, it crumbles all the ground beneath. But unfazed, Hyun Won Gang then begins to bring down his sword staff in a similar fashion to when he fought Jin Ah. Once again, Hyun Won Gang's key is too strong and sharp that it cuts through Bo Jang's attacks, and he experiences the full blow of the force. For some reason, this panel reminds me of Muran Rider from One Punch Man. As he falls down, experiencing what seems to be his final moments, he murmurs, Bo Yang, please live. After observing Bo Jang's injured body with an expressionless face, Hyun Won Gang tells his troops to take Bo Jang to the military headquarters since he isn't dead. Now back at the Nam Gung family household, a messenger comes running to two of the Nam Gung brothers and tells them that the Pei Palace sent an envoy. The younger brother immediately seeks his counsel as to what they should do, and the old brother asks the envoy to immediately be brought in. As the elder Nam Gung brother lays eyes on the envoy, he sees a tall, muscular man with pitch black eyes, who introduces himself as Se Chung. Pei Palace's Dark Energy Hall Master. Tensing up with a fearless expression, the elder brother mentions that it's Sei Chun who is known to be the famous Flying Sword of Death. In response, Sei Chun tells him that it is merely a false name. Now cutting straight to the point, the elder brother asks him why he's here. Standing high and mighty like a mountain, Sei Chun tells him that he's brought a message from Sir Gukja of the Pei Palace. The message states that there are several Dark Path clans and warriors that live in Honan and Gangho. Unlike what the Light Path thinks, the Dark Path doesn't like to shed unnecessary blood. So as long as the Nam Gung family surrenders and promises to shut their gates for three years, the Dark Path and the Patient Palace will back off too. Giving a piece of his own mind, Sei Chung also tells the Elder Brother that if a fight breaks out then no one will come out alive. So surrendering is the only way to save the Nam Gung family and the South's Light Path. Hearing this, the Elder Brother breaks into laughter. Followed by this laughter is Wrath as the elder brother yells at Sei Chung, and asks him if it's some kind of a joke that they should surrender and shut their gates for three years. He further goes on to tell him that he'd rather have his throat split than accept such a humiliating condition. So with all due respect, Sei Chung can get out with his proposal. 
Humiliated by these antics, Sei Chung furiously tells the eldest brother that he'll regret this. However, unintimidated by him, the eldest brother replies that the regret will apply to Sei Chung too. Damn, I'm liking the exchange between these two. After bowing and telling the eldest brother that they shall meet again, Sei Chung takes his leave. Whilst the eldest brother stands tall as he tells Sei Chung to prepare his forces well, since he'll be waiting. Now back at Heijang, the patient palace's camp, all the militia leaders discuss the current state of the battle. Giving a sadistic smile, Gokja mentions that declining was inevitable. Angry at hearing that command, Sei Chung asks Gokja what was the purpose of sending him if he knew that the Namgung family would decline. Laughing at Sei Chung's questions, Gokja mentions that it's nothing much but the duty of the strong to recommend surrender. Confused by Gokja's response, Sei Chung wonders why he's saying and doing something like hurting the opponent's pride. Is it because he's a tactician rather than a warrior? Just then, Gung Se Yun asks when will they attack. In response, Gok Jia bows down to Se Yun and tells him that he's achieved his objective so Se Yun can decide for them now. Hearing that, Se Yun stands up and tells everyone that then they'll attack as planned. In an authoritative tone, Se Yun calls on the two ghastly brothers and asks them to gather the troops to attack the Nam Gung family from the east side. Following down, the ghastly brothers immediately head out for their task, then calling out to Ma Jiam Peng and Da Pei John. He asks them to attack the Nam Gung family's west side. Whereas Nan Gok along with the Blood Slasher corpse will remain here and protect the patient palace camp and Se Yun himself will lead the charge to take down the Nam Gung family with the aid of the Dark Energy Hall. Now at the Nam Gung family hall, we see all the family elders sitting together. One of the elders mentioned that the patient palace has been too quiet but he's heard that they gathered somewhere nearby. In response, Jiang tells everyone that in the report he received, he learned that the patient palace is looking for a chance to attack. One of the Huang family elders, Huang Bo Xianok mentions that the Zug family has laid out the five elements of the forbidden chain spell, so they wouldn't even dream of a surprise attack. Sitting aside, Zug Gong, the representative of the Zug family, modestly denies this praise. The five elements of the forbidden chain spell is a spell that uses the energy of fire, water, wood, gold, and earth, and creates the foundation of the five elements of harmony and dissonance. This results in the creation of a huge space. If someone were to enter that space, then the spellcaster can induce illusions or create mirages. However, these illusions won't be able to land any physical damage. Suddenly, large explosions are heard shaking all of the family elders gathered around in the Nam Gung household. In a tense voice, Jiam asks his soldiers to check out the source of commotion at once. Several moments later, the soldier informs that it's bad news. Using the explosion, the patient palace created an opening through the spell. This has allowed the patient palace to break through the Zug family's spell. Well, so much for all that praise about the spell. Hearing that the patient used explosives, the Nam Gung family and the other elders are left shocked. However, Jiam calms himself down as he tells himself that the government officials will take suitable measures against the dark path for this. Wow. Some government this is, ours wouldn't be here till hundred people have died. Now gathering all of their warriors, Jiang tells them that if they lose today, then the south of the Yangtze River will also perish. He further goes on to tell that the Nam Gung family will be overseeing the front lines, whilst the Huangbo and Hebei Peng clans will handle the left, whereas the right will be handled by the Dang family and the south's Light Path clans. Before ending his speech one last time, Jiang wonders how many of his soldiers will live. However, Pushing his sentiments aside, he yells out, Do not die and let us shout together in victory. Onwards to victory. We shall win this fight. Just then, Jiam's younger brother, the Chad guy, shows up. Jiam asks him if he's moved the family members to a safe place. In response, the Chad guy tells him that he's already sent the family members to nearby villages and relatives' places, so the family member must have passed the Yangtze River by now. However, their third sister-in-law is still here. Hearing that Jiam tells his brother that it's understandable, since she is Shangxi's greatest warrior and the daughter of Li Gojang herself. Her skill is level above others, so she'll be very helpful in this battle. Now at the west gate of the Nam Gung family, we find the Hebei Peng clan along with the Huang Bo family fighting relentlessly. Soldiers upon soldiers stack up on each other, while some are kicked and punched in the face. There are those unfortunate whose brain is splattered by the sheer force of the blade, there are some whose guts are open, and there are some stabbed in the heart. Looking at this sight, Ma Jiampeng and Dok Pei John are amazed as they mention that they knew that the five mightiest families would be strong, but to think that they would push the dark path forces this much is amazing. However, 
Not shying from the challenge, both of them ask their troops to go all out as they head into the line of fire themselves. Meanwhile, on the east gate of the Nam Gung family household, using his chains, one ghastly brother is able to take out several of the Hubei Peng and Wan Bo clan warriors. Whereas using his axes, the other ghastly brother begins to butcher his enemies. Seeing the terrifying duo in action, the surrounding warriors begin fearing for their lives. As the war at the Nam Gung household rages, we once again meet our boy So Moon and his group. As the group is slowly traveling through the thick fog, Guac Muang finds a homing pigeon that gives him a letter. As he reads the letter, he tells everyone that it seems that the Nam Gung family is enduring. One of the soldiers mentions that the Nam Gung family is the hope of the South's light path. In response, Guac Muang tells him that the combination of the light path forces gathered by the Nam Gung family has blocked the Patian Palace's all-out attack. The soldier asks Wak Muang about how many casualties took place. Replying to that question, Wak Muang tells that the Light Path suffered 400 casualties, but the Dark Path suffered the loss of 1,300 soldiers and had to retreat. Hearing this, the group finally calms down a little, and the soldier mentions that they've been traveling hastily up until now so they can finally slow down. Riding alongside So Moon, Joe Mun points his finger to a lake and asks him if he knows what that is. In response, So Moon tells him that he's not very sure, but it looks like a lake with no end. So educating So Moon a little, Jo Mun tells him that it is the renowned Daunting Lake. Intruding into the conversation, the beggar sex Lord Wan Chum mentions that there are three great towers in the lake known as the Yuing Tower, the Yellow Crane Tower, and the Pavilion of Prince Tang Tower. However, the best of all these towers is the Yellow Crane Tower, because even a beggar such as himself can admire its beauty and extravagance. Narrating the history of the tower, Huang Chun mentions that the yellow cranes have long since left, and now only the tower remains. Once the yellow crane is gone, it does a return and the white clouds drift slowly and emptily for a thousand years. Wow, this yellow crane sounds like my ex. Now Zhou Mun takes over and reads So Moon a poem that says, The river is clear in Hamyang by the trees and fragrant grass grows thick on Pear Isle. In this dusk, where is my homeland lay? The river's mist-covered waters bring me sorrow. Huan Chun mentions that this poem was read by Li Bai and Zhou Mun agrees with his elder. Looking back on So Moon, he asks him if he knew about this poem, and So Moon answers that he didn't. Smiling, Zhou Mun asks if So Moon knows about Li Bai. However, going on to a deep thought, So Moon responds that he might have heard of him. Hearing this, all guys look at So Moon with disgust as they are shocked at the fact that So Moon doesn't know who Li Bai is. This is every English teacher's reaction when you don't know at what date and time Shakespeare went to the toilet to poop. Seeing the people's reactions around him, So Moon begins to wonder who this guy is and is only able to conclude that he may be a king from the Ming Dynasty. Just then, Wak Yang begins talking and tells everyone what else could they expect from someone like So Moon, since someone like him from the countryside wouldn't know how big of a poet Li Bai is in China. Hearing this, So Moon thinks to himself that Wak Yang is provoking him again. It seems that she still hasn't come to her senses yet. Now walking to Guac Yang, as So Moon stands next to her, he asks her if she knows about the poet, Zhang Mongju. Hearing an unfamiliar name, in a sassy tone, she asks So Moon why she should know about someone like that. Hearing this, So Moon, in a mocking tone, mentions how could she not know Zhang Mongju after he risked his life to protect Goryeo's integrity. It seems that there is still an ignorant person who doesn't know about him. You know what guys, I'd actually read a whole manga on So Moon and Guac Yang's fights because they hella entertaining. Furious in her squeaky voice, Guac Yang asks So Moon why should she know about someone from his country. Applying the same logic, So Moon asks her and why should he know about this Chinese poet, Li Bai. In response, Guac Yang tells So Moon that since China is the center of the world, to know about Li Bai is a given. Runting So Moon asks Guac Yang if everyone should know about famous Chinese people. In response, she tells him that yes, they should. Seeing that she's fallen for his trap, So Moon asks her that, if that is the case, then she must know when the Sholin Temple priest goes to the bathroom. Hey, it's the same bathroom logic. I and So Moon think alike. Now shouting, Wak Yang tells So Moon how would she know that, and that he's talking nonsense. In response, So Moon tells her that it's very frustrating because didn't she just say knowing Li Bai is a given? Being the mentally slow person she is, she asks So Moon how the Shaolin Temple chief priest fits into the equation. Responding to her questions, So Moon tells her that the Shaolin is the center of Chinese martial arts, and the most important person, there is the chief priest. So by that logic, she should know everything about him. At last, 
Having her brains fried out, Wak Yong gives up as she says that she is speechless due to So Moon's ridiculous persistence. Just then, one of the soldiers calls on the platoon leader and tells him that three warriors from a raiding party for the Nam Gung family have arrived. As Gu Yuk Gai and Guak Muang meet them, he tells them that they made the right call to flee since he on one gang isn't their opponent. Seeing as how the soldiers are too injured, Gu Yuk Gai asks his subordinates to prepare a wagon for the three injured warriors. As so movement in the advanced party travel, they reach the place where the soaring Buddha figure was sculpted. Joe Mun tells So Moon that seeing the carved shape of Buddha flying toward the sky is a sight to behold. In response, So Moon tells him that he'd like to see it. However, suddenly So Moon senses someone's presence from the cliff. So without waiting a moment, he tells Joe Mun there might be someone there. But upon observing closely, Joe Mun tells So Moon that there is no need to worry since he can't sense anything. But still not assured, So Moon sends Iron Blood to check it out, as Iron Blood goes into the deep mist to find out what's happening. So Moon tells Bu Yang Poom that there's an ambush. Plus, the presence is unusual, so he should be careful. Waiting on Iron Blood's return, So Moon thinks to himself that it's unsettling having to go somewhere when you know the danger resides. As everyone waits for Iron Blood's return, thousands of red arrows come flying at the advance party. Unable to see through the surprise attack, several soldiers are quick to die. However, now finally realizing that it's an ambush, Wak Muang asks everyone to get cover. Well, he sure realized it pretty soon. He commands everyone to stick to the cliff walls and hide their body. Taking notice of the red arrows, Wak Muang realizes that it is none other than the Blood Bow group. Feeling guilty for being too hasty, Wak Muang beats himself up as he understands he should have been more careful. As several soldiers lie dead or injured in the open, the advance party has no option but to stay covered behind giant rocks. As the Blood Bow group draws their blade, standing on top of the cliff, Mok Hyuk introduces himself and tells everyone that he isn't a fan of childish ambushes, but he has no other choice. He then tells the advance party that their path of retreat has been cut off and there's no way they can survive. However, if they surrender their lives will be spared. So will the advance party accept his offer? Responding from behind a rock, Wak Muon thanks him for the offer and tells him that his pride wouldn't allow him to surrender, even if it means that his bones will be buried here. In response, Moxa Hyuk tells Wak Muum that he understands his heroism, but wouldn't it be better if he was to plan for his future? Still staying true to his words, Wak Muum tells Moxa Hyuk that he'll never back away from his words. Trying to seek advice from Wak Muum, the platoon leader for the Shaolin Disciples asks him how they can overcome this crisis. In response, Wak Muum tells him that currently they can't do anything but wait since they need to reach the top of the cliff, and with the Blood Bow group standing their ground is impossible. Squatting behind a rock, So Moon whilst pouting asks Jo Mun who they think they're shooting arrows at. Picking a nearby red arrow, So Moon draws his bow as he tells himself that he's about to give the Blood Bow group a taste of their own medicine. Oh, things are about to get interesting. As So Moon takes aim, Jo Mun asks him what he's doing since shooting an arrow from beneath isn't of any use. However, So Moon tells him that he is good with arrows, so Jo Mun will just have to trust him. Scared, Jo Mun tells So Moon that they might get targeted, so it's best if he doesn't do anything dangerous. Sitting under the same rock, Guak Yang tells Jo Mun to leave So Moon since it seems that he's gone crazy from fear. However, So Moon tells them that even though he may not look like it, but he's a pretty famous hunter. Saying this, So Moon shoots the arrow high up into the sky. Guak Yang, not being able to shut her mouth, yells at So Moon and asks what good would shooting it straight up do. However, being 100% focused, So Moon asks her to stay quiet and not disturb him. Still not getting the point, Guak Yang continues to argue with him as she tells So Moon to stop fooling around. However, sitting aside, Gu Yang Poon asks her to leave So Moon alone as he has a keen sense when it comes to the bow and arrow. As the arrow goes straight up, it plunges into the neck of an archer. At first, the blood bow group thinks that the guy slipped. However, as soon as they find an arrow in his neck, Another archer is taken down when an arrow hits him right in the brain. Frightened to see something like this, the archers begin looking here and there to find the source of this attack. However, upon looking up in the sky before the archer can move, the arrow plunges into his eye. Alerted by this, all the archers begin looking for the source of these attacks and shoot several arrows all at once. Unfortunately, all these arrows return right back at them, killing a large number of the Blood Bow group. Seeing this, Moxa Hyuk asks all the Blood Bow group members to avoid the arrows at any cost or else they are all dead. Taking notice from down below, 
so Moon realizes that they are avoiding the arrow. So trying to come up with a new strategy, he wonders if he should use the key guided arrow. However, he realizes that it would be difficult since there are too many people. But then So Moon suddenly observes that the wind is blowing his favorable direction. So coming up with a new strategy, So Moon once again shoots the arrow into the air. Using the flow of the wind, So Moon shoots his arrow at such an angle that his arrows are able to reach the Blood Bow group. As a multitude of arrows come flying at the Blood Bow group members, they shield themselves and try to run away. However, still some of them are killed, as the arrow is able to pierce through the shields. Looking at the state of his soldiers, Mok Sehyuk coldly watches his soldiers get slaughtered. As the arrows come flying toward Mok Sehyuk, he easily manages to cut through all of the arrows. With a determined look on his face, Mok Sehyuk observes that there's an expert archer group in the Light Path advanced party that is more capable than the Blood Bow group. Little does he know that it's our boy So Moon all alone. Seeing this, Gwak Yong is left stunned, however, so Moon looks back at her and asks her not to simply sit around but make herself useful by collecting some arrows. Now for once, accepting So Moon's requests as she is collecting arrows, she thinks to herself that while she understands that every man has his own trade, to think that a fool such as So Moon would be such an expert archer. As Wak Yong is collecting the arrows, the Blood Bow group is able to spot her and find where So Moon is hidden. Immediately prioritizing him as their target, the Blood Bow group begins shooting arrows at the So Moon. However, they are unable to reach him due to the big boulder in front of So Moon. However, collecting all of their key into one arrow, the Blood Bow group shoots the boulder and is able to break through it, dodging the arrow now in plain sight. So Moon takes a deep breath and mentions how much of a savage the Blood Bow group is. Taking aim, all the Blood Bow group members direct their shots at So Moon. However, upon realizing that others might get hurt because of him, So Moon decides to walk directly into the center. If I saw a guy walking through hundreds of arrows directed at him, trust me I'm telling him, Daddy chill and running away. As So Moon walks to the center, Wak Yong shouts at him and asks him to come back as he could get killed. Is this care that I see for So Moon in Wak Yong's eyes? However, being confident in his abilities, So Moon stands directly into the line of fire. Seeing this as a big opportunity, all of the Blood Bow group fire all of their shots at once by putting all of their individual strengths into it. As the arrows land in So Moon's surrounding area, a large explosion like smoke is created. Celebrating, the Blood Bow group thinks that they finally gotten So Moon. However, as the smoke settles down, So Moon, simply standing amidst the chaos of the battle, is able to grab a hold of several arrows. Seeing this sight, Moxa Hyuk gets furious and asks the Blood Bow group why can't they shoot properly? Can they not hit an open target? Well, sir, it seems that no, they can't. Being riled up by their commander's word, the Blood Bow group begins a flurry of attack in quick succession. However, with his hand tied behind his back so Moon moves flawlessly like a ballerina and is able to dodge all the attacks without breaking a sweat. Looking at this, Joe Mun and the other members of the advanced party are all amazed as they haven't witnessed such techniques before. Du Yanpong, seeing this from the sidelines, also thinks to himself that even though he knew So Moon would be exceptional, this is certainly exceeding his expectations. Scared of So Moon's exceptional techniques, the Blood Bow group begins wondering if So Moon is even human. In fact, some of them make it out to be witchcraft. Imagine being so good at martial arts that people start believing that it's magic. One of the Blood Bow archers says that he's positive that So Moon is either a ghost or a phantom. Hearing this, another archer asks whether it would be a good idea to waste arrows on him then. Seeing this masterful display, even Guac Mu Ung is left wondering if what he's seeing is even real. Now having a playful grin on his face, So Moon tells the Blood Bow group that enough with the jokes, and now it's time that he returns their arrows back to them. Having collected more than enough arrows, So Moon vanishes into thin air using his amazing speed, and once again takes cover behind a boulder. As the Blood Bow group tries searching for So Moon again, he looks behind him to see all of the advanced party members showing thumbs up with surprised Pikachu face. Giving them the thumbs up back, So Moon with a wide smile on his face proceeds to draw his bow and shoot several arrows. As multiple arrows come flying at the Blood Bow group, they lose formation as they run for their lives, but it is to no avail. One of the Blood Bow group archers asks his men to not get flustered and stand their ground so they can attack So Moon's position. Gathering their energy, the Blood Bow group once again tries to destroy the boulder that So Moon is taking cover behind. However, this time So Moon decides he won't let this work, but as he tries to find some arrows, he realizes he's used all of them. Seen from a side, Guac Muang worriedly mentions that So Moon has run out of arrows. 
However, seeing as there are no other options, so Moon decides to use the formless firing technique. Seeing this from the sidelines, even Wak Yong asks him to dodge the arrow and yells at him for trying to shoot an empty bow. As the formless bow, made up of So Moon's key strikes the blood bow group's arrow, it decimates it into small pieces and a huge explosion occurs. Seeing this, the blood bow group is left stunned, as they wonder how could someone stop their mightiest attack so easily. One of the blood bow group archers asks his group leader if he saw So Moon shoot an arrow. However, he's told that he didn't see any arrow. Back at the advance party's side, both the Shaolin leader and Guak Mu Ung are left stunned as they ask each other if they saw So Mu shoot an arrow. However, both have no answers since they only saw him draw the empty bow. Still based on his observation, the Shaolin leader suggests that perhaps So Mu used his key as an arrow instead. Hearing this, Guak Mu Ung is amazed as he mentions that it is possible in the sword arts, but is the first time he's heard of firing key as an arrow. Now coming up to the advanced party leader, So Moon asks if everyone is alright. The Shaolin temple leader breaks into a wide smile and tells him that he saved all of them. However, still not losing focus, So Moon asks the elders what they need to do in order to get out of there. Hearing this, Guak Mu An tells So Moon that he could have just used the sound transmission technique for such a simple question. What was the need to come all the way here? Hearing this, So Moon is baffled as he questions what the sound technique is. Intervening in the conversation, Gubiak Guy tells So Moon that it is a technique that is used for communication over a distance and all experts can do this. Scratching his head, So Moon tells everyone that he isn't an expert yet, so he doesn't know it. Listening to this, all the elders are ashamed, as they wonder that if So Moon isn't still an expert, then what are they? Just then, So Moon hears Jia Myung's voice in his head, telling him that his bow skills are amazing. Alerted by it, So Moon looks in Jia Myung's direction who happens to be waving at So Moon. Gu Yuk Gai tells So Moon that he asked Jia Myung to send him a sound transmission, so he must have heard his voice. Imagine being able to use something like that in a classroom. My friends and I would keep talking. However, I have to get friends first for that, sad life. Fascinated by it, So Moon tells the elders that he's only mastered the bow and agility techniques so he isn't familiar with such skills. However, Gu Yuk Gai tells So Moon that he'll be fine with just his skills. However, getting back on track, so Moon tells Wak Mu Ung that they need to handle the Blood Bow group shooting range first. For that, they'll need to take control of at least one side of the cliff. Hearing this, Wak Mu Ung tells So Moon that it is easier said than done, so how does he plan on getting up there? Wak Mu Ung suggests that he'll distract the enemy while certain experts can get up the cliff. However, So Moon goes against that idea since he knows that the Blood Bow group will begin to pour down arrows, so instead he'll play the role of the bait whilst Wak Mu Ung along with certain experts will go at the cliff. Using the sound transmission technique, Wak Mu Ung tells everyone about So Moon's plan. After informing So Moon that he's alerted everyone, he asks him how he's planning on handling the Blood Bow group. With a proud smile on his face, So Moon tells Wak Mu Ung that he'll simply shoot his arrows a little hysterically. Following this statement, So Moon fires his arrows into the sky and yells out to the members to go. Following his directions, the experts and the leaders at once begin climbing onto the cliff. Taking notice of them, the Blood Bow group tries shooting them. However, before they can do that, So Moon's formless arrows get the best of them. Seeing So Moon single handedly deal so much damage, Moxa Hyuk feels a chill down his spine. Now, diverting their attention to So Moon, the Blood Bow group tries to take him down. However, So Moon easily dodges all of their attacks and then hits a multi shot combined with the formless firing technique. I mean, why do people even mess with So Moon? He is too OP. But these shot more and more Blood Bow group archers fall, whilst the remaining survivors are subdued with the elite warriors and the leaders of the advanced party. Conquering one side of the cliff, the advanced party is able to take down all of the Blood Bow group. Angered by this, Moxa Hyuk sends his personal troops to kill the Light Path warriors on the front lines. As they rush on to battle, Guat Mu Ung and his warriors stand in the Dark Path's way. As Moxa Hyuk rushes into battle, he's met face to face with none other than Guat Mu Ung. As the two face off, Moxa Hyuk realizes that the Blood Bow group has fallen and half of their forces have been killed. Even though he was certain they'd win, the reality of the situation now is that it would be difficult to escape defeat. As Guat Mu Ung stares Moxa Hyuk down, he tells himself that the only thing left to do is have an honorable death. Now addressing Guat Mu Ung. Moxa Hyuk says that he hadn't imagined that the Light Path possessed such an archery genius that would surpass the Blood Bow group. In response, Wat Mu Ung tells Moxa Hyuk that he's a rising member of the Light Path. 
With a tensed and pained expression on his face, Mok Sekiduk asks Wak Mu Ung that which clan is So Moon from. In response, Wak Mu Ung tells Mok Sekiduk to ask him personally. As the advance party makes way, Mok Sekiduk with heavy steps and seeping bloodlust walks up to So Moon. At first glance, So Moon is able to realize how much of a formidable foe Mok Sekiduk. Frowning, Mok Sekiduk tells So Moon that it was fun watching archery skills since it almost made his spirit leave his body. Yeah man sure seems like you're having fun. In response, So Moon tells him that he's been mastering this ever since he was a kid. However, he believes that he's still lacking. Still frowning, Moxa Huck tells So Moon that it is crowded over here so they should fight someplace else. As Moxa Huck leaves, So Moon tells the advance party that he'll be back and follows behind. Seeing this Guyuk guy wonders if So Moon will be alright. But Guak Muang tells him that they'll just have to wait and see. Meanwhile, Dan Gaian mentions that while So Moon is facing off against Moxa Huck, they should clean up this area. Following that, Guak Muang asks the remaining Dark Path troops to surrender so that they can be exempt from death. However, still staying persistent, the surviving troop members tell Guak Muang that this place will be the Light Path Coalition's grave. As the group say their respective dialogues, they once begin their battle. Now standing on top of the cliff, as So Moon and Mok Sehyuk size each other, Mok Sehyuk tells So Moon that arrows don't work against him, so it would be better if he drew his sword. However, taking out his bow, So Moon tells him that he's more comfortable this way. In response, Moxa Hyuk gives a nod of understanding and tells So Moon that in that case, he'll have to be careful. Following this statement, Moxa Hyuk takes his stance and charges towards So Moon and tries to out his legs. However, jumping high into the sky, So Moon quickly shoots a formless arrow. However, Moxa Hyuk realizes that it would pierce his head and weaves past it at the last second. Seeing this, Moxa Hyuk is left impressed as he mentions that an invisible key arrow was the last thing he'd expect. Not giving Moxa Hyuk a chance to settle, so Moon fires several key arrows at him. However, evading and blocking these arrows, giving respect where respect is due, so Moon also realizes that Moxa Hyuk has been able to keep up with him by avoiding or blocking his arrows. So Moon then realizes that if he combines the arrow key with his inner key, then he'll win. Doing just that, so Moon fires two more key arrows. However, Moxa Hyuk is easily able to block these moves and tells So Moon that upon a closer look, he realizes that So Moon's movement techniques are more surprising than his bow skills. Getting a breather, Moxa Hyuk charges his sword with his key, and using the exploding lightning annihilator throws the sword and So Moon's head. While So Moon is easily able to dodge the sword, it turns out the sword follows So Moon for a second time and comes straight for his head from a blind spot. However, sensing the overwhelming key, So Moon is able to dodge it for the second time. Seeing this, So Moon immediately realizes that it is the key guided sword, a technique all sword wielders dream of mastering. The sword then comes at So Moon for the third time. However, So Moon backflips over it, but as the sword travels back to Mox Sehyuk, So Moon's clothes are tethered. In a respectful tone, Mox Sehyuk tells So Moon that he was only able to scratch his clothes by performing the key guided sword. Seeing someone land a hit even on his clothes for the first time, so Moon realizes that Moxa Hyuk is really strong, enough to rouse up his fighting spirit. Smiling, So Moon excitedly tells Moxa Hyuk that he's the first person in China to ever put so much as a scratch on him, so he's glad to find someone he can test his martial arts on. With a poker face, Moxa Hyuk tells So Moon that if that is the case, then the Patient Palace has much stronger experts than himself. Moxa Hyuk then asks So Moon if he's still going to continue using a bow. However, so Moon replies that in return for showing him the joy of battle, he'll use a sword for Moxa Hyuk, grabbing a nearby sword. So Moon asks Moxa Hyuk to come at him. Guess it's time for Moxa Hyuk to see the peerless Unity blade in action. Pointing his sword towards Moxa Hyuk, tells So Moon that he'll be more aggressive than last time. With a fearless expression, So Moon tells him that he'll look forward to it. Taking his stance, Moxa Hyuk, once again using the key guided sword, throws his sword at So Moon, putting every ounce of his strength into it. As the sword engulfed in the red key comes flying at So Moon, he raises his sword up and begins cultivating his key, having made a barrier through his key. So Moon conveniently manages to block the sword's strikes. But having had enough at last, So Moon decides to stop Moxa Hyuk, and in one clean strike breaks Moxa Hyuk's sword into several pieces. Seeing this, Moxa Hyuk is left stunned as he asks So Moon if that was blade deflection. However, so Moon tells him that it is the second step of the peerless triple unity blade, 
the Loveless Blade. Repeating the name of So Moon's sword style, Mok Se Hyuk tells him that he's undoubtedly lost, so he has nothing to say. And So Man can do as he pleases, Aeonan as he pleases. Observing Mok Se Hyuk's actions closely, So Moon realizes that he could probably still continue fighting, yet he chose to admit defeat. So So Moon tells him that he never felt any hostility towards him from the start. Plus, they have to fight much longer for a satisfactory outcome. But since Mok Se Hyuk admitted defeat, So Moon also decides to stop there. In exchange for sparing Mok Se Hyuk's life, So Moon asks him to release the coalition member that they held prisoner and then heads back to the advanced party. As So Moon heads back, it seems that the advanced party has already won against the remaining coalition members. Being the honorable man he is, Wak Mu Ung tells his soldiers to mend the wounds of the Dark Path warriors. Taking notice of So Moon, Dan Gaian tells the rest of his brothers that he's here. Jo Mun runs towards So Moon and asks him how the fight went. Too excited, Jia Myung says to So Moon, considering that So Moon is in one piece, it seems that he won. However, keeping a humble demeanor, So Moon tells everyone that he was just avoiding Mok Se Hyuk's attacks and shooting his arrows. However, Mok Se Hyuk just left himself. Gotta admit, So Moon is the first humble OPMC that I've come across. Man would save the world and not take credit. Hearing this, Dan Gyun, why would he just leave? However, intervening Jo Mun tells him that it's simply because he knew he had no chance of winning. But keeping a modest demeanor, So Moon tells everyone that Mok Se Hyuk was just afraid of the people that would come to So Moon's support. Intruding in the conversation, Wak Mu Ung tells So Moon that regardless, it was due to him that they all survived the ambush. In response, So Moon gives him a warm smile and tells him that he's glad his archery skills were able to help them even if it was just a little. Putting further praise on So Moon, Wat Muung tells him that his archery skills are the best. Agreeing with this statement, Gu Yuk Gai mentions that who else could compete against the Blood Bow group in Gang Ho but So Moon? Now expressing his sadness, Wat Muung mentions that they have over 30 people that are either dead or injured. Blaming himself, he further goes to accept his mistake and tells everyone he's ashamed since everyone suffered due to his carelessness. However, Gu Yuk Gai asks him not to be too hard on himself since the enemy suffer in much greater loss. As the advanced party then continues its journey, Gu Yang Poon riding alongside So Moon asks him about Muk Se Hyuk. In response, So Moon tells him that who knows what might have happened. Worried, Gu Yang Poon asks So Moon if he killed him. However, So Moon frowns and tells Gu Yang Poon what a kind-hearted thought it is. Moving forward, he dismissively tells Gu Yang Poom that he worries about the people that betrayed him. However, Gu Yang Poom tells him that the Light Path views the Patient Palace as a group of villains because he entered the Shaolin in pursuit of power. Since then, as a lord, he didn't exercise his power properly, so it's all his fault, giving him no reason to despise his former subordinates. Having a displeased expression, so Mu tells Gu Yang Poom that he's still upset at the fact that they betrayed him. Nonetheless, he doesn't want to meddle in the matter even a little. However, not minding So Moon's words, Gu Yang tells him that he's grateful for letting Mok Se Hyuk leave, and that he must have learned after fighting against him that he's a true warrior. Moreover, he tells So Moon that even though it may be hard to believe, but most of the experts in the Patient Palace are just like him. Nevertheless, the other dark clans that follow the Patient Palace are a greater threat, since even though they may have the same military government, they still have many differences with the palace. If the Patient Palace were to restrain them, they wouldn't go on a rampage. However, the Patient Palace will let them be. And if those Dark Path villages freely do what they want, then it will be harder to stop the Patient Palace. After several days of travel, at last, the advanced party is able to reach the Nam Gung family. Nam Gung Jiam welcomes the advanced party and tells them all that he is deeply moved to see that all those years that the Nam Gung family spent protecting their friendship have finally paid off. Now keeping the formalities aside, he welcomes Mu Ung like a brother. In response, Wak Mu Ung also hugs Ji Yum like a brother and tells him that he knows how hard it was for the Nam Gung family to endure the patient attack. Honestly, it's wholesome to see So Moon having such a brotherly bond with someone. Seeing some injured soldiers in the advance party, Ji Yum asks Wak Mu Ung about what has happened. Giving a shy laugh, he tells Ji Yum that they were ambushed on the way here. At first, they couldn't do anything due to being stuck in between cliffs. Further seeing the blood bow group arrows all around them was startling. However, in the end, they were able to get on the cliff and subdue them. Hearing this, Jiam grieves as he mentions that then there must have been many losses. But Guak Mu Wang tells Jiam that a single lad subdued the blood bow group by himself. 
lowering the number of casualties. Now as all the elders sit together to feast and celebrate their reunion. Jia mentions that it's a shame he couldn't see So Moon's archery skills firsthand. On the other hand, So Moon sitting with his three brothers is basking in praise as all of them are still in complete awe of So Moon's skills. Jia Myung mentions that aside from So Moon's brilliant archery skill, he was more surprised by the agility skills technique that he used to climb the cliff. He also makes fun of the fact that it's hard to believe that someone who doesn't even know the sound transmission technique can use such agility techniques. Laughing, Dan Gyun and Jo Mun mention that no one would believe it until they've seen it firsthand. Just then, Jia Myung stands up and pulls out his sword. Too impressed by So Moon's skills, Jia Myung tells him that he'd like to teach him a lesson. However, So Moon raising his hands tells him that he's lost. Still, going into demon time, Jia Myung asks So Moon to draw his sword because there's no going back anymore. But So Moon stays adamant about not fighting Jia Myung. Taking it as an offense, Jia Myung chases So Moon around. Seeing this, the two remaining brothers can't stop laughing. Jia Myung really does act like an elder brother since he is chasing around trying to fight someone who is younger than him. Now inside the Namgung family household, Jia and the Huang family elder check up on Jin Ah. The two ask what happened with the rest of the advance party and Jin Ah in a weakened voice mentions that whilst the rest of them were able to escape, Huan Bo Jang stayed behind just so that they all can escape. Hearing this, Jiam says to the Huang family member that he must be worried. However, breaking into his smile, he mentions that he couldn't be more proud of his eldest son for doing the right thing, and if it were to him, he'd have done the same. Now back at the Pajian family headquarters, as Se Yun hears that the Moxa Hyuk failed, he can't believe his ears. Admitting defeat, Moxa Hyuk honestly narrates the events that took place in the battle and inform everyone that a single archer was able to take on the Blood Bow group subduing all of them. Hearing this, Gokja worries as he tries to plan his next move. Moxa Hyuk then tells Seyum that he also lost against So Moon with a sword. Hearing this, Seyum is left shocked to his core. To add more salt to the wound, Moxa Hyuk tells Seyum that So Moon was able to destroy his key guided sword in one move. Hearing all of this, Gokja has a hard time even believing that such a warrior exists. But Moxa Hyuk assures that it is the truth. Hearing the arrival of a new formidable enemy, Gokja tells the commanders that he'll now have to adjust some plans. However, the overall plan will remain the same and won't change just because of a single person. Now during a meeting between the elders, Jiam Nam Gung brings So Moon to his father and introduces him as the savior of the advanced party. Meeting him, Nam Gung Sangin has a wide smile on his face. Bowing down, So Moon introduces himself whilst Sangin praises So Moon's archery. However, so Moon mentions that he was simply lucky, but Sangin continues to praise So Moon. Scratching his head, So Moon asks him to stop since he actually might think of himself as skillful. However, laughing at this remark, Sangin tells So Moon that it is simply acknowledging the truth. Just then, one of the Dang family elders sitting there asks So Moon where is Jo Sion he is from. In response, So Moon tells him that he lived on Pektu Mountain. As the conversation carries on, So Moon is asked about his parents, however, he mentions that his parents both passed away when he was only just a child, so it was his grandfather that ended up raising him. Sangin then tells So Moon that he had heard of many great archers in Zhao Xian, but why did he end up coming to China? Sitting aside from the Dang family elder, Dang Qian Ho mentions that it is because he wanted to spread his name. So Moon tells them that it isn't the case, but rather he has some business with the Dang family in the south. Hearing this, the room gets quiet and Sangin tells So Moon that all the people apart from him and his son are from the Dang family so he can freely talk to them. Well, it's the moment of truth guys, will So Moon get a wife or not? Dang Chi and Ho then proceeds to ask So Moon what business he has with their family, and So Moon tells them that his grandfather had sent him to find a bride, and he heard that his future father-in-law had made a pledge with his father. Hearing this, Chi and Ho wonders when his son made such a promise. Thinking back, he recalls that since his son did travel a lot, there might be such a connection. Assessing So Moon for a while, Chien Ho realizes that So Moon does indeed have all the qualities that he'd like in a groom. So at last, Chien Ho decides to give his granddaughter's hand to So Moon. Hearing this, Sang In also mentions that he has some granddaughters of the marriageable age. However, it seems that the Dang family has already chosen him. In a time where people riz up girls, so Moon is rizzing up their fathers, and that's how you end up with a double U girl. Hearing this, so Moon immediately bows down to Chi and Ho out of respect. Chi and Ho then asks So Moon for his age, which happens to be 22. 
he decides that he is perfect for his granddaughter So He, who happens to be 20 years old. Hearing his future wife's name, So Moon is extremely ecstatic, now in hopes of rejoicing. So Moon is taken out for drinks by the younger Dang family member. After So Moon takes his leave, Nam Gung Jiam mentions that he believes that while So Moon may be powerful, it seems that he lacks ambition. However, the two leaders tell Jiam and his fellow that So Moon has a martial arts style, unlike anything. Hearing this, both Jiam and his fellow is left stunned, and somewhat of a sad tone. Sang and questions himself as to why he desired So Moon so much. Wait, that came out wrong. Sang and further goes on to tell everyone around that he was swept by So Moon's martial arts as he thought of the state of his own family. Still not following, Jiyum and his companion mentioned that whilst So Moon's archery skills seem exceptional, he doesn't feel that much of a martial artist. Smiling, Sang and tells them that a stage that they hardly reach would be difficult for them to understand. Smiling, Xiun Ho mentions that while So Moon has amazing martial arts skills, he wasn't able to sense any key. Adding to Qian Ho's dialogue, Sang tells a person needs to at least reach the restoration of truth to hide such immense key. Hearing this, both Jiam and his companion are baffled and are left with no other option but to accept the words of two of the Light Path legends. Following the Dang family, So Moon visits a tavern where all of So Moon's brothers, along with Guak Yang, have gathered. Taking So Moon around, the Dang family member introduces him as his brother in law and informs everyone of his engagement with his younger sister. This comes as a shock to Jiam Mian, however, he recalls that So Mu's primary goal was to find a wife in Sichuan. The Dang family member then introduces So Moon to Nam Gung Jin and the daughters of the Nam Gung family, Su Rian, Su Mei, and Hai. After exchanging pleasantries, So Moon is introduced to Ha Bei Peng clan's eldest son Peng Man Ho and the younger brother Peng Du Zhang. Alongside them is standing Huang Bo Yang, who introduces herself to So Moon and tells him that she'll soon be a part of the Hubei Peng clan. Hearing this, her elder brother, Huang Bo Guan, introduces himself and tells her how disappointing it is for him to hear such a thing since his sister is still a part of the Huang family. As So Moon is meeting new people around him, Zhou Mun sweeps in close and tells him that Nam Gong Hai has constantly been looking at him with mischievous eyes. So how did So Moon impress her? So Moon tells him that he didn't do any such thing. But, not believing that answer, Joe Mun stays persistent and nicknames So Moon a ladies' man. You know what, I agree with Joe Mun. At this point, So Moon has become a ladies' man. And of course, he was already old men's favorite person to hang out with too. So it seems So Moon can attract both beautiful women and stupid old men. Hearing Joe Mun's words, Dang So Myung also asks So Moon if it's an affair. But So Moon asks him to stop saying that, since it's not the case. Now being surrounded by several warriors, so Moon begins describing his archery techniques and how he manages to do them, standing aside. Hai keenly listens to So Moon's words. While So Moon is telling the warriors that to shoot up the arrows straight up with power, all you need to do is main the inner key that is poured into the arrows. Hearing this, Wang Bo Wan asks So Moon if he always analyzes the wind before shooting an arrow or not. To answer that, So Moon tells him that yes, he does, because back at his home of Pek Tu Mountain, the climate changes a lot. Suddenly intervening in the conversation, Hai asks So Moon what his hometown is like and So Moon paints a picture of the high mountains inhabited by selfless and kind people. So Moon further goes on to describe that he lives in a small cottage near a river, and when the sun shone on that river it seemed like the world was filled with gems. Reminiscing about his grandpa, So Moon mentions that he would be basking in the sun right now whilst the foot of the mountain would be blooming with wild spring flowers. Hearing this description, Hai is brought to tears, and even Guak Yam is flustered as she has to admit that So Moon has a way with words. Damn. So Moon has become the Rizzler in a matter of two chapters. I need his game. Seeing this, Joe Mun once again teases So Moon as he calls him ladies' man for making a woman cry just by his words. The following day, as So Moon is spending his time resting on a tree branch, suddenly Iron Blood rushes to him in panic and tells him that multiple people with an ominous aura are headed this way. After getting all the details from Iron Blood, so Moon jumps down off the tree and proceeds to collect a large number of sticks for arrows. He then gets on top of a tall building to use it as a vantage point against the enemies. Guess it's sniping time. Now standing on top, So Moon mentions how nice of a view it is. However, seeing as there's still some time for the enemies to arrive, So Moon lies down as he waits for the rest of the coalition members to take notice of the enemy's advance. On the other hand, as the two guards take notice of the enemy's movement, they immediately rush to alert the Nam Gung family elders. Within a couple of seconds, panic and disarray spread throughout the Nam Gung family stronghold, where soldiers rush to grab their weapons and get to their assigned stations. 
On the other hand, the Dark Path troops led by Se Yuan riding on horseback notice the Nam Gung family's front gates wide open. Seeing this, Se Yuan decides to ride straight through it. But one of Se Yuan's underlings brings it to his attention that they might get ambushed this way. However, ignoring those words, Se Yuan goes straight on as he can't care any less about ambushes at this moment. As Se Yuan along with the Dark Path soldiers crosses the Nam Gung family's front gates, they are all greeted by Sangin. As the two stand face to face, so Moon standing on top of the building, analyzes the force sizes and thinks to himself that the patient palace has twice as much force as the light path. With an expressionless face, Sangin tells Seiyun that he's grateful for the gesture of goodwill since the eldest son of the Hebei Peng clan, Huan Bo Jang, returned this morning. Keeping the same poker face, Seiyun replies that they only did that because they had promised it. Hearing this, Sangin is shocked as he says, promise, in an inquisitive tone. In response, Se Yuan tells Sang and that they should be the ones showing gratitude since exchanging Mok Se Hyuk for Huan Bo Jang isn't a bad trade at all. Hearing this, Wak Mu Wan thinks to himself that he had a gut feeling that even though Se Moon won, he let Mok Se Hyuk go. Learning that Mok Se Hyuk, the hand of the reincarnated, had lost and his life was exchanged, Sang and is left baffled. Now standing in an authoritative stance, Se Yuan tells Sang and that he doesn't wish to fight them so as a last favor. The Namgung family will be asked to seal their gates and no blood will be shed. Brushing his beard, Sangin tells Seiyun that while he appreciates his kindness, the Namgung family doesn't plan on yielding, glaring at Sangin. Seiyun tells him that if that's how it's going to be then there is no other choice. Raising his hand, Seiyun shouts and commands everyone to attack, obeying Seiyun. The patient palace soldiers charge toward the light path soldiers. Unfazed, Sangin also raises his sword high up in the sky and tells everyone that his bones will be buried here today. Following Sangin's commands, Dan Gian, Zhou Mun, and Jiang Miang take their battle stance, and as the two forces charge toward each other, bloodshed can be seen all around. However, this time without giving much of a fight, it is the Dark Path forces that are getting decimated. Looking at this from afar, Gok Jia along with Mi Jia Yun. The leader of the Blood Bow group mentions that he knew this fight was going to be difficult even with larger numbers. In response, Ji Yun tells him that since their forces were gathered hastily, their military prowess wouldn't have made that big of a difference. However, Grinning Gokja mentions that they've already prepared something for this situation, saying that Gokja orders the Blood Bow group to go up front. Taking position alongside Ji Yun, the Blood Bow group takes their formation and upon their leader's command starts shooting. Surprised by this attack, several of the Light Path soldiers are taken out. Now paying their attention to the Blood Bow group, the Light Path soldiers charge towards them. However, they fall short against the Arabs coming at them at blistering speed. As the Light Path soldiers close the gap between themselves and the Blood Bow group, the Blood Bow group disperses and shoots several arrows, taking out the few surviving members. Looking at this sight, So Moon pouts as he thinks to himself that it seems that the Blood Bow group still hasn't learned their lesson since they dared to shoot arrows in front of him, shooting a single wooden arrow. So Moon immediately catches the attention of the Blood Bow archers and their leader Ji Yun. Taking notice of So Moon's position, Ji Yun orders his troops to shoot So Moon. But we've seen something like this happening before, haven't we? Drawing their bows, the Blood Bow group shoots several arrows towards So Moon. As the arrows travel towards So Moon at supersonic speed, he stands there unfazed. Looking at this sight, both Sang In and Chi and Ho wonder how So Moon will face the arrows that are filled with Blood Bow Group's aura of vengeance. Well, you're about to see. Awakening his ultra instinct, So Moon bobs and weaves past all the arrows, smiling. So Moon, in a mocking tone, tells the Blood Bow Group that they are idiots, and if they want to hit him, then they need to shoot properly. Enraged by this, the Blood Bow Group shoots several arrows. However, without even breaking a sweat, Moon is able to catch these arrows with his bare hands. As he does this, he asks the Blood Bow group if they are shooting with their eyes closed. I say let So Moon cook. Seeing this, both Gok Jia and Ji Yun are left grinding their teeth. However, still using his brains, Gok Jia mentions that if any more of the Blood Bow group archers die, then it will be impossible for them to recover. Bowing down to Mok Se Hyuk and Hyun Won Gang, Gok Jia requests both of them to block So Moon's arrows, else the Blood Bow group will be decimated. Accepting Gokja's request, both head over to the Blood Bow group's aid. While Gokja standing alongside Se Yun mentions that he's never seen such a skill. On the other hand, Se Yun has nothing but admiration for So Moon's skill, even though he's an enemy. Looking at this, 
Chi Yun Ho laughs and tells Sang-in that So Moon's the guy that will become Sobi's husband. Jealous of this, Sang-in pouts and tells Chi Yun Ho, who asked, Getting back to the battle, Se Yun commands the Dark Energy Hall to advance. Led by Se Chun, the Dark Energy Hall initiates its attack. Countering this attack, the advance party led by Guak Mu Ung faces off against the Dark Energy Hall. Amidst the chaos, Wak Mu Ung orders the Mount Wasek disciples to take on the left side, whereas the Nine Wando Ha Hu Gang takes on the right. Vibrantly running around in the battle, Ha Hu Yemen tells her father that she'll be taking on the rear. Using her colorful techniques, Ha Hu Yemen is able to take down several Dark Energy Hall soldiers. For someone who looks so dull like Ha Hu Gang, his daughter sure is that much more colorful. Looking at Ha Hu Yemen's beautiful techniques, Chin Ho mentions that it appears like an angel is punishing people from the skies, whereas Sang In is more taken in by the fact that the martial art being used is the legendary Jade Fist Arts. Seeing this, Sang In begins to laugh in joy as he realizes that the Dark Energy Hall group is slowly avoiding Ha Hu Yemen. I want everyone to comment Slay Queen because she sure is slaying a bunch of Dark Path soldiers. Meanwhile, the other three Sam Wang are also fighting. Zhou Mun using his fan is preoccupied with several soldiers, whereas Dan Guyan using the Drunken Arts knocks out several people at once. One real-life fighter that's mastered the Drunken Arts is John Jones, if you know you know. On the other hand, Ji Myung takes on Sei Chun. Swinging his sword in a careless yet calculated manner, he closes the distance between them. Seeing this beautiful display, even Sei Chun has to admit that the Mount Wa sect lives up to their reputation with the sword. However, he isn't the Dark Energy Hall master for nothing. Pulling out some throwing knives, Sei Chun throws them at Ji Myung. Noticing the knives, Jo Mun shouts and alerts Jiang Myung to be careful. As two knives come flying at Jiang Myung, he's able to evade one whilst blocking the other with his arm. Trying to close the gap, Jiang Myung runs forward. However, as he's getting closer, more and more knives are directed at him. Deflecting the knife using his sword, Jiang Myung skids below the following attack and manages to close the gap between himself and Sei Chun. Finally finding an opportunity, he tries to plunge the sword into Sei Chun's neck. However, as Sei Chung is caught by Jiang Myung's blade, he strikes him with a knife in the back. Feeling the burning sensation in his back, Jiang Myung grunts as he thinks that he should have just avoided the attack. Now back to our boy So Moon, who seems to be frustrated at the fact that Hyun Won Gang and Mok Se Hyuk keep deflecting his arrows. As time is of the essence, the longer the Blood Bow group lingers around, the more damage the Light Path soldiers take. Seeing this, So Moon finally decides to pull out his trump card. Even though he hasn't perfected it yet, he has no other choice but to do it. Drawing an empty bow, So Moon, using the formless firing technique, shoots a key arrow. Looking at this, Hyun Won Gang is surprised as he wonders why So Moon would fire an empty bow. Disheveled, Moxa Hyuk tells him that it's a shadowless force, but it's very powerful. Taking their stances, Hyun Won Gang compliments So Moon for pouring his key into arrow form and shooting it. However, to both of their surprise, as the key arrow nears them, it changes direction and goes right past them to shoot the blood bow archers. The two wonder how this is possible, while So Moon nervously smiles as he realizes that he managed to combine the formless firing technique and the key guided arrow despite it being too draining. Not taking any time to rest, So Moon immediately draws his bow for another attack of similar aptitude. However, as he's doing this, he realizes that the dark path is retreating, giving So Moon a cold stare. Nangak whispers to himself that next he'll be the one to take down So Moon along with the Blood Slasher Corps. Yeah right, this pissy pants already had the opportunity but ran away back then. Check out part 2 to see that. Now as the battle dust settles down, standing amongst heaps of dead bodies, Chi and Ho mentions that they've managed to hold up for now, but he's worried about the future. Standing next to him, Sang and mentions that if they face the Blood Slasher Corp right now then it will be their last battle. Walking up to his father, Jiam tells Sang and that their losses today were great, so it would be difficult to take on the Blood Slasher Corp right now. Frowning, Sang and tells Jiam that they must fight against injustice to the death, and that there is no other path but that. Now, as the Patient Palace Army is riding back to their headquarters, Se Yun asks Gok Jia why he stopped the Blood Slasher Corp from entering the battlefield and retreated. In response, Gok Jia tells him that it wouldn't be very easy for the Light Path forces to recover from the battle and chase them. However, if they had continued to fight, then their attention could have been drawn to the Patian Palace's base. A little frustrated, Se Yuan tells Gok Jia that their job is to direct the Nam Gung family's attention toward them. Gok Jia, in response, tells him that they've benefited enough already. Curious, 
Seguvman asks Gokja that it wasn't their purpose to attack in the first place was to capture the Nam Gung family. In response, Gokja tells him that whilst it would be nice to see the Nam Gung family's demise, it would mess up with the Patient Palace's leader's plans. So for just the time being, they all should simply be patient. Looking at Gokja suspiciously, Seguvman asks him, if he means to say that in order for the plan to succeed that he and the palace leader came up with, the rest of them should act as decoys. Hearing this, Gokja is immediately startled. Staring into his soul, Seguman asks him if there's something in the patient palace that's being hidden from him. Stuttering after hearing the truth come out of Seyun's mouth, Gokja blatantly lies and tells him that it isn't like that. Whispering into his ears, Gokja tells Seyun the next action to take. After getting a better view of the situation, Se Yun determinedly looks on as he mentions that they'll have to open up the retreat route. In response, Gokja mentions that once the Nam Gung family leaves, then the Patient Palace will properly attack from behind. What is this evil guy up to now? After the battle, as the family leaders sit together to discuss their position, Jia mentions that even though they won the battle, their losses were too great. Only 20 warriors from the Nam Gung family survived, so the Nam Gung family's existence is at stake. He further goes on to state that even though they won the fight is far from over yet. Sitting in his chair with a saddened expression on his face, Chien and Ho tells everyone that he also thinks that they can't beat the dark path. So they are only left with two choices, either to die fighting or back out for their future. Looking at Jiam, Chien and Ho mentions that he's here to assist the Nam Gung family, so whatever decision that the family leader takes, he'll follow that. Wish my friends were this loyal man. If I was ever getting beat up by bullies, they'd join in to beat me. Sad life. GM's younger brother, Nam Gung Ho Yang, recommends that they should back out. Even though it's a humiliating decision, it still gives them a chance to live and fight back. The only person with a brain in this series, as Jiam is walking through the palace halls, he's stopped by Chien Ho, who mentions that Sang Yen would never agree with backing away. Humiliated by his auctions, Jiam mentions that they'll just have to convince him somehow. On the other hand, so Moon resting under a tree thinks to himself that the world is made for the strong since most of the people that died were low-class warriors anyways. Walking up to So Moon, Jiyang Myung asks him what he's doing, happy to see his brother moving again. So Moon asks Jiyang Myung about his condition. However, being the macho man he is, Jiyang Myung tells So Moon that it's nothing when compared to taking on Se Chung. Walking up to them, Jo Mun humbles Jiang Myung as he questions how sloppy would one have to be to get stabbed in the back. Pouting, Jiang Myung replies that it was because he fought he ended up with only two injuries. However, if it was Jo Mun, then he'd probably end up with more wounds. Now directing his attention towards pulling So Moon's leg, Jo Mun in a teasing tone tells him that Nam Gung Hai was asking about him with so much fear in her eyes. Nam Gung is cute. I think she'd make a good match with So Moon. Trying not to meet Jo Mun's eyes. So Moon looks away and tells him to stop joking around. However, Jo Mun in response tells him that he isn't joking around since he's an expert in female psychology. Andrew Tate's theme intensifies. Hearing this, Jiang Byung mentions that he also thought Nam Gung Hai had fallen for So Moon, but how troublesome it is since So Moon's bride is in the Dang family. Giving Jiang Myung the bombastic side eye, Jo Mun tells him that's not all. Surprised, Jiang Myung asks if there is someone else. Now giving the criminal offensive side eye, Jo Mun tells Jiang Myung that his younger sister, Wak Yang, was also very curious about So Moon. I swear Jo Mun is the guy that insinuates fights. Angry to hear what sounds nonsense to So Moon, he asks them both to stop saying things that even a dog wouldn't believe. Since how could a girl that tried to eat him alive also like him? As So Moon is frustratedly pouting over this thought, Jiu Myung mentions that So Moon has to admit that the torment and pressure a guy feels from a younger sister can't be explained. Not getting the point, So Moon asks Jiu Myung if his sister has tried to strangle him in every way. Having heard enough, Jiu Myung laughs as he jumps on top of So Moon and asks him to stop. Now as Jiu goes to present his options to Sang In, he shouts in fury as he tells his son that he's chosen this place to be his grave. He mentions that the people of Gango call him Jiu Song Sang In for a reason and he was the 21st Nam Gung leader before his son. He further goes on to use the popular saying that even a pirate would drown his own ship if it was sinking. So if someone like a pirate does that, then there's no way he'll abandon his family, but rather continue his fate fighting. Burdened by the role of the family leader, Jiam bows down and tells his father that it's his duty to carry the humiliation as the family leader. In response, sang -in tells his son that he's correct, and that's why he'll remain here whilst his son can go. Hearing this, an injured Jin rushes to his grandfather and in a begging tone asks him not to do such a thing. 
since if they endure the humiliation then greater glory will follow, having taken his decision. Sangin replies that it's simply impossible for him to do. Hearing his reply, Jin Ah in a determined yet respectful tone tells his grandfather that he'll also remain here if that is going to be the case. However, Sang In, in response, tells Jin Ah that he's the future leader of the family, so he must leave. Crying Jin Ah tells his grandfather that he's the very symbol of the Namgong family. Wherever he and Jian go, the Namgong family goes. A building can always be rebuilt. However, if his grandfather dies, then it's the end of the Namgong family. Breaking down into tears, Jin and Ah ask his grandfather if his father will leave without him. Pursuing this tactic of persuasion, Jin Ah tells his grandfather that it's an obligation for him to teach martial arts to him. And if he's not around then who will teach him the different kinds of sword arts? Taking a deep breath, Sang and sighs as he mentions that he has no choice. Looking at GM and Jin Ah, he tells him that they'll have to pay for this humiliation ten times. Just then, Chi and Ho walks into the halls and tells Sang to have a drink before they set out. Seeing Xi and Ho, Sang In looks at him and asks if he's responsible for bringing Jin Ah here. Grinning, Xi and Ho tells Sang In that he'd have remained stubborn otherwise. If that were the case, then Jin Ah would have had to prepare for his grandfather's funeral, and Xi and Ho would have never gotten a meal from Sang In. Now back in the open field with So Moon and his brothers, Jia Myung asks So Moon that while his sister has been rough with him, he was pretty rough with her too, wasn't he? In response, So Moon tells him that of course he was since he needs to be true to himself and say whatever he feels like in response. Smiling, Jia Myung tells So Moon that as a man isn't it his responsibility that he shows some generosity? Poor men, we are never right. Pouting So Moon responds with a quote from Confucius, saying that it's hard to deal with women and petty people. These are some traits that Guak Yong happens to have. Walking past, Gu Yang Poom catches the brothers conversing, laughing. He asks them how they are so loud even after a battle. Bummed out at Gu Yang Pung's sight, So Moon tells him that he's got nothing to do with this. Laughing Zhou Mun tells Gu Yang Pung that they were talking about how So Moon is a ladies' man. Looking at So Moon with judgment, Gu Yang Pung asks him how he could look at other women when he's getting married. Shouting, So Moon asks Gu Yang Pung who's looking at other women. Responding to So Moon, Gu Yang Pung tells him that being popular with the girls must mean he's pulling some tricks. Lecturing So Moon, Hu Yang Poom tells him that he was once young too, so he understands this feeling. However, a man shouldn't seduce multiple women. Shaking his head in disappointment, Hu Yang Poom looks at So Moon and wonders how unfortunate those girls are, since what do they even see in a man who only screams at the elderly? Having his brain short circuit, So Moon tells Gu Yang Poom that it's all because everyone keeps on making up things that aren't real. Now moving on to a serious note. Gu Yang Poon tells So Moon that when he watched him fight, he realized how amazing his archery and agility techniques were. However, he lacked the basics of martial arts. Being humble for once, Gu Yang Poon tells him that he doesn't know much but he'd like to supplement So Moon's lacking area. Well, for the first time in this entire story, Gu Yang Poon has proven to be useful. Sitting aside, Jia Myung tells Gu Yang Poon that it's true that So Moon lacks the basics since he didn't even know the sound transmission technique. So Moon tells him that he won't need such techniques since he's already powerful without them. Listening to So Moon's ignorant words, Gu Yang Poon explains to him that if first class chef's best dish is plain noodles, since noodles are the foundation of cooking, whoever can make the best of them becomes a master chef. Hence, similar to martial arts, if you want to progress, then you have to become strong with the basics. Finally, getting Gu Yang Poon's point, So Moon realizes that he can't use a bow forever, nor can he simply run around trying to catch rabbits using the family treasure sword. Upon giving Gu Yang Poon's words some more thought, So Moon realizes during his battle with Mumu he won because his movement technique and inner key were stronger. Still, he was still suppressed by his fist guided technique. If he had known the basics back then, that he wouldn't have backed down so easily. Gu Yang Poon then asks So Moon what he'd like to learn first. In response, So Moon tells him that he'd like to know about the sword arts. Hearing this, Gu Yang Poon asks So Moon if he's practiced sword arts. Upon getting a confirmation, he asks him if he can emit key from his sword. After hearing a positive response, Gu Yang Poon mentions that it means that So Mu's skills are already at the level of a master, which is absurd considering he has zero knowledge of theory. Giving a nod of approval, he tells So Moon that even with his inner key and the basics, he'll still produce tremendous force. So firstly, he must learn three techniques. Gu Yang Poon then tells So Moon that there are three basic techniques. One, total annihilation a form that is used to attack and block left and right. 2. 
pressure of Mount Tai used for upward and downward attack and thirdly, eight directions of wind and rain, used to attack and block from all directions. After giving So Moon the brief information, Yu Yang Pung asks him to master these three, and no one would approach him anymore. Looking at this, both Jia Myung and Jo Mun laugh as they think to themselves that this is something even a kid would know. Holding a stick, Gu Yang Pung begins to give So Moon a practical demonstration. Swinging his stick left and right, he states it to be total annihilation. Then swinging his sword upwards and downwards for the pressure of Mount Tai. Following Gu Yang Pung's shadow, So Moon first imitates total annihilation and then the pressure of Mount Tai. However, without even being directed for the eight direction of wind and rain, So Moon is able to beautifully display the technique. Looking at So Moon's beautiful sword display, both Jia Myung and Jo Mun are left in total awe as they claim that So Moon's form looks like art. Now in the darkness of the night, we finally see the Nam Gung family members moving. Riding alongside his father, Jin Ah asks, wouldn't it be better if they had traveled to Hubei by ship and then crossed Dongting Lake? In response, his father tells him that the Peichin Palace would have considered that path, so they took the mountain path. Hearing this, Jin understands and tells his father that because of their dire situation, he forgot to consider the possibility of an ambush. His father then states that by now the Peichin Palace must have already realized that they've left and might be pursuing them. Learning this, Jin asks his father if he should reinforce the rear guard. His father tells him that they'll be prioritizing speed instead and heading north by northwest to Guryang Mountain. Since the Guryang Mountain spreads both east and west, it has several turns and corners making it a perfect place to set up an ambush. Hearing this, Jinna asks if they'll be luring the Patient Palace into an ambush. In response, his father tells him that even though they are abandoning the palace, they can still get revenge for the humiliation they caused them. Meanwhile, Back at the Patient Family Hall, Se Yoon is informed by Se Chum that the Nam Gung family have fled the palace at midnight and are headed north northwest. Hearing this, Se Yoon mentions that Gokja had expected the Nam Gung to take the mountain path instead of traveling by the lake. Pointing to the map, Se Yoon mentions that they must be around somewhere here if they left at midnight. He mentions that if they go after them in this instance, then they could catch them at Baipa Mountain. However, there's no need for the pursuit group to hastily fight. The surrounding leaders tell Se Yoon that they could get away from the pursuit group this way. However, Se Yoon begins laughing and tells them that the Nam Gung family is nothing but a beast caught in a trap, since they are bound to be caught. Once again pointing to the map, Se Yoon tells his underlings that the Nam Gung family avoided Daunting Lake to pass Guryang Mountain. However, to recover their wounded pride, they will definitely set up an ambush at the mountain. The underlings tell Se Yoon that it will be dangerous to pursue them then, and alternatively, they won't have a choice but to suffer their attack either. Grinning with his teeth out, Se Yoon asks his underlings not to worry since the Patient Palace's military and the Blood Slasher Corp will be arriving at the mountain first and waiting for the Nam Gung family instead. So all the Patient Palace has to do is pursue and make them believe that they are being baited. Well, the Nam Gung family is totally screwed. Now as the Nam Gung family is heading to the Gurion Mountain at full speed, they are convinced that the Patient Palace is following them with caution. Meanwhile, Nangak heading towards the mountain receives a message that the advanced group from the Blood Slasher Corpse has reached the Gurion Mountain already. Nangak asks if they set up the forces in suitable areas. After getting confirmation from his henchmen, Nangak decides to hurry and set up his own forces on the mountain. As he rides his course, Nangak is overtaken by thoughts about So Moon as he realizes that he was the same guy that shot the arrow at Mount Sung. As Nangak is riding in pursuit of the Nam Gung family, he wonders if the Patient Palace's leader is still alive. However, trying to save himself from the guilt, he tells himself that something like that simply isn't possible. On the odd chance that he's still alive, then the subordinates that are still loyal to him cannot find the truth no matter what. Putting these thoughts aside and focusing on the matter at hand, Nangak calms himself by acknowledging that once Guryang Mountain becomes the grave of the Light Path, then there will be nothing to worry about any longer. Meanwhile, Jian Myung on the other side mentions that something seems weird. Bewildered, Jo Mun asks him what is so weird. In response, Jian Myung tells him that even though they're running away from them, the way they are chasing after the Nam Gung family feels a little too convenient. Still not getting the point, Jo Mun asks why it's suspicious. In response, Jia Myung tells him that it feels like the Patient Palace isn't being persistent enough. Calming down Jia Myung's impulse, Jo Mun tells him that the pursuers always have more freedom than the pursued. Well, famous last words. Riding up to So Moon, Jia Myung asks him why he's so absent-minded. 
So Moon tells him that he's been thinking about the sound transmission and sword arts from earlier. Happy to hear that, Jia Myung asks So Moon how it is going. So Moon asks him if he'd like to try hearing him. Now using the sound transmission. So Moon asks Jia Myung how it is, and if Jia Myung can hear him properly. Stop it So Moon, because it seems he can hear you a little too well. Covering his ears, Jia Myung cries out and asks So Moon to stop it. Unaware of his mistake, So Moon innocently asks what's wrong. Disarrayed by So Moon's attempt, Jia Myung tells him to quiet down his sound transmission. Since if people sent sound transmissions this loud then, no one would have their heads intact. Teaching So Moon, Jia Myung explains that one has to control the volume of the sound transmission using their inner key. As Jia Myung is explaining So Moon, he once again sends another loud transmission. Covering his ears, Jia Myung asks him to lower them down until So Moon reaches the perfect level. Having taken this lesson, So Moon realizes that something like this also requires control. Seeing this as a useful technique, So Moon asks his first smart question of the series Can this sort of martial art be used to send an extremely loud sound transmission or continuously send sound transmissions? Hearing this, Jia Myung begins to sweat profusely as he worries if he'll be the test subject for this experiment. Turning to So Moon, Jia Myung asks him if he's joking. Invading the conversation, Dan Gaiman asks Jia Myung if it really looks like So Moon is joking looking at his expression. Baffled, So Moon asks if he's wrong. A little furious, Jia Myung asks what kind of a question is that since who would use such a cheap trick such as this, even if there was such a martial art? Further explaining his claim, Jia Myung tells So Moon that such a martial art doesn't exist because one can simply block the transmission using their key. So in the end, it was a useless thought. So there's no need to attempt something like that. Come on now, give my boy So Moon an A plus for effort, please. Pouting So Moon wonders when martial arts decide what is right or wrong. Pitching in, Jo Mun tells So Moon that there aren't any martial arts that use a loud sound transmission, but there are some that use sonic waves. The technique works by pouring key into sound, and once those sound techniques hit the opponent, it disrupts their inner key, creating a ringing sound in their head, making them lose strength. To give one example, Joe Mun tells So Moon of Gu Yang Pung's famous world domination roar. It's known to have a tremendous force. However, in the light path, the lion roar is often used to stabilize one's mind after being hit by sorcery or sonic attack. Excited to hear about all these new techniques, so Moon asks Jo Mun if he knows how to use Lion's Roar. Looking at So Moon from a distance, Nam Gung Sumi asks her sister Hai what she finds so appealing about So Moon since his looks are unappealing and he's clumsy. Well, that's because he's the Rizzler, and you better watch out because he might just come for you too. Ignoring her sister's stupid questions, Hai chooses to remain silent. Pitching in, the third sister Su Yevon asks Sumi to leave it. Now as the Nam Gung family reach the Guryeon Mountain, they realize that the enemy has already lined up its forces there. Cornered from all sides, the Habei Peng clan elder mentions that if the pursuit group attacks them from behind, then they'll have no means of escaping. Looking at his brother, Jiam asks him if they'll be able to break through. The brother in response tells Jiam that the path is tight and narrow, so only a few people will be able to get through whilst the rest will be slaughtered. However, Guak Muang mentions that if they don't break through, then pursuit group will slaughter them here. Unable to think of any other option, the Nam Gung brothers bow down to Elder An Wang Chien Ho and Elder Jiam Siang Sang In and ask them to lead the troops from the front, so they can use their overwhelming power to clear a path. Agreeing to their request, both Chien Ho and Sang In walk into the line of fire. Seeing the two walk intimidatingly toward himself, Nangak is awed to see such an overwhelming aura from just two individuals. As the two walk up to the enemies, Sang In asks Chien Ho how long it has been since they fought together. In response, Xuan Ho tells him that it's been decades, scared of the duo's intimidating aura. One of the soldiers asks them to stop, but being the badass he is, Sangin tells them that he doesn't intend to stop. However, if there's someone who wishes to stop him, then he can try. Hearing this, two Dark Path soldiers simultaneously attack Sangin. In one clean strike, Sangin cuts through both of them. Meanwhile, Xuan Ho, surrounded by enemies, shoots several key blasts while saying that he'll have to be a little rough since they are short on time. Signaling to the Blood Shadow Corps, Nangak orders them to go all out on the rest of the Nam Gung family troops. Passionate to try his new sword arts, So Moon asks the soldiers to come at him so he can give them a taste of his new sword arts. As several soldiers surround So Moon, he uses total annihilation to take care of those left and right of him. Then using the pressure of Mount Tai, So Moon brings his sword downwards at several soldiers. 
As several soldiers succumb to Samud's attack, they mention his attacks being poor and basic, but too strong. At last, using the eight directions of wind and rain, Samud kills all the enemies in front of him. Seeing this, Dan Gaia mentions that So Moon is pressuring the enemy to back away with such basic techniques. Jiu Myung tells Dan Gyeon that while it may be basic, it's simply too fast and strong for the enemy. Not giving the rest of the Nam Gung troops any chance to stand still, several Blood Shadow Courts come running at the remaining Light Path members. Running rampant on the battlefield, Kwak Myung takes on several Blood Shadow Courts members. On the other hand, Sangin continues to cut down his enemies. Interrupting his sword dance, Chien Ho asks him to stand aside and collect his inner key. He uses one of his strongest techniques, Heaven's Downpour. Following that several key blasts fly the Blood Shadow Court at once, finally opening a path for the Nam Gun family. As the path is cleared, all the Light Path troops run to escape a gruesome death. Just then the pursuit party also arrives, seeing Hyun Wan gang riding at him at full speed. So Moon thinks to himself that at this rate they won't be able to run. As he and Wan Gang's troops charge at So Moon, they yell that they should trample So Moon, as he's the gifted archer of Light Path. Using his formless firing technique and multi shot, So Moon fires multiple key arrows, taking down the enemy's frontline soldiers. Taking on multiple casualties, He and Wan Gang asks his troops to halt. Just then, So Moon is called on by Joe Mun, who asks him to hurry up. Looking behind, So Moon realizes that he was the only one left. Seeing So Moon standing all alone, all of the Blood Shadow Corp try to take his head to avenge their fallen brothers. Not giving up that easily, So Moon begins to run away. In attempts to stop So Moon, the Blood Shadow Corp shoots several arrows, but So Moon is easily able to dodge all of them. At last, So Moon reaches the escape path where two of the Nam Gung brothers are waiting for him. As So Moon runs past them, he asks if they are going to come. However, the two mention that they'll be staying behind in hopes of delaying their reach to the light path. Looking at each other, the two brothers smile as they mention how amazing it would be for the two of them to die together protecting the honor of their family. Meanwhile, So Moon catching up to Jiang Myung tells him that this isn't right. Not understanding So Moon, Jiang Myung asks what isn't right. In response, So Moon says that using two people as bait whilst they turn their tails and flee isn't something okay. Angry at hearing this, Jiang Myung asks So Moon not to use such words for their divine sacrifice. Equally angry, So Moon asks Jiang Myung what he means by sacrifice, since whether they live or die, they do it all together, not being able to live with the guilt. So Moon decides to run back to the Nam Gung brother's aid. As So Yoon walks to the escape path, he asks who the two people standing in front of him are. Jiam introduces himself as Nam Gung family's leader, whereas his younger brother introduces himself as Nam Gung Ho Myung. After introducing himself, So Yuan asks the two to open up the path. Prepared for death, Jiang tells him that the path will open up by itself after their death. Intervening in the convo, Gokja comes up to Se Yuan and tells him that if they wait any longer, then it might become impossible for Patient Palace to catch up to the light path. Looking back at Gokja, Se Yuan asks him to be patient as he believes that respect should be shown even on the battlefield. Acting like a little kid about to pee his pants, Gokja tells the superior elder that it's quite urgent. Calming him down like a kid, Se Yuan asks Hyun Wan Gang and Mok Se Hyuk to open up the path. Obeying their elders' command, both Mok Se Hyuk and Hyun Wan Gang walk up to the two Nam Gun brothers and give a brief introduction of themselves. Unsheathing his sword, Mok Se Hyuk tells the brother that since they have to clear the path, they shouldn't rebuke the Dark Path leaders for being too rough. Smiling, Jiam thinks to himself that these two will be learning something from him. Unable to do anything, standing on the sidelines, Gokja grunts as he finds it frustrating to see all these generals paying respect rather than pursuing the light path as it's a much more important thing to do. Going after Jiam, Han Wan Gang tries to take him down in one clean strike. Jiam also shows that he isn't the Nam Gung family leader for nothing, since he barely evades the deadly attack, making some space in between himself and Han Wan Gang. Jiam thinks that if he had been even a second off in his timing, then Hyun Wan Gang's sword staff would have hit him. On the other hand, seeing Jiam's defensive ability, Hyun Wan Gang wonders how strong Sang is if his son is at this level. Meanwhile, Mok Se Hyuk happens to be easily overtaking Ho Myun. Analyzing the situation, Se Yuan predicts that Warrior Mok will easily come out victorious. The same can't be said about Hyun Wan Gang versus Jiam as the odds seem to be 50 50. Suddenly, Se Yuan sees a peculiar sight when he finds Jiam taking a stance to unleash the Emperor's sword arts. Despite having mastered only the sixth stage, Jiam decides to gamble it all in hopes of winning. 
Taking notice of the change in GM's key and the atmosphere around him, he and Wan Gang is quick to realize that his opponent is trying to use a different martial art. Panicking, he and Wan Gang tells himself that this isn't going to be good, putting all of his power into one single attack. Second stance, Emperor's Heaven. Jiyoung shoots a powerful key blast from his sword. Acknowledging the strike's terrifying power, Hyun Won Gang mentions that it's truly terrifying. However, it's still not on the level of Yanlu Wang Sword Art's third step, Yanlu Separation. As the two kids collide, Hyun Won Gang is able to cut through Jiyoung's attack, rendering him powerless and weaponless. Falling onto his knees with the acceptance of humiliating defeat, Jiyoung asks Hyun Won Gang to kill him and reunite him with his brother. As Hyun Won Gang raises his blade to kill Jiyoung, he cries whilst calling out to his father and son to protect the Nam Gung family. Just then, a formless arrow comes flying at Hyun Won Gang. In an attempt to cut through the key, he brings down his sword staff. However, the key arrow changes direction at the last moment and strikes him right in the gut. As Hyun Won Gang curses himself for getting injured, our boy So Moon walks towards the Patian Palace troop all alone. And he does all this whilst looking like a badass. When did Bowblade Spirit turn to solo leveling in medieval times, I wonder? Holding Hyun Won Gang, Mok Se Hyuk takes notice of So Moon and the two give a glare to each other. Walking up to Jiyum, So Moon asks him if he's alright. Too disoriented, Jiyum asks So Moon why he'd come to his burial ground. Putting those thoughts aside, So Moon tells Jiyum that he'll be carrying him on his back. As Jiyum gets a piggyback ride from So Moon, several soldiers of the Dark Path surround So Moon, and Mok Se Hyuk asks him if he really thinks that he'll be able to escape. Famous last words, I'm telling you guys. Laughing. So Moon tells him that if the dark path opened up a way for them, they'd be able to cross easily. Hearing this, Jiyum thinks to himself about how So Moon is so calm despite being surrounded by such powerful enemies that even Sangin wouldn't be able to take on. In response, Moksa Hyuk coldly tells So Moon that they won't be able to open up the path for him. Swinging his sword, So Moon tells him that he'll just open up the path himself then. Talk about having confidence. Hearing this, Mok Se Hyuk asks the surrounding members to attack So Moon. As the soldiers attack So Moon, he uses total annihilation. Seeing So Moon in action, Mangak is horrified to see his sword key. As more soldiers close in, So Moon once again uses total annihilation. Seeing this, both Gok Ja and Se Yoon are horrified as they realize that these are moves even beggars can use. The amount of key that is oozing out of the attacks is insane. As more and more soldiers charge So Moon, he leaps into the air and uses the pressure of the Mount Tai technique. Caught in So Moon's overflowing key, several soldiers fall down. Furious at the Blood Slasher Crop's performance, Nangak asks them to attack simultaneously rather than individually. That is also to no avail since So Moon successfully uses the eight directions of wind and rain. Despite their best attempts to dodge So Moon's attack, all of the charging soldiers are killed by it. Looking at this onslaught from the side, both Mok Se Hyuk and Nangak are left shocked to their core. Mok Se Hyuk mentions that while the eight directions of wind and rain sound like a useful technique to help block attacks from all directions, in reality, it's just a poor martial art technique. Grinding his teeth, Nangak wonders how something like this is possible since the Blood Slasher Corp, which is said to silence even a crying baby, is so helpless before a poorly executed technique. Frustrated. Nangak yells that this is a humiliation of the Blood Slasher course. Dashing towards So Moon, Nangak tells him to take on the leader of the Blood Shadow course. Meanwhile, the trio of three brothers resting on a mountain cliff wonders if So Moon is going to be alright. Dankion is the first to mention that perhaps they should have stopped So Moon. However, Jomun argues if they even had a chance to do that since they were all running. Standing anxiously, Jiam Myeon mentions that So Moon was right as dying while fighting would have been better. Cursing at the situation, Dan Gayan mentions that nothing can be done now since the time has already passed. Pitching in, Jo Mun tells the rest of his brothers that there's no one to blame here. As So Moon is carrying Jiyum, both Mok Se Hyuk and Nangak attack, blocking their attacks with one hand. So Moon thinks to himself that fighting experts isn't very easy. Smiling whilst looking at So Moon, Mok Se Hyuk mentions that So Moon is extremely awesome. Meanwhile, Mangak also admires So Moon's capabilities as he realizes that despite using Sword Key for half an hour, So Moon's strength hasn't diminished even a bit. He further goes on to think to himself that he never would have imagined the Light Path Coalition having such a monster. Nangak and Mok Se Hyuk are lost in their thoughts. So Moon uses the pressure of Mount Tai and the Total Annihilation technique in order to clear a path, as several soldiers are flown away by the sheer force of So Moon's key. 
So Yum, in a terrified reaction, thinks to himself how amazing So Moon is, since it seemed that he was a gifted archer. However, it seems like his sword skills aren't too far from his archery either. Frustrated at the unexpected chain of events, Gokja tells So Yoon that they won't be able to chase the light path anymore, so it's a must that they at least capture So Moon. Looking at So Moon battling everyone, So Yoon asks Gokja if he really thinks that So Moon will be captured, since it's already been half an hour and even the great So Yoon can't use the sword key for that long. Furthermore, So Moon's also holding Mam Gung Jiam on his back, giving himself a handicap. Does it seem like such a brilliant martial artist will be caught? Now back on the battlefield with So Moon, as he realizes that the longer this fight drags on, the more dangerous it will get. So gambling on one move, So Moon decides to take a risk and go straight for Moxa Hyuk. Dashing towards him at supersonic speed, So Moon uses the first step of the peerless triple unity blade. Catching a glimpse of So Moon at the last second, Moxa Hyuk swings his sword and thinks to himself that he's blocked So Moon's attack. However, as his neck starts to bleed, Moxa Hyuk realizes that he's been hit after all. Baffled, Moxa Hyuk wonders when he got hit since he's sure that he had blocked the attack. As he begins to breathe his last breaths, he realizes that So Moon used a sword art that he was unaware of. As Moxa Hyuk falls to the ground, he asks So Moon what sword art he's dying for. In response, So Moon tells him that it's his family's sword art, the peerless triple unity blade, the first stance thoughtless blade. While Moxa Hyuk breathes his final breath, he mentions that the attack was like a sword with no soul, just like the name suggests he couldn't feel its presence. Before dying, he mentions that he has no regrets about dying to such a beautiful sword art. Well, at least my guy didn't have any regrets. But then again, the living do have more regrets than the dead. Manga Otaku dropping wisdom just like that. You gotta subscribe after hearing that. Seeing his warrior's death, so Yoon drawing out his sword runs towards So Moon and leaps in for an attack. Clashing his sword with Se Yoon. So Moon blocks it with ease and both are pushed back due to the sheer force generated by the swords. Watching this from the sidelines, Nangak mentions that if the light path has Sang and then they too have Se Yoon. Enraged, Se Yoon shouts at So Moon and asks him how long he'll be avoiding his attacks. Continuously dodging Se Yoon's attack, So Moon also begins to realize that he's weakening due to his key running out. However, this won't be solved by running away, pointing his sword towards Se Yoon. So Moon decides that since the fight has come to this, he should go all out. Meanwhile, Se Yoon walking towards So Moon with an overwhelming aura asks him that, seeing as how So Moon's only evading. Is it because he's given up or will he continue to fight? Just then, So Yoon uses his sword blast and fires it in So Moon's direction. Seeing the attack coming towards him, so Moon realizes that this attack can only be blocked using the peerless triple unity blade. For that, he'll need a tremendous amount of ki. Using the peerless triple unity blade, second stance loveless blade, So Moon also fires a sword blast. As the two kiss collide, So Yoon is the first to stagger and be pushed back by So Moon's overwhelming power. Exhausted as So Yoon is processing this, So Moon in a flash comes for his head. Using his years of experience, So Yoon also at the last second swings his sword. Thus, both warriors are injured, as Se Yuman bleeds through his chest. So Moon is cut through his gut, realizing he can't fight with an injury. So Moon uses the opportunity to run away, whereas Se Yuan holding his chest thinks to himself that even though he was prepared for death, he never thought his end would come like this. Seeing through So Moon's poker face, Gokja asks all of the blood slasher cork to chase So Moon and bring his head as he's injured too. Meanwhile, Nangak and the rest run to Se Yoon's aid to treat his injuries. Now deep within the forest, So Moon also begins to feel dizzy as he's losing a lot of blood. As he's taking a moment's rest, several soldiers of the Blood Shadow Corps find him. As they try to attack So Moon, he thinks to himself that he has no strength left and his ki is depleted. However, he still can't give up. Firing up himself once more, So Moon cuts down multiple enemies chasing after him. As So Moon's wounds catch up to him, even holding the sword becomes hard for him. Capitalizing on So Moon's weakness, the Blood Shadow Court once again attacks. So Moon barely manages to block that attack and create room between himself and the Blood Slasher Corp. Breathing heavily, So Moon tells the Blood Slasher Corp that he acknowledges their stubbornness. He further goes on to tell them that he's not afraid of death. Dying before being able to get married is just too depressing. Just then, So Moon realizes that before he dies, he wants to at least see the face of his bride. As this realization hits So Moon, he begins to maniacally laugh, scared of his hysterical laughter. The Blood Shadow Corp mentioned that it seems like So Moon has gone crazy from fear. 
As So Moon continues to laugh, the Blood Slasher corpse tells him that they should find out if this laughter will continue, when his head will be detached from his body. Damn, chill out, man. Just then, appearing out of the forest mist, Gu Yang Pung appears and asks So Moon if he still isn't done. Seeing Gu Yang Pung, So Moon asks him why he come here since his body isn't well. In response, Gu Yang Pung tells So Moon that since he didn't return for a while, he came back to check on So Moon. Looking at the blood slasher corp with pure bloodlust in his eyes, So Moon asks Gu Yang Pung to get out of there, he doesn't want his bones to get smashed. Gu Yang Pung in response asks So Moon if the blood slasher corps would raise their swords against an old man, no matter how rude they may be. To answer Gu Yang's question, So Moon tells him that these people simply don't care about such stuff. Looking towards the blood slasher corps, Gu Yang Pung asks So Moon what they would gain by killing an old man such as himself. Putting this nonsensical argument aside, So Moon asks Gu Yang Pung to carry the family leader back to safety. Gu Yang Pung tells So Moon that it's difficult for him to carry Yun himself around. In response, So Moon tells him that his injuries are so severe that even standing up for him is difficult. But being the stubborn guy he is, Gu Yang tells So Moon to take responsibility till the end since he made it this far. He then asks So Moon to go on ahead, as he will reason with the Blood Shadow Corpse. Pointing towards Gu Yang Pung, one of the Blood Shadow Corps members asks him what he's planning and orders the rest of his soldiers to attack him even if he's an old man. Meanwhile, at the Yangtze River Estuary, the Light Path troops sit down and pay their respects to the Fallen. Huang Bo Chianak mentions that when they came, they had a hundred men. Now, no one from their sect is left. Huang Bo Chianak then goes on to mention that the forces gathered at the Nam Gung family palace were still exceptional. Walking up to his father, Wang Bojang also mentions that all of the beggars' sect forces have been annihilated except for Dan Gion and their leader Gu Yuk Gai. Furthermore, the Shaolin and Mudang factions also lost most of their forces, leaving behind only two young disciples. As Wang Bojang is mentioning these statistics, he then wonders how Sun Moon is doing. In response, his father tells him that whilst his chivalry was excellent, it would be difficult to get out of that situation alive. Now talking to the other leaders, Wak Muang mentions that they are still not completely safe as they haven't crossed the river, so they should hurry to board a ship and leave. Shigen Ho mentions that they should wait a little longer. Just then, Jiang Miang mentions that he still hasn't seen So Moon's grandfather. Let me just clarify he's referring to Gu Yang Pung, as they know him to be going. Pitching in, Jiao Mun answers that perhaps he quietly went to So Moon's help. Looking in the forest's direction, Jiang Miang mentions that he hopes So Moon and his grandfather are safe. Just then, Jo Mun tells his two brothers that they should head for the port as he'll stay here waiting for So Moon. Hearing that, Dan Gion also mentions that he'll be staying, seeing as how two of his brothers are going to be staying behind. Jian Myung decides that he'll also stay behind with them. Holding Jian Myung by the shoulder, Jo Mun tells him that he and Dan Gion should go. Angered by this, Jian Myung tells Jo Mun that if one stays then, they all should stay together. Just then, Dan Gaiyan breaks into laughter as he points in the direction of the forest. As Zhou Mun and Jian Miang look in that direction, their faces light up seeing their fourth brother alive. As So Mu is walking back with Hu Yang Pung, he asks him for help since he's too injured. Hu Yang Pung asks So Mu to stop making a fuss, completely serious about the matter. So Moon asks Gu Yang if he's going to continue goofing around and not help. Gu Yang tells him that he already saved his life by evading the attacks of the Blood Slasher corpse and riling them up thus giving So Moon more opening to attack. Furthermore, Gu Yang tells So Moon not to downplay his contributions. So Moon asks him what contributions, since all of this is happening because of the patient palace. Sweating profusely, Gu Yang Pung answers So Moon and tells him that it's all because he was betrayed. Furious, So Moon asks Gu Yang Pung what's so prideful about being betrayed that he's screaming about it. Looking at So Moon with complacent eyes, Gu Yang Pung tells him that he can't console him for being betrayed, and then he goes a step further by insulting him. Still angry, So Mu tells Gu Yang Pung that it's because he couldn't control him properly. Pouting, Gu Yang Pung tells So Moon that his life was saved because of him. Barely walking, So Moon replies that if that were the case, then he saved him first. While smiling, Gu Yang Pung looks at So Moon and tells him that it means they have both paid their debts to each other. Just then, Dan Gion and Zhou Mun come running at So Moon whilst calling out his name. Walk him up to So Moon, Stangin thanks him and tells him that he didn't think it was possible that any of those who remained behind would return alive. Resting on Dan Guyan's shoulder, 
So Moon tells Sang that the family leader sustained some injuries but he'll live. However, by the time he got there, the younger Nam Gung brother had already died. Saying that So Moon finally falls unconscious in his brother's arms. As So Moon's eyelids open, he finds himself in an unfamiliar place and in an anxious voice asks where he is. As he sits up straight, he finds himself covered in bandages with his hair untied. So Moon has to tell me what shampoo he uses because his hair is drop dead gorgeous. Just then, So Moon finds Nam Gung Hai sitting next to his bed sleeping. As So Moon notices her, he wonders who she is. Just then, Jo Mun and Dan Gayen come into the room and ask So Moon how he's feeling. Clothing himself, So Moon tells that he's fine and questions where he is. In response, Dan Gayen tells him that they are at the Zug family palace and it's been two days since they arrived. A bit lost, So Moon asks two days. Just then, Miss Nam Gong Hai wakes up from her slumber and sees that So Moon has woken. Bowing her head, she gracefully thanks So Moon for saving her father's life and tells him to rest well as she'll see him later. As Hai takes her leave, both Dan Gion and Jo Mun break into laughter. Curious and annoyed, So Moon asks them what's so funny. In response, Jo Mun tells So Moon that Miss Nam Gong has been looking after him for the last two days. Hearing this, So Moon has a worried look on his face. Just then, Dan Gayan pitches in and tells So Moon that it's amazing devotion since you'd see this kind of devotion when nursing someone you love. Pointing at Dan Gion, So Moon asks him if he's trying to ruin his chances of getting married to Soe. Hearing this, Jo Mun interrupts the conversation and asks So Moon why he keeps on rejecting a girl that likes him. Furious, So Moon asks Jo Mun why he keeps on spouting nonsense and why he thinks that she likes So Moon. A little amazed at So Moon's question, Jo Mun asks So Moon if he can't tell by Hai's behavior. Despite the fact that So Moon is already her family's savior, if she didn't have any feelings, then she wouldn't have cared so much either. Tying up his hair, So Moon angrily tells Jo Mun that at this rate there will be misunderstandings. Now at 100% strength, So Moon visits Chi and Ho. After the two ask each other about their health, So Moon tells Chi and Ho that he'd like to go to Sichuan right now as he has completely recovered. Curious, Chi and Ho asks So Moon why he'd like to go to Sichuan since all the elders and the chosen soldiers along with So Moon's bride, Sylvie will be arriving at the Zoo Palace anyways. In response, So Moon tells him that in his homeland, Zhao Xian, the man goes to his in-laws to greet the bride. After requesting permission, So Moon tells the elders that he's heard of a ship going to Sichuan. So as long as they grant permission, he'll leave as soon as possible. Just as So Moon gets the permission and is on his way to greet Sangin. So Moon is met by Hai who asks him if he's really going to leave for Sichuan tomorrow. In response, So Moon tells her that it's the truth since it's already been a year since he left his home to meet with his bride. So he must hurry back. So Moon further goes on to mention that his heart is racing at the thought of seeing his bride. Sharing this thought with Hai, So Moon takes his leave to see the elders, blushing and flustered. Hai turns away with despair in her eyes and thinks to herself what she was thinking. Man, So Moon is loyal. I'd have folded the moment Hai showed me some attention. As So Moon leaves the palace halls, he thinks to himself that it should be enough for Hai to stop liking him. The next morning at the port, Gu Yang Pung tells So Moon that they'll be parting ways here and asks So Moon if he's sad. So Moon tells him that it's not the case at all. Showing care for So Moon, Gu Yang Pung tells him to be careful since he's now a prime target for the dark path as he's trapped in China's state of affairs. Gu Yang Pung further goes on to warn So Moon that since he's killed one of their commanders, his death will be their top priority. So he must be careful. Smiling. So Moon asks Gu Yang not to worry since he'll only meet his bride and then go back to his hometown because surely the dark path won't follow him till Mount Pektu. Gu Yang tells So Moon that in Gangho the Dark Path will follow him to hell for vengeance if they have to. Meanwhile, back at the Patient Palace, the Patient Leader frowns upon hearing about the gifted archer. Gokja further goes on to tell him that the Blood Bow group is nothing in front of him and even warriors Moxa Hyuk and Hien Wan Gang had trouble blocking his key arrows. Enraged to hear this, the Patient Leader asks Gokja how he plans on getting rid of him. Gokja tells him that in terms of skill, they can't beat him. So he'll try to get So Moon assassinated since all the preparations to put this plan into action have already been done. Now back at the port, So Moon asks Gu Yang where he's going. In response, Gu Yang tells him that he'll be heading to the Shaolin Temple since he feels upset for hurting his former subordinates. This way, he'll be able to get clarity of mind. As Gu Yang heads onto his own path, So Moon calls out to him and asks him to be safe. However, seeing one of his closest allies walk away, So Moon feels quite sad. Now walking up to the ship captain, 
So Moon asks him where the ship headed to Sichuan is. But as always, it turns out that So Moon is late, since the ship left 30 minutes ago. Worried, So Moon asks when the next ship headed there will arrive. To his disappointment, the captain tells him that since this isn't a big port, a ship to Sichuan comes every 10 days. If So Moon were to go to the port at Daunting Lake, he easily find a ship headed to Sichuan there. Scratching his head, So Moon wonders why it's so hard for him to meet his bride. The porter tells So Moon that this ship will eventually head to Sichuan since it is a cargo ship, barred by a silver horse escort agency. The porter further goes on to tell So Moon that if there's an urgency, then he can talk with the escort captain. Hearing this, So Moon has a wide smile on his face and gracefully accepts the porter's offer. Now, as So Moon boards the ship, he experiences seasickness. The porter looking at So Moon tells him that this is the first time he's seen someone get sick due to riding across a lake. Who have known that So Moon's greatest weakness is water? A fellow passenger looking at So Moon tells him that he knows this feeling since he was once a young boy traveling by ship for the first time too. Just then, Yi Du Jun of the Silver Escort Agency asks the passenger if he's mocking So Moon or feeling sorry for him. Intimidated by Yi Du Jun's towering figure, the guy tells him that he was just reminiscing about old times. Coming near So Moon, Yi Du Jun tells him that during seasickness, the whole body is covered by cold sweat, and a splitting headache is experienced, making the person eventually vomit all the food. That's only the start since depending on how much the ship shakes, your stomach will simply vomit bitter liquid. The good thing about reaching that state is that slowly the seasickness will end and the person will be fine in about two hours. Hearing that there are still two hours left, So Moon wonders if the person came to make fun of him or because he was actually worried about him. As the journey continues, So Moon keeps throwing up. Later that day, the porter comes and sits near So Moon, asking him why he's going to Sichuan. So Moon tells him that he has business with the Sichuan Dang family. The porter tells So Moon that the Dang family palace is in Chengdu. However, this place is near Jiangan. Receiving this information, So Moon asks how far Jiangan is from Chengdu. In response, the porter tells So Moon that they are only 250 km. Now as night falls, while So Moon is looking at the stars, he thinks to himself that he'll soon have the chance to compare his martial arts with the Shaolin martial arts. He recalls that Gu Yang Pung told him that he created a martial art that rivaled the Dharma Triblade after he lost to San Jay. And then the current Patian Palace leader and Gu Yang's disciple mastered that art. With a sad expression, So Moon tells Gu Yang that he talks about a subordinate that betrayed him with such pride. Gu Yang tells So Moon that his disciple won't allow for stronger martial arts than his to exist. So he'll come to the Shaolin where Gu Yang plans on facing him. So Moon finally understands the reason Gu Yang is heading to the Shaolin. Looking at So Moon with hope, Gu Yang asks him if he'd like to try learning martial arts, since he was thinking of passing it on to him. So Moon, being as respectful as he can, declines Gu Yang's offer. Hearing this rejection, Gu Yang laughs as he never would have anticipated someone rejecting such a brilliant offer. Looking at the stars with a sad reaction, So Moon thinks to himself that if Gu Yang found out that his martial arts were stronger than the Dharma Triblade, he'd probably faint. Just then, So Moon is invited by the porter to meet the escort captain. After introducing himself, So Moon tells the escort captain that the number of porters is less than the cargo. The escort captain tells So Moon that they can simply hire more people when they reach their destination. The only real problem is the pirates that can appear to plunder the cargo. The captain then asks So Moon if he's worked with an escort agency before. So Moon tells him that he did work as a porter for the Thousand Mile Agency. The captain laughs as he mentions that So Moon is quite an oddball for working as a porter rather than an escort to reach Sichuan. Just then, the two are invited to have drinks, and as the passengers sit together, they talk about the gifted archer from the Light Path who is as fearsome as Gu Yang Pum. As the conversation carries on, so Moon goes away for a bit as he still feels a little unwell. Staring at So Moon from a distance, an assassin stares him down as he mentions that he's found several openings to take down So Moon. He wonders why he was so nervous and scared when he first took on this mission, since So Moon doesn't have an expert's presence and seems rather weak. Meanwhile, at the Dragon Blade Stockade, No Juk Sam, the stockade leader, is informed that a ship is approaching. The informer worriedly asks Juk Sam what they are going to do. Cleaning his ear, the scarred-faced man replies that they'll be seizing the ship without question. After giving his reply in an authoritative tone, he asks what kind of a ship it is and where has it reached. In response, the informer tells him that the ship is currently crossing the unpleasant valley and it just so happens to be a merchant ship. Hearing the word, merchant ship, Jack Sam is shaken to his core and immediately stands up from his seat. 
ordering his subordinates to set out with him to seize the ship. Standing beside, Jai Gu tells Jik Sam that seeing his high spirit can be safely concluded that he's planning on sucking the ship dry. Replying in an excited and energetic tone, Jik Sam tells Jai Gu that they were on the brink of death due to starvation. However, out of the blue, a merchant ship appeared. So it's a sign from the universe that there's no way they'll die. Well, that's some trust on the universe. Showing some principle, Jaiku asks if they'll simply take the tolls and some good to let the ship through, or will they be breaking that principle? However, asking Jaiku to take it easy, no Jack Sam ignores his words. Meanwhile, as So Moon is traveling through the lake, he yawns due to pure boredom, us without internet be like. However, one of the porters advises So Moon to take in the beauty of the Yangtze River, since this mystical site is simply to die for. In response, So Moon tells him that mystical or not, he simply wants to get off this ship. Since his body isn't compatible with traveling on a ship, just then, the porter notices two giant ships with the dragon bone stockade crest on them. Despite the pirates blocking their path, the escort captain tells everyone including So Moon not to worry since he's acquainted with the stockade captain and they'll probably be able to pass through after paying some tolls. Climbing aboard, Juk Sam exchanges pleasantries with the escort captain, who quickly offers up some tolls to the dragon bone stockade. However, Dissatisfied with the amount, Jack Sam tells the escort captain that the situation back at the stockade isn't good plus winter is about to arrive too. Hearing this, the captain gives Jack Sam a firm stare and asks him if he wants to take all the goods. Blowing dirt off his finger, Jack Sam dismissively responds that he didn't mean everything, implying that he'd like most of the goods. Enraged at such a response, the escort captain prepares for a fight despite their low numbers. Whereas, being the wretched pirates they are, Jack Sam and his troops also draw their swords with the intention of looting and plundering the merchandise. Meanwhile, breaking the fourth wall, So Moon addresses us viewers and says, I knew it. Everywhere I go, there's always fighting. Frowning. So Moon wonders if he's unlucky or escort group is. Definitely, you're the unlucky one, my friend. But just as the fight is about to begin, So Moon asks the porters to let him pass since he can take care of these porters with his bare hands. As these words escape So Moon's mouth, a gasp of pain is followed by it. As So Moon's eyes widen, an excruciating pain is felt as he realizes that he's been stabbed in the chest. Taking notice of the assassin, So Moon recognizes him to be the porter that first came to his help. Disoriented, So Moon asks him why he'd do such a thing. Replying with an ominous grin, the guy asks So Moon if he was expecting to live after defying the dark path. Hearing this, So Moon recalls Gu Yang Pung's words. The old man really was looking out for So Moon. After supposedly taking care of So Moon, the assassin tells the Dragon Bone Stockade that he's with the Patient Palace, which will soon be controlling all of China. So the Dragon Bone Stockade should start causing some chaos under the Patient's command. As Jiuk Sam complies and is about to step forward, So Moon with his bloodlust intensified tells everyone to not move an inch or else they'll be considered his enemy. Suddenly, So Moon feels a hand on his shoulder along with a comforting yet masculine voice asking him to rest as his injuries are serious. Walking past So Moon, Du Ilchung, the ship owner asks Juk Sam what's the meaning of this since the pirates of the Yangtze River don't succumb to the patient palace. Furious, Du Ilchung turns his attention to the assassin and asks him where his brother Du Chil is, since he was the one that went to the patient palace. Taking off Du Chil's face like a mask, the assassin replies to Ilchung that his brother lent him his face and went on to the afterlife. What kind of a sick man this guy is? Seeing his brother's face lying in the palms of an assassin, Du Il Chung is furious yet keeps his wits about himself. Looking at Juk Sam, Il Chung questions if the Dragon Bone Stockade wants to be the patient's dog after something like this. Pointing at Jai Gu, Juk Sam tells him that he thought he had some sense in him, but he happens to be just the same. Seeing Du Il Chung's face and hearing his voice, Jai Gu refers to him as High Commissioner and falls down into prostration. Seeing this, Jack Sam and his troops do the same and all of them collectively greet him. It seems that El Chung used to be a high commissioner of the Yangtze River, who single-handedly brought up the pirates to a respectable name. Infuriated, El Chung asks when did the Dragon Bone Stockade submit to the patient. Offering his apology, Jack Sam gets up and asks El Chung's permission to take the assassin's head off. However, El Chung asks Juk Sam to step aside and tells him that he'll be the one to kill the assassin. However, Holding the High Commissioner back, So Moon tells him that he'll take care of it since it's only right to return the favor after receiving such an amazing gift. Is it? I mean the guy did kill the Commissioner's brother. 
As So Moon pulls out the dagger, Il Chung strikes at several pressure points surrounding it to stop the bleeding. Overconfident, the assassin thinks to himself that So Moon will never be able to defend against an assassin's specialty, the Agile Sword Arts. As the assassin's thoughts subside, he charges to take So Moon's head. However, moving to the left, So Moon is easily able to evade the assassin's attack and return his favor by stabbing him in the chest. As the assassin falls down, Il Chung addresses the absurdity of the fact that a Patian Palace assassin wasn't able to stab So Moon in the heart. Pulling out the Dang family necklace his grandfather had given him before he head out, So Moon tells Il Chung that it was because of this piece of jewelry. After this conversation, Il Chung apologizes to the escort captain for the inconvenience caused by the Dragon Bone stockade. As the conversation ends, the ship is back on its way to Sichuan. Now finally on course to the homeland of So Moon's bride. Holding the piece of jade jewelry, So Moon thinks to himself that it saved his life. Clenching the jewelry in his hand, So Moon with a wide smile on his face thinks to himself that his bride's name is So He. Now only a few days are left till the two finally meet. As this thought comes to our MC's mind, he wonders what his wife is going to look like. Considering how much So Moon has sacrificed for Sodi, she better be pretty and a wonderful wife to him. Now finally arriving at Sichuan, as So Moon walks the dry land, he can't find a single soul there, so he asks Iron Blood to fly ahead and see if there's any village nearby. As So Moon is thinking to himself that he might have to camp outside, he hears the calling of Iron Blood. Following his voice, So Moon finally finds a place with smoke coming out of its chimney. Knocking on the door, So Moon is greeted by an old man who tells him that this place is a hotel for travelers. How convenient, let's hope these aren't about to be famous last words. As So Moon takes his seat inside the hotel and is treated to some food, he tells the old man that he's headed to Chengdu. However, he lost his way a little bit. In response, the old man tells him that he's on the right path since Chengdu is only 50 kilometers from this place. But despite this little distance, people don't take this path due to how dangerous it is. Hearing that there are only 50 kilometers left, So Moon excitedly replies to the old man that he's pretty much already there. As the old man and So Moon are conversing, suddenly a loud knock on the door is heard. Opening the door, the old man is greeted by a horde of men led by Doc Ma and Gal Taak. The duo asks the old man if he has rooms. In response, the old man tells them that he can only accommodate 30 people. Complying with the old man, Doc Ma tells him that it's fine since the remaining will sleep outside. As 40 or 50 men come into the hotel, the old man mentions to So Moon that having so much customers is unbearable. In response, So Moon tells the old man that he'll help with the work around here, and as payment, the old man can give him some alcohol. Well, isn't So Moon a lovely guy? After a long and tiresome day of work passes by and night falls, So Moon lying in his bed hears the conversation of two men through his room wall. As he leans in close to eavesdrop, he's shocked to hear that Doc Ma's men plan to attack the Dang family. As So Moon learns this, he's enraged to hear that someone is about to attack his in-laws. What a family man. As the sun rises, So Moon heads out on his journey to Chengdu, but decides to follow the group of mercenaries. It turns out that these mercenaries belong to a place known as Man Doc Mun where all poison art experts stand united. As Doc Ma and Gal Taak are walking through the forest, they converse about the Dang family. Gal Taak reassures Doc Ma of victory. But despite that, Doc Ma mentions that he's worried about the Dang family's assassination technique. However, Gal Taak reminds him that they have a secret technique to render the Dang family's assassination techniques useless. You ain't gonna do nothing, because our boy So Moon will be there. Standing at a vantage point, So Moon comes up with a strategy to defeat Man Doc Mun and decides to strike and run repeatedly. Shooting an arrow, So Moon smiles as he mentions that he prefers the bow for sure. As the key guided arrow flies at blistering speed through the jungle, it pierces through one of Man Doc Mun's soldiers, grinding his teeth. Poison King Wang Mu mentions that over 20 people of his have died due to such sneak attacks, yet they don't even know what weapon is being used. Assessing the soldier's corpse, Gal Taak observes that it was a chest wound caused by Ki. And since the wound is much smaller as compared to the sword Ki arts, or the divine finger snap, then it must mean that it is a Ki arrow. Hearing this, Wai Mu is shocked and tells Gal Taak that while something like this is possible in theory, who would be this good at archery that he can use something of this sort? Well, you're about to find out Wang Mu. Before the conversation between Wai Mu and Taak can carry forth, Another key arrow comes and strikes down a man Doc Mun soldier. Seeing this, Wai Mu realizes that they have no choice but to stay back and try to figure out the archer's identity. 
standing on top a tree branch. So Moon smiles as he continuously shoots some more arrows taking down several soldiers. Now hiding behind a rock, So Moon observes his enemy and thinks to himself that if he were to eliminate some more of the soldiers and the man Doc Mun group would probably retreat. Meanwhile, Wang Mu on the other hand yells at his soldiers and commands them not to get flustered but rather keep their eyes open to find the perpetrator. Just then a key arrow comes flying at Gao Taak. However, using his sword skills, Taak is able to block the attack. Seeing this, all of the ordinary soldiers scream in awe for Taak. Using this opportunity, Doc Ma also riles up the soldiers and commands them to block these arrows. Meanwhile, the man Doc Mun elders plan to escape the mountain whilst Doc Ma guards the rear. Observing his enemy's movements, So Moon realizes that they are running forward instead of retreating like he expected. Anyhow, noticing that the soldiers are guarding their backs, So Moon decides to switch up his strategy. And after carving some wooden arrows, he shoots them straight into the sky. Not anticipating an attack from above, several soldiers fall prey to So Moon. Seeing this, Doc Ma orders his men to hide under the trees. However, that too proves useless when one of Doc Ma's men has a key arrow pierced through the tree. Seeing no option but to fight back, Doc Ma asks all of his men to spread out and look for So Moon. Finding a moment to themselves, both Gal Taak and Doc Ma tell Guang Mu that if there are multiple enemies then their forces are done for. However, Guang Mu tells the two of them that if there were many enemies then there would have been a continuous stream of arrows. To reduce any further damage to the forces, Guang Mu asks the duo to step up. Just then another key arrow strikes an enemy right in between the legs. Not cool so Moon, you just ended my guy's future. Seeing this, both Gal Taak and Doc Ma begin the chase. In attempts of not getting caught, so Moon also runs back whilst shooting his arrows simultaneously to keep the enemies at bay. As So Moon is running away, he thinks to himself that despite killing half of Man Doc Mun forces present here, they still haven't backed off. As So Moon is thinking this, he once again finds himself all the way back to the hotel he stayed at. Coming out of the hotel, several mercenaries surround So Moon along with the Man Doc Mun elders. Hearing the commotion, the old man comes outside to find So Moon and in a kind tone asks him what he's doing here. However, before So Moon can answer, the old man is struck in the head. As the poor man falls to his death, So Moon tells the mercenaries that they shouldn't have dragged the poor man in this mess. But ignoring So Moon's words, Wang Mu asks him why he's after them. Frowning, So Moon tells them that he has his reasons. In response, Wang Mu tells So Moon that he'll get the answers out of his mouth after cutting his arms and feet. Following this conversation, Doc Ma asks his forces to take down So Moon, so they may have revenge for their fallen brethren. However, swooping in close to one of the mercenary, So Moon strikes him in the throat and steals his sword. As the mercenaries charge at So Moon and attack him, upon the first block, So Moon realizes how weak they are. As So Moon understands his enemy's power level, he decides not to use the peerless triple unity blade and wipes them using total annihilation and pressure of Mount Tai. Now, that right there is a violation, I personally wouldn't have. As So Moon is taking down these mercenaries, he wonders if they were really planning to take on the Dang family with such low-level skill. Looking at this sight from the sidelines, Wang Mu wonders why the poison doesn't have any effect on So Moon. Since all the forces are using their key to release it, but So Moon's attacks are only getting faster instead of slowing down. The three elders wonder if So Moon is some sort of an expert from the Dang family, or someone who has mastered the poison key art since someone like that could absorb all the poison key and use it to his advantage. Asking everyone to step aside, at last, Wang Mu himself steps onto the battlefield and goes straight for So Moon's head using his bare hands. As Wang Mu throws a barrage of strikes trying to rip through So Moon using his claw-like nails, So Moon easily manages to maintain a distance between them. Realizing So Moon's strategy, Wang Mu decides to use his most powerful technique, the disappearing Soul Dark Smoke Palm. Just then, a key blast is shot at So Moon. As the key blast gets closer to him, he wonders that even though Guang Mu's key isn't as strong as Se Yun's, there's still something odd about it. However, ignoring this odd thing, So Moon decides to simply take on the attack. After having defended himself, So Moon strikes back by using the eight directions wind and rain technique. Overpowered by this move, Guang Mu is left wounded. However, So Moon has to stop the attack due to Gal Taak's interruption. Grunting, Wang Mu tells the other two elders that So Moon is a 10,000 poison untouched. That's why he's able to sustain no damage against so much key poison. Acknowledging So Moon's skill, Wang Mu gives him his respect. However, not caring about something so trivial, 
So Moon asks them to come at him without wasting his time. As So Moon says this, he thinks to himself that he has to eliminate anyone that tries to attack his bride. Okay, So Moon, you better quit being so romantic because you're raising the standard of all the girls watching this video. Seeing as there's no way to defeat So Moon, the three elders upon consensus decide to reveal their trump card that they had kept in store for the Dang family. Just then, several coffins are brought to the battle. Looking at this ridiculous sight, So Moon wonders about the purpose of doing this. Just then, the coffin doors go off flying and several zombies start walking out of them. Seeing the zombies, So Moon recalls that they have metal bodies and can't be killed since they are already dead. However, upon realizing that their movements are sluggish, So Moon is easily able to dodge all the attacks. But despite that, the main problem for our MC arises when he realizes that he can't cut through the zombies due to their metal bodies. So changing up his game plan a little, So Moon uses the sword key blast and sends all the zombies flying away. As the lifeless corpses fall, So Moon thinks that he's finally got them. However, that isn't enough since they get right back up. Shocked to see this, So Moon suddenly remembers the words of Joe Mun, who told him that to kill a zombie one must either behead them or chop their bodies into small pieces. Since when did Bowblade Spirit become Demon Slayer or Zombie Slayer should I say? Following his brother's advice, So Moon begins beheading the zombies but immediately realizes that something isn't right since his key isn't connecting properly with him. Looking back on the fight, So Moon tries to recall if he sustained any injuries that would cause this. However, that isn't the case so narrowing down the possibilities to only poison. So Moon decides to end this fight quickly before the poison spreads any further. As the fight continues, Wai Mu is unable to believe what his eyes are seeing since he never would have imagined that there would be someone capable of taking 10 poison zombies all by himself. Standing next to Guai Mu, Taeak tells him that they can't waste all of their poison zombies so it would be best if they attack simultaneously. With this plan in mind, both Dok Ma and Taeak head towards So Moon. Dok Ma is first to attack, as he throws several shurikens at So Moon. However, So Moon easily manages to block them. Okay, so we got ninjas now. What's going on guys? Following the same attack patterns, Taeak attacks too, but to no avail. Just then several zombies come at So Moon, but they are quickly beheaded. As one of the zombies is falling down, he strikes So Moon on the arm. Nevertheless, to avoid getting poisoned even more, So Moon quickly runs his blade across the wound. Recollecting himself, So Moon realizes that one misstep could cost him his life. Just then both Taeak and Dok Ma charge towards So Moon, leaping right at the duo. So Moon counters their attack, yet still he is pushed back by the sheer force of the attack. Giving respect where respect is due, So Moon tells the duo that it was an impressive attack. In response, the duo tells So Moon that they respect his martial arts too. He should simply accept his fate and die a comfortable death. Enraged to hear this, So Moon looks at them with berserker eyes and asks them if they really think he was going to die with such an attack. Looking into So Moon's eyes, Taeak also feels an intense murderous gaze. Before any of them can react, So Moon raises his sword high in the air and ends up using the peerless triple unity blade, the third step, the endless blade. As So Moon calls onto his attack, a massive key wave flows out of his sword that wipes out all the zombies in one clean blow. Realizing that the attack is bad news, Wai Mu orders all of his troops to retreat and take cover. On the other hand, just as So Moon finishes his attack, he questions himself if the attack was too much for him to handle. Since he couldn't achieve the Endless Blade to its 12th ascension, he wasn't able to perform it properly. Now totally drained, So Moon wonders what he'll do next since he's having a hard time even moving. Just then, So Moon senses the key from the Heart Sutra visualization that was pushed aside by Wu Wei's key, rising in him once again. Now finally regaining some of his key, So Moon thinks to himself that he'll be able to escape now. However, just as the three elders of Man Dok Mun walk to So Moon, Wai Mu asks So Moon what sword arts he was using. In response, So Moon tells him that it was the peerless triple unity arts. Dragging the conversation further, So Moon then tells Wang Mu that the reason he attacked their group was due to ties of the Dang family. However, he doesn't wish to fight anymore, so they should just settle this matter. Hearing this, Dok Ma lashes out since he doesn't want man Dok Mun to quit. Upon Wai Mu's order, they decide to finally accept defeat and humiliation. But before parting ways, Wang Mu asks So Moon for his name, and with teary eyes vows to carve it into his heart, so he may pay back the humiliation the man Dok Mun faced. Well, at least the man Dok Mun were all smart enough to realize that they aren't up to challenges. On the other hand, 
Finding ourselves in the Amy faction household, we see some unfamiliar faces. Introducing himself as Huanya from the Patient Palace, the leader of the Steel-Blooded Adventurers. He asks the Amy faction leader to close their gates for the next five years. Keeping a calm composure, the Amy faction leader asks Huanya to leave peacefully. Huanya makes it clear that it isn't an option, but he'd like to avoid any unnecessary bloodshed. So why don't they send a representative to fight and whoever wins gets to decide the fate of the Amy faction? As the two agree to this method for settling the matter, their duel begins. Whereas, on the other hand, So Mu, whilst camping analyzing his mistakes during his fight with Man Dokmon realizes that he was reckless in using the Endless Blade despite internal injuries. Due to this recklessness, he now has to weigh a little extra for his wounds to recover. As the sun rises on a new day, So Moon smiles since his injuries have been completely healed, and now his key is being restored. Meanwhile, back at the Patient Palace, Gokja grins after learning that Dian Kane, Kinching, and the Amy faction all have been captured and now all that's left is the Dang family palace. Just then Gokja receives a letter from Man Doc Mun, and as he reads it, Gokja is left frustrated and begins throwing a tantrum. Hearing this commotion, the Patient Palace leader asks him what's got him so worked up. In response, Gokja tells him that whilst they've achieved great results on the attack on Sichuan, the attack on the Dang family has failed. Furthermore, the Man Doc Mun squad was defeated before they could even enter Chengdu. Hearing this, the Patient leader asks who was the warrior to defeat Man Doc Mun defeated by. Frowning, Gokja responds that it was none other than So Moon that ruined their plans. Hearing So Moon's name, the Patient Palace leader realizes that it's the same guy that defeated the Blood Bow group. Guess the Patient Palace is bound to face defeat as long as So Moon is alive. Questioning, So Moon's skill. The leader asks what happened to the Poison Zombies and the Blood Shadow group. In response, Gokja tells the leader that the Poison Zombies were all defeated. Whereas, for the Blood Shadow group after the man Doc Mun's crushing defeat, all of them were recalled. Looking on with a determined expression, the patient leader wonders if the Blood Shadow group considered the assassination of So Moon to be impossible and retreated. Meanwhile, So Moon, on the other hand, is now in Chengdu. As So Moon roams the city, he goes around asking the people where the Dang family's residence is whilst also exploring the city. Finally, heading off to see his bride. At last, So Moon begins to feel nervous, being So Moon's best friend. Iron Blood teases him. Laughing out of embarrassment, So Moon tells Iron Blood to get a wife of his own if he's so jealous. Love the bond between these two, I need Iron Blood in my life too. As So Moon is heading to the Dang family residence, the Dang family elders are out returning from a battle. The family leader, Dang Mun Qian, mentions that he had to choose momentary coordinates because a great commander knows when to retreat and when to advance. First, commander who actually thinks like a commander in this story. Riding right behind him, Dang Mun Yang, his younger brother mentions that he worries there will be a great battle between light and dark paths since in just a day three factions from the nine united sects have fallen. Reassuring his brother, Dang Mun Qian mentions that the light path won't fall so easily. Meanwhile, so Moon finally reaches the Dang family household. A little nervous, So Moon standing in a zesty way wonders how he'll go about this conversation as it's been almost two years since he left Mount Pektu. Confused, So Moon realizes that it would be weird if he straight up mentioned that he was a guy for Zhao Xian here to marry So He. As all these thoughts are going haywire in So Moon's brain, he realizes that he should have asked Qian Ho for a letter, so that his words could have more authenticity. I'm getting a bad feeling about this. Putting the nervousness aside, so Moon walks up to the guards, who keeping a rigid attitude asks So Moon, who he is and where is he from. In response, So Moon respectfully gives a brief introduction and tells them that his father was a friend of the family leader, so he thought he would come all this way to offer his greetings. Keeping a firm attitude, upon hearing the family leader, the guards dismissively tell So Moon to come back in the afternoon when the family leader arrives. Frowning, So Moon asks the guards if there is a place where the guests can rest until then. The guard tells him that many people can act as guests and then cause chaos in the house. Having heard enough, So Moon finally loses his cool and asks him what kind of a household lacks so much sympathy that they don't offer a warm meal. In response, the guards tell So Moon to stop making a noise and rile him up. One of the guards taunts So Moon and asks if he wants to hit him, just as the guard thinks that So Moon wouldn't dare since he's a simple man. So Moon knocks out the guard in one clean punch. So Moon is now the one punch man. As one of the guards is knocked out, the other guard draws his sword and begins attacking So Moon. However, So Moon evading his attacks with ease realizes that he's still not 100% healthy to fight. 
Just then, a beautiful woman comes out hearing the commotion and breaks the fight. As So Moon sets eyes on the young lady, he is immediately captivated by her beauty. So Moon be like, oh, I'm just dying in your arms tonight. The woman then asks So Moon his purpose for this visit, in response. So Moon tells her that the Dang family leader had made a promise to his father. Hearing this, the woman wonders, could it be that her father promised some sort of fee, or So Moon might be a spy? Unclear of the situation, she decides to bring So Moon inside and keep a close eye on him. As the two reach the guest room, the woman introduces herself as Dang So He. Hearing her name, So Moon thinks to himself that her name is as pretty as her. Just then, it hits him and it's his bride that's standing in front of him. Finally, the two lovers have met. Well, they aren't lovers yet, but hopefully. Despite being shy, upon seeing his bride, So Moon asks her to wait up and confirms with her if her name really is Dang So He. Upon getting a confirmation, So Moon tells her that the reason he's here is because of her. Not getting the full picture, So Be asks what he means by that. Now at his melting point, So Moon tells her that the two of them are supposed to have an arranged marriage. Hearing this, So Be is left shocked. Calming herself down, So Be once again reiterates So Moon's statement to make sure she heard him correctly. Upon getting a confirmation, she thinks to herself that her father never mentioned such a thing. But then again, something like this is totally expected from her father, since he was joking about finding her a groom anyways. Giving So Moon a bombastic side eye, she thinks to herself that So Moon's figure looks fine, but what sort of a man is this shy? Without getting shy or flustered, So Be bows down and tells So Moon that she appreciates the fact that he respectfully told her about this arranged marriage. In response, So Moon in a polite tone tells her that since it was a promise made by the adults he thought she would know, so Be acted a little impolitely. Bowing down once again, So Be tells So Moon that he wasn't impolite at all and his kindness is appreciated. Bowing right back, So Moon tells her that it's nothing and ends up headbutting So He in the head. Following this act, So Moon immediately apologizes. So Be remaining calm and composed tells So Moon that she'll meet him again after her father returns. As So Be takes her leave, Iron Blood gives So Moon a really dude. Look. Embarrassed out of his mind, So Moon begins pulling his hair apart as he realizes that he really is a pathetic idiot. Meanwhile, when the family leader returns back and So He informs him of the situation, he takes it as a joke, but seeing his daughter's serious demeanor, he realizes that she isn't joking, but rather an actual guest has come their way who claims to be So He's groom. Thinking hard, the family leader mentions that he doesn't have any friends living in Mount Pektu. So He tells her father that she hasn't seen a hint of lies in So Moon's actions or words. Upon hearing that, the family leader asks how long So Moon's been in the palace. In response, So He tells him that it's been two hours. So Moon hasn't done anything that can be considered suspicious. Hearing this, the family leader finally comes to a conclusion and tells So He that he hadn't made such a promise to anyone, and that So Moon is telling a pure lie. Since So Moon wasn't showing any signs of deception, it may be that he's taken them for a different family. But then again, the Dang family's name is too far known for that to be true. So the only conclusion left to make is that So Moon is a spy from the Patient Palace. Hearing this, So He asks her father if there really would be a spy who would enter the palace with such an obvious lie. In response, her father convinces her that So Moon was probably trying to take advantage of the fact that he wasn't there. Hearing her father's words, So Di is enraged and decides to take off So Moon's head as she thinks that he took advantage of her hospitality. Her father advises that instead of killing So Moon, they should capture him by giving him a tea full of intoxicants. And once So Moon is unconscious and vulnerable, he'll be subjected to the torturous techniques of the Dang family, so he may spill out all the information he has. Well, so Moon sure is getting a warm welcome from his in-laws. Meanwhile, some time later as So Moon opens his eyes, he finds himself in a pitch black room. Unable to move, So Moon realizes that he's been chained up against a wall, and right at his feet lies iron blood completely still. As So Moon sees his best friend lying down, he yells to check if he's still alright. Just then, So Moon is hit by a hard metal object in multiple areas of his body. Just then, an unfamiliar voice is heard that tells So He that it would be a problem if So Moon died. Now standing right in front of So Moon, So Be asks him if he knows who she is. Barely opening his eyes, So Moon sees his future bride. Full of fury, So Be tells So Moon that it's his arranged bride. Broken both physically and mentally, So Moon asks why she's doing something like this. In response, So Be tells him that if he wouldn't know, who would? Well, poor So Moon always gets the shorter end of the stick. Putting the baton up to So Moon's neck, she asks him what he thought he'd get out of deceiving the Dang family. Bruised and battered, 
So Moon tells her that he's undoubtedly her groom, so what is she talking about? Hearing this, Sovi goes for another attack but is stopped by Dang Iljai, the one in charge of Dang's family's law enforcement. Having barely any strength left, So Moon asks him why they are doing this. In response, Iljai tells So Moon that since he was from the Patient Palace, the Dang family thought he'd be hard to take down. So Moon still fell unconscious to one of the weakest drugs their family has. Hearing this, So Moon recalls that after he had eaten and was drinking alcohol, he suddenly felt sleepy, and as his eyes felt heavy, the last thing he saw was Iron Blood fighting for his sake. Keeping a cold attitude, looking at So Moon, Il Dang then tells him that it was admirable to see an animal fighting so hard to protect its owner. For that reason, they didn't kill Iron Blood. The animal had to pay the price for slashing Il Dang's neck, heartbroken. So Moon asks him what's their reason behind this, and if it is that they want to back out of the marriage, then it's fine because he doesn't want this sort of marriage either. Poor So Moon, his whole world has come crashing down. Hearing this, both So He and Il Dang ask So Moon to stop lying and quit being so stubborn. So Moon asks them why he'd lie after traveling thousands of kilometers, looking on at the Dang family with fury. So Moon tells them if they don't want their daughter to marry a guy like him due to their reputation, then he'll back out of this repulsive marriage. Just then, the family elder walks in and tells So Moon that he never made such a promise, and asks him for some sort of evidence for such a claim. In response, So Moon asks them to take out the token his deceased father left as evidence, providing further backstory on the jewelry. So Moon tells the family leader that he had received help from his grandfather at Mount Pektu, and promised that he so he would get married to his grandson. Clenching the piece of jewelry in his fist, the family leader tells So Moon that something like this is impossible since he's never even traveled near Mount Pektu. So the arranged marriage So Moon is speaking about is simply impossible. As So Moon hears these words, he realizes that his grandfather had him chasing a lie all this time. After having learned the truth, So Moon is once again asked who he is. And in response, So Moon gives a brief introduction and tells them that he came to meet his bride. Of course, some mistakes were made, but he isn't a spy as the Dang family thinks he is. But despite that, not believing a word he says, So he continuously beats So Moon and asks him who he is. Mentally exhausted at last, So Moon tells them that he's just Yolji So Moon and no one else. And as So Moon nears his death, he hangs by the chains and thinks to himself that why'd he fall for the words of an old jeezer such as his grandfather and get so worked up about an arranged bride anyways? Forget the patient palace, the real antagonist of the story is the grandfather. Freaking hell. Still not believing So Moon, Ildang rips out So Moon's thumbnail. After ripping out one of So Moon's nails, as he hears his shrieks of pain, he rips out another. Despite So Moon's heart-wrenching screams, Ildang without showing any mercy dips So Moon's hand into a plate of salt. As So Moon's wounds come in contact with the salt, he screams in agony and asks Il Dang, that no matter how serious his mistake is, how could someone put a person through this much torture? Yeah, the Dang family seems more animals than humans. No worse than animals because our boy Iron Blood is an animal too, and there should be respect for his name. With both his eyes swollen shut, So Moon tells the Dang family that Chi and Ho wasn't like their stupid and spiteful descendants, just as Sobi hears her grandfather's name, she asks So Moon if he's met him. In response, So Moon tells her that he fought alongside Chien Ho and risked his life for him. Pouting, So He looks at So Moon angrily and tells him that first he was lying about being her groom and now he lies about her grandfather. Having heard enough, Ildang finally decides to use his last resort, which happens to be a certain kind of insect that will lay eggs inside So Moon's body within two hours. And then the baby insects will begin devouring So Moon's body from the inside out. So he once again warns So Moon and tells him that if he doesn't tell her the truth right now, then it'll be too late. Not caring about anything anymore. So Moon once again tells her that he's innocent, and just as Ildang is about to place the insect in So Moon's mouth. Suddenly, Iron Blood comes flying him and claws him. As the insect falls down, Iron Blood crushes it with his talons. Enraged at this, So He shoots a key blast in Iron Blood and strikes him with full force. As the key blast hits Iron Blood, he is sent flying away and hits a wall. Furious at Iron Blood, Ildang stomps him with his feet and pinches him hard with his hand. As Iron Blood caused in sheer agony, So Moon looks on with a bloody face and screams out not to torment Iron Blood. Not just as Ildang is about to crush Iron Blood's windpipe, So Moon asks him to stop and tells the Dang family that he'll answer honestly now. Realizing that So Moon and Iron Blood share a special bond, Il Dang holding Iron Blood captive asks So Moon if he's from the Patient Palace and why he came over here. 
having no other option but to lie to save his dear pet. So Mu tells them that he's from the Patient Palace and came here with the objective of killing the Dang family. After hearing what seemed to be the truth to Il Dang, he lets So Moon free and asks him to be comfortable till the family leader makes a decision. Too injured to even move, So Moon crawls towards Iron Blood with tears in his eyes. But just then, So He crushes him under her foot and asks So Moon if he really thought that she'd let the bird live after it injured her hand. Yelling, So Moon begs So Hui not to hurt Iron Blood. At first, So Be plays with So Moon's heart and tells him that since he's begging, she'll let him go. However, being the cold-hearted woman she is, she kicks Iron Blood, sending him flying into a wall. Now, as Iron Blood lies there dead, Sogi asks Il Dang to rip off its talons, since they might come useful. And after mutilating Iron Blood's corpse, the Dang family members leave. Standing alone near his best friend's dead body, So Moon cries red tears as he recalls the moments he found and cared for him. With tears in his eyes, So Moon asks Iron Blood why he had to protect him. R.I.P. Iron Blood, you were a true friend and fought valiantly to the end. Talking to his friend's corpse, So Moon tells Iron Blood that he can't die yet and pass on like him. Since if he did that, then who would satiate his friend's hunger for revenge? Vowing to pay them back, So Moon decides that he has to escape somehow. Just you wait, So He. Your death is going to be a thing of beauty. As of now, he's unable to move his arms and leg. So, firstly, he must rest and recover some of his key so that he can get moving again. Lying down, as So Moon recovers enough key to move around. He gets right back and comes up with a brilliant plan. Using the chains near him, So Moon ties himself up to a beam and gives the guard the impression that he's trying to take his own life. Seeing this, the guards hurriedly rush him as they fear that Sully might suspect them if a patient palace spy died on their watch. As the guards run in and try to put So Moon down, he wraps his legs around one of the guard's neck and chokes him to death, whilst the other guy is knocked out by a vicious headbutt. Now finally finding an opportunity to escape, so Moon gets out of the torture chamber. News of So Moon's escape spread like wildfire, and all the Dang family warriors head out in search of So Moon. Leading the search party, So He tells all her warriors to block all escape routes and capture So Moon. And whoever accomplishes this task will be rewarded handsomely. Hiding in the trees, So Moon thinks to himself that if he had even a quarter of his key, he would have been able to take care of the Dang family right now. Meanwhile, so he asks all her soldiers to attack So Moon on sight, but not take his life, since she wants to do it herself. Resting on a tree branch, So Moon regrets his decision of recovering some key. However, considering his options to either run away by using all of his strength or hiding, So Moon decides that it would be best if he tries to get away. As So Moon tries to escape the clenches of the Dang family and runs away at full speed, his movement is caught by the Dang family when the rustling of the bushes is heard, catching So Moon's sight. So he is the first to run after him at full speed. As So Moon is running through the forest, he realizes that his key is about to hit rock bottom. Keeping a persistent pace, So Moon tries to keep running. Come on, you old witch, give So Moon some rest. Following behind, So he smirks as she realizes that So Moon is running towards a cliff that connects to the Yangtze River's tributary. As So Moon reaches the cliff, he realizes that he has no place to run to. Looking at the river behind him, so Moon wonders if he were to dive then would he live. Looking at Sohi with rage, So Moon tells her that even though he doesn't have the strength to fight her right now, one day will come when he will wipe the smile off of her smug face. In response, Sohi tells So Moon that he's awfully talkative for someone who's going to die soon. However, as Sohi runs behind So Moon to stab him using his last resort, So Moon jumps from the cliff in hopes of diving into the river. But just as So Moon is falling down, So He throws the sword at So Moon and strikes him right in the chest. Meanwhile, at the Zood family palace, as all the Light Path Coalition members are gathered, one of the Shaolin monks brings a message from the Amy faction. As the Shaolin monk reads through the letter, she finds out that after the Amy faction leader lost the duel against Huan Ya, she decided to starve herself to death. Crying, the Shaolin monks also tell the other elders that the Dian Kang faction has been annihilated and the Kinching sect and the other warriors have lost their lives. Standing up, one of the elders asks what is going on with the Dang family. In response, the beggar's sect leader tells everyone that the Man Doc Mun family had led an attack on the Dang family. It failed miserably. Hearing this, Chun Ho asks if it was the Dang family was the one who overpowered him. The beggar's sect leader answers that it was someone else instead, who happened to be a young warrior that killed all of their poison zombies too. Hearing this, Chun Ho asks if the guy was someone who carried a bow. Answering the question, 
The beggar sect leader responds that it was someone who did have outstanding archery skills. As Shinho hears this, he erupts into laughter since he realizes that it was none other than So Moon who protected his family. Yeah, right, and look at what your family did to him. Meanwhile, at the Patian Palace, one of the informants tells Gok Jia that Dang Mun Qian has left to meet with his father, Qian Ho at the Zug family palace. However, more focused on So Moon, Gok Jia asks what's going on with him. In response, the informant tells Gok Jia that for some odd reason, the Dang family sent So Moon to confinement and was tortured by them. Even though So Moon was able to escape, he was then hit by So Li's sword and fell off a cliff. So as of now, So Moon is presumed dead. Hearing this, Gok Jia breaks into laughter as he realizes how much of an idiot the Dang family is since they took care of So Moon for the patient palace. Meanwhile, the Dang family on the other hand finally arrives at the Zhu family palace. After the family ends their greetings, Qian Ho asks where So Moon, his son-in-law, is. In response, Dang Mun Qian questionably asks Qian Ho regarding what he means by his son-in-law. Just then, So Li comes running at Qian Ho and jumps at him. Acting like a little brat, So Li tells Qian Ho that she was attacked by a spy's bird. However, she killed it and made its talons into a bracelet. Following that, So Li offers a steel bow and tells her grandfather that she heard there was an archery expert here. So this bow was brought as a gift for him. Seeing this, Nam Gung Hai angrily asks if So He mentioned the bow belonging to the spy. In response, So He tells Hai that even though at first the guy denied it, eventually he admitted to being a spy. But as soon as the Dang family took his eyes off of him, the spy escaped. So He then proudly mentions that she went after the spy and stabbed him just before he fell off a cliff. Hearing this, Hai worriedly asks if the spy is dead. And upon getting confirmation, she pulls out a sword to So Yi's throat. You go, girl. Kill this evil witch. As Hai does this act, Jiam yells at her, asks her to lower her weapon, and apologizes to the Dang family. Looking on at Jiam with anger, Sang and asks him to settle down and closely look at the bow, since it's none other than So Moon's. Looking down at the bow with a saddened expression, Sang and shares his thoughts with Qian Ho and tells him that the bow is undoubtedly So Moon's and the bird So Yi killed is none other than Iron Blood. Looking at the bow closely, Wak Muang asks what they should do now. Meanwhile, the leader of the Huan Bo clan angrily asks if the Dang family really killed warrior So Moon. Looking at So He and Mun Qian with anger, Qian Ho asks them what's going on. Good the world should know their sins. The pathetic and filthy humans they are. Now profusely sweating, Mun Qian mentions that So Mu stated he was So He's Guru and showed a necklace. However, he never made such a promise, so the Dang family mistook So Moon for a spy. Looking at Mun Qian with anger, Qian Ho asks them if they really took the world's savior as a spy. Yelling at Mun Qian and So Yi, the Huang Bo leader asks them if they didn't hear about the battle that took place north of the Yangtze River. It was the one and only renowned Phantom So Moon that was the X factor between the forces. Unable to control his anger, the Huang Bo leader shoots a key blast at a tree. Looking up at the sky, Qian Ho, out of embarrassment, wonders how he'll face all the soldiers of Gang Ho. Furious out of guilt for his son's action, Qian Ho asks him how could he not recognize such a figure yet have the audacity of calling himself a family leader. Saying this, Qian Ho wonders how his family could be so weak that they can't thoroughly assess someone and simply call them a spy. Trying to prove her innocence, So Li mentions that So Moon's key was too low. Having heard enough, Qian Ho asks her to shut up and tells her that he probably sustained injuries when he single-handedly defeated Man Doc Mun. But instead of resting, so Moon must have gone to the Dang family in excitement, and this is how he was treated. Well, at least someone from the Dang family has a heart. Pulling out a sword, Qian Ho throws it in front of So He and Dang Mun Qian, and asks them to take their own lives to atone for their sins. Calming his friend down, Sang and reminds Qian Ho that even if his granddaughter and son were to take their lives, So Moon wouldn't come back. So there's no need to take such a rash decision. Crying, Qian Ho mentions that the hero that was sent to them from the heavens was killed by the Dang family, so he now has no right to look up to the heavens. Turning his back on his son and granddaughter, Qian Ho asks them to leave and never show him their faces again. Meanwhile, holding on to So Mu's bow close to her chest, Hai cries tears of heartache and tells herself that she's sure So Moon isn't dead and will return. Man, Hai really was the better option. On the other hand, it seems like the Patian Palace is raging another war against the Hell Faction of the Dark Path since they deny the Patian Palace's option of allegiance. As havoc is being wrecked throughout China, 
so Moon on the verge of death washes ashore. Mustering up some strength, so Moon begins walking but not being able to think clearly. So Moon wonders if he's lost the use of both of his arms since he can't feel them. Walking like a dead body, so Moon at last comes across a lady, and as he puts his hand out asking for help, the lady scared of so Moon screams and runs away. As the woman runs away, she crashes into a Huanya walking in front of her. Worried, Huanya asks her what's wrong and the woman in an anxious tone responds that there's a weird guy chasing her. Moments later as Huanya checks on So Moon, he brings him to the infirmary for treatment. Sometime later as the doctor is checking up on So Moon, he tells Huanya that he's never seen a patient with such vicious wounds. Seeing this, the woman wonders what sort of a fierce fight So Moon in to get so injured. However, Huanya tells the woman that it wasn't a fight but rather torture since So Moon's nails have been ripped off. Learning this, the woman wonders who could do such a thing. As Huan Ya and the woman take their leave, So Moon wakes up and the first thought on his mind is taking revenge against the Dang family since they killed Ironblood. I tell you guys, once So Moon recovers, he's about to be on demon time. Staying So Moon conscious once again, the doctor runs outside and informs everyone about it. As both Huan Ya and the woman come inside to check up on So Moon, he thanks them for saving his life. In response, Huan Ya tells him that after the woman found him, they were able to get him to a doctor and treat his wounds. Introducing herself as Chun Ha, she tells So Moon that she's glad to see him alive. Still not being able to feel his arms, So Moon asks the doctor to honestly tell him if he'll be able to use his arms again. In response, the doctor tells him that it can't be said for sure. But there's some sort of an aura around So Moon that reduced his injuries and started healing So Moon from the inside. Lying down helpless, So Moon asks the doctor if he'll be able to use martial arts once his arms are back to normal. The doctor tells So Moon that the chances of that happening are low since his radial nerves were severely damaged. Lying physically and mentally broken, So Moon asks the two why they would save him. In response, Huan Ya tells him that he's just trying to atone for his wrongdoings, whereas Chung He tells him that her father taught her to help others. Apologizing for suspecting them, So Moon continues to be treated by the doctor and as some time passes by, So Moon is finally able to walk freely again. Unfortunately for our MC, he's no longer to even make a fist. Now back at the inn, Chun Ha is feeding So Moon. Huan Ya pouts and mentions that it would have been great if someone fed him too. Looking at him with really dude, eyes. So Moon tells him that he should break both his arms too if he wants to be fed. Huan Ya tells So Moon that he doesn't need to get injured for that but rather make a girl fall for him. Pouting. So Moon asks Huan Ya why someone would marry him just to feed him. However, Laughing, Huan Ya tells So Moon that once he makes the girl fall head over heels for him, then she'll also take out her gallbladder for him. Okay, Huan Ya is officially a psychopath. Looking at Huan Ya with mundane eyes, So Moon responds that he would really just get married to someone for their gallbladder. Now, as one month passes, the doctor finally takes off So Moon's braces, setting sight on his arms for the first time in one month. So Moon is shocked to see that his arms now look like dead tree branches with no movement. The doctor tells So Moon that the bones have healed, but using them right now would be hard since his muscles would be stiff right now. As several days pass, So Moon begins training his arms by rock climbing. As he's trying to reach the top, So Moon slips and lands once more on the ground. But instead of showing disappointment, So Moon erupts into laughter as he lets out a scream of victory. Looking at So Moon while hiding behind a rock, Huan Ya and Chung Ha converse about how bad they feel to see So Moon in such a state. Just then, So Moon giving them a side eye asks them how long they are going to hide. As the two come out, Huan Ya asks So Moon about how he knew of this. In response, So Moon tells him that whilst his hands and arms are a problem, his inner key was restored ages ago. So he knew that they were watching from the beginning. Yeah, I think we're forgetting that even without having full control of his arms, So Moon is pretty OP. A little confused, Huan Ya asks So Moon why'd he call them out today if he knew they were there from the beginning. In response, So Moon clenching his fists tells the two of them that he can finally make a fist. With a stern look on his face, So Moon then tells Huan Ya and Chung Ha that it was because of them that he was able to exert and muster this strength. In hopes of rejoicing at this moment, Huan Ya hugs So Moon and decides to have a drink when they get back home. Meanwhile, Chung Ha on the other hand, thanks God for accepting her prayers. Man, do I need a woman like this in my life? Now as more time passes by and night falls, So Moon decides to go out and train under the cold winter sky. Standing beside So Moon, Chung Ha tells him that she'll be following him there too since she feel weird if she missed out on watching him train because she's been doing it for a long time. 
Now as So Moon sits near the river canal, he thinks to himself that the Dang family's actions were understandable, since they could have easily mistaken him for a spy as the family was on high alert. However, So Moon then suddenly reminds himself that they were still responsible for killing Ironblood, so they must pay. Just then, sitting behind So Moon, Chun Ha begins to cough. Hearing the cough worsening, So Moon touches Chun Ha only to realize that she has a severe fever. Realizing this, So Moon immediately carries her on his back and rushes to the infirmary. Meanwhile, Lying on So Moon's back, Chum Ho wonders if So Moon's heart is as warm as his back. Now as So Moon heads to the infirmary and the doctor checks Chum Ha's condition, he disappointingly tells So Moon that he can't believe he let a patient's conditions get to this point. Worried, So Moon asks the doctor about Chum Ha's condition, and in response, the doctor tells him that it's very serious. Anxious, So Moon asks the doctor if he can cure Chum Ha or not. Upon not getting a serious answer from the doctor, Huan Ya interferes and asks him if he could cure So Moon then he can surely cure the flu. But in response, the doctor tells both of them that flu can be a fatal disease to those with weak bodies. Looking at his beloved Chun Ha, So Moon asks the doctor if her body is so weak. In response, the doctor tells him that Chun Ha's body really is so weak that she might as well be dead right now. Hearing this, So Moon thinks to himself what kind of a man he is since he never noticed the lengths Chun Ha went to for him. The doctor then tells So Moon that the fever should be controlled first and then something about the body can be done. Determined to save Chun Ha, So Moon asks what he needs to do. In response, the doctor asks him to cool Chun Ha with a wet towel and take off all her clothes to let the heat evaporate. It should have been me, not him. As the doctor takes his leave to get some medicine, he asks So Moon to take off Chun Ha's clothes. Just as So Moon is about to do this, Huan Ya asks him to wait and suggests that they should bring a woman from the village for this job. Since no matter how close they are with Chun Ha, it doesn't mean they can unclothe her. God admit, Huan Ya sure is a man of honor. With a stern expression, So Mu tells Huan Ya that Chun Ha has helped him through thick and thin and has seen him in every possible way. So now isn't the time to differentiate between a man and a woman. Furthermore, So Moon tells Huan Ya that if there were to be any problem, then he would take responsibility. Hearing this, Huan Ya asks So Moon if he means marrying Chun Ha by taking responsibility. In response, So Mu tells him that if he does get married to Chun Ha, it will be because he wants her more than anything. Oh, our boy has finally found the one. Crying, So Mu tells Huan Yan that seeing Chun Ha in agony makes him feel unbearable pain. So he wants to share her pain because he loves her. After hearing his brother's emotional speech, Huan Ya goes to get some medicine and leaves So Mu and Chun Ha alone. Now all alone, So Mu in a very gentle tone tells her he'll be taking off her clothes now. So if she doesn't like it, then he'll call a lady from the village. As So Moon takes off Chun Ha's clothes, unable to say anything, Chun Ha thinks for herself that she too loves So Moon, but is simply unable to say it back to him due to having little strength. As So Moon is doing this for a moment, he gets flustered. However, punching himself, he comes back to his senses and carries on with the treatment. And at last, thanks to the efforts of So Moon and everyone else involved, Chun Ha's fever breaks down and she's finally able to move the following day. Just then, Huan Ya and So Moon return from fishing and have some banter about who caught the biggest fish. Directing his attention towards Chun Ha, So Moon walks up to her and asks if she'll be fine in such cold wind. After getting a confirmation, So Moon with a serious look on his face asks Chun Ha if she can give him an answer today. Hearing So Moon's question, Chun Ha takes a nervous breath. Seeing this, Huan Ya asks So Moon what kind of a question he asked. In response, so Mu tells him that he proposed to Chun Ha yesterday. Shocked to hear this, Huan Ya asks So Moon why he proposed all of a sudden, since Chun Ha seems so shocked. Meanwhile, Chun Ha, with a saddened expression on her face, tells So Moon that she's grateful for the proposal but she can't accept it. Seeing this, Huan Ya decides to give the two some space and goes away. Looking at Chun Ha with a questionable expression, So Moon asks her why she's rejecting him and questions if it is because she doesn't love him. However, Chun Ha tells him that isn't the case. As tears flow through her eyes, she tells So Moon that she doesn't deserve to be his wife. A little confused, So Moon asks her if it isn't love enough for two people because things such as money and status hold no value. Hearing this, Chun Ha slightly covers her mouth and embarrassingly tells So Moon that she's Kizang. Without giving it a second thought, So Moon tells her that he'd known this from the start, but things like this don't matter. Burying her face in her hands, Chun Ha begins to cry uncontrollably and tells So Moon that she wants to marry him. However, her past doesn't allow her to. 
hugging Chungha. So Moon tells her that the past has already gone by, and now the only thing that matters is the present and the future. With these words, So Moon promises Chungha that he'll cherish her. As Chungha looks back at So Moon with teary eyes, the two kiss. Now later back at the house, So Moon asks Huanya to be his witness. At first, Huanya pouts and says he doesn't want to, since he's jealous of them. However, seeing Chungha's cute expression whilst requesting him, he's left with no other choice. The following day, with Huanya acting as a witness, the two lovers tie the knot and So Moon has officially found a wife. In search of gold, my guy found a diamond. As night falls whilst Huanya is out drinking, he sees So Moon training, standing in the river with the sheer force of his key. So Moon is able to make a wave. Jumping towards it, So Moon cuts in half. Now standing underneath the water, So Moon uses the first stance of the peerless triple unity blade, a thoughtless blade. This time, a much larger wave is created, now jumping towards the incoming tide. So Moon strikes with the third step of peerless unity triple blade and makes a huge water tower. Seeing this from the shore, Huanya is left completely in awe. As So Moon ends his training, Huanya praises him for his skill and asks him what martial arts he uses. In response, So Moon tells him that it's the peerless triple unity blade. Happy with his achievement, So Moon tells Huanya that he couldn't use the third step of the peerless blade even once before, but now he can do it several times in a row. Seeing as how So Moon is back to 100% strength, Huanya asks him what he plans on doing now and in response. So Moon tells him that he'd like to go somewhere. Understanding what So Moon is implying, Huanya tells him that the Dang family has moved to Jondo for quite a while. So Moon in response tells Huanya that he knows but he still wants to go to Chengdu. Complying with his brother, Huanya and Chun has set out on the journey too. Back at the Dang family household, which is now abandoned. So Moon visits the chamber where he was brutally tortured. Leaning up against a wall, the poor guy cries as he recalls his best friend Ironblood. Man, the loss of Ironblood is really something that is going to keep hitting us. Now the reignited flame for revenge in his heart, so Moon decides to finally go to Jondo to pay the Dang family back. Meanwhile, back at Mount Huizen where the Nam Gung family resides, both Hai and Jin are trained together in hopes of getting stronger when a messenger comes running and informs Sang In that all three great families have fallen to the patient palace. Angry to hear such devastating news, all Sang In can do is accept the reality they live in now. Meanwhile, the San Wang trio discusses the political situation of Gang Ho. Dan Gaian informs the other two that there was an all-out war between Bakdo and Hukdo. Hearing this, Zhou Mun mentions that whilst he was expecting this, he had no idea it would happen so soon. Looking ahead, Jian Myung asks what decision has the elders made. In response, Dan Gaian mentions that he's heard that the Zug army will be going to Jiangning with Hashin, Yu Yeo, and Bakma. Hearing this, Jian Myung with a serious look on his face tells everyone that the order to participate will soon be issued. Meanwhile, at the Shaolin Temple, the leader monk briefs everyone about the war they're going to fight in Jiangang. As the monk tells them that the future of Jiangang lies in the hands of all the soldiers. War cries from one end to the other begin. However, Huang Bo Xianak and Guak Mu Ung know that it's going to be a gruesome fight. On the other hand, unsure of whether to attack Huazin or Mudang, the patient palace decides to take over the Nam Gung family first. As Riao Yang, the daughter of the Zub, learns this. She immediately asks the Sholin Temple leader to ask all forces traveling to Jiangang to shift their course to Huazin. Seeing the desperation of the situation, she also asks the monk to call the Sholin Temple to Huazin. Guess the Light Path is gonna need the help of the Phantom Archer, but I doubt he'd be willing to give it. So let's see how the Light Path fares up on its own. As this news reaches Sionje, he's quick to call Mumu. As Mumu arrives there, Sionje briefs him on the situation and tells him that he's going to pass the reign of the successor guardian deity. Placing his hand on Mubu's chest, CMJ passes the energy, and behold a new guardian deity is formed. In the meanwhile, CMJ decides that since he has nothing to do in this old age, he'll be going to Huazin with Mumu. Despite being nervous, Gu Yang Poon claims that he doesn't know how things will turn out, but he'll come to Huazin too. Now as Sohi is lying on her bed asleep, she's awoken by So Moon's slap. As she opens her eyes, she looks at So Moon with a horrified reaction. In response, so Moon asks her that is it weird that he's still alive. Sweating, So he tells So Moon that she surely stabbed him and he fell off a cliff. Replying with an ominous group, So Moon tells her that he did fall, but the king of hell sent him back, telling him to deliver Soe first. While choking Soe, 
So Moon punches her in the gut and tells her that whilst he wants to kill her this instant, he wouldn't do that, just so he can satisfy Iron Blood's resentment. Feeling extreme anguish, Soe asks So Moon to kill her. However, So Moon tells her that he won't let her die that easy, since she cut off Iron Blood's talons. How would she feel if the skin of her face was peeled off? Screaming, Soe begs So Moon to leave her alone. But instead of peeling off the skin from her face, So Moon starts to dissect her from her hands. Feeling excruciating pain, Soe wakes up and realizes that it was just a dream. I'm sure all of us viewers are wishing that this wasn't a dream somehow. Meanwhile, it seems that the situation between the Patient Palace and the Light Path Coalition has gotten worse. Since on the orders of Se Yun and Dang, an assassination expert, goes to Mount Wa and is able to assassinate several elders. However, when faced with Sang In, he has no choice but to escape, seeing as how the Mount Wa faction must be tired and broken. The Patient decide to attack them before the Shaolin and the rest of the forces can arrive to help them. But hiding in the trees, the three Sangwang decide to act as a wall between the Mount Wa faction and the Patient Palace forces. Just as the Sangwang jump down from the trees, they begin taking on the Dark Path soldiers. Hordes of men then charge at the trio in hopes of overwhelming them. However, using their superior skills, the Sangwang are able to hold on their own. Tired. For a second, Zhou Mun thinks to himself that no matter how many he kills, the guys won't stop attacking. In an attempt of capitalizing on this opportunity just then, a guy tries to behead Joe Mun, but fortunately, Jiang Myung is there to save Joe Mun from becoming headless. However, asking Jiang Myung to duck, Joe Mun stabs another enemy right behind Jiang. As the two brothers rest their backs against each other, they wonder since when the dark path became this vicious, probably since So Moon single handedly altered their plans. Conveniently fighting the enemies with his drunken arts, Dan Gaiyun mentions that the light path has the upper hand in this battle. Hearing this, Jiang Myung tells him that it's good news. But just then, all the soldiers covered in the battle smoke begin coughing blood and falling to the ground. Having just arrived there, Wak Muwan wonders what is going on. In response, someone yells that the Dark Path has released poisoned zombies. As the zombies wreak havoc on anything standing in their way, friend or foe, getting caught in a rage of fury, Wak Muwan dashes at the zombie and strikes them straight on the shoulder. However, is surprised when he realizes that the sword isn't able to cut through the strong metal body. Nevertheless, regaining his composure, Guak Muung continues to strike the zombie in several parts of the body, but at last, he finally realizes that it is destructible. Yet, before he can process his thoughts, he's clawed by the zombie. And as the poison runs rampantly through his body, Guak Muung realizes that he's unable to connect his inner key. Grunting in pain, he asks all the forces to withdraw. Back at the Righteous Path Coalition, the Shaolin leader is terrifyingly shocked to hear what has just happened. In response, Huan Chung explains that Man Doc Mun had used the poison arts, and two experts were also there. Still unable to understand, the Shaolin leader inquisitively asks, wasn't Guak Muun there? Answering with a stoic expression, Huan Chung tells him that Guak Muun and leader Muk couldn't handle the battle pressure and ran away. Just then, Wak Muang storms through the front door and tells them that they stood no chance against the poisoned zombies. A little surprised, Qian Ho questions that the poisonous zombies had been destroyed by So Moon. However, Wak Muang assures them that they indeed were the poisoned zombies. Ordering Wak Muang's wounds to be tended to, at last, Sang An and Qian Ho decide to take matters into their own hands. Meanwhile, So Moon, on the other hand, continues his journey to Mount Wa with an unquenched thirst for revenge. And whilst Huan Yat is against the idea, he has no other option but to stand by his brother's side. On the other hand, assessing the zombies in front of them, Sang Wang talk about So Moon's death as they can't imagine how he defeated all of them and still went to the Dang family palace. The three wonder if Sang In and Qin Ho will be able to take on such a formidable foe. Meanwhile, Man Doc Mun's leader, Wang Mu, along with poison expert Guy Su Gan, mentioned that these zombies are stronger than the ones that So Moon destroyed. Hence, they are perfect and fully capable to bring the light path to its knees. After this brief interaction, the Man Doc Mun troops begin their charge toward the Mount Wa faction. Facing off Sang In, Qian Ho, and Qian Peng stand against Se Yun. However, this time without giving a warning or a chance to give up, Se Yun commands his troops to attack. Meanwhile, the light path also begins its charge. Standing on the front lines, Sang In and Qian Peng decide to take on the poison zombies. Walking with heavy steps, the duo asks the Light Path soldiers to move aside and make way for them. Brushing his beard, 
Sangin mentions that he'll decide how tough these poison zombies are. Whereas, Chun Peng is all about revenge since the zombies were able to defeat his student. Wish I had a teacher who fought for me. Anyhow, without wasting any time, the duo takes their respective stances and slashes the poison zombie with their swords. However, that is to no avail. Seeing this, Sangin realizes that he shouldn't let the fight go on, or else they'll be at an advantage. So getting into a different stance, he infuses his key with his blade and shoots a sword key blast. Just as the blast comes in contact with the zombie, it sends him flying away. But as the battle smoke settles, Sangin is amazed to see the vile creatures still standing. Meanwhile, in an anxious tone, so Yum is informed by his subordinate that the Buddhist master Yang O along with several light path experts has arrived at the battlefield. Hearing this, so Yum is a little surprised. However, trusting his commanders, he orders them to face the experts. Him one gang is the first to charge into the experts. To stop him in his tracks, the experts throw several swords at him. However, using his Spider-Man-like reflexes, him one gang steps over the swords and goes straight for the experts. On the other hand, se Yun prepares to face Yang O, oh, and the two exchange pleasantries. se Yun is the first to use his sword key blast, but Yang O oh easily manages to block it with his wooden stick. Just then, chaos ensues everywhere as the great Buddhist disciples group of the 108 passions run into the battlefield and single-handedly turn the tide of the battle in the light path's favor. Well, not exactly single-handedly, the 216 hands. And last but not least, Mumu arrives too, Carrying a sword, being the OP character he is, he beheads all the zombies standing in their path. Seeing this, Seiyuun commands the patient palace to step back. Bowing down, Seiyuun tells Yang O that he accepts defeat and will be retreating for now. However, before going away, Seiyuun tells Yang O that he's never seen such a monk. In response, Yang O tells him that he's the Shaolin guardian deity, standing like a baddest version of Krillin. Mumu hears praises for himself all around. Now back the Righteous Coalition gathering, the Light Path statistically analyzes their losses and realizes that they suffered a loss of around 1,000 men along with 250 of them being from the Mount Wa and Zhang Nam faction. Saddened, Yang O mentions how much of terrible news this is. However, keeping her head high, the Zug family woman mentions that the Patian too lost 700 men which is still more than half of their original headcount. Trying not to get too far ahead of himself, Yang O reminds all the leaders that the patient's military headquarters is yet to join, so they'll have to prepare thoroughly. Well, Yang O is the one leading the coalition for a reason after all. Meanwhile, back at patient palace's headquarters, Wan Fei hears a brief summary of the events of the battle by Gok Jia. Relieved to hear that the troops managed to do significant damage to the light path despite the group of 108 passions showing up, Wan Fei smiles. Well, at least this guy has emotions. In response, Gokja tells him that it was due to the man Doc Mun that they were able to corner the Light Path army, since their poison zombies were too strong. Surprise, Wan Fei asks, weren't those zombies destroyed by one person? However, Gokja assures him that these zombies are ten times stronger than the previous batch and won't be taken down so easily. Hearing this, Wan Fei decides to order man Doc Mun to make more poison zombies. Meanwhile, on the outskirts of Mount Wall, five Light Path members are searching for medicinal herbs. They end up running into the dark energy hall. As the soldiers come out of the trees, one of the light path warriors, Dang Il Jai, immediately realizes how unfairly numbered they are. If you guys don't remember, Dang Il Jai is the guy that tortured So Moon along with Soe. Moreover, three of the five people gathered there are mere farmers with no skill in martial arts. Talk about having bad luck. Leading the dark energy hall, a scarred man asks the light path representatives to surrender without putting up a fight so that their lives can be spared. However, letting his pride get in the way, one of the soldiers unsheaths his sword and asks the guy to shut up. My man definitely has a death wish. Fortunately, Daniel Jai asks his friend to surrender, since they have three farmers with them that don't have a clue about how to fight. Grunting, as his friend's words get through to him, they both throw their swords. Laughing at this temporary victory, the scarred face man mocks the light path for giving up, but just then, a wooden arrow comes flying and pierces the man's chest. It looks like our boy So Moon is here. Walking like a badass, So Moon enters the battlefield and tells the Dark Energy Hall to get lost if they want to live. I wouldn't mess with a guy who says that. Offended by So Moon's words, the Dark Energy Hall charges him. But now at full strength, So Moon evades the attack and counters with a multi shot formless firing. As some of the soldiers fall prey to So Moon's attacks, they realize that he's the Phantom Archer. 
keeping a stern expression. So Moon draws his bow for another attack. However, Huan Ya stops him and tells him that this much is enough. Complying with his brother's words, So Moon asks the dark energy hall to disappear at once. But as the group runs away, one of the light path warriors attacks them. With a stoic expression, Huan Ya asks him to stop. In response, the guy tells him all the soldiers are simply dogs of the violent and vicious Patient Palace. Hearing this, Huan Ya tells him that Patient Palace is a place that reveres strength. Just because they don't fit the standards of the light path, they aren't supposed to be labeled as violent and vicious. Huan Ya further goes on to tell him that he's from the Patient Palace too, so if he sees all of them as enemies, he should try killing him. Taking up Huan Ya on his offer, the guy brings his sword down on Huan Ya's neck. However, evading at super speed, Huan Ya punches the guy and sends him flying away. Full of rage, Huan Ya unsheathes his sword to take the warrior's life, but this time So Moon asks him to stop. Before stopping, Huan Ya gives the man a piece of his mind and tells him that he's lucky, else he'd have died due to talking bad about the patient. Even though the path that the palace takes is different than the rest, it still isn't as bad as it is perceived to be. A little shocked, So Moon asks Huan Ya if he's really from the patient palace. In response, Huan Ya apologizes for not having told this before, putting all these matters aside, So Moon diverts all his attention to Dang Il Jai. As So Moon's murderous gaze meets Dang Il Jai's eyes, he immediately feels shivers down his spine. Giving an evil grin, So Moon asks Dang Il Jai if he's happy to see him because he sure is. Trying to stand his ground, Dang Il Jai tells him not to hurt anyone else since he's the one who sinned against him. Without wasting a moment in any more dialogue, So Moon kicks Dang Il Jai into oblivion. Going near Dang Il Jai, So Moon asks him to stop saying such pretentious things or he'll throw up seeing his hypocrisy. Begging So Moon, Dang Il Jai tells him to spare the others and just let him die. Maintaining a cold hearted attitude, So Moon asks him for one good reason to let everyone live. In response, Dang Il Jai tells him that none of the people here have hurt him or know about anything, so they don't deserve such a death. Now you got sympathy for others. Looking at Dang Il Jai with a soul piercing gaze, So Moon tells him that Iron Blood was also just a bird that didn't deserve to die. Further pleading his case, Dang Il Jai asks So Moon to only take his life since the others have wives and kids. Finally complying with Dang Il Jai's request, So Moon tells him that he won't kill the others. However, there is a catch if Dang Il Jai opens his eyes or passes out even once, then all the others will be killed too. As So Moon says this, he throws a straight cross and bashes Dang Il Jai's face in. Whilst hitting him with a barrage of punches and kicks, So Moon asks him how it feels to get beat up with his eyes closed, not knowing where the next strike is coming from. This is how he felt when he was blinded by a cloth over his face and he couldn't see where he'd be hit next. Next, grabbing a stick, So Moon asks Dang Il Jai to stand up since he's only started, recalling that he was beaten till both of his arms were broken. So Moon tells Dang Il Jai that he'll break his arms too. Damn, my guy So Moon is on demon time. As So Moon continues hitting Dang Il Jai like a madman, Chun Ha is horrified to see this and asks Huan Ya to stop it. Huan Ya reminds her that they've both seen how much So Moon has gone through these past few months, so it's only fair for him to get his revenge. At last, when Dang Il Jai seems to be at his end, So Moon begins unsheathing his sword. Meanwhile, the onlookers shout at him to stop. On the other hand, the second warrior also gets back up and tells So Moon that this much punishment is surely enough for a man. So Moon tells them that he isn't going to kill Dang Il Jai yet since Dang Il Jai took out his fingernails and put salt in his wounds. But the only problem is that this forest seems to have no salt. Hearing this, the warrior is shocked to learn how cruel So Moon was treated. But having seen enough violence, Chum Ho runs at So Moon and holds him tight from behind asking him to stop. Still full of rage, So Moon tells her to get away since he doesn't want her to hurt. Crying, Chun Ha makes So Moon realize that what he's doing isn't right and this isn't the person she fell for. Seeing Chun Ha's tears, So Moon finally realizes that he got a little carried away. Comforting Chun Ha, So Moon thanks her and tells Dang Il Jai that he better not meet him anywhere. Guess Chun Ha is the strongest creature in the Bow Blade universe, since she can control So Moon. As Dang Il Jai is taken by the farmers, Huan Yao with a slightly saddened expression tells So Moon that they'll part here. Surprised to hear that, So Moon and Chun Ha ask why. Replying, Huan Ya tells So Moon that they don't have any other choice, since the Light Path and the Patient are fighting. If the people in Wazen saw So Moon coming with a Dark Path member, then he'd be in trouble, wouldn't he? Smiling, 
Huan Yao goes on to tell So Moon and Chun Ha that this isn't goodbye and that they'll meet again. Just as the trio part ways, Huan Yao asks So Moon where he's headed to after Huazen. In response, So Moon tells him that he'll be heading back to his hometown. It's about time that old Jeezer got walked by So Moon. Meanwhile, at the Patian Palace headquarters, Nangak comes running in to inform Elder Taizeng, Heaven Wan Gang, and Se Yun that a message from the Dark Energy Hall states that So Moon is still alive. Hearing this, Taizeng takes the report lightly and wonders why Nangak is fussing so much over a single person. However, having seen So Moon's skills, Se Yun immediately asks all the elders to not engage in combat with So Moon if they see him and run away at the first instance. As Taizeng hears this, he's baffled. Meanwhile, News of So Moon being alive also reaches the Nam Gun household. As Hai hears this, she is unable to express her happiness. On the other hand, Jenna also smiles as he believed that So Moon wasn't dead. Zhu Yang Yang exclaims that this might just turn out to be a problem in the end since So Moon hurt someone from a prominent family and might have left him crippled for life. Hearing this, Hai responds to Yang Yang and tells her that Dang Iljai should be crippled for life and moreover. If the Dang family were to persecute So Moon, then she would fight against them. You know I look key like Hai more than Chung Ha. What do you guys think? Now walking with Jinna, Yang Yang tells him that there were reports that some of the Light Path members were injured apart from Dang Il Jai. As the report claims, a guy with So Moon who claimed himself to be from the Patian Palace did this act. Listening to her words closely, Jinna wonders what's going on. To clarify what she meant, Yang Yang mentions to Jin Ah that So Moon might be on the Patian Palace's side. Jin Ah denies any possibility of such a thing and tells Yang Yang that even if such a thing were to happen, the Nam Gung family wouldn't turn their backs on him since he's their hero. Guess the Dang family can learn a thing or two from the Nam Gung family. Meanwhile, at the Dang family household, Dang Mun Yang narrates the recent turn of events that have occurred, giving a sad and yet firm look. Dang Mun Qian accepts that anyone would seek revenge after going through what So Moon went through. And whilst Dang Mun Qian is adamant about facing and atoning for his sins, his younger brother suggests that they send an assassin after So Moon to avoid being humiliated. However, Dang Mun Qian denies this request and tells his brother that he's ready to face being humiliated. Meanwhile, So Moon and Chung Ha finally reach the base of Mount Hua and decide to take a short break there since it seems that Chung Ha is quite tired. Just then, So Moon feels the presence of several warriors. Calling out the warriors, So Moon asks them who they are. However, he's responded to with a question himself Are you the one they call Yolji So Moon? Locating the enemy's position, So Moon draws his bow and shoots a key guided arrow at one of the positions. Fortunately, though, the guy dodges at the last second and begins running away. Without paying any attention, So Moon shoots a second key arrow, but as he does this, he realizes that the guy is his brother Dan Gion. Running away from the arrow, Dan Gion is able to direct it toward a tree and escape death by a few seconds. I mean, maybe he should have introduced himself first rather than asking whether or not So Moon is there or not. Anyhow, following Dan Gion's arrival, the other two brothers also come out of the closet, oh, I mean the bushes. Seeing each other after a long time, the brothers hug as tears of happiness roll down their cheeks. Asking all the important questions first, the trio asks So Moon who the woman accompanying him is. In response, So Moon tells them that she's his wife. Hearing this, the trio run towards Chun Ha and respectfully congratulate her. But it seems Dan Gian has a few screws loose as he's about to ask So Moon about Nam Gung Hai, but luckily at the last moment, Jo Mun covers up Dan's mouth. Dan is definitely the friend that blurts out the most awkward things. Now hiking at Mount Wa, Jia Myung mentions that he was too surprised when he heard about So Moon's death. Furious to hear that the Dang family were the perpetrators behind this, Jia almost tried to attack the Dang palace, but it was Jo Mun who stopped him. As the four of them continue walking, Jia asks So Moon what he'll do now. In response, So Moon tells them that he'll simply repay the debt he owes the Dang family. Unsure of So Moon's words, Jia once again asks So Moon if he'll be fighting against the Dang palace. In response, so Moon tells them he will if he has to. Upon hearing this, the Sambang immediately helps So Moon realize that things aren't going to be as easy since all the other factions of the Light Path would simply let So Moon hurt the Dang family. Walking beside So Moon, Jo Mun also asks him what he wants from the Dang Palace, replying. So Moon tells him that he simply wants So He's life, but the Sanwang asks So Moon if he really thinks that Dang family leader would let him touch his daughter. And if the family leader were to make a move, so would all of the Dang family causing an all-out war. 
The trio further goes on to explain to So Moon that even though he was in the right, he must be the bigger man and let go of revenge. Jo Mun further goes on to explain that even though the Light Path understands his situation, if there's a fight then ultimately they'll support the Dang family. So overcoming the Mount Wa faction, Wang Bo and the Nam Gung family all at once would be quite difficult. Frowning, So Moon tells them that he won't back down from a fight. Meanwhile, Jo Mun further elaborating his point tells So Moon that he'll have to kill countless people unrelated to the matter. Moreover, he may have to fight the beggar's sect, disciples of Mount Wa and the Sanwang themselves. So would he be able to kill them all? Knowing that Jo Mun is speaking the truth, So Moon turns his head away. Furthermore, Jo Mun asks So Moon that if he were to die, how would the people that drew swords against him would feel? Moreover, what about his wife? How would she feel? Not having any answers to such tough questions, So Moon stays silent. Looking at So Moon with a saddened expression, Jo Mun tells him to plan his revenge thoughtfully. On the other hand, GM explains that the Dang family hasn't had it easy either. Ever since the news of So Moon's death, the Dang family leader and Soe have been in a bad place mentally. Jiem further goes on to explain that when Elder Qin Ho learned about So Moon's death, he asked his son and granddaughter to commit suicide. However, when they couldn't, he tried to behead them, but he was stopped by Sang In. Despite all that, Qin Ho still wouldn't talk to his son or So Yi. Deserved, I'd say. Hearing this, So Moon thinks about how happy Qin Ho was when he sent So Moon to marry So Yi. Having heard and processed his brother's words, So Moon at last tells them that he'll decide what to do once he meets the Dane family. As the day passes, So Moon finally reaches Mount Wa and is given a warm welcome by the Light Path except the Dang family are afraid to even look him in the eye. Whereas, looking at So Moon from afar, Hai is beyond happy but wonders what kind of a relationship Chun Ha has to So Moon. After greeting everyone, at last, So Moon walks up to Hai and tells her that he heard she's been holding on to his bow. Getting extremely flustered, in a very shy body language, Hai gives So Moon his bow back and tells him that she's glad to see him alive. Man. Hai is so cute. Just then Nam Gung Jiung shows up and takes So Moon inside to meet with the elders. As So Moon enters the meeting hall, he's greeted by both Yang O and Sang In. Now seated the elders get right down to business and ask So Moon whether it was he who crippled Dang Il Jai. In response, So Moon confidently admits that it was him. However, the ex-leader of Mount Wa, a Qian Peng is more interested in asking something else. Unintimidated by Qian Peng's words, so Moon asks him to question whatever he wants. With a little fury oozing out of his question, Qian Peng asks So Moon what he was doing traveling with someone from the Patient Palace, who happened to be responsible for the death of one person from the Bak Ma group sent protect Dang Il Jai. Full of rage, Ma Kinyang also asks So Moon what he was doing traveling with someone from the Patient. In response, So Moon tells them that Huan Yan is his sworn brother. Unable to understand, Yang O, tells So Moon that he'll have to explain himself since someone from the Righteous Coalition was injured. Obliging Yano's words, So Moon explains that he didn't know that Huan Yao was from the Patian Palace until he injured someone from the Bak Ma. So Moon further goes on to state that even though they were sworn brothers, he didn't creep into his past nor did he care. And while So Moon could have stopped Huan Ya, at that moment his eyes were locked on Dang Il Jai only. As So Moon finishes explaining himself suddenly, Qin Ho enters the room and with a very saddened expression tells So Moon to go outside as the Dang family is waiting. Seeing his beloved So Yi after so long, So Moon tells her that he's been dying for this very moment. Not being able to look So Moon in the eyes, Dang Mun Qian tells him that they didn't properly find out who he was and made a mistake. So the Dang family has nothing to offer except ask for forgiveness. Hearing this, So Moon erupts into laughter as he mentions that the Dang family destroyed his whole body and now has the audacity to call it a mistake and ask forgiveness. Intervening into the conversation, Dang Mun Young tells So Moon that everyone has contemplated what they did and even after six months of the event. The Dang Palace has nothing to say. They better not have anything to say. Further pleading the Dang family's case, Mun Young tells So Moon that they even put up a memorial tablet for Iron Blood and him and grieved his loss for the past 10 months. Hearing this, so Moon instantly gets angered and asks Mun Young if he's implying that the Dang family spent their days in agony while he was spending them leisurely. Tearing off his shirt, So Moon shows the cruel family how they scarred his body forever. With his voice shaking out of pure fury, So Moon tells them that he couldn't make a fist. The doctor said he may not be able to use his martial arts again. At the point, as he despaired, 
He wanted to die, but thinking of Iron Blood and how the Dang family laughed whilst rubbing salt into his wounds, so Moon survived hell. As all the atrocities of the Dang family are learned by everyone gathered, Dang Mun Qian falls to his knees and asks So Mu to take his life. However, unable to see her father sacrifice herself, So Yi offers up herself and tells her father if she dies then everything will be all right eventually. Thank God, So Yi finally gets it. As So Moon walks towards the murderer of Iron Blood, Chung Ha in a low voice tells So Moon that it's enough and that everyone understands So Moon's agony. She goes on to tell So Moon that the Dang family has already contemplated their mistakes. Plus, killing someone's parents in front of them is just too cruel, and killing someone's child is even worse. However, without paying any attention, So Moon continues to march forward. Continuing her dialogue, Chung Ha states that she hate to see So Moon lose his life, no matter how right he may be. She doesn't want anyone to die. And then at last comes the big reveal when Chun Ha tells So Moon that she doesn't want her child to grow up without a father. As these words ring in So Moon's ears, he immediately wonders what is going on. To clear So Moon's confusion, Jo Mun tells him that since Chun Ha's complexion wasn't good, they asked the clinic to check her pulse, and it seems that there is a new life forming inside of her. Well, that escalated quickly. A man So Moon has come from being a child to a freaking dad. As So Moon hears that, all his rage quiets down and he comforts Chung Ha. Still upset by everything around her, Chung Ha asks So Moon to forgive the Dang family and leave, but still adamant about taking revenge for Iron Blood's death. So Moon asks her woman what about Iron Blood? Just then, she and Ho bows his head and tells So Moon that it's all his fault since he was negligent in leading the palace properly. However, So Moon being the kind-hearted man, he asks the elder to get up. Seeing she and Ho in such a state, So Moon asks Dang Mun Qian, take his father inside and tells him that he'll leave and forget everything. As the Dang family shows their gratitude to So Moon for his forgiveness. However, before So Moon takes his leave, the Sam Wang surround him and tell him to stay here so they can have fun together after all this time. As So Moon is walking with his brothers, he looks up to the sky and sees a bird flying around. As So Moon sees this, he recalls Iron Blood and how So Yi killed him. Recalling this memory, so Moon asks the Dang family to return Iron Blood's talons to him. Just then, he sees So Yi wearing it as a bracelet. Looking at this blasphemous act, So Moon fills up with rage and fury. On the other hand, at the Shaolin Temple, Xian Jie and Gu Yang Pung are playing a game. Xian Jie mentions that he's worried about So Moon's return since he must be looking for revenge. However, Gu Yang Pung asks him not to worry since he believes that So Moon is a kind soul, so he'll forgive the Dang family. Furthermore, Gu Yang Poon tells Xian Jie that in case So Moon goes out of control, then the guardian deity will be able to subdue him. Hearing this, Xian Jie realizes that Gu Yang Poon is ignorant of the fact that So Moon is much stronger as compared to Mumu. Just then, the two of them feel a huge power surge from the Mount Wa faction. Seeing this, Xian Jie and Gu Yang Poon, along with Mumu, decide to rush there. On the other hand, So Moon, now engulfed by a bloodthirsty rage, walks intimidatingly towards So Yi. As So Moon does this, he maniacally laughs as he asks the Dang family, how hard do they think Iron Blood would laugh at him for backing away with just a few apologies? Completely blinded by anger as So Moon walks towards the Dang family, Chung Ha stands in her way and stops him. However, So Moon pushes her aside and marches ahead. As So Moon walks past the surrounding Light Path members, the people begin choking due to his blood lust. Standing aside, Makin Yang asks So Moon to stop and orders all of his troops to attack him. Following his command, certain Zhang Nam faction disciples led by Oh Sang stand in his way and ask him to stand back. Underestimating So Moon, Oh Sang thinks to himself that he has the upper hand in close range combat since he's an archer. Where have we seen something like this before? However, in a split second, So Moon closes the gap between himself and Oh Sang. Before Oh Sang can pull out his sword, so Moon grabs him by the throat and picks him up. In a very cold yet monotonous tone, So Moon asks if he has a death wish, seeing his disciple being choked to death. Mak and Yang ask the other to attack So Moon. As the Zhang Nam soldiers jump on So Moon, he easily evades their attack while still holding on to Oh San. Seeing this, Mak and Yang asks So Moon to let his disciple go. Listening with the Zhang Nam faction leader's commands, So Moon throws Oh San into his teacher. As he holds his unconscious student in his arms, Makin Yang braces himself to take on So Moon and reminds him that he can't lose to him or else the reputation of the Zhang Nam faction will turn to ashes. Backing himself, 
Machin Yang swings his sword at So Moon. However, So Moon with ease dodges all of them and asks Machin Yang, How dare you challenge me with those measly skills? Using his simplest technique, So Moon counters back with the pressure of Mount Tai. Dodging the first attack at the last moment, Machin Yang takes a sigh of relief only to realize that he has fallen for So Moon's technique. As the onlookers shout in fear, So Moon cuts Machin Yang in half and sends him to his death. Seeing this, Sangin realizes that So Moon has crossed a line he shouldn't have because ever since the nine great factions came to being, certain factions would become stronger, yet they would respect the hierarchy of power. Whenever a greater threat would come, the nine factions would unite with each other to fight against the bigger threat, no matter what internal hostility and conflict between the nine great factions. After having killed the one standing in his path, So Moon looks back at Soe with a menacing look and asks her if she contemplated and apologized as she said. But just then, Guakuo Wool of Mount Wa stands in So Moon's path and tells him that he won't let him get through to the Dang family. Just then, So Moon hears Jiang Myung's sound transmission telling him that Wa Wool is his brother. Realizing the difference in strength, Jiang asks So Moon not to kill him. Honoring his friend's request, So Moon asks the guy to back down. But too stupid to realize the difference in power, Wa Wool uses the 36 Plum Blossom stance and swings his sword at So Moon. However, without even breaking a sweat, So Moon manages to dodge all his attacks. Now coming up with a new strategy at last, Wa Wool decides to use his ace attack, the 18 Fallen Petal Sword Arts, a move that deceives the opponent's eyes whilst also maintaining an element of extreme agility. As the onlookers see this, they think that So Moon's only option is to retreat, but they are dearly mistaken. At the last, the duelists decide to decide the outcome using agile swordsmanship. As they finish their sentences, the two charge at each other. However, it's So Moon who ends up holding a sword to Wa Wool's throat. After the two pay each other their respects, several soldiers from the Zhang Nam faction and the Dang family begin attacking. But needless to say, they all are quick to get their throats slit against So Moon too. At last, Yang O, along with his Shaolin monks, also witnesses the massacre done by So Moon. As So Moon looks at his enemy standing in front of him, he hears Hai's voice, who also happens to take down several enemies as she mentions that she won't let anyone touch the hero of the Nam Gung family. That's why I love Hai more man. As Sangin sees Hai fighting against the Dang, he's utterly disappointed at how things have turned. On the other hand, Qian Peng, Ilgeg Jinin, and Guak Mu Un decide to stop So Moon together. Not wasting a second, the three strike together. However, in one sword swing, So Moon is able to block all of their attacks. Watching from the sidelines, Huang Chung, the beggar sect leader, is unable to believe that someone is able to block the attack of such elites all alone. All pumped up watching such a thrilling battle, Huang Chung also runs into the battlefield. As the battle turns into a four against one, So Moon is finally caught by an attack and feels a stinging pain in his gut. Tending to the wound, So Moon notices that it's one of Iron Blood's talons that So Yi stabbed him with while he wasn't paying attention to her. Now I'm diverting her attention back to So Yi. So Moon draws his bow and fires several key guided arrows. In attempts at protecting Soe, several Dang family members are hit by the key arrows. However, one of the key arrows eventually makes its way to Soe. Fortunately for her, Dang Mun Qian deflects the arrow with his sword at the last second. Now furious beyond the point of holding back, So Moon, at last, raises his sword and uses the third step of the peerless triple unity blade, Endless Blade. As So Moon shoots an enormous amount of key, everything in the path of that attack is vaporized. Hiding behind a wall, Mumu, Sianjay, and Gu Yang Pung all are in awe of So Moon's true power. On the other hand, witnessing this demolition as the battle smoke settles, saying it is unable to believe that a human is capable of withholding so much power. Meanwhile, So Moon, after obliterating anything and everything in his path, finally gets to Soe, menacingly smiling at her. So Moon tells her that this moment reminds him of the time when she killed Iron Blood. Crushing her right hand with his iron grip, So Moon smacks her. As So He falls to the ground, her screams of horror intensify when So Moon continues to break her hands with his feet. Just then Yang O asks So Moon to stop and tells him that his crimes can no longer be unanswered for. Following this, the group of 108 passions of the Shaolin Temple square up against So Moon, but unintimidated. So Mu shoots a key blast at him to understand how powerful the group is. Seeing this sight from the sidelines, Xian Jie wonders who is going to win. In response, Gu Yang Poon tells Xian Jie that if So Mu's body was in the perfect state, then he'd have won, but as things are right now, he may lose his life 
if you were to continuously use Peerless Triple Unity Blade. After having heard Gu Yang's opinion, Xianjie orders Mu Mu to tell everyone to stop fighting. Well, I'm glad at least So Moon has some friends left, and whilst Mu Mu relays this information to the other monks, suddenly, Qian Ho appears and tells So Moon that all this mess happened because he failed as the family elder. Requesting So Moon to talk to Soe, Qian Ho walks up to her granddaughter. Seeing a semblance of hope, Soe screams out Grandpa, only to realize that he's here to take her life. As Qian Ho chokes Soe to death, he apologizes to her for doing this and tells So Moon to no longer pursue revenge because of Soe, because she's already going on to the afterlife. Okay, I took an extremely dark turn. As Xian Ho picks up his granddaughter's lifeless body in her hands, he tells Dang Mun Qian that it is due to his mistakes that such fate became inevitable. Crying, Qian Ho tells So Moon that he's extremely ashamed that his family denied the blessing from God and that he failed to make the strongest warrior in China a part of his family. Seeing Qian Ho in such a state, at last, So Moon also tells him that everything is good now and he no longer wants revenge. But then, Oh Sang stands up and tells So Moon that he wants revenge for all the Light Path members that have fallen. But giving Oh Sang an angry look, both Sang In and Qian Ho ask him to leave the matter aside else this vicious cycle of revenge will never end. Listening to the Elder's words, the John Man faction also decides to back down. Well, glad this is over. I was sweating worrying about how this would end. Just then Moo Moo pops out of the blue and greets So Moon. After the two exchange pleasantries, Mumu tells So Moon that Xion Jie has invited him to meet privately. Following Mumu's lead, So Moon is led to the Dragon Temple. There, So Moon's wounds are tended to, and he finally reunites with both Gu Yang Pong and Xion Jie. After all of them greet each other and meet So Moon's lovely bride, all of them sit down together. There, Gu Yang Pong asks So Moon what martial arts he used. In response, So Moon tells him that it is the Peerless Triple Unity Blade. Hearing that. Gu Yang Pung smiles and mentions that he now understands why So Moon refused his martial arts. Zhou Mun, also accompanying So Moon, joins them and asks his grandfather to know the same martial arts as him. Hearing this, So Moon smiles and tells him that he just happened to meet this old man when he was in Jungwon. Confused, Zhou Mun wonders what's going on. Smiling, So Moon tells Zhou Mun that it's Gu Yang Pung, the legend himself. Hearing this, Zhou Mun claims that he heard that Gu Yang Pung had died. However, so Moon reminds Jo Mun of the rumor of his death, now speaking in a more serious tone. So Moon tells Jo Mun that his life was saved by Chun Ha, and he happened to save the life of the old man. But getting to the main point, Jo Mun asks So Moon what he's planning on doing now. Without giving it much thought, So Moon replies that he'll be going back to his hometown. Well, it's about time that grandfather got a beating. But just then, Xiaven Jie asks So Moon to wait a minute and tells him to stay here till the battle with the Dark Path is over. Frowning, So Moon tells Xiaven Jie that he doesn't want to stay here any longer. However, Xiaven Jie reminds So Moon that half of the Light Path forces were injured whilst trying to stop him, so it's his responsibility to stay back. I mean, that's fair game in all honesty. However, favoring So Moon, Xiaven Jie tells him that he doesn't have to fight but only gives the army his protection. Understanding Xiaven Jie's words, so Moon's expression immediately changes into a sad one as he thinks about how Jia Myung is doing. In response, Jo Mun tells him that he doesn't know since he accompanied So Moon immediately after the battle, but it may be that he's with his family since many of them were hurt during the fight. Ashamed of his actions, So Moon thinks that Jia must be blaming him. However, Jo Mun reassures So Moon that it wouldn't be the case since Jia would understand. After reflecting on his actions, so Moon realizes that he ended up hurting a lot of people because of his revenge. So to make up for it, he'll stay back for now. Someone play the Thorfinn music, guys. Meanwhile, at the Patian Palace, Gokja informed the leader about So Moon's return. However, the leader pays little to no attention to it since he's more excited to hear that Huan Yan is back in action. Hearing this, Gokja wonders how the leader can keep So Moon on a lower status than Huan Yan even after hearing all of his feats. But Guan Fei assures Gokja that Huan Yan is a talent unlike anyone since he was trained in martial arts by Gu Yang Pung from a very young age. Even though no one has seen Huan Yao's full strength, the leader himself speculates that Huan Yao might just be even stronger than him. As Gok Jia hears this, he's baffled. On the other hand, Huan Yao finally arrives at the Dark Path headquarters near Mount Wa. As he meets So Yun, he's asked about his brotherhood with So Moon. Not shying away from the truth, Huan Ya tells Se Yun that he saved him without knowing his identity and the two of them eventually became sworn brothers. 
Just then, Taizing also enters the scene and gives Seiyun a report narrating the events that had gone down at the Mount Wa faction. Learning that the Light Path is now in half of its original strength, Taizing encourages Seiyun to attack tonight, so they can capitalize on this opportunity. Unsure about the matter, Seiyun asks Huanya's opinion on the matter. Responding to Seiyun, Huanya mentions that it's better for them to wait until So Moon leaves for his village since things might turn out in the Light Path's favor as So Moon fights for them. First time ever seeing an MC's power being respected in a Manwa. Meanwhile, near the surrounding area of Mount Wa, an unfamiliar face appears. As one of the medicinal herb collectors from the Light Path is roaming around the forest, he happens to see the old man and wonders about his business here. But to his surprise, the old man notices his presence quivering in fear as the farmer comes out. Using his overwhelming bloodlust, the old man asks if So Moon is still in Mount Wa. What is it with So Moon and old man? After learning the truth about the matter, the old man leaves the farmer unharmed. Realizing that he just leaked information without confirming the old man's identity, the farmer too runs back and forms the righteous coalition of the matter. On the other hand, the weirdly suspicious old man reaches the patient headquarters set up nearby. Not recognizing him, the guards try to stop him. Using his agility techniques, the old man easily manages to get away and meet Nangak. As Nangak and several other higher up of the Patian meet the old man, they bow in respect to their elder Sama Hu. But keeping the pleasantry short, Sama Hu and the rest sit down together for a meeting. Sama Hu immediately makes it clear that he's here for the phantom archer, So Moon. However, trying to learn about his enemies, he asks the one person who is close enough with So Moon, Huanya, if he thinks So Moon will be able to beat the great Sama Hu. In response, Huan Ya, whilst maintaining a smile on his face, tells So Ma Hu that So Moon will definitely overpower him if he's not careful enough. As So Ma Hu hears these words, excitement and adrenaline begin running wildly in his veins as he's dying to meet the Phantom Archer. Meanwhile, at the Mount Wa faction, as all the elders sit down together and ask the farmer several questions, Stang In is the first to anticipate So Ma Hu to be the Bo King. As the rest of the elder, So Ma Hu's name chaos and panic erupts all around. However, for our boy So Moon, he's as chill as ever. So to help him better understand the complexity of the matter, Gu Yang Poon gives a brief history lesson and goes on to explain that there are five kings of different martial arts in China: Bow King, Blade King, Fist King, Poison King, and Qian Ho. Gu Yang further goes on to state that whilst Sang and could have been the Blade King too, at the top of his fame, he lost a duel against the Blade King at the time, not allowing him to carry the title. Giving a piece of his own mind, Zhou Mun also tells everyone that the reason Sa Ma whose name isn't as widespread as all the other kings are due to the fact of his late entry into the Mirin world. But despite his age, his ability to take town experts using a single red arrow is astonishing. As So Moon learns all of this, he tells Gu Yang Poon that it isn't the case since he's seen it himself that the Poison King is much weaker than Qian Ho and Sang In. However, Gu Yang explains to So Moon that there's a huge gap of power between the kings and each king is the best in their own respective field. Whilst Qi and Ho and the Poison King are put aside, the other three kings are in a constant argument to prove themselves to be the strongest. Diverting his attention to Zhou Mun for a minute, Gu Yang tells him that there is yet to be a sword king because there wasn't a comparably good sword expert when these kings came to be. A little surprised, so Moon intervenes and asks Gu Yang what about the sword skills when compared to the ex Patian leader himself. In response, Gu Yang tells that he's fought the Bo King before and the fight itself was quite challenging and scary. Even though Gu Yang came out victorious in the end, he still thinks that Sa Ma Hu held back a bit. After the fight was over, the two decided to form a brotherly bond for the rest of their lives. Now almost speaking in a challenging tone, Gu Yang tells So Moon that if he's so curious about the Bo King, then he can just fight him since the Bo King is here all the way from his hometown just to meet the Phantom Archer. So Moon's definitely had a rise in his popularity poll. Unintimidated, So Moon mentions that this should be interesting. As the conversation between So Moon and Gu Yang ends, So Moon finally steps outside of the temple with Chung Ha to take his leave. After exchanging goodbyes and blessings as So Moon and Chung Ha head out, Gu Yang follows them along the way. Not this again. And as So Moon is walking back to his hometown, he thinks to himself that every bad thing that has ever happened to him happens when Gu Yang Poon is around. So he urges Gu Yang not to follow him. Dismissing So Moon, Gu Yang tells him that the Bo King will follow him to even hell and back, 
and he's definitely going to miss such a banger battle. Ignoring Gu Yan. So Moon continues to go forward until he runs into Dam Gion and Jian Myung, who takes So Moon and the rest of his party for drinks. In the meantime, sitting in a small hut, two experts from the man Doc Mun, Gai Su Gan, and Poison Hand Bong Qian receive a letter with instructions to assassinate So Moon. Well, we've never seen this go horribly wrong, the assassin, am I right? Whilst Bong Qian is cautious about the letter and wonders if it could be a trap, Jai Sugan is full of fury and rage as he awaits to avenge the death of comrades and brothers of Man Dot Mun. Now back to So Moon walking down the mountain, he finally runs into Sa Ma Hu, who happens to be accompanied by Huan Ya. At first, So Moon glares at Gu Yang. But Gu Yang assures So Moon that he didn't send Sa Ma Hu any message or something. After both So Moon and Huan Ya exchange pleasantries, Sa Ma Hu greets Gu Yang and tells him that he and the Blade King couldn't stop laughing when they heard that about the ex-Patient Leader's death. Looking at So Moon gratefully, Gu Yang replies that if it wasn't for So Moon, he'd have died. In response, So Ma Hu tells Gu Yang that Huan Ya already told him everything. Hearing this, Gu Yang scolds Huan Ya for sharing such information since it could put his father at risk. So Ma Hu assures Gu Yang that it was Wan Pei himself that came to him and told him all the details. A little saddened and curious by the events taking place, Sa Ma Hu then asks Gu Yang that even though the underlings had many complaints why didn't he take care of them and let his student turn into the most despised human in China. Hearing this conversation closely, So Moon and the San Wang finally realize that Huan Ya is the current patient leader's son. Suddenly, with a dejected expression, Gu Yang replies that he didn't want anything to do with war. All he cared about was to see the Shaolin martial arts that defeated him over 40 years ago. In those 40 years of peace, the patient palace got extremely strong. Eventually, this strength got to their head and they betrayed their leader, so that they can attack the light path. Holding his missing arm, Gu Yang goes on to mention that whilst he had foreseen this outcome, Gok Jia's scheme ended up being beyond his understanding, resulting in Gu Yang losing an arm and two precious underlings that died for him. R.I.P. Underlings Just as Gu Yang finishes explaining his situation, he asks the San Wang not to tell anyone. With a saddened expression, Zhou Mun exclaims that so many people have died. Gu Yang responds to him and tells him that there's nothing anyone can do about it. Furthermore, as annoying as it may sound, Gu Yang claims if the light path had gotten stronger, they'd have attacked the patient first. Listening to this, Jia Myung agrees with Gu Yang's words. However, Jia Myung also reminds Gu Yang that the light path hasn't lost a single battle outlandishly and things have been pretty even with the dark path for now. Confident in his group, Jiam is all pumped to let Gu Yang know that the light path will not fall. In response, Gu Yang tells Jiam that they'll eventually find out about it. On the other hand, Sam Ma Hu diverts his attention to So Moon after exchanging introductions. The two go deeper into a forest to duel. Now standing square of each other, Sam Ma Hu tells So Moon that mostly all the people in Gango preferred not to use the bow. So back when he was a kid, he picked a bow to be different. Further elaborating on his statement, Sa Ma Hu then goes on to ask So Moon what makes a bow a special weapon in a battle. In response, So Moon tells him that because the bow is simply a bow. I'm not joking, he actually said that. Raking into laughter, Sa Ma Hu hands So Moon some arrows and the two take their positions. But just before the duel starts, Gu Yang tells the Bow King that So Moon's agility technique is two levels above his. As the Bow King hears this, he anxiously laughs and thinks to himself that he's not quite sure if he win or not. However, Loving the adrenaline rush, he decides to duel So Moon anyway. Drawing their bow, both So Moon and Sa Ma Hu begins enwrapping their arrows in their keys and shoot simultaneously. Barely moving, So Moon manages to dodge the attack, and so does Sa Ma Hu. Now as the battle smoke from the sheer force of the arrows settles, So Moon thinks to himself that he finally understands why Sa Ma Hu is called the Bow King. Walking towards So Moon, so Ma Hu makes his excitement clear and tells So Moon that he's finally met the person he has been searching for. Saying this, he shoots three more arrows, but So Moon standing his ground also replies with shooting three arrows. As So Ma Hu's arrow near So Moon's body, he dodges all of them in the Matrix style. Whereas So Ma Hu jumps over So Moon's attack. Now down to his last three arrows, So Moon spans a similar attack as So Ma Hu. However, both of them not only dodge it but also break the arrows. Seeing as to now, So Moon has no arrow left, Sa Ma Hu urges him to go all out. Listening to the Elder's command, So Moon draws his bow and shoots a key arrow using formless firing. Meanwhile, 
Chum has sitting along with the Sam Wang worry if So Moon will be alright. But So Moon's brother assures him that everything will be okay and to lighten up the mood joke about Dan Bayan's intellect. Whenever there's a trio of friends, one of them is just there to be bullied. Now back to the fight between the Bo King and So Moon. As Sa Ma Hu sees the key arrow flying aim at blistering speed, he's overwhelmed by it and jumps over it using the Egret flight. As he does this, he realizes that he's fallen for So Mu's trick, and another key arrow is coming at him whilst he's in midair. Unable to do much, Sa Ma Hu deflects it using his bow, and is immediately put on the back foot by So Mu by the barrage of arrows shot at him. Now totally corn at the last, the Bull King ends up using the Lazy Donkey Roll, a move that is helpful in a tricky situation. But the position is so embarrassing that most martial artists prefer death over it. At last, when So Mu stops shooting to regain his key, he thinks to himself that he wasn't even able to land a single hit. Giving So Moon a thumbs up, Salma Hu tells him that he's glad that So Moon didn't disappoint him. But now it's Salma Hu's time to show his technique. As Salma Hu shoots an arrow and So Moon replies with a key arrow. But just as the two come in contact, Salma Hu's arrow deflects using So Moon's key arrow and comes straight for the phantom archer's head. Realizing that there's no time to counter the attack, So Moon quickly takes a step back in hopes of creating some space between him and the arrow. Now completely on the back foot, So Moon thinks to himself that there's nothing he can do right now but keep on moving because if he gets hit even once then, it'd be bad news for him. Having no other option as a means of retreat, So Moon also eventually pulls out the lazy donkey roll and is finally able to find enough room to shoot some of his own key arrows. But not giving So Moon a minute to settle, Salma who also shoots his arrow, and as the two arrows strike each other, a huge shockwave is sent around. Looking at this, Salma Hu is completely awed by So Moon. Now as the two warriors stand face to face, Salma Hu tells So Moon that he can't stop admiring his techniques, since he once studied formless firing once but wasn't able to keep up with the energy expenditure from the attack. Well, becoming the bull king at 40 gotta have its downsides I guess. Salma Hu then further explains that when he realized that formless firing wasn't feasible for him and the sensation of the arrow rubbing against the bow was too hard to let go. Ayo, this sounds kinda wrong. Anyhow, when he realized those things, this king developed his own skill known as the illusion shooting. He further goes on to tell So Moon that formless firing and a sword dance are quite similar since they both require real and virtual focus simultaneously. Similarly, illusion shooting was created inspired by the illusion blade. Hearing all of this, So Moon tells So Ma Hu that he has a trump card up his sleeve too, but he is yet to perfect it. Replying to So Moon, So Ma Hu decides that they both should go all out to evaluate their skills. As the two warriors draw their bows, they warn each other of the harm that they might receive. Just then, So Ma Hu shoots three arrows, whereas So Moon shoots three key arrows. Much to So Moon's surprise, So Ma Hu's three arrows divide into several arrows creating an illusion. Baffled by this attack, So Moon closes his eyes in hopes of sniffing out the real arrows using his senses, but just then an arrow brushes his cheek, opening a slight wound and whilst the second arrow that is headed for the chest is blocked. The third arrow strikes So Moon straight in the knees, making him kneel. On the other hand, Sa Ma Hu is also struck by a key arrow in the side of his abdomen, bleeding heavily from his guts as Sa Ma Hu tries to stop his blood. He thinks to himself that he dodged So Moon's arrows for sure, but how could this be? It is then that he realizes the arrows changed directories and came back for him from behind. Now as the duel comes to a halt with So Moon as the clear winner, Huan Ya, Gu Yang Pung, and the two warriors gather up. Whilst everyone is trying to understand what they just witnessed, So Moon explains to them that he was able to combine the key guided arrow with formless firing, hence resulting in this attack. Impressed by So Moon's attack, So Ma Hu asks him for his skill art's name, but So Moon has no words. So to repay So Moon for such an excellent duel, So Ma Hu names his arts, Peerless Bow Art. At first, So Moon tries to deny the request, but upon Huan Ya's word, So Moon finally decides to name his bow art the Peerless Bow Art. Now gathered around the group shares a wholesome conversation and there are smiles and laughter all around. Finally, been a while since a chapter ended on a good note. Meanwhile, the Sam Wang are sitting with Chung Ho wondering when So Moon will come back and discuss how the duel must be going. Suddenly, the three hear someone tell them to worry about their own lives. As the Sam Wang stand up and cover Chung Ha, they ask the surrounding soldier who they are. In response, Jai Sugan tells the Sam Wang to think hard, because they met just a few days ago. Hearing this, Jian Myung realizes that these guys are a part of Man Doc Mun. 
pointing towards Chonha. Daisugan asks the trio to hand over Chonha in exchange for their lives. However, the three brothers are extremely offended by Daisugan even proposing that idea and asking him to bring it on. Man, wish I had friends like So Moon. My guy sure is blessed. Now, guarding Chungha, Jo Mun mentions that they'll have to hold their ground until So Moon arrives. Jio Myung assures Jo Mun that they can stand their ground against such soldiers. As several man Doc Mun soldiers attack Jio Myung, easily manages to send them all to their deaths. As the fight proceeds, Jio Myung is about to dash at the soldiers. Jo Mun asks him to stop since it would break the formation. Realizing that these are only proficient in poison, Dan Gayan gives everyone hope that they stall till So Moon arrives. Meanwhile, standing with So Mu Ha and the rest, So Moon tells them that he's simply trying to get back to his hometown and isn't interested in fighting the Blade and the Fist King. Both Gu Yang and Sa Ma Hu tell So Moon that they will hunt him down if they find out he's stronger than the Bow King. Whispering in So Moon's ear, Huan Ya tells him that they aren't so strong as he believes he can take them on with ease. Sama Hu tells Huan Ya that he doesn't believe So Moon will be able to defeat the Blade and Fist King. Gu Yan Poon tells So Ma Hu that So Moon's sword art is even better than his bow skill. And whilst he hasn't experienced it firsthand, if the two of them were to fight then So Moon would probably beat him. Hearing this, So Ma Hu is bewildered and asks So Moon for a round two but with the sword this time. Even though hesitant at first, So Moon gives in to his kind request. Now as the two take stances, Sama Hu uses his illusion shooting. Using his sword Key Blast, So Moon can overcome the attack and close the gap between him and the Bow King in one instance and bring his sword down upon him. Respecting his elders, So Moon only slashes So Ma Hu's clothes. Seeing this, Gu Yan Pung is amazed and asks So Moon what he just did, since it was different from the technique back at Mount Wa. In response, So Moon tells him that he mixed up the first and second steps of the peerless Triple Unity sword art. Meanwhile, completely awed by So Moon's power and capabilities, So Ma Hu tells him that he finally understands why Huan Yao is stopping the Fist and Blade King from facing against him. And whilst things are going smoothly for So Moon, on the other hand, the situation is getting grimmer by the moment at the Sang Wang's end. Mocking the defenders of Chungha, Gai Su Gan upon hearing Ji Myung's challenge for a duel brings out a poison zombie. And not just any poison zombie, but a Hulk-like poison zombie. Well, remember when I said it's been a while since a chapter ended on a good note? I should've known that something bad was coming. Having no other option but to protect the honor of their brother So Moon, the San Wang, despite the overwhelming difference in strength, decides to stall for time as long as they can. Now as the zombie throws a straight right, Jia Myung is the first to charge it and after dodging the punch, strikes him in the head. But that does little to no damage, following that Jo Mun gives the zombie a powerful kick to the jaw. But instead of giving any damage, Jo Mun receives it himself as he's sent flying by the zombie's punch. Trying to cover up his brother, Dan Gyeom then strikes the zombie's neck, but since it's too thick for the sword to penetrate, Dan Gyeom is also forced to retreat. Now at last, seeing how this fight isn't going anywhere, Gyeom Myung decides to use his trump card by utilizing the destructive sword arts. Taking his stance, he uses ascending flying dragon technique, which is essentially a sword key blast. As the sword key blast hits the zombie, he blocks it with his hand. Trying to capitalize on this opportunity, Jiam Myung then dashes at the zombie. However, he's easily punched away. Now as Jiam Myung lies down on the ground defenseless, the zombie charges at him. But fortunately, Dan Gaian comes to his rescue and shields him with his own body but ends up getting clawed by the zombie in the back. Distracting the monster from his brother, Jo Mun kicks it in the head but is easily sent flying away by the poison zombie right under the feet of Gai Sogan. Grinning at his victor, the evil man orders the zombie to kill Jo Mun. And as Chung Ha hears this, she screams in horror. However, Gai Sugan asks her to shut up and tells her that she's next. Now as the zombie picks Jo Mun to land the final bow, So Moon senses something to be wrong and fires key bow that strikes the zombie's hand. But before Jo Mun can fall to the ground, using his agile technique, So Moon grabs him and asks the other Sang Wang to take care of him. Finally seeing the phantom archer himself, Jai Sugan expresses his acknowledgement. However, So Moon is too angry to even think straight and simply asks Gai Sugan who he is. Hearing So Moon's question, Gai Sugan is amazed as he reminds So Moon that he's the successor of Man Dot Mun, and he remembers how So Moon not only humiliated but also caused the death of over half of the Man Dot Mun's forces. 
Recalling this, So Moon realizes that there wasn't any need for him to fight Man Doc Mun since it led to him getting injured and then Iron Blood's death back when he was tortured by the Dang family. A little ashamed of his actions, So Moon frowns and tells him that it was a canon event. Hearing this, Jai Sugan is infuriated and orders the poisonous zombie to kill So Moon. With the help of Dan Gaian's weapon, So Moon rocks the zombies' heads hard. And as the two face off in a battle of ki and poison, so Moon starts degenerating due to the poison. Seeing this, Gai Sugan tells So Moon that this Hulk zombie isn't a normal zombie that was a corpse, but rather someone with an intellect. Okay, now that's messed up. But then suddenly, the other Dark Path experts such as the Bo King and Gu Yang Pum arrive. Now answering to the superior, Gai Sugan lies and tells So Ma Hu that he had planned on challenging So Moon after their duel, but since So Moon arrived first, they thought he had killed the Bo King and were trying to avenge him. Mate, be a story writer rather than a warrior because you sure know how to paint a narrative. On the other hand, So Moon heals his hand using the pure Semity fire and runs to his brother Jo Mun's aid. However, it's too late for him. Crying Jo Mun tells So Moon that he was happy he met him and was able to protect his wife. With such sad words, at last, Jo Mun departs from the world. Not furious at his best friend's death, So Moon stands to fight back. But it seems that Gai Sugan has taken Chun the hostage in the meanwhile. With bloodshot eyes, So Mu tells Gai Sugan to leave Chun He or else Man Doc Mun will be history. Gai Sugan also claims that he can't forget all the comrades that were killed by So Moon. Keeping a sword to Chun He's neck, Gai Sugan apologizes to Sa Ma Hu for using him as bait, but also tells him that if he orders him to stop, then the Man Doc Mun will withdraw. Giving it a thought and analyzing it from a practical viewpoint. Sama who asks Man Doc Mun to withdraw. Obeying to the command, Gai Sugan pushes Chun Ha into So Moon. And as he lives, he gives an ominous smile and tells So Moon that he has a surprise waiting for him. Carrying his brother Jo Mun's lifeless body, So Moon arrives at the Righteous Coalition in Mount Wa, seeing one of their finest warriors having passed away. Yango worriedly asks what's going on. In response, So Moon tells him that Jo Mun has succumbed to the wounds inflicted by a poisoned zombie. Inquiring about his two surviving brothers, So Moon asks about Dan Gion and Jian Myung. In response, Nam Gun Jian tells him that their lives are hanging by a thread and the Dang family is trying their best to cure them. Worried about So Moon's health too, Jian asks if he's alright. Responding to Jian, So Moon tells him that he's okay since he had a duel with a Bo King and came out on top. Just then, Moo Moo with a panicky voice rushes to So Moon and exclaims that Miss Chun Ha collapsed whilst resting. Hearing this, So Moon immediately rushes to the love of his life. Entering her chambers, he finds Gu Yang Pong and Xian Jie already tending to her wounds. Worried to see his wife in such a state, So Moon asks what happened. In response, Gu Yang Pong tells him that she was fine when she came here until a few moments ago. But then she grabbed her chest and started screaming in agony. Trying to communicate with his wife, So Moon asks her what's happening. However, before Chun He can reply, she begins screaming, once more holding onto her chest. Baffled, So Moon asks Seon Jae what's going on, but he's unable to diagnose Chun Ha. So he calls in Chien Ho. Reading Chun Ha's pulse, Chien Ho mentions that a parasite venom has been planted in her body and that there isn't a cure for it yet. Nevertheless, being less knowledgeable about parasite venom, Chien Ho decides to call in a friend. Sitting in a wheelchair, Daniel Ji enters the room and assesses her closely. Looking back at So Moon, he tells him that the starving ghost bug was planted in Chun Ha's body. The bug immediately starts eating the person from the inside. However, the worst bit is that it lays eggs within two hours, and in just three days, the bug devours everything inside of a person's body. Well, that's a rather bad way to go out. Frantic to hear that, So Moon asks what they should do. In response, both Dang Il Ji and Gu Yang Poon tell So Moon that it's better to put down a person sooner than to let them experience the pain of their insides being eaten alive. Talk about a moral dilemma. Not even considering it as an option, So Moon vows to destroy the patient palace if Chun Ho were to die. However, seeing as there's nothing that can be done right now, So Moon denies the option of killing Chun Ho swiftly and falls to his knees as tears roll down his cheeks. Meanwhile, all the elders gather around and wonder if Chun Ho can be cured in any way. As the conversation continues, Everyone learns that Chun Ha's life could be extended by the use of pure Sama D, but that will only kill the babies inside the body. However, there are two issues with this matter. Number one is that the adult bug can't be killed, so it will keep laying more eggs, and secondly, Chun Ha is too weak to withstand the fire. Moreover, 
Another issue arises as the elders don't know of anyone capable of utilizing pure Samadhi. On the other hand, at the Patient Palace's current post, Huan Ya learns from Ji Su Gan that he planted a parasite in Chun He's body. Enraged at Ji Su Gan's actions against a girl that doesn't know martial arts, Huan Ya pulls his sword out and calls him a rat. Underestimating Huan Ya, Ji Su Gan tells him to put his sword back because he doesn't want to fight someone from the Patient. Just then, the Bow King sees the two fighting. Respecting the hierarchy of power, Huan Ya apologizes to the Bo King for such disobedience. However, the Bo King permits him to sort out the matter himself. Not realizing who Huan Ya is, Ji Su Gan tries to humble and sends his subordinates to attack him. As several soldiers come flying at Huan Ya, he conveniently manages to strike all of them down. Imagine if Huan Ya and So Moon made a team to open a new path, the Grey Path. All right, all right, I know it was a stupid joke. Anyhow, seeing Huan Ya in action, Ji Su Gan decides to take him on himself. Standing in his stance, he begins moving his hands in a circular motion, gathering up his key to poison his opponent. As Ji Su Gan unleashes a barrage of poison infested attacks, Huan Ya dodges them like a ballerina. Whilst everyone around cheers for Ji Su Gan, Bong Xian knows what's up and worries that Huan Ya's skill is higher than they anticipated. Meanwhile, standing with a cold expression on his face, Huan Ya decides to end this, and with one sword key blast, he sends Ji Su Gan flying away. But before the man can meet his demise, his hope like poison zombie shields the attack with his own body. Now squared up against the mighty poison zombie who killed Zhou Mun himself, Huan Ya doesn't show a speck of fear. Standing up straight, Huan subtly drags his sword. Seeing this, the Bo King is shocked as he realizes that this is Gu Yang Pung's skill. Meanwhile, as the poison zombie charges toward Huan Ya, he swiftly evades its attack and cuts it into so many little pieces that the zombie dies. Yeah, I mean he dies square because he dies twice, you know, since zombies are dead. Now walking up to Ji Su Gan, Huan Ya points the sword at his throat, but just then, all the patient elders arrive including Se Yun, Taesung, and Sa Ma Hu. Ignorant of why this conflict came to be, the two elders question Huan Ya's action. Speaking in a grunting and furious voice, Huan Ya tells them that the man Doc Mun used parasite venom on a girl without any martial arts skills, whilst both Se Yun and Taesum are left speechless as they fail to understand the severity of the situation. The Bo King calms down Huan Ya as he reminds him that Ji Su Gan was also blinded by a grudge and didn't think about the consequences. Furthermore, he explains to Huan that having defeated the man Doc Mun master in such a humiliating manner is enough for now. Man, this forgiveness stuff is too much for me. Somebody get revenge already. Kicking Ji Su Gan into oblivion, Huan Ya decides to spare him for the time being. Meanwhile, back at the Mount Wa faction, as the bug larvae are about to lay their eggs, the elders begin Chun He's treatment using the pure So Ma Di. However, the heat proves too much for Chun He as she screams in agony, and So Moon has no other option but to close his eyes and hold her down. After a couple of minutes of torture like pain, at last, Chunha manages to get some rest, and so Mood is once again given the moral dilemma of choosing between the options of ending Chunha's life quickly or prolonging her life till she gives birth. Not having an answer, so Mood sits quietly with thoughts unbeknownst to us. Meanwhile, all the Righteous Coalition members sit together and discuss a means to fight the patient palace, and whilst there's a lot of discussion about So Moon and his wife, the meeting concludes that the Light Path currently has the upper hand due to the guardian deity and the 108 passions of the Shaolin Temple. Now finding ourselves in an entirely new place, we accompany So Moon's grandfather who has come to China in search of his grandson. I hope So Moon beats this guy to death. He happens to be the antagonist of the story after all. Traveling through China, at last, So Moon's grandfather manages to get a hold of one person who narrates So Moon's entire journey so far. Listening to him closely, as he hears the tale of the fight at the Yangtze River and how So Moon single-handedly saved the Namgong leader and got crowned with the title of the Phantom Archer, his grandfather can't be more proud. But that pride soon turns into guilt and regret when he learns that So Moon fought off the man Doc Mun and despite getting injured went to the Dang Palace where he was mistaken for a spy and met tortured before being killed. As the old man learns this he's riled up and furious, swearing to take revenge on the Dang family he takes his leave. Now as night falls, standing amidst trees, the old man punches the trees in frustration as he accepts his mistakes and realizes that So Moon, his one and only grandchild, was killed due to his lie. Well, I'm glad So Moon's grandfather is suffering. 
Now as the old man's travels continued, his thirst for revenge remains for a little while as he hears two men conversing about the event that took place at Mount Wa, and how So Moon turned it into a wasteland, despite plenty of light path experts fighting against him. Hearing this, the old man immediately asks the man, wasn't So Moon dead? In response, the guy tells him that everyone believed him to be dead, but he came back alive. Hearing this, So Moon's grandfather falls down due to shock. Now heading towards Mount Wa, he thinks to himself that he's going to punish by breaking his legs. Man, if I was allowed one murder in life, I use it on So Moon's grandfather, this guy is toxic as hell. Now standing at the base of Mount Ha, the old man blames So Moon for everything. Since he believes that So Moon made his own choices and failed due to his own stupidity. Meanwhile, cowering in the bushes, the Zhang Nam faction takes notice of So Moon's grandfather and mistakes him to be the Bo King due to the similarity in looks and overwhelming aura. Leading the Zhao Nam faction, Osang asks his subordinates to relay this message to the Light Path leaders and decides to wait on the attack until So Mu's grandfather is closer to the palace. Now as the palace comes into the old man's sight, Osang jumps out with his forces and surrounds the old man. Asking the old man to stop, Osang goes into deep thought as he thinks of how strong the supposed Bo King must be to not feel overwhelmed at all. However, putting those thoughts aside, he challenges So Moon's grandfather to a duel and comes dashing at him. Seeing this as disrespectful, the old man evades all of the Zhang Nam's attacks and pulls out his bow to teach them some manners. As the old man goes around punching his enemies and knocking them out unconscious with his bow, the righteous coalition experts arrive at last and wonder who this guy is since they notice the old man fighting like a street beggar. Well, that's a violation I personally wouldn't have. Now as the fight continues, only Oh Sang is left standing. Try and teach him a lesson, as the old man draws his bow when the light path experts dashes towards him. Without giving it a second thought, So Moon's grandfather uses the formless firing technique. Seeing this, all the experts are amazed as they realize the technique to be similar to So Moon's. Meanwhile, Osang gets his butt handed to him when he's slapped into oblivion by the old man. Now as Osang falls to the ground, with foam coming out of his mouth, so Moon's grandfather tells the elders of the Righteous Coalition that he's sorry they had to see this side of him, but the guy was just too rude. However, Chin Peng gets straight to the point and asks him if he's the Bo King. Giving the question some thought, So Moon's grandfather thinks that since So Moon is the Phantom Archer, it's only right that his grandfather be called the Bo King. What kind of nonsense logic is that? Lying and boasting without a speck of shame in his heart, the grandfather tells them that he indeed is the Bo King. Hearing this, all the experts stand respectfully in front of the Bo King until one of the experts loses his cool and decides to duel So Moon's grandfather. Unable to come to terms with his and his students' failure and humiliation, the bald-headed man steps up. Now as the man dashes toward the old man, he quickly draws his bow and shoots an arrow, but the bald expert easily blocks it. And whilst the man keeps chasing So Moon's grandfather like a wild boar in hopes of getting in some hits, the old man continues to keep his distance just so he can use the bow. Now when standing face to face, the old man is the first to shoot multiple arrows. However, both are blocked by the bald expert. But that's not all the phantom archer's grandfather has in his arsenal, since he shoots three key guided arrows. Whilst two of them are blocked by the expert, one is purposely made to miss him and then circle around. However, at the last second, the expert realizes that there's an arrow coming and ducks, saving his life. Meanwhile, the Righteous Coalition experts are in awe watching the fight and realize why So Moon's grandfather is the supposed Bo King. But then, Qian Peng realizes something and tells the expert that this guy isn't the Bo King since the Bo King is left-handed. Realizing this truth, one of the guys wonders who the old man really is. Meanwhile, taking a closer look at the Bo art and movement technique, both Nam Gung Jiam and Qian Peng realize the true identity of this old man. Now as the duel ends when the supposed Bo King knocks out his opponent's sword from his hand, the experts ask him if he's So Moon's grandfather. Cut to a couple of hours later, we find ourselves once again with our boy, So Moon who happens to be led by Moo Moo to the meeting room where his grandpa is waiting for him. With a stoic expression built on heaps of pain and agony, So Moon enters the room and is shocked to see his grandfather after all these years. Meanwhile, it seems the grandfather hasn't learned his lesson since he continues lying whilst telling So Moon that he even stopped him from leaving Mount Pektu, but he wanted to come to China stubbornly. However, trying not to rile up So Moon too much, he tells him that he's heard that So Moon's made friends and memories, so he's very proud of him. Man, I need to learn how to gaslight like this old geezer. 
Having paid their respects to So Moon's grandfather, all the experts standing there decide to take their leaves in order to give the two family members some space. So Moon, trembling from anger, sits with his grandfather and in a heavy voice asks him to explain. At first, the old man tries to evade the question and asks him what he means by that. However, keeping the conversation on track, So Moon asks why there was no bride waiting for him at the Dang family. Furthermore, the Dang family claimed that they'd never been to Mount Pektu. Seeing this much anger in his grandson, the old man wonders what he must do but decides to come out clean and tells him that it was all a lie said for his sake. Well, see that wasn't hard you pathological liar. Hearing this, So Moon grunts as he inquisitively asks, for my sake. He further goes on to ask a question of his own and asks his grandfather if he can grasp even a little idea of what he went through because of that lie. Standing up once again, So Moon smashes the table and tells his grandfather that it was due to his lie that countless people died and his grandson barely escaped death. Still stuck on his best friend's death, So Moon asks his grandfather if Iron Blood also died for nothing due to his lie. Having nothing to say in defense, the old man apologizes to So Moon and tells him that he never thought that things would turn out like this. Still angry at his grandfather, So Moon asks him what he meant when he said that he lied for his sake. Was it to teach him how to lie to people? Oh, that's a burn. Now deciding to counter So Moon's arguments, the grandfather tells him that back at Mount Pektu before So Moon left, he did nothing but stay at home, wasting his life. The grandfather tells So Moon that it was difficult for him to watch his grandson waste his life. Moreover, he had to come to China anyway. Further explaining his comment, the old man tells So Moon that his great grandfather's dying wish was to travel to China and meet a lot of people. However, he himself couldn't do so because his own son and So Moon's father got crippled and he had to take care of him. A classic Asian family putting the dreams of their elders onto the young uns of the family. Still keeping a stoic expression, So Mu tells his grandfather that if this was the case, then he should have simply said so. However, pinning all the blame on So Mu and the grandfather tells him that if So Mu listened to him at first, then he wouldn't have had to lie to him. Furthermore, the grandfather even claims that the cause of Iron Blood's death is So Mu himself since he got too reckless and overconfident, resulting in fighting Man Dot Mun in close quarters and getting injured. Realizing his grandfather's tactics, So Moon is knowledgeable of the fact that his grandfather is deflecting all of the blame from himself and pinning it on the victim. However, diverting the conversation, So Moon's grandfather asks if he has a wife. After hearing a positive response, he urges So Moon to take him to her. But, sadly, So Moon tells him that she's been infected by the starving ghost bug. Hearing this, the grandfather immediately goes to his daughter in law. Crushed to see her in so much pain, he uses the pure Soma D and some needles to relieve Chun Ha of her torment. But a sucker for household traditions, he asks So Moon and Chun Ha to pay their respects together. Getting up despite her broken body, the pure and soft Chun Ha complies and bows down to So Moon's grandfather. Now, with a horrific expression, So Moon's grandfather explains to her that she should give up on the baby because even if they did kill the larva, there's no guarantee the baby will be born healthy. Moreover, Chun Ha will have to experience the excruciating pain of the pure So Ma Di six times a day till she gives birth. However, despite hearing such horrors, Chun Ha determinedly tells So Moon's grandfather that she wants to give birth because after all So Moon and she has been through, she can't leave without any results. As long as she can see So Moon and her baby happy, it will be enough for her. Uh, remember when I said Haya was better than Chun Ha? Yeah, well, I take those words back. Since then, almost nine months have passed, and Chun Ha along with Hu Yang Poon. So Moon and his grandfather have arrived back at Mount Pektu. Running with the midwife on his back, Gu Yang Poon enters So Moon's house, and as the midwife lays eyes on Chun Ha, she's scared out of her wits. Seeing Chun Ha's zombie like body, the midwife wonders how Chun Ha is going to give birth with a body like that. However, So Moon's grandfather requests her to help since Chun Ha is determined to give birth. Still not sure if the childbirth will be successful, the midwife mentions that unless the three legendary gods of childbirth descend themselves and help. Nevertheless, upon hearing Chun Ha's request in a fading voice, the midwife rolls up her sleeves and gets ready to give it a try. Whilst the midwife does her job trying for Chun Ha to successfully deliver the baby, So Moon and Gu Yang Pung stand outside waiting for some good news. Engulfed in an anxious atmosphere, so Moon mentions that he's sorry for saying this, but he cares more about Chun Ha's life than his own kids, feeling guilty. So Moon mentions that he's greedy because even though he knows Chun Ha's death is approaching, yet he wishes for a miracle that will allow her to live. However, 
Hu Yang Peng reassures So Moon that wanting someone you love to live isn't greed. Just then, the midwife comes out and tells everyone that a healthy baby boy has been delivered, from a kid to having a kid, So Moon has really grown. Hearing this news, tears come flowing out of So Moon's eyes. Rushing to his wife, he praises her, and tells her that their baby has his mother's looks. Too frail and weak, Chum Ho wishes to breastfeed her baby, but isn't able to do so. Looking at So Moon's grandfather, Chum Ho apologizes to him for not being able to serve their household. However, So Moon's grandfather tells her that he's forever indebted to her because she has continued their household for a generation. Kissing her baby with tears in her eyes, Chum Ho tells him that she'll always be by his side. Now looking at the ceiling, Chun had to tell So Moon that she was able to come all this way due to his help, and a moment ago she saw her father in a dream telling her she did well. Things Asian kids only hear in their dreams. Don't get offended. Just trying to lighten up the mood, friends. Crying at Chun Ho's words, So Moon tells her that he didn't even know his parents, so he's glad to hear about what Chun had just thought. Looking at her beautiful baby, she tells So Moon that she's saddened by the thought that their baby won't have a mother. However, thinking about her beautiful son, she tells So Moon to find love again as she wouldn't want her son to grow up without the love of a mother, nor would she like So Moon to spend the rest of his days lonely. Man, who's cutting onions in here? Anyhow, hugging Chungha. So Moon tells her that he'll be the baby's mother and father, and as long as she's in his heart, he'll never be lonely. Now almost whispering in So Moon's ears, Chungha asks him not to hate Huan Ya even though he's from the Patient Palace, because the time they spent together was something that she cherishes. Promising his wife that he won't hate Huan Ya due to his association with the Dark Path, So Moon sees his wife's life fade away. And as her hand falls flat onto the bed, So Moon screams in agony. Poor guy has once again lost someone so important to him. Since then, several months have passed by, and as So Moon is training Iron Mask, just then his grandfather arrives. Talking about Gu Yang Poom, So Moon's grandfather mentions that he will be back soon. However, talking with a complacent attitude, so Moon mentions that he may be slacking off somewhere. Angered by this childish behavior, the grandfather asks So Moon if he's even once brought the nanny or gone to the village himself with Hiso. Pouting and making excuses, So Moon tells his grandfather that traveling with Hiso isn't good for his health. Plus, it also looks weird. Yes, So Moon's failing the fatherhood test. Just then, the nanny arrives, and after Hiso has had his stomach's fill, So Moon's grandfather asks him what he plans on doing next, looking at his grandfather with a serious expression. So Moon tells him that he's planning on visiting the Righteous Coalition after he's dealt with Man Dot Mun. Realizing So Moon's true intentions, the grandfather mentions that it seems So Moon wants revenge. Frowning, So Moon replies that the Patient used Chun Ha as a scapegoat, and no matter what he does, he can't let it slide. However, his grandfather questions what So Moon will do when all of the Patient Palace comes after him. In response, So Moon tells him that he'll fight the Patient head on if that were to happen. Agreeing with So Moon's wishes for revenge, his grandfather's only remaining concern is Hiso. Meanwhile, it seems that after the incident at Mount Wa, the war between the Light Path and the Dark Path reached a stalemate centered around the Yangtze River. Since then, the Patient Palace took control of the North and is expanding its influence. Now, finding ourselves amongst the Righteous Coalition, we learn that the Patient have been harming escort agencies and similar businesses, owning to the people of Light Path in order to cut their military funding and increase their own. So to protect these escort agencies, Yang'o decides to send one warrior to each escort agency. Following this order, it is Osang that happens to accompany an escort agency on its travels. Now just as the escort agency leader John Won Sum and his subordinates are discussing how there's talk of Osang being very cocky, they are suddenly stopped by Ba Myun, the Yunjia faction's great leader. At first, John Won Sum asks Ba Myun to step aside. But of course, it can't be that easy, laughing in overwhelmed joy. Ba Myung tells John Won Sum that he's glad he's getting a chance to fight against the one they call the Overflowing Iron Fist. However, things take a dark turn when Ba Myung introduces himself to be one of the elders of Eunja, China's greatest assassin faction. Taking notice of the commotion, Oh Sang comes to the front and asks Ba Myung to bring it on. In response to Oh Sang's attack, several Eunja soldiers fight back but are easily defeated. Underestimating his opponents once again, Osang tells Ba Myung that he shouldn't dare talk about taking the supplies of a caravan that Osang is protecting. However, Ba Myung tells Osang that the soldiers were mere bandits that he had hired and the real assassins are yet to appear. Overconfident, Osang responds by telling Ba Myung that even if he brings the assassin of Yunja to the fight, they'll easily defeat them. Just then, an assassin with wolverine-like claws comes out of the ground and tries to take down Osang. 
Whilst Osang blocks some of the attacks, it isn't without the help of Jun Won some that he is able to stand at a safe distance. Furious, Osang orders his troops to go wild and attack the Yunja faction. And as chaos ensues everywhere, our main gang arrives at the scene. So Mu carrying He So, along with his grandfather and Gu Yang Pum, take notice of the battle. It is then he realizes that this escort agency happens to be the one where he worked as a handyman, handing over his son to Gu Yang Pum. So Moon draws his bow and begins shooting arrows. As the arrows strike several soldiers surrounding Ba Myung, he looks around to find who's the one shooting. Observing the direction the arrow came from, Ba Myung orders his troops to find So Moon and cut him down. However, as the troops try to go after him, they are shot by multiple key arrows. Now cornered into a situation where he may lose, Ba Myung thinks of his next steps and asks everyone to get into the circular formation, so they may understand where the arrows are coming from. Suddenly, an arrow strikes one of the assassin's chest. Looking around, Ba Myung asks if anybody saw the direction it came from. But then, one of the assassins points upwards to the sky. As all the other members of the Yunja faction look upwards, they see a barrage of key arrows coming straight for their heads. Taking cover under a tree, Ba Myung wonders how the arrows are falling from the sky when there aren't any tall trees around. I'll tell you, it's because the phantom archer has decided to whoop you guys. Unable to pinpoint the archer's location, Ba Myung finds it very annoying, but then one of his subordinates suggests that it may be the Phantom Archer. Hearing this, Ba Myung gets goosebumps, but just then, he hears a baby crying and goes to check out the noise. There he finds Gu Yang Pung and So Mu's grandfather trying to calm down He So. Walking up to the old men, Ba Myung asks them if they were the ones that attacked the Yunja faction. However, ignoring Ba Myung and his men, both Gu Yang Pung and So Mu's grandfather are more concerned with He So's hunger and his crying. Offended by getting ignored, Ba Myung asks them to answer his question or he'll kill them both along with the baby. Meanwhile, So Moon sitting on a branch thinks to himself that he'll let the elders figure this one out on their own and he'll just watch this time. Conversing amongst themselves, the two decide that they don't feel like fighting and begin running away from Ba Myung and his men. But soon enough, the old duo's luck runs out and they run into a dead end. With no means to escape at last, Yu Yang Pung hands Hiso to So Moon's grandfather and decides to fight back. After handing over Hiso, Yu Yang Pung immediately begins taking on the Yunja faction, knocking them out unconscious with one clean strike. Taking a sword from one of the assassins, Gu Yang Pung charges straight toward Ba Myung. However, shielding their elders, several assassins stand in his path, only to be slashed by Gu Yang Pung's blade. With no other option left, Ba Myung also comes at Gu Yang Pung. Nevertheless, Gu Yang Pung decides to take on the assassins before going for Ba Myung and easily knocks out all the assassins standing on each side. Meanwhile, as So Moon's grandfather is in complete awe of Gu Yang Pung's skill, So Moon shows up from behind and whilst playing with Hiso, tells his grandfather that indeed Gu Yang Pung's skill is superior to most martial artists out there. As So Moon is playing with his baby, Suddenly, one of the warriors from the Zhang Nam faction realizes that it's the Phantom Archer, Yalji So Moon himself. On the other hand, it seems that Ba Myung isn't able to fight any longer, and as his blade falls from his hands, he accepts defeat. However, giving him and his men another chance at life, Hu Biang Pung tells him that he's only knocked out his assassins, so the Yunjia faction should take their leave at once. Now, with the looming threat of death gone, John Won some thanks the heavens and exchanges greetings with So Moon and Ko. Smiling out of the memories of his previous Kone Padre, Elder Gang Rang. So Moon asks if he didn't participate in this escort. However, John Won some is disappointed to tell So Moon that Gang Rang and all of the others are dead. Shocked to his core, So Moon stutters and asks when, who, how. In response, John Won some tells him that once So Moon left the escort company, it didn't take any trips to the south and only the safer side of the north. Despite that one day, they were all attacked and everyone in that caravan. From the bodyguards to the escort captain, gang rioting, everyone was killed. As So Moon hears this heartbreaking news and remembers his days as a handyman, his hate for the patient palace increases even more. Omitting an insane amount of bloodlust, So Moon ends up scaring Hiso, who erupts into tears. However, Gothu Yang Pung and So Moon's grandfather ask him to control himself and take their leaves since he so can't handle the smell of blood. Best believe, he can't handle the smell of blood right now, but my guy will be drenched in it in a while. Meanwhile, in the Peixin Palace's south station, we find ourselves amidst a conversation between Gokja and Guanpei. 
Gokcha being the shrewd strategist he is, tells Guanpei that they will have to stop attacking escort agencies for a while because ever since the merchants started complaining, the council might get involved. Hearing this, Guanpei decides that they'll focus on their main objective and attack the Murim world once again. Arranging a meeting with all of his top commanders, Guanpei tells them that he's planning on attacking the south once again. Not questioning their leader's command, Se Yun asks when the attack will take place, and with a stoic expression, Guanpei replies that they'll attack tomorrow. Explaining the plan to the members over there, Gokja tells them that whilst Elder Qian Suyu will take care of Patient Palace's north base in Hubei, the main forces here will be the Blood Slasher Corps and the Dark Energy Hall, alongside the assistance of Man Doc Mun's Health Faction. Guess all of these corps are about to get whooped at the hands of So Moon. One of the experts, Heiku Shin, asks, Will the Light Path be preparing? In response, Gokja informs them that all of the Righteous Coalition forces are gathering in the Hinan province. Egu Shin then asks if it will be a minor battle. However, Gokja tells him that it's going to be an all-out war, one that will decide the fate of the Gangho. Further explaining the plan, Gokja tells that the Eunja and Blood Slasher Corp will take care of the rear's parts of the Righteous Coalition. Using their assassination techniques, several branches of the Righteous Coalition will be broken down. Now looking at the Eunja faction leader, Bu In Gok, Gokja tells him that the fate of this battle lies in his faction's hands. Hearing this, Mu Ngok gets extremely excited and riled up. However, the Blood Slasher Corp leader, An Dan claims that Gokja is just leaving them to die first. Well, at least someone has a brain. Standing up at last, Wan Pei tells everyone that this battle will tell everyone the power of the Dark Path so everyone must fight with her all. Meanwhile, in parts of Hubei, as some soldiers guard the fort for a Light Path family, the two are joking around when one of them is struck with an arrow whilst the other with a sword. Well done, man. Very good job defending the fort. Having breached the walls, Dark Energy Hall's Wheelock decides to decimate the whole castle. Now as the whole of the fort is covered by the Dark Energy Hall forces, one of the guards hardly gets to the fort leader and informs him of the situation. However, knowing that it's impossible for him and the others to stop the patient, he calls Mu Yang and asks him to inform the Righteous Coalition of the situation. Meanwhile, in Henan, as the patient palace receives the letter sent by the homing pigeon, all the elders discuss the situation. Nam Dung Jiam mentions that all of Hubei fell to the patient palace in one night. However, Sang In sees this as an opportunity to make the upcoming battle the final showdown. Meanwhile, training in an elsewhere area, Dan Gayan mentions his frustration for not having done anything despite it being a year at Joe Mun's death. Giving him company, Jiam Myung reminds Dan Gian that even though he's frustrated about his elder brother's death, they shouldn't put revenge above the Light Path's wishes. On the other hand, standing tall in front of his men, the brilliant Commander General, Lee Song Jin assembles his troop. Yelling in an authoritative tone, he tells them that they'll soon be facing the Patient Palace. However, the Righteous Coalition and Lee Song Jin have their back. So they should give their all for the Light Path, their comrades, and themselves. Damn, this man is making me want to drop some push-ups. After filling his troops full of adrenaline and confidence, he thinks back to Nam Gung Jiam asking him not to overextend himself. However, pushing his words aside, Lee Song Jin states that it isn't simply his style. Now back at the beggar's sect, Dan Gaian barges into the sect leader's room and asks him why they haven't been commanded to fight in the battle and only the Hoqian group get to fight. In response, Wang Chung asks him not to be concerned with it since he doesn't need to know what the matter it is. Not giving in to Wang Chung's words, Dan Gaian tries to haggle him for a while but when he sees no positive response, he leaves. Finding the room to himself, Huang Chung mentions that Dan Gian does have a point since he's worried that things won't go as planned. Eavesdropping from outside, Dan Gaian pushes sticks his head out the door and asks what is that has to go well. However, keeping him quiet, Wang Chung throws a pillow and asks him to run away. Dang, what is Wang Chung hiding? Meanwhile, Zuka Yang Yang asks her father if it was his idea to not dispatch the Bak Ma and Yui Hul groups so that they may attack the backlines. In response, the Zuka family leader confirms this and tells that the plan is to avoid a head-on fight and attack from the backlines. However, Yang Yang mentions the possibility of the patient palace figuring this out and heading straight here. Already miles ahead of his daughter, the Zuka family leader mentions that he's already set up traps here, so if that were to happen, the light path would effortlessly win. Meanwhile, as Dan Gian is letting his frustrations out on the trees, 
His master arrives and tells him that they're going to fight too, but it's going to be nothing but a death wish. With Di Yankai faction representative Jang Nam Sol already present, only the presence of a few elders is needed for the fight. Meanwhile, cloaked by the darkness of the night, as the Yunja faction and Blood Slasher Corp are traveling with their camouflage on, they end up running into So Moon's group. At first, taking them to be residents, the assassins decide to end them. However, the leader asks them to stop. Anyhow, as they pass through So Moon and Gu Yang Poom, the leader immediately recognizes them to be the Phantom Archer and ex leader of the Patient Palace. Feeling the tremendous aura of the three combatants, the Yuja faction tries to sneak past them, but suddenly, So Moon's grandfather ends up asking him for directions. Nevertheless, acting calm and composed after guiding them, the Yunja and Blood Slasher corpse take their leave. Now, somewhat in the safe zone, both An Dang and Bu and Gok take a sigh of relief. Having just experienced a tremendous aura from So Moon and Ko, he wonders who they were. In response, An Dang tells him that the one with the baby was none other than So Moon, the Phantom Archer. So Moon's like the Mike Tyson of Bowblade Spirit. Now, as So Moon and Ko are walking together, they mention that as soon as the guys saw So Moon, it seemed that they almost peed their pants. I mean, I'd pee my pants too if my opponent was the Phantom Archer. Now resting for the night, the trio begins to converse with each other. It is then that So Moon learns that the Light Path had informed the Patient Palace of his traces, wondering who would do such a thing. So Moon asks for the source of this news. In response, Gu Yang Poon tells So Moon that according to Huan Ya's intel, it was Zhu Ka Yang Yang. Amazed to hear this, So Moon wonders why she'd do such a thing. However, Gu Yang Poon calms So Moon down by reminding him that she's the Righteous Coalition's lieutenant and she's only doing what's right for the Light Path. Plus, the man Doc Mun would come after So Moon regardless, since that's how revenge works in Gang Ho. Furthermore, Gu Yang Poon tells So Moon that if he wants revenge on Zhu Ka Yang Yang, then no one will stop him. However, he should consider her influence and understand that going after her would mean that a lot of blood will be shed, so it's better to drop this matter. Thinking back to how Chien Ho killed his granddaughter for So Mu's revenge, he realizes how horrible the old man must have felt and decides to leave the matter. Well, Character Development 101 Now as So Moon is traveling to find man Da Mun, he receives a letter delivered by Oh Sang from Zhu Ka Yang Yang. In the letter, she informs him that Dan Gian and Jian Mian will be leading the Bak Ma group whilst Nam Gun Hai and Jin will be a part of the Yui Hyul group, so So Moon's assistance is requested. Now put in a predicament, so Moon decides to go help his brother in arms, but only after dealing with Man Doc Mun first. However, his grandfather asks him if he's thinking of taking He So to the battle with him. But So Moon tells his grandfather that as long as he'll be with him, He So will be safe too. But as usual, when needed, his grandfather tells So Moon that he won't be coming and will be taking He So back to Mount Pektu. Hearing this, So Moon immediately asks him not to, as he cares about his son crying and throwing a tantrum without him. After some back and forth between the grandson and grandfather, at last, it is decided that So Moon's grandfather will be waiting for So Moon at the Shaolin Temple for 100 days. If So Moon can resolve his problems by that time, then he's welcome to travel back to Mount Pektu with his son. But if he is even a day late, then he can forget about traveling back with his son. Now, as So Moon heads out, his grandfather asks if he needs Iron Mask to accompany him. However, So Moon tells him that he doesn't need a useless bird like Iron Mask. As So Moon heads out to take on the Patient Palace, the Zhang Nam faction tags along to help in any way that they can. Anyhow, seeing the emergency of the situation, So Moon decides to run to the Patient. Seeing this confidence, Oh Sang is enraged as he believes that So Moon's arrogance and confidence in his skill will get the better of him. Meanwhile, Chiem Su Yu's squadron is engaged in a full on battle with the Light Path forces led by none other than Li Song Jin. However, doing everything by the book, Lee Song Jin retreats as he had planned. But not sure of how this will all work out, Suk Bu Siong mentions that this is their fifth retreat. Wak Mu Wang also intervenes in the conversation and reminds him that retreating is more exhausting, so the force's morale might be going down. Nevertheless, despite all these issues, Lee Song Jin tells them that they have to conserve as many forces till they reach the Pyongyang branch, the last line of defense. Meanwhile, standing on higher ground, Xian Su Yu wonders what kind of trick the Light Path has up their sleeves since they aren't properly fighting back. On the other hand, Xian Su Yu's subordinates complain about the fact that it's been 10 days since they enter Hanan but haven't been able to move forward and now, the forces have started to become agitated. Responding in an authoritative voice, 
Chien Su Yu tells him to tell everyone to wait because the enemy uses traps, and going in blindly will only cause harm like it did last time. Meanwhile, at the Light Path military headquarters, Nangak commands the poison zombies created by Man Doc Mun to attack the palace. Standing on top of the balcony, the Zuka family leader commands to make poison zombie retreat while maintaining distance. But despite some of the front lines being overwhelmed by the poison zombies, Moving on to the second stage of the attack, an ambush group attacks the poison zombies. However, they too take damage, seeing the grim situation. Zhuka Yang Yang commands them not to face the poison zombies but retreat on either side. Nevertheless, this strategy also goes horribly wrong when the blood slasher corpse surround all the men trying to get on either side. Seeing as how the light path is blocked from all directions, Zhuka Yang Yang mentions that they should retreat, since if the retreat path is blocked everyone will be annihilated. However, the family head tells them they should stay because if this place falls, then the Dark Path are the ultimate winner. Stress that one of the Zhang Nam faction warriors, Bong Hak Jung, comes in clutch, raising the morale of several other soldiers. He takes down the Blood Slasher corpse. Yes, this guy should have been the leader and not that stupid Oh Sang. With Bong Hak Jung pushing the Blood Slasher corp back, the balance falls a little in the Light Path's favor. To increase their odds of winning, the Hebei Peng clan shows up. Pinning down the poison zombies with ropes, the clan leader An Mun beheads the zombies one by one giving the light path a higher success rate. Meanwhile, So Moon sitting on a branch nearby assesses the battlefield and tries to figure out who is the one controlling all these poison zombies. Recalling to last time, he remembered that sound transmission was used but this time it could be a flute. Trying to find the guy that killed his beloved wife, So Moon shoots two poison zombie in the neck with his key arrow. Now coming out of the battle smoke, So Moon is stopped by a Blood Slasher Corp member, but just like all of So Moon's enemies, he's decimated. Not recognizing the Phantom Archer, the Hell Faction leader Noi Wu Yun asks So Moon who he is. However, ignoring all the expert warriors standing in front of him, So Moon simply asks where Ji Sugan is. Not taking too kindly to this disrespect, Bong Qian tells So Moon that he isn't here. Not believing the word of his enemies, so Moon asks him how could it be that the poison zombies are here but Chi Sugan isn't, make it make sense mate. Enraged at the guy's cocky attitude, So Moon asks him if he's trying to pick a fight because all he wants is to know where Ji Sugan is and he'll spare the life of everyone around. However, not taking lightly to So Moon's disrespect, Bong Qian commands his poison zombies to attack the phantom archer. Now as the zombies jump onto So Moon, he quickly beheads one of them using the tail of his bow and uses the created space to move out of range from zombies. Jumping into the air himself, as So Moon draws his bow, he decides to keep his distance and take out the zombies. One by one, zombies fall prey to So Moon's immensely powerful key arrows. However, at last, two zombies are able to get past those arrows and as they near So Moon, the patient forces get a glimmer of hope of taking down the phantom archer, but at the last second, the key guided arrow turns around 180 degrees and beheads both the zombies. Seeing this from the sidelines, Wu Yun is completely in awe of So Moon's skill, but Nangak reminds him that they must think of a solution instead of getting impressed. Continuing the poison zombie massacre, So Moon thinks to himself that he should have fought with similar aptitude back in Sichuan too. If he had done so, he wouldn't have experienced the pain he felt. Now faced against the great Nangak himself, So Moon stands calmly. Unfortunately, the same can't be said about Nangang as he looks on at So Moon with anger and rage. Looking at So Moon with a furious and intense gaze, Nangak asks So Moon what's talking about after killing all of their poisonous zombies. Following this dialogue, Nangak swings his sword at So Moon, but So Moon dodges using his agility technique and the wolf's step. Seeing this, Nangak utters inquisitively, Instant transmission? My man So Moon moves so fast, Nangak thought he turned into Goku. Now planning on countering, So Moon decides to end this fight, but instead of going for Nangak and the Hell Faction leader, So Moon jumps over both of them and shoots an arrow straight at the poison zombie guarding Bong Qian. Unexpectedly, as Bong Qian opens his eyes with confidence in his poison zombie, he finds himself at death's gate as the key arrow went through the zombie's chest and hit him straight in the heart. Now as blood pours from Bong Qian's mouth and he falls onto his knees, so Moon asks once again where Ji Sugan is in exchange for sparing the lives of Man Doc Mun. Taking So Moon's promise not to hurt Man Doc Mun, with his last few breaths, Bong Qian tells So Moon that Ji Sugan is currently in the Patient Palace's south station. Furthermore, 
He tells So Moon that he'll find out soon why Man Doc Mun is strongest in poison arts when he meets their leader in the south. Processing Bong Chiam's words, So Moon remembers that the elite force of the Righteous Coalition is headed to the south station, meaning that Dan Gion and Jiang Myon's lives are in danger. Now as So Moon is about to take his leave and head for the south station, he stopped by Nangak. Honoring his promise, So Moon asks him to let him leave since his feud with Man Doc Mun is over now. However, telling So Moon that Man Doc Mun is an integral part of the Pei he along with his soldiers encircles the Phantom Archer. Standing 3 o'clock in So Moon, Noi Wu Yun tells So Moon that his fate will be decided in a little while. However, knowing the weakness of his enemies, So Moon tells the Pei that they can come at him as they wish and he won't move an inch from the place he's standing. Now that's some serious gloating, but as the great Muhammad Ali said, it ain't arrogance if you can back it up. Humiliated by So Moon's words, Wu Yun charges at him but when So Moon begins shooting his key arrows, he has no other option but to stay back and use the lazy donkey roll. Unable to accept this humiliation, Wu Yun decides to come straight at So Moon but is hit with multiple key arrows. Now lying on the ground like a wounded animal, he realizes that So Moon went easy on him if he had shot him like he did the poison zombie then he wouldn't have survived. Calling out to Nangak, Wu Yun tells him that he'll die here, so his forces should retreat to see another day. Meanwhile, calling out to So Moon, he asks him to finish him since he lost and doesn't need the sympathy of an enemy. In response, however, So Moon tells him that the duel decided who was stronger, so there's no need to give his life in such a fashion. So Moon looks like a guy with no enemies. Just then, looking at the trees behind him, So Moon tells some men in hiding that the duel is over and they can come out. Coming into sight out of the thick fog, a slender and a, well, don't want to get cancelled, so let's say a curvy man comes out. I know it sounds sus, but bear with me, guys. The two men confirm from So Moon that he's the Phantom Archer and tell him that they are here to fight him. At first, So Moon tells them that he has no animosity towards any of them and he doesn't want to fight. But Gang Mu and Park Un tell him that it simply isn't possible since they want to test their skills on him. Seeing that there's no way out of this, So Moon accepts the fight. Now taking out their weapons, Gang Mu is first to use his meteor hammer and try taking So Moon's head off, trying to catch So Moon off balance as he dodges the meteor hammer. Park Un jumps at him with his double axes. But using his brilliant agility techniques, So Moon is able to dodge, but now on the back foot. So Moon struggles to find an opening whilst running away and at last when he does so and shoots three key arrows. All of them are easily deflected. Now coming up with a different strategy, So Moon decides to stand his ground and not avoid their attacks. Now as the two axes and the whip are coming at So Moon, he uses his bow to deflect the axes. As the axes come back at Gang Mu, he has no other option but to pull back his whip and evade the attack. Pulling out the axes from the stones behind Gang Mu, Park Ung wonders what So Moon's bow is made out of as it damaged his axes made with 10,000 year old iron. However, getting back to the fight, Park Mu Wang throws the axes once again. Trying to deflect it with his key arrow, So Moon shoots the axes, but at the last second one of the axes changes its direction and comes straight for So Moon's head. Seeing this, he realizes that Park Ung used a key guided axe and blocks the attack using his bow. Holding his axes once again, Park Ung unleashes the key guided twin axe technique. Trying to stop the axes, So Moon fires key arrows, but capitalizing on this opportunity, Gang Mu takes So Moon's bow using his whip. Taking So Moon to be harmless without the bow, Gang Mu offers him the chance to give up if he wants his life to be spared. Watching this duel from the surroundings, the patient palace begins cheering, and Nangak tells his seniors not to show So Moon any mercy. Meanwhile, the Light Path forces gathered there can't believe their eyes as they think that So Moon has lost. Getting ahead of himself, Park On with a smug face tells So Moon that he's unskilled and was famous for no reason. Ignorant of So Moon's past, he asks him if he thinks he'll be able to protect his woman with his skills. Hearing this, So Moon's horrible memories are flashed in his brain. Taking out a sword, So Moon calls Park on the pig and asks him to shut up. Ignorant of the fact that So Moon's about to go John Wick on them, Park On begins spinning his axe. Meanwhile, So Moon strikes Park On with the peerless triple unity blade the first stance thoughtless blade. Before Park Ung can even react, So Moon slashes his sword through Park Ung's shoulder. But just then, Gang Mu takes hold of So Moon's sword with his whip once again. But this time as he tries to pull it, So Moon doesn't let go of his sword. Seeing this, Gang Mu is excited to see So Moon's full power. Just then, Park Ung jumps at So Moon. Cutting through Gang Mu's whip, faster than any eyes can catch So Moon's movement, he cuts both of Park Ung's arms. Damn, 
seems So Moon went more Kratos than John Wick. Following this, Gang Mu is the next to fall as he tries to strike So Moon with his whip. However, dodging the attack and closing the distance, So Moon slashes him through the chest. Nearing death, Gang Mu claims he has no regrets about dying at the hands of So Moon. Accepting defeat, he takes the life of Park Gung and the two fall together. Seeing this, the light path celebrates, and So Moon tells Mangak to fall back as he promises he wouldn't hurt the man Doc Mun. Realizing that they've lost far more than they've gained, Nangak decides to retreat. However, the light path claims that they won't let the patient leave. Nevertheless, despite the tension between the two forces, So Moon asks the Zuka family that they should stop here for today since he made a promise. But some of the light path experts claim that you should forget about the promise. But being the honorable man he is, So Moon tells the light path if they don't fall back then he'll make them fall back. Despite being tempted by the convenient battle, respecting So Moon's wishes, the family leader lets the Patian Palace retreat. Now as So Moon heads to the South Station, Zhuka Yang Yang and Yang O discuss the matters of the Light Path. Noticing that Yang Yang looks upset about something, Yang O asks what the matter is. In response, Yang Yang tells him that Light Path warriors in one of their main camps are being slaughtered. Plus, they can't send any more soldiers to their aid since they'll be needed for the counterattack plan. Hearing that the coalition has no soldiers to spare, Yang O tells Yang Yang that Mount Wa will fall without any backup since the Dark Energy Hall and other assassins group are too hard to handle in the night. Meanwhile, as Bu Yang Pong and So Mood's grandfather are traveling together to the Shaolin, they sense a group hiding their key. Peeping through the bushes, Gu Yang Pong realizes that it's the Blood Shadow group led by none other than An Dang. With a very serious expression, An Dang asks about the reports from the Shadow Striking group. In response, his subordinates tell him that they showed splendid results. However, unsure of what the Blood Slasher Corp is doing here, he asks An Dang what their next move will be. In response, An Dang tells him that they'll be attacking the Shaolin since all the warriors in the temple have been dispatched. My man is about to get his butt hawked by Mu Mu and Seon Jae. Hearing this, Sto Mu's grandfather confirms from Gu Yang Pung if the Yung Jia and Blood Slasher Corp is planning on taking down the Shaolin. In response, Gu Yang Pung nods his head, processing all of his thoughts. So Moon's grandfather recalls that the Shaolin helped him immensely with Chung Ha, and it was because of their help that Iso was born. So he can't just ignore their statement and will be fighting them on, but without killing them. Meanwhile, it seems the Yunja faction is struggling too as their numbers have fallen and many of the men have been killed due to the ambushes by the Light Path. Too angry and worried about his men, Gu and Gok is furious and unable to calm his mind. On the other hand, as some time passes, An Dang is furious as his men keep getting injured due to being shot in the leg, and despite being assassins they can't find the sources of these arrows in the darkness of the night and the thick fog, having his squad's number drop from 70 to just a mere 19. An Dang wonders if it's the Phantom Archer. However, one of his subordinates tells him that it's impossible since So Moon was in a fight with Nangak elsewhere. Not knowing his enemy's identity, An Dang wonders who's attacking him. Now as So Moon's grandfather continues taking down the Blood Slasher corpse, he notices Gu Yang Pung to be a little upset. Seeing his expression, So Moon's grandfather rhetorically asks if he just wants to let the Blood Slasher corpse go to the Shaolin. In response, Gu Yang Pung tells So Moon's grandfather that these are all people who followed him and An Dang was a disciple of his. Hearing this, So Moon's grandfather tells Gu Yang Pung that he knows about this, and that's why he's only hitting them in the leg, so they would retreat. Meanwhile, An Dang sitting under a tree wonders what should be done to tackle the situation since they can't even dream of attacking the Shaolin as they are. Hearing a piece of his mind, one of the subordinates suggests that they retreat since there's nothing they can do, and that's what the enemy might want too. Accepting his subordinate's suggestion, An Dang decides to retreat, but just then he hears the cries of Hiso. Alerted, all uninjured guys from the Blood Slasher corpse surround the area, and An Dang asks his enemy to come out. Calming down, he, so both Gu Yang Pung and So Moon's grandfather come out, without any fear. So Moon's grandfather confesses to being the one who was shooting the arrows. As An Dang hears this, he prepares to strike down So Moon's grandfather. But then he hears a familiar voice telling him not to fight the old man since he won't be coming out of it alive. Looking in the direction, the voice came from An Dang as baffled to see his supposedly dead master. Unenlightened by the truth about Gu Yang Pung's death, he asks his master if he was the one attacking him. However, Gu Yang Pung explains that it isn't him that was attacking, but rather warrior So Moon's grandfather since he owes the Shaolin a great deal. 
Having explained himself, Hu Yang Peng asks On Dang to fall back. Nonetheless, On Dang claims that he'll take on So Mood's grandfather since he caused huge damage to the Pei Qian today. But once again, Gu Yang Poon tells An Dang that he has no chance of beating So Moon's grandfather. Plus, the only reason the Blood Shadow group hasn't been completely decimated is the fact that So Moon's grandfather honored Gu Yang Poon's wishes. Hearing this, despite having many questions, An Dang bows down to his master and takes his leave along with his Blood Slasher course. Meanwhile, at the South Station, a rumor is spread that the Phantom Archer said he would single handedly face the Pachin Supreme Leader's guards. Eavesdropping on the conversation from the sidelines, a spy sends a message about So Moon's arrival to the Patient Palace's guards. Having heard the rumor, Jock Song, the Supreme Leader's guard commander, is enraged as he finds it offensive that So Moon claims he can single handedly take on all of the Supreme Guards. After telling all of his fellow guards, Jock Song meets with the Patient Leader himself and asks for permission to set out so he may fight So Moon. And despite Gok Jo's counsel of not letting the guards set out as it may be a rumor, Wan Pei permits his guards to set out so that it may not seem that the patient leader is scared of a single warrior. Now Ms. So Moon and Oh Sang are traveling towards the south station. He's suddenly stopped by Jok Song and the 107 guards and is asked if he's the Phantom Archer. Conversing with So Moon, Jok Song tells him that it was stupid of him to send the challenge note in such a fashion. In response, So Moon tells him that he did no such thing. It's then that So Moon realizes that it must have been Zhu Ka Yang Yang that sent the Pei forces here so that they can easily get to Guan Pei. Taking So Moon's words for that of a coward and an attempt to back down, Jok Song sends one of his men after So Moon, but raising his hands, Zhu tells time and time again that he has no intention of fighting since he doesn't want to hurt Guan Ya's forces. As the soldier comes at So Moon, he runs away, but it's Oh Sang who wants to play the soldier and ends up fighting with Patience Guard. Despite his low skill, Oh Sang is able to take him out, but then the vice commander, Hyuk Jong, himself shows up, and as he goes after Oh Sang, he kicks him into oblivion. Injured by one hit, Oh Sang falls down, awaiting death. However, So Moon carrying Oh Sang uses the wolf step and escapes. It is then that Jok Song realizes that they've been tricked by someone else to leave the Patient Palace unguarded. Realizing this, the Supreme Guards leave So Moon and run back to the palace. On the other hand, worrying about his leader, Gokja suggests that an ambush be laid for the Righteous Coalition since despite being lesser in number, they still have more experts. However, keeping a calm composure, Wanpei asks Gokja to forget about ambushes and surprise attacks since he'll gladly take on anyone that comes his way. Meanwhile, standing a couple of meters away from the Patient Palace, an attack force is being led by none other than Sang and himself. Looking at the palace with a thirst for conquest, Sang and orders Huang Bo Jang to lead the Yui Hul group and take the left, whilst the Chondong, Gondong, and Beggar's sect are to take on the right, and the Bak Ma group will be the advanced party. On the other hand, the Righteous Coalition sits together to discuss the situation of the South Station. The elders mention that taking out the Supreme Guards would be a difficult task. However, Yang Yang explains that won't be the case since the Supreme Guards aren't present and at best it would take them a day to arrive at Patient. Hearing this, the elders ask how she knows about all this. In response, she tells everyone that Oh Sang has been traveling with So Moon all this time and giving int. Now as the Supreme Guards are running back to the Patient Palace at full speed, the battle at the Patient Palace is going on. Suffering heavy losses, the Northern Light Nosa stands at the inner gates to guard it with life. However, Several moments later, we learn from a reporting soldier that the central area has been overtaken. Following that, another soldier arrives and tells Gokja that the right has been overtaken too along with the demise of Nosa, who fought valiantly. I don't know why, but his death has really good comedic timing. Now standing amidst the battle, Sang and asks his subordinates to give a damage report. In response, both Guan Bo Jang and Guak Wa Wo report that the Iwi Hul group has lost 32 warriors whilst the Bak Ma group has lost 17 warriors. After having heard the damage report, Sangin tells everyone that they'll now be going for Guan Pei's head. However, standing in their path, Mun Ju Jong of the Red Energy Hall thinks otherwise. Standing opposite to each other, Guak Wa Wo and Mun Ju Jong introduce themselves to each other and giving respect to each other's skill, the two strike their swords together. As Mun Ju Jong leaps to attack Wo Wo, he escapes at the last second and decides to use the 18 Fallen Paddles sword arts. Charging up his key in one attack with blistering speed, Wo Wo cuts through Mun Ju Jong. Seeing their master fall, the Red Energy Hall attacked with their full power. 
But following that, we learn from Gokja that the Red Energy Hall has fallen. Sitting on his throne, Wan Pei tells Gokja that he must hate him for being too reckless. However, being loyal, Gokja claims that isn't the case. With a stern expression, Wan Pei then commands Gokja to head over to the Superior Elder since they meet him if the Patient Palace is to take over China. Now heading out of his palace, Wan Pei asks his soldier to escort Gokja and leaves Huan Ya in his care. As Guan Pei comes out of the palace, Sang In and the other Light Path experts have their kish shining through their eyes since they see what tremendous key Guan Pei has. Seeing the patient leader, the Light Path soldiers try to take him down, but are easily defeated, letting his emotions run wild. Wa Wol is the first expert to attempt an attack, but is sent flying by the patient leader only by one tenth of his strength. Meanwhile, So Mu now walking through the woods decides to take a stroll in the mountain to appreciate the view. Oh Sang tries talking So Moon out of it. However, sitting on a rock, So Moon thinks to himself that his role here has been fulfilled since he was used as bait for the Supreme Guards. But then it hits him that Jia Sugan is also at the South Station, and if he were to die, then he wouldn't be able to have his revenge. But reassuring himself that Jia Sugan wouldn't die so easily as the master of the clan, So Moon calms himself. However, it would be problematic if he were to go into hiding. As this thought comes into So Moon's head, he begins running towards the South Station. Can't wait for the fight between So Moon and Ji Su Gan. Meanwhile, Ji Su Gan sitting in a cave awakens as he stands up with a red aura emitting all around. But this time something is different as Ji Su Gan stands up as a poison zombie. Okay, so it's basically So Moon versus the Incredible Hulk. Now running to the battlefield, Ji Su Gan takes on several soldiers by himself and decimates everything standing in his way. Walking up to the patient leader, Ji Sugan bows down and asks what's going on and why the Supreme Guards aren't here. In response, Guan Pei tells Ji Sugan that the elite warriors of the Righteous Coalition have attacked and the Supreme Leader Guards went out and won't be back till tomorrow evening. Hearing this, Ji Sugan asks Guan Pei that if the situation isn't that good, why is he not running? In response, Ji Sugan tells him that as the palace leader, it's his duty to stay back. Meanwhile, Jiang Myung and Dan Ji Yuan look at Ji Su Gan and wonder what's different with him. Maybe the fact that he's freaking green guys. Walking up to Guan Pei, Sang In introduces himself and the two pay their respects. Sang In takes his stance in hopes of wearing down Guan Pei. But Guan Pei, on the other hand, thinks that he has to finish this in one blow. Using the Emperor's sword arts, the second stage Heavenly Emperor, Sang In shoots his sword key. However, Guan Pei counters with his sword key blast and easily overpowers Sang In's attacks. Falling into the arms of his son, Sang In spits blood from his mouth. Now coming in as a replacement, Mu Mu steps in to fight. After the two exchange pleasantries, Guan Pei pulls out his sword and tells Mu Mu that the skill he's going to use was created by his master after he lost to the Dharma's triple blade. Calling out the twin dragon blade, Guan Pei throws immense key at Mu Mu, which takes the shape of two dragons. Easily the coolest move in all of Manwa. Anyhow, despite the unreal strength, Mumu is able to cut through the key and face the attack without a scratch. Showing his appreciation for Mumu's skill, Guan Pei tells him that he'll have to use the Dharma Blade this time or it will be difficult to block the next attack. Charging up his key, Guan Pei uses the three destroyer blade arts. First stage wave of the thousand blades, the trait of this attack is that it overlaps and neutralizes an enemy. Now as the huge key wave is directed at Mumu, he uses the first stance of Dharma's triple blade, the immeasurable blade, and cuts through the attack. Following this, the patient leader uses the second stage, a thousand shadowless blades as several blades come flying at Mumu he wonders if these are all illusions. Unable to find the real blades amongst the illusion, Mumu uses the second stance origin blade and creates a wall of key to block the attack. With their respective attacks taking a toll on their bodies, both are pushed back and begin bleeding from their mouth. However, not taking a moment to rest, Wan Pei uses the third stage Heaven Destroyer. Leaping at Mumu, he tries to stab him with his sword. Getting into his stance, Mumu also uses the third stance, the Cycle of Life Blade. Now as the two warriors strike and go past each other, Mumu stands unscathed while seeking support from his sword. Wan Pei wonders if this is the power of the Guardian Deity. Leading from his mouth, Mumu stands victorious, yet claims that it was only because Xian Jie bestowed his key on him. Seeing that the Pei Qian Palace has lost, Gak Jia sends a message and rushes to his lord's care. Meanwhile, as Guan Pei begins breathing his final breaths, he accepts his loss to Mumu. 
However, Mumu replies that he was merely lucky and that's all. But acknowledging the guardian deity's power, Wanpei tells him that skill is needed even for luck. Just then Gokja finally reaches his lord and holds him close, crying the Pei Qian leader tells him that he should escape when he had the chance. But Gokja's more concerned about the palace leader, saddened. Wanpei expresses regret for murdering Gu Yan Pum and not being able to unify Gungo and defeat the guardian deity. Reassuring his lord, Gok Jia tells him not to lose hope as Huan Yao will fulfill this dream since he's already surpassed his father in skill and getting the strength of the Senate. Hearing this, Huan Pei mentions that Huan Yao is capable of achieving what he couldn't but whenever he thinks of him, the tragedy of his mother comes to mind. As Huan Pei lets out these words, his soul escapes his body and it falls limp on the ground. Crying Gok Jia decides to take his own life and tells the Light Path that he'll be watching their match against Huan Ya from above as he's certain that Pei Qian will be victorious in that battle. Who's gonna tell Gok Jia that he ain't going to heaven? Seeing the palace leader die, Ji Su Gan decides to run for the time being as he's heavily outnumbered and vows to return. Meanwhile, as Huan Ya is homing his skills at the Senate, he's asked to take a break since he's already very strong. However, Huan Ya claims that he's still not confident as his sworn brother. So Moom is extremely powerful. Just then, Huang Nad has brought a letter from the Bo King. Reading it, he realizes that his old man and Gok Jia have been killed in battle. Crushing the paper in his hand, Huang Yao cries and goes into solitude. On the other hand, as the forces of the Light Path are traveling back, GM suggests that they rest since everyone seems tired. However, Huang Chung counters the argument and tells him that it wouldn't be safe since the Pei Qian guards must have noticed the South Station's destruction. And there's a possibility that he on one gang and the Blood Slasher Corps would join the station guards in hunting them. As these words escape Huang Chung's mouth, he suddenly finds the light path surrounded by Ji Su Gan and he on one gang's troops. Without any hesitance, the true groups clash with each other in battle of death. Being one of the experts, GM is the first to try and hold back Ji Su Gan. However, that goes horribly wrong since he's sliced like a mango multiple times and is killed rather easily. Damn, Ji Su Gan's kill count keeps rising. Now taking notice of arresting Sung Yin, Ji Su Gan shows an evil grin and slashes the old man with his claws. As Sung Yin falls to the ground too, the trio, Hai, Dun Jian, and Jian Myung jump at Ji Su Gan. Yet, the mere strength of his attacks is too much to handle and both Dun Gian and Hai end up getting tiny cuts on their bodies through which the poison starts seeping into their bodies. Bruised and battered, Resting against a tree, Hai wonders if this is it. As she thinks of her death, she wishes to see So Moon once more. Smiling at the thought of him, she tells herself that she's just having foolish thoughts. Just then, So Moon appears and asks her how could she be smiling when she's knocking at death's gate. Wish my crush appeared in front of me like this. Whilst Hai is happy to see her love in front of her, So Moon in all seriousness instructs her to use key concentration and neutralize the poison. Sharing some of his key with Hai, so Moon manages to take her out of harm's way and asks her where her father and grandfather are. Crying the thought of her family members, Hai hugs So Moon closely and begins to sob in his arms. Embarrassed, So Moon tries to talk to Hai, but Jia Myung explains that the Numbung family elders were killed by Ji Su Gan, and it is due to him that Dun Gian is now missing a leg. I guess Dun's martial arts days are over. Walking up to Ji Su Gan, So Moon tells him that since they've both got grudges, it's time that they settle their affairs. Now as the duel starts, So Mu shoots a key arrow. However, that does nothing but cause an itch to Ji Su Gan. Now returning the favor to So Moon, Ji Su Gan swings his sword, but So Moon easily manages to evade it. Overconfident, Ji Su Gan asks him how he'll be able to continuously dodge his attacks without getting tired. Replying with a cocky smile, So Moon tells Ji Su Gan that he didn't evade the attack, but rather he's just showing how such attacks are useless against him. Now upping the tempo a bit, so Mu shoots a more powerful key arrow, but that too is blocked. But still having more tricks up his sleeves, So Mu shoots an arrow straight into the sky, and as the key arrow falls back, it heads towards Ji Su Gan. It changes course at the last second and hits him, not giving him a chance to settle. So Mu shoots several key guided key arrows at him, managing to block a few and evade some by using the lazy donkey roll. Ji Su Gan closes the gap between him and So Moon and swings his sword, but yet again. So Moon easily evades, and as Ji Su Gan tries to get closer to So Moon, he keeps getting hit by key arrows. Looking at this duel from the sidelines, the trio wonders if they should help So Moon. However, Jian Myung mentions that So Moon has a plan as he's only draining Ji Su Gan of his energy. 
Now standing his ground, Ji Sugan tells So Moon that if he's going to keep running away, then he won't be chasing him around either. Again talking with a cocky attitude, So Moon replies that he wasn't running around, but only giving Ji Sugan a chance to kill him. However, now it's his turn to get revenge. As he says this, So Moon uses the illusion shooting technique of the Bow King and several arrows hit Ji Sugan. Enraged at the fact that So Moon's arrow penetrated his thick and impenetrable skin, Ji Sugan charges at So Moon. However, a fully powered key arrow of So Moon's is enough to cut through Ji Sugan's arm. Looking at Ji Sugan like a pest, So Moon tells him to just give up. However, Ji Sugan is adamant about killing So Moon. Walking with one arm as Ji Sugan takes a step in So Moon's direction, he shoots him in the legs multiple times till Ji Sugan finally falls over. Supporting himself with his sword, Ji Sugan mentions how frustrating the current situation is since he's been planning to kill So Moon for the longest time now. As he utters these words, he throws the sword at blistering speed towards So Moon. However, being the renowned Phantom Archer, So Moon catches the sword and walks up to Ji Sugan, standing over him. So Moon tells him that Chung Ha had to go through 10 months of torture and despair, yet she persevered. Oh, that rhymed. Anyhow, now enraged after recalling his beloved's suffering, So Moon kicks Ji Sugan into oblivion and cuts his other hand as he's in midair, kicking Ji Sugan here and there like a small cockroach. So Moon tells him that every time Chung Ha arrived and screamed in pain, he promised never to forgive him. Now, at last, stepping onto Ji Sugan's chest, so Moon begins pushing it down until it begins to cave in and his ribs are crushed into his organs, grinding his teeth. So Moon tells Ji Sugan that this was the pain that Chung Ha felt every day. Meanwhile, Ji Sugan, despite all the suffering, tells So Moon that he feels that way only because of one person, but what about his masters? The brothers of man Dot Mun that So Moon killed? Stepping into the conversation, Jiang Myung mentions that it was a fight between martial artists, whereas Ji Sugan stooped so low that he hurt a girl who had no fighting skills. But all this matters little to Ji Sugan as he expresses his frustration for not being able to avenge his brothers. As he says this, Ji Sugan begins to fluff up like a balloon, seeing as he's about to explode. The trio runs away before the explosion can get them. Now deep into the forest, So Moon is greeted by Chien Ho, joining the righteous coalition forces on the journey back. So Moon learns that they've lost 100 men excluding the injured, and only have 50 people left that can fight. Paying respect to Sun Yan and the Fallen, Chien Ho begins to cry and tells his friend that he was always one step ahead of him and has reached heaven before he could do. On the other hand, talking to the elders around him, Huan Ya mentions that he doesn't want to claim revenge since his father lost fair and square. However, he would like to avenge him by defeating the guardian deity, who was responsible for both Gu Yang Pong and Wan Pei's defeat. As the Blade King hears this, he tells Huan Ya that he could have gone to Shaolin and requested a duel on his own if that was the case. In response, Huan Ya tells him that he wants to calm down the Pei Chiyun Palace first, since there is chaos all around. And once that task is done, then he'll be heading off to the Shaolin to settle his affairs. Meanwhile, as the Light Path troops catch a break, Huan Chun looks around keenly as he wonders where he and Wan Gang and his troops have gone. Just then, the Blood Slasher Corpse sneaks up on the Righteous Coalition. Jumping onto the attacking Pei Chion soldiers, Wan Chung pushes them back. Seeing this, both Qian Ho and Guak Mu Ang realize that Pei Chion forces have passed them and have set ambushes for them. Just then, shurikens and arrows come flying at the soldiers, realizing that they've already walked into an ambush. So Moon gets onto a tree and decides to find the enemy by sensing their key. Closing his eyes, so Moon locates each of his enemies one by one and using formless firing shoots several key arrows to annihilate his enemies. Jumping from branch to branch, changing his positions, So Moon continues to shoot his key arrows, pushing the enemies back. Now out of danger, the elders mention that they were saved once again by So Moon. However, another problem arises when there are only 30 soldiers left, meaning that if they were to meet the Pei Chi on Supreme Guards in this state, then death surely awaits them. On the other hand, Though, the good news is that the safe house isn't too far away and they'll be able to reach it in a day. Meanwhile, covered in the sheath of the night as the Pei Chion Supreme Guards are traveling, they discuss Hyun Won Gang's request of retreating. However, the two guards get into a slight argument regarding the matter, as one of the guards doesn't want to accept Hyun Won Gang's request. Just then, crawling out of the woods, an injured Hyun Won Gang appears who happens to be filled with wounds. Supporting himself with his sword staff, he tells the guards that experiencing the Phantom Archer's powerful arrows was truly terrifying. Breathing heavily, 
Hianwan Gang tells the guards that the enemy is hiding 30 kilometers west of their location and their numbers are ranging from 30 to 40, so taking them on won't be a problem. However, at the same time, Hianwan Gang suggests the guards to be careful since the Phantom Archer has joined the League of the Light Path, and if the guards aren't cautious enough, they will pay with their lives. As these words escape Hianwan Gang's mouth, he passes away. Respecting the commands of their senior, the Pei Qian guards rush to the location where the Light Path forces reside. Meanwhile, as the sun rises on a new day, the Qinqing sect's senior disciples Chui Jin Wen and Chan Sang Il decide to get married. Wow, most of her troops are dead, what happy occasion to get married. Attending this auspicious ceremony, all the bystanders pass their comments, but our girl Hai is absorbed at the thought of how being married to So Moon would feel. Seeing the smiles of the beautiful couple, So Moon smiles gently and wishes that they don't go through the pain that he went through. Seeing his brother's saddened expression, Dun Gion walks up to So Moon and tells him that if he's feeling jealous, he can just marry again. Turning his face away, so Mu tells Dun Gion that he isn't one to think about marriage. However, grinning Dun Gion gives Hai the bombastic side eye and tells So Moon that he doubts that he'd have trouble finding a wife. Hearing this, both So Moon and Hai are embarrassed. However, that embarrassment quickly turns into So Moon's anger, and Dun Gion is forced to take back his words and claim that it was just a joke. Just then, So Moon places his hand on Dun Gion's mouth and signals him to stay quiet. Sensing the overwhelming kiss of the Pei Qian guards, he immediately concludes that the enemy is 600 meters away. As So Moon learns this, he immediately informs Qi and Ho of the news and taking pardon from Dun, Hian, and Hai. So Moon takes his leave. Meanwhile, at the south station of the Pei Qian Palace, the Bow King, Fist King, and Blade King meet up with Huan Ya. Reporting the situation of forces, the Fist King tells Huan Ya that he doesn't need to head into the battle. However, Huan Ya insists since he believes that he's the only true opponent for the Guardian Deity and wants to see how his opponent fights. Hearing this, both the Blade and the Fist King insist Huan Ya on taking them with him. Intervening in the conversation, the Bow King asks the remaining two kings if they want to travel with Huan Ya just to duel against So Moon. As Huan Ya hears this, he questions how So Moon is tied into this matter. In response, the Bow King tells that it was rumored that So Moon had challenged the Pei Qinan Supreme Guards. Accepting the challenge, the guards left the palace and went after So Moon. Responding to Bo King's claims, Huan Ya tells him it's probably because of Ji Su Gan since So Moon isn't someone to do something so stupid. Hearing this, the Fist King asks Huan Ya if there's a possibility of him joining the Righteous Coalition. In response, Huan Ya tells that he believes So Moon must be with the remaining forces of the Righteous Coalition and he'd like to meet his brother. Meanwhile, at the Righteous Coalition Mount Hack Branch, as the Light Path seniors collectively sit together, they learn that an extremely supreme expert has appeared and is defeating the Righteous Coalition. On the other hand, as the Supreme Pei Qian guards sit together raging with hatred and hopes of revenge, So Moon also lies close to them. Hiding in the trees, So Moon decides to go with a different strategy this time than usual and chooses to flatline all the guards using normal arrows before they can get out of the mountain. Simultaneously, Faced off against some of the Righteous Coalition members, mysterious Dr. Lim Jong Da and Master of Assassination All Killer Song Mu easily overwhelm them with their presence. This message of overwhelming difference in power is processed by the Righteous Coalition members when Lim Jong Da easily takes on Dang Mun Chin's Heaven's Downpour and counters with the same move killing him. Seeing this, all the Light Path members realize that they're dead. To further trouble the situation, even more experts show up such as Yu Yan from India. Shout out to India. Tung Mun Ji, and lastly Zhou Hui Wun. Seeing all these elders standing up against them, the Ak Ji Bong wonders how they'll be facing all these experts. You won't mate, you're dead. Standing all squared up, Ak Ji Bong mentions that they need time to retreat. However, Wek Mu Wan claims that since it's the third retreat for them, it's quite troublesome. Hearing this, Lim Zhang Dae asks the Light Path members if they think that they can defeat them. With these words, the battle begins. However, a couple of moments later, we learn that the Light Path members are retreating again. One of the bald Light Path members standing all bloodied up in front of the Fist King charges at him. But despite putting all his force into the punch, the Fist King easily manages to counterpunch and send the Light Path expert flying away. Pushed back, the Lee Song Jin charges again, but the Fist King dodges the attack and counters with a palm strike, but the Lee Song Jin evades at the last second and tries to attack the Fist King from the back. However, Hitting with the back of his fist, 
the Fist King sends Lee Song Jin flying away once again. Now with broken arms and legs, as Lee Song Jin lies down unconscious, he begins moving toward the Fist King. Respecting the guy's warrior spirit, the Fist King with one single move knocks Lee Song Jin out and hands over his body to his vice commander, Hajimu. The Fist King tells him that he's happy to see him have such a faithful subordinate. As Lee Song Jin and Hajimu leave, the Bow King asks the Fist King if he's pleased. Smiling, the Fist King responds that he's just glad he got to fight someone with such a fighting spirit. Meanwhile, the Pei Chion Supreme Guards are occupied with So Mu's fearsome arrows. As more and more guards fall, the leader asks them to take cover. Now hiding behind trees, the Pechen guards lie still away in the arrows. Sheathing himself under a pile of bushes, So Moon acknowledges the fact that the Supreme Guards have much better coordination and agility techniques as compared to the Blood Slasher Corpse. But that still isn't enough as So Moon begins shooting arrows into the sky and uses his key to guide them straight into the bodies of his enemies. Getting comfortable, So Moon continues to shoot key guided arrows until he senses a bloodlust right behind his back. As his spider sense tingles, So Moon jumps out and evades Pei Chi on Supreme Guard Leader's attack. Now out in the open, So Moon finds himself chased by what is left of the guards. Staying on his toes, the Phantom Archer continues to fire his arrows until the Pei Chi on Supreme Guard leaders finally realize that So Moon is trying to lure them into the forest again and buying time for the light path. As this realization hits the leader, he immediately gives up chase for So Moon and heads for the remaining Light Path members. Understanding the Pei Chi on Supreme Guard's tactics, So Moon also starts following his enemies. Overtaking the Pei Chi on Supreme Guard with his awesome agility techniques, So Moon shoots countless arrows in hopes of stopping his opposition within the forest. However, despite all attempts, the brass top of the Pei Chi on Supreme Guards, along with some other soldiers, are able to escape out of the forest and get into formation. Seeing So Moon standing in front, the Pei Chi on Supreme Guards immediately surround him and question how he'll be able to attack without hiding in the trees. Responding with silence, So Moon draws his bow and uses formless firing to take on some of the charging soldiers. But as the enemies draw closer and closer, So Moon grins at Hu Tak Gang's remark about him being a toothless tiger. Pulling out his string, as So Moon's bow straightens up, he asks Hu Tak Gang if he believes that a tiger would be scared when surrounded by dogs. Oh, just give up, mate, you've already lost. Underestimating So Moon's power as Hu Tak Gang closes in to kill So Moon in one clean strike, So Moon beheads him. As Hu Tak Gang's headless body falls to the ground, Both Jok Song and Hyuk Jong realize that if they're not cautious, they might as well end up the same way. Now charging in himself, So Moon uses the eight directions of wind and rain, and despite being so sloppy with technique, he totally annihilates his opponents. Looking at So Moon so easily killing the Supreme Guards, Hyuk Jong wonders how they are losing to such beginner level attacks. In response, Jok Song explains that it is due to the tremendous amount of sword key bursting out of So Moon's attack. However, Hyping themselves up, the Supreme Guards decide to up the ante and command the subordinates to use the Bloody Downpour Sword Art's last stage unmatched Bloody Downpour. Following the Elder's commands, the Supreme Guard begins running in circles around So Moon, creating a tornado of enemies trying to kill So Moon from his blind spot. One by one, several Supreme Guards attack So Moon, but all find themselves dead soon after. Until So Moon finally catches a glimpse of Jok Song and Hyuk Jong and is stabbed in the feet whilst being distracted. Splitting the Supreme Guard that stabbed him into two, So Moon gives off an ominous grin and tells his enemies that it seems he won't be able to run away. Meanwhile, Huan Ya and the Blade King are observing this battle closely, but decide not to interfere as they want to see the end result. On the other hand, So Moon raising his hand high up charges his key and uses the second step of the peerless triple unity blade, Loveless Blade. Using this technique, So Moon unlovingly slits the throats of several enemies approaching him. And without giving the Supreme Guards time to regroup, So Moon once again raises his sword and uses his ultimate move, the third step of the peerless triple unity blade, Endless Blade. Seeing So Moon's sword and body emitting such a dangerous aura, the Pei Chi on Supreme Guards realize that death awaits them and they can't escape either. Meanwhile, So Moon, now flowing with energy, brings down his sword, and such a massive sword key blasts is shot that it eviscerates all of the Pei Chi on Supreme Guards. My man just one shot an elite class of warriors. Jock Song before falling to the ground. One last time tells So Moon that it's his honor to die by such martial arts. Showing mercy as he always does, So Moon offers the breathing Supreme Guards to retreat as he believes that one's life is precious. However, 
Jock Song insists that at times there are things more important than life itself. Saying this as he stands, Hek Jong yells and asks all of the living guards to stand up and follow their leader. Following Jock Song as the Pei Chion Supreme Guards try to kill So Mu this time they are killed for good by taking the direct impact of the Endless Blade. Watching this from the sidelines, the Blade King tries to go and fight So Moon. However, Huan Ya commands him to stop since he doesn't want to lose his uncle. Dang. Wouldn't want to be the Blade King. My man's just got violated. Understanding Huan Ya's position, the Blade King throws away his sword as he believes he's unworthy of the title ever since seeing So Moon's skills. Damn. So Moon out here giving people existential crisis. Nevertheless, the Blade King accepts back his title and the encouragement from Huan Ya, but also mentions that if he's the Blade King, then So Moon must be the Blade God. Now, as So Moon stands as the lone victor in the battle, Huan Ya approaches him, and the two exchange pleasantries. Addressing Huan Ya, So Moon tells him that he's sorry that the battle had to come to this, but being understanding, Huan Ya tells him that it's alright since loss is expected in a battle. Smiling, his brother Huan Ya asks about the baby. And So Moon tells him that his name is He So Yulji. After catching up a bit, Huan Ya asks So Moon since he protected the light path during the battle at the South Station. Was there something he was planning from the beginning? In response, So Moon tells Huan Ya that he only came there after Ji Su Gan and was planning to meet the righteous coalition later with his grandfather, but Zhu Ge Yang Yang's message led him here. Hearing this, Huan Ya inquisitively questions Zhu Ge Yang Yang. In response, so Moon tells Huan Ya that he had mentioned someone leaking information about their whereabouts. It happened to be Yang Yang. Hearing this, Huan Ya questions why So Moon didn't get revenge since she was the one that cornered Chung He to her death. Giving a sad expression, So Moon asks his brother to understand that if he were to try killing her, he'd have to kill others first, and that just happens to be something he doesn't want to do. Understanding his brother's situation, Huan Ya claims that he'll be the one to kill Yang Yang himself, but getting back to the story at hand, he asks So Moon what letter Yang Yang had sent. In response, So Moon explains how Yang Yang sent the challenge letter to the Supreme Guards and asks So Moon for help at the South Station by using Dun Jian and Jian Myung as bait. Learning this, Huan Ya frowns as he mentions that if the Pei Chi on Supreme Leader Guards hadn't left, then his father wouldn't have died. Hearing this, So Moon is amazed as he didn't know such a thing. Grinning at So Moon's reaction, Huan Ya, talking to himself, mentions that Yang Yang sure is an impressive girl as she had everyone fooled. Now with his heart at peace, Huan Ya decides to take his leave, but So Moon questions if he's just going to leave. Baffled by So Moon's question, Huan Ya asks if they are supposed to fight now. But So Moon tells him that he'd never break the promise he made to Chung Ha, as she told him not to hate Huan Ya if he and So Moon ever stood on opposing sides. Hearing this, Huan Ya breaks into tears and tells So Moon that he'll be heading over to Hubei, where there will be a fight with the Righteous Coalition. Upon Huan Yao's question, So Moon also shares that he'll be heading off to meet his grandfather and he so at the Shaolin before heading back to his hometown with his family. Learning this, Huan Ya proposes to So Moon that they travel together since his final destination is the Shaolin too. Accepting Huan Ya's proposal, So Moon decides to have an adventure with him. But just then, some of the righteous coalition along with Yang Yang to see if So Moon is alright. But boy oh boy, it seems that they aren't expecting it since So Moon seems to be just fine as opposed to the lifeless bodies of the Pei Chion Supreme Guards. Talking to So Moon with a pale expression, Hai tells him that she was so worried for him. To further flame the fires of love, Jian Myung also keeps mentioning how she admires So Moon and was so scared for him. Embarrassed, So Moon asks Jian Myung to stop. These guys really trying for So Moon to find love again, and there are my friends. Sad life. Now a time being of the essence, the Blade King tells So Moon that they should head back. Walking up to So Moon, Huan Ya tells him that they should leave, but just then Zhu Ge Yang Yang intervenes and tells So Moon that he can't just leave since he promised to help. Unclear on how to sort the situation out, So Moon is left shrugging his shoulders. Now talking with Huan Ya, Yang Yang tells him that even though they understand that the ex palace leader's son happens to be So Moon's sworn brother, he has to understand that the Light Path can't let him simply escape and would request him to stay here until the fight is over. Not overwhelmed by Yang Yang's statements, Wan Ya asks what if he doesn't stay, grinning. Yang Yang tells him that if that were to happen, then the Light Path would have to forcefully submit him. Standing behind Yang Yang, Jian Myung tells her that this isn't fair to So Moon. However, she asks him to simply follow orders for this once. Addressing So Moon, Huan Ya asks him what he'll do since this lady isn't letting him go. However, 
So Moon has no answer to that question. Patting So Moon on the shoulder, Huan Ya tells him that he understands such situations are hard to deal with, so he wants him out of the picture for some time. Meanwhile, Shi and Ho looking at the Blade King wonders who he is, since he can't recall his name but happens to have seen him. On the other hand, Huan Ya tells the Light Path that he has no intention of coming along with them and they'll probably be having an unavoidable clash, but before that, he asks Xion for her name. As he hears the name of the woman responsible for the death of his sister-in-law and father, Huan Ya begins raging with fury and tells her that now even if she let him go, he wouldn't. Sensing danger, Oh Sung is the first to jump at Huan Ya, but is easily knocked out with one punch. Oh Sung has Rainer-like plot armor. Now walking towards Yang Yang, Huan Ya asks Jin Ah to move aside, but not realizing Huan Ya's capability, he urges him to come ahead. Guarding Yang Yang, as several righteous coalition members jump at Huan Ya, they meet their deaths in single strikes. With only Jin Ah standing in Huan Ya's way, he tries to stab the Pei Qian leader's son, but is easily overwhelmed by his attacks and left battered. Seeing her right-hand man fall, Yang Yang is also enraged and commands everyone to kill Huan Ya. Seeing this fight from the sidelines, so Mu worries as he sees Hai and Jia Meng both facing off against Huan Ya, frowning. So Moon thinks that he needs to do something, but is held back. Meanwhile, Qian Ho finally recognizes Blade King and realizes how bad it would be if he were to back up Huan Ya. However, that theory is denied when Blade King mentions that he doesn't want to interfere in children's fight. Hearing this, Qian Ho wonders if that means that Huan Ya is strong enough to survive on his own. Huan Ya, with a much more serious approach, this time tells Jia Myung to stand back since he doesn't want to kill him. However, Jiam is adamant about fighting as he believes that Huan Ya has crossed a line. Furious, Huan Ya yells at the Righteous Coalition and tells them that they've crossed the line in reality since they used So Moon to lure out the Pei Chi on Supreme Guards. Ignorant of the situation, Jiam asks Huan Ya how the Pei Chi on Supreme Guards tied to So Moon. Pointing to Yang Yang, Huan Ya shouts and tells him to ask her. Hearing this, Jiam gets confused as he tells Huan Ya that they've never done something like this. Yelling, Jiam questionably tells the Pei Qiyong that even though So Moon is his sworn brother, he had no idea that the palace leader, his father, had died. Raising his hand, Qian Ho takes responsibility for that and explains his actions to be for the sake of others, since he was worried about how So Moon would react. Since the matter involved the lives of many, he ordered his troops to stay silent. Now, once again addressing the righteous coalition, Huan Ya tells them that this proves the light path has been using So Moon. Walking towards Yang Yang, Huan Yo tells everyone who has a relationship with So Moon to step aside because he's about to get serious. But unyielding due to his warrior spirit, Jia Myung also steps forwards until commanded by Yang Yang to move aside. Walking up to Huan Ya, Yang Yang tries to bargain for the Righteous Coalition's retreat. However, Huan Ya asks her now that the situation isn't looking good, and she wants to run away. When will she accept that she's the one who cornered So Moon and Chun Ha? Meanwhile, Yang Yang, playing with her necklace, smirks and dismisses Huan Ya's claims with sarcasm as he tells him that she doesn't know what he's talking about. Enraged at Yang Yang's lie, Huan Ya tries to get closer to her, but is hit by powerful poison by Yang Yang. Guarding himself, Huan Ya realizes that he's messed up by letting his guard down. Moreover, this poison seems to be too strong. As soon as Huan Ya is hit, both So Moon and the Blade King come to shield him. Furious. So Moon asks what the meaning of such a sneak attack is, and Yang Yang cheekily responds that this matter has nothing to do with So Moon and Huan Ya deserves death for killing countless of their soldiers. Looking over to Qian Ho, So Moon asks if there's a cure for the poison. However, he learns that the blood of the rotten corpse poison is the strongest poison ever and is incurable, even by pure So Moon D fire. As So Moon hears this and sees his brother burning up and calling him out in agony, So Moon finally loses it taking Huan Ya's sword. So Moon begins walking up to Yang Yang and tells her that even though he knew he was being used as bait, he came to protect his loved ones. Even though he knew that his location was leaked causing Chung Ha and Zhou Mun to be casualties of war, he kept enduring just so he wouldn't have to go Jia Myung and the rest of the Righteous Coalition. But now he realizes that if he had killed Yang Yang from the start, none of this would have happened. Fuming with bloodlust, So Moon tells all the Righteous Coalition members to step aside as he won't be holding back. Looking at So Moon's bloodthirsty eyes, Seven seeing her decorated in red, Yang Yang shudders, but it's too late now to say sorry, cause I miss. Oh sorry, it just fit in there too perfectly. Anyhow, still trying to persuade So Moon, 
Jiang Myung tries to bargain as they can't let him kill their lieutenant, but without hearing any of their words. So Moon fires a powerful sword key blast clearing his way to Yang Yang. Seeing this sight, Yang Yang tries to call out to Qian Ho for help but too scared, Qian Ho tells her that no one can stop So Moon, not even the guardian deity. Walking up to her, So Moon grins and tells her that it was her despicable hands that wrote those letters. So starting off with her hands, So Moon cuts them both, preceding this amputation. So Moon tells her that after getting sick Chung, he couldn't walk a day so it's only fair that Yang Yang can't do that either. Following that, So Moon cuts off Yang Yang's legs too. Lying down on the ground, as Yang Nong bleeds to her death in sheer agony. So Moon continues to stab her in the chest and push it in continuously to prolong her suffering until finally Jiam Myung holds his hand and asks him to stop. Looking at Jiam with a bloody gaze, So Moon asks him that didn't he tell him not to move. However, unimpressed by So Moon's actions, Jiam reminds him that he's losing himself and should be better than this. Revenge is fine and all, but such viciousness isn't. Because if Joe Mun and Chung Ha were to see So Moon in such a state, they'd think of him as a devil from hell. A pretty cool devil from hell. Understanding Jiam's words, So Moon puts the sword aside and attends to Huan Ya, who has happened to control the damage to his body using his inner key and the antidote provided by Qin Ho. And whilst Huan Ya won't be losing his life, it is important that he get proper treatment. So to begin Huan Ya's recovery, the Blade King decides to take him to the mysterious doctor. Being hard on his former apprentice, the Blade King asks Huan Ya to stand up now. As So Moon holds his brother, Huan Ya introduces the Blade King to So Moon. Showing his respect, So Moon bows, but the Blade King tells him that he's going to throw away the title since he's seen a Blade God today. Just then, Jiam asks So Moon what he's going to do now. In response, So Moon tells him that he'll be heading off to the Shaolin and then his hometown. Hearing this, Hive the saddened expression asks So Moon if he's really just going to leave like this. I mean, how else do you leave? Nervous. So Moon is unable to answer her question. But on further insistence by her, So Moon bows her head and tells her that he's sure they'll meet again. Meanwhile, Hai seeing her beloved walking out of her life again begins to cry. On the other hand, whilst Huan Ya and So Moon are busy with their respective affairs, the experts of the Pei Chiyun Palace, despite being few in number, pushed the Righteous Coalition to their headquarters and overtook it in just four days. However, as long as the Shaolin and the Guardian Deity stood, so did the Light Path. Now on Mount Sum, the experts travel to Shaolin to defeat them and take control over Gungo. Meanwhile, it seems that there's quite chaos in the Shaolin upon the news of the Pei Chiyun Palace's attack as the Zuba clan leader is ready to throw in the towel with the Mudong, Chung Sung and the Di Unkang faction are all ready to give their lives. Worried, Yang O frowns and assures everyone that justice will prevail, but someone tells Yang O that justice is blind, not heartless like the light path. On the other hand, So Moon and Huan Yang also reach Mount Sung and reminisce about So Moon's journey from meeting Gu Yang Pung to the present. After having a heartful moment, the brothers part ways. Meeting up with this camp, Huan Yang is addressed as palace leader now. Whereas, the Fist King and Lim Zhang Dei are more curious as to whether the Phantom Archer is as the rumors claim. Upon hearing that even the Blade King is weaker than him, both of them are left shocked. In the meanwhile, So Moon finally reaches the Shaolin, and as he walks through the front gates, murmurs can be heard all around as people wonder whether So Moon is with the Light Path or the Pei Qian Palace since he recently killed Yang Yang. However, ignoring all the chatter around him, so Moon goes straight to Sion Jae who happens to have summoned him. Meanwhile, Mumu seems to be honing his skills and being instructed by Sion Jae, watching Mumu train. So Moon's grandfather holding he so tells Gu Yang Pung that Mumu's skills seem to be improving. And whilst Gu Yang Pung agrees with this statement, he also tells So Moon's grandfather that this level of skill isn't enough to defeat Huan Ya. Just then, So Moon comes into the picture and after greeting Sion Jae, he meets up with his family and cuddles Hiso. As So Moon is doing this, Sion Jae asks him if Huan Ya is here. In response, So Moon tells him that he and Huan Yao parted ways at Mount Sung. Brushing his beard, Sion Jae mentions that it must mean that the Pei Qian will be moving soon. However, So Moon assures them that Huan Yao wants to challenge the Shaolin alone. Knowing his students' skills, Sion Jae tells So Moon that Mumu isn't prepared to take on such a challenging opponent. A couple of moments later, the Pei Qian Palace experts along with Huan Ya arrive at the Shaolin. Frowning, Yang O welcomes them all and asks them what brings them here. In response, Huan Ya tells him that he'd like to challenge the Shaolin. However, there's a catch. 
If Guan Yan is to win the duel against the Guardian Deity, then he will control all of China and if he were to lose then the Pei Qian will go back. Unsure of response, Yang O asks for some time to ask the other factions for their opinion. Respecting Yang O's decision, Huan Ya gives him time to decide and takes his leave. Later, as the meeting with Yang O takes place, it is decided that the duel is the best way to avoid bloodshed. I'm pretty sure that if Shaolin is about to get their butt kicked, was pretty against the Pei Qian but seeing what the Light Path has done with So Moon, I'm kinda on their side now. Now that the final showdown decided, Yang O announces that seven days later, Huan Ya and the Guardian Deity will be facing off. As those seven days pass, people from all around gather to see the fate of Mirim being decided. Not even feeling a little fear, Huan Ya smiles as he talks to the Blade King. Just then, Mu Mu walks out and the stadium erupts in cheers. Seeing Xian Jie along with Mu Mu, the Blade King recalls how the guardian deity of their time was the only one to beat them in a duel. On the other hand, Gu Yang Pong arrives to meet his student Huan Ya. And last but definitely not least, So Moon arrives and the crowd erupts into a second round of cheers as they all know he's the strongest guy in all of China. As So Moon meets Huan Ya, a little baby clings onto him. So Moon's grandfather also then arrives and asks Huan Ya if he's So Moon's sworn brother. After the two exchange pleasantries, the time for the duel finally arrives and Sion J announces that the duel will take place inside the hall. Talk about all the people who came to see the fight. Now as the duel between the two warriors begins, both Guan Ya and Mu Mu, pulling out their respective weapons, have a cold stare down to intimidate each other. At the same time, So Moon is asked by Gu Yang Pung to accompany him somewhere. Handing over He to his grandfather, So Moon leaves with Gu Yang Pung, and after the two get to a somewhat secluded place, Gu Yang Pung attacks So Moon. Swinging his sword with utmost precision, Gu Yang Pung tries to take So Moon's head, but So Moon, creating some space, begins shooting key arrows. However, Gu Yang Pung tells So Moon that this fight won't be easy and fires some of his own sword key blasts. Somewhat annoyed, So Moon decides to not hold back either and shoots several more arrows to block Gu Yang Pung's key blast. All riled up, Gu Yang Pung goes for another attack and rotating like a whirlwind. He comes straight for So Moon. Shooting Gu Yang Pung with all of his power, So Moon tries to stop him. However, the key arrow is unable to pierce through the whirlwind. Seeing this, So Moon wonders if it was the blade shield techniques since it was quite similar to Loveless Blade. Standing up tall and strong now, Gu Yang Pung asks So Moon to use his sword art now. But So Moon tells Gu Yang Pung that it's too dangerous. Still wanting to try his skills, Gu Yang Pung tells So Moon to bring it on. Taking out the bowstring, So Moon asks Gu Yang Pung to come at him. Overflowing with ki as So Moon takes his stance and strikes with the loveless blade, Gu Yang Pung counters by using the destroyer triple blade art, stage 1, 1000 blade tsunami, but that isn't enough to pierce through So Moon's ki blast. Following that Gu Yang Pung uses the destroyer triple blade stage 2, 1000 shadowless blades, looking at the attack closely. So Moon thinks to himself that it works on the same principle as illusion shooting. As there are several key blasts flying towards So Moon, he concentrates hard to find which one is the real attack. Focusing, as the real key blast approaches So Moon, he easily blocks it using the Thoughtless Blade. Now, at last, Gu Yang Pung decides to use his best move, Destroyer Triple Blade, Stage 3, 1000 Blades of Death. As Gu Yang Pung uses this technique, he hurls his sword at So Moon. As the sword goes flying at him, So Moon uses the endless blade and breaks down Gu Yang Pung's attack with ease. Meanwhile, it seems that Mu Mu and Huan Ya's duel also seems to be going at a high intensity as both are proving to be each other's equal. But during one move, as Mu Mu comes flying at Huan Ya, he's struck by his sword and is defeated. As the duel ends, Xian Jie announces that Sir Huan Ya is the victor and whispers begin all around as the Light Path villages wonder what they'll do now since the Pei Qian Palace will be taking over. Just then, Huan Ya steps up and tells everyone that as promised, the nine great factions and the five powerful families will be taking over and the Pei Qian will rule China for a total of four days. After that, the Pei Qian Palace and all the military factions will return to where they came from. As Huan Ya announces this, the crowd finally takes a sigh of relief as the war is finally over and the Pei Qian Palace is being dissolved. Meanwhile, we also see Hai who is told both by Jin Ao and her uncle that whilst her presence will be required for rebuilding the Numbung family. It's better that she follows her heart and leave with So Moon. 
Crying, Hai promises to pay them back for this kind gesture, and getting on her horse she rides it as fast as she can to catch up to So Moon. On the other hand, as So Moon is walking with Huan Ya, the two discuss the situation with the Pei Qian and Huan Ya tells So Moon he's fine with ruling only for four days. Furthermore, he also claims that he hasn't dissolved the Pei Qian since he just sent all the factions that were in the military back to their homes. Just then, So Moon's grandfather asks the two of them to walk quicker, and as So Moon and Huan Ya approach Yi So, the little kid goes into Huan Ya's arms instead of So Moon's. Seeing this, So Moon wonders how strange he So is since he's going to his uncle but not his own father. Looking at So Moon with questionable eyes, his grandfather calls him a slow and clumsy person, but So Mu doesn't understand what he's done. I don't understand what he's done either. Now walking with Huan Ya once again. So Moon asks him if there's a place further from Sichuan and Huan Ya tells him that Hainan is pretty far as it is at the end of the continent. Smiling at the thought of such a place, So Moon tells Huan Ya that he asked because he was just curious. Meanwhile, back at Mount Peik 2, it seems that some years have passed by since Hidi So is training martial arts with a much older So Moon. Seeing He So, So Moon is impressed as he realizes that the kid has mastered all of the familial techniques in five years while it took So Moon more than ten years himself. However, not going easy on his son, So Moon asks him to wear the 60 kilograms iron plate around his neck and walk up to Heaven Lake. But his son ignores this instruction as he claims that this is an old and boring training method of people from the past. Shouting at his son, So Moon tells him that it's a traditional method as martial arts isn't something you do for fun. In response, Iso claims that hunting is more fun as you get food, experience, and fun all together. Hearing this, So Moon yells once again and asks, You hunt for fun? Raging in anger. So Moon asks he, so if he wants to hunt instead, but Hiso says he's done for today and goes to take a nap. Angered, So Moon asks him to get up and tries to punch him. However, Hiso, now stronger than even his dad, is easily able to block and dodge all of his moves. Just then, So Moon's grandfather arrives and tells him that Hiso's actions are the same as So Moon's when he was his age. But So Moon claims innocence as he mentions he can't recall being this disobedient. How is So Moon's grandfather not dead at this point? Later, as So Moon and everyone else is sitting together eating dinner, So Moon tells He, so that he has to head to Hai Men tomorrow, so that he can meet his bride. Hearing this, Hai, Huan Ya, who seems to be looking a little girlish, are all surprised. Hiso inquires what his father means by a wife, and So Moon tells him that he has already arranged a marriage for Hiso with Yuk Jian's daughter, who just so happens to be the next family leader of the Hai Men faction. To make his lie more believable, So Moon tells him that they two traveled together back in the day and made a bond stronger than blood. Handing Hiso a jade crest like his grandfather did to him, So Moon tells the same story to Hiso. Well, that's how generational trauma begins. However, Hiso starts smiling and tells So Moon that if he is to lie, then he should make it more believable. Oh, if you're not as dumb as you look, yelling at Hiso. So Moon asks what he means by this. But Guan Ya interrupts and tells him to stop since he would fall for such a nonsensical lie, because until now, So Moon hasn't mentioned something like this to anyone about this. And Hiso's bride just so happens to be the daughter of the Hai Men faction's leader. How is this possible? Sitting aside, Wan Ya, Hai also starts laughing and claims that it really is a very obvious lie. Smiling at So Moon, Hiso tells him that he knows about his travels in China and also understands his reasoning for sending him there, but he should have made it more believable. However, gaslighting Hiso, So Moon asks him that if he was really lying, wouldn't he plan more accordingly? Why would he tell such an obvious lie? This question traps Hiso in a web of confusion as he wonders if his wife is actually in Hainan. To gaslight Hiso furthermore, So Moon tells him that even though things may sound similar to his personal reasoning for leaving home, but how could he lie in front of two elders? Damn, So Moon really is just like his own grandpa now. Calling Huan Ya, his wife So Moon asks if she knows what the symbol of the Hainan faction is. What? Huan Ya was a girl all along. What's the right of thinking? This biggest plot twist. And not only is she a girl, but also So Moon's wife. Damn, I'm losing my mind. Anyhow, getting back to the story. Gender bender Huan Ya replies that she isn't sure. Getting in on the lie, Guyan Poon tells that it's a dragon. Taking advantage of this support, So Moon shows he so a jade crest and claims that it's from the Hyman faction. However, not giving in to So Moon's words, he so claims that such a thing can be easily forged. But So Moon tells He, so that it's made from the strongest jade that won't break even if struck with iron. Snatching it from So Moon's hand, He So tries to break it but fails. Seeing this spectacle, 
he slowly begins to believe the lie. To further cement this belief into his son's head, so Moon tells him that a letter also arrived two days ago. Taking the box in which the letter arrived, Gu Yang Poon claims that it is eternal bamboo, a thing only found in Hainan. Now, so Moon's grandfather getting on the lie reads out the letter and asks him why he never mentioned such a thing to him or his wives. Dan, my boy has two wives now, so Hai and Huan Ya both are married to him. So Moon really be playing with both sides, the female Hai and gender bender Huan Ya. Lying like his grandfather once did, So Moon replies that he had forgotten about it and is sorry for such a mistake. Convinced by So Moon's act, everyone ends up believing that the letter and the marriage are legend. However, he so is still unsure. So using sound transmission, So Moon asks his grandfather to help out and bribes him with a special wine. Immediately giving in to So Moon's request, his grandfather tells he so that he should leave by now since there's no other option but to honor a promise made between previous generations. Wanting to send his son immediately, So Moon claims that the marriage between Hiso and the Hyman faction's leader's daughter will happen in the middle of October and since it's early September right now, Hiso must leave immediately. Holding his son, So Moon even brings up Chunha and tells him that his late mother would have been very proud to see her son grow up so fast. With no other choice, Hiso leaves for Hainan with the same aspirations as his father once did. But on his journey, he encounters the Yulji family's greatest weakness, the sea. Vomiting throughout the journey as Hiso finally steps into the land of Hyman, he looks so horrendous that any woman he stops to ask for directions runs at the sight of him. Oh, that's got hurt. Taking it on the chin, Hiso tries it with another woman, but after looking at his face, she begins crying and begging him for forgiveness. To further salt Hiso's wound, the woman faints when he tries to calm her down. Damn, Hiso is having a bad day. Luckily though, before she passes out, she tells he, so that the Hyman faction is located in Mount Soji of Dingan. Now walking through the city, as Hiso smells the odor of delicious dishes from a nearby restaurant, he stops to eat and orders anything that doesn't have vegetables in it. Damn, the vegan teacher must be really mad right now. Anyhow, Things take a turn for the worse for He so when he eavesdrops on a conversation and learns that a wedding is taking place at the Hainan faction. Shocked to hear this, He so asks the stranger to confirm what he's just heard. After conversating with the stranger, He so learns that Yuk Jion's daughter and his finest student are getting married today. Hearing this, He so loses as he is furious at the fact that the Hainan faction found a replacement for him because he was just two days late from the promised date. Ashi, here we go again. Bowing vengeance on the Hyman faction, he so immediately rushes to Mount Suji at supersonic speed. Meanwhile, as the wedding ceremony is happening and the bride and groom take their vows, he so finally arrives. Walking through the front gate, when he's inquired about an invitation, he simply punches the guy into oblivion without an answer. Stepping in his path, several soldiers stand to stop him. However, being the son of an elite warrior, he easily manages to dodge their attacks and knock them out. Fuming, as he so walks through the door to the marriage hall, he thinks to himself about the pain he endured for traveling here, just to respect the promise between two families, so he will not allow his bride to get married to anyone else. He's so talking about enduring, he doesn't know what his father went through, but well, at least he got three wives in the end. As he so enters the marriage hall, he's stopped by what seems to be the head of security, who questions the identity of the one causing trouble at the Hainan faction. In response, he so tells him that he has every reason to be upset. Unsheathing his sword, the head of security is about to say something, but Hiso in one clean blow knocks him out. Seeing their leader fall, the other guards also jump onto Hiso. However, they are all defeated shortly after. Furious, the groom asks his brother Jung what's going on. In response, he tells that mysterious man has intruded and is causing mayhem. Hiso now facing off against an elder is asked some questions about him. But this time, Hiso has no response but his fuming bloodlust. Taking his fighting stance, the elder decides to take down Hiso but seeing that he just grins and takes a sword too. Guess the apple doesn't fall too far from the tree, Hiso is just as arrogant as So Moon was, if not more. At first, the elder shoots an electrifying sword key blast at Hiso. However, countering it with his own sword key blast he, so not only blocks the expert's move but also cuts through it, making the expert take a knee. As the crowd rushes to help out the bleeding elder, Several guards crowd He So and dash at him. But being the son of So Moon, he easily manages to dodge and knock all of them out. Seeing this, the elder is left baffled as he can't believe his eyes. Just then, an authoritative voice tells everyone to stop. Staring at He So, Yuk Jian asks him who he is. In response, He So questions that Ku's asking, 
and after getting Yuk Jian as an answer, he immediately pulls out the Jade Crest. Pointing it towards Yuk Jian, he asks him if he knows what this is. However, Yuk Jian claims to be ignorant of such a thing. Throwing the Jade Crest to Yuk Jian, he so asks him to take a closer look, but the answer remains the same. Surprised by this, he tells Yuk Jian that he had heard that this token represents the Hyman faction. Throwing it back to Yiso, Yuk Jian tells him that this Jade Crest has no relation to the Hainan faction. Then comes the second question of Hiso, as he asks Yuk Jian about the promise he that the owner of this Jade Crest will marry his daughter. Hearing this, Yuk Jian finally loses it and points his sword at Hiso threatening him with murder. Not a good move dude, eyes lit with rage, Hiso tells him to do as he pleases and then they'll see who gets murdered in the end. With this, Yuk Jian finally loses it and jumps towards Hiso swinging his sword. In return, ever so calm, he so decides to use the Emperor's Sword Arts and shoots a massive lightning key, which is able to block Yuk Jian's attack. Off! So he so also knows the Numbung family's martial art. Talk about OP. Combining their power, all of the elders and Yuk Jian attack he so simultaneously. As several sword key blasts meet he so sword key blast, the respective attacks dissipate into thin air. Now having lost it, he so seems to go for his final move. The peerless triple unity art, endless blade. However, before Key can be shot out of the sword, it breaks, and capitalizing on the opportunity, another elder throws a sword at Hiso. As the sword comes flying at Hiso, he remarks how cowardly such an attempt is. Taking out his bow, Hiso breaks the sword in two and draws an empty bow. Seeing this, the elders wonder what he's trying to do. However, when a key arrow comes flying out of the bow and strikes an elder in the arm, Everyone quickly understands what Hiso was trying to do. To stop Hiso from pulling such a move again, several guards attack him. But Hiso conveniently gets away and shoots a key arrow at the guards. Following Yuk Jian's commands, the guards dodge at the last second, and the arrow ends up heading straight for the groom. But just then, Hiso sees the expression of his supposed bride and immediately realizes that the girl isn't at fault for such a thing. She's only in such a situation due to the adults just like him. Well, at least, he still didn't have to kill anyone like so Mood to realize that revenge is wrong. So guiding his key arrows to miss the groom, Hiso curses him and tells him that he hopes he'll live a good life. Just then, an old man jumps at Hiso and tries to take him from the back, but Hiso manages to block him at the last second. The old man tells Hiso that his skill is quite fierce for his age, and Hiso replies, Same to you, old Jeezer. With fire in his eyes, the old man tells him that not only his skills are fierce, but also his mouth. In response, Hiso tells him that this is nothing compared to Hainan's shamelessness. Hearing this, the old man inquisitively asks what he means by this remark. Just then, Yuk Jian intervenes and tells the old man not to listen to Hiso since he's a crazy guy just spewing nonsense. However, Hiso tells Yuk Jian how can he have the audacity of calling someone nonsense when he's the one calling a wedding worthless. He was only two days late, and in all honesty, he didn't want to get married either, but since a promise was made, he endured the harsh boat ride. As Hiso is spitting all these facts, he suddenly notices another girl standing next to the bride. Seeing this, he realizes that Yuk Jian has two daughters, and immediately apologizes to him and tells him that he thought the daughter getting married today was his bride. As the saying goes, if you can't be her mister, then you can always marry her sister. As the younger daughter hears this, she begins to blush. But man oh man, Yuk Jian isn't happy as he pulls out his sword again and asks he so if he really wishes to die. However, the old man stops him as he understands that there's been a misunderstanding. He then proceeds to ask he so what he means by wedding and bride. In response, he so tells the old man the same story he had to Yuk Jian and gets the same answer as before. When the Jade Crest doesn't work, he asks the Hyman faction about the promise. Confused, Yuk Jian asks who made a promise to who. In response, he so tells him that he and his father were traveling together and promised that there would be a marriage between the two families. However, Yuk Jian tells him he never made such a promise since he's never left Hainan. Straying at the last straw, he so asked about the letter that was sent to his father, but Yuk Jian denies that too. Clenching the jade crest till his hands bleed, he so finally realizes everything was a lie. Furious, he so yells as he recalls not throwing a tantrum and obliging despite not wanting to. Scraping at the heavens, he so swears to have revenge on his father and great grandfather. Wow, seems the story going full circle. However, Suddenly, Hiso vomits and falls to the ground unconscious. After Hiso falls, the Hainan faction takes a sigh of relief and sits together to talk about the fate of Hiso. As the meeting ends between the elders, they conclude that for now, Hiso's acupuncture points will be locked and when he wakes up, his punishment will be decided. 
Just then, a messenger runs into the hall and tells the elders that there's trouble. As the elders run out to see to the commotion, Iso's eyes slightly open up only to find Yuk Jion's younger daughter, Yeon, tending to him. Blushing, Yuk Jion's daughter thinks that even though Hiso may look strange, his actions are like a kid. Seeing Hiso wake up again, she asks her maid to bring some food for him. Interrupting, Hiso tells the maid to make sure there are no vegetables in the food. Hiso is bound to have a bad time in the washroom with all this meat he's eating. Anyhow, as So Moon finishes his meal, he apologizes for his sin, but before Yen can answer, an elder enters the chambers and asks her to come out immediately. Seeing this, Isha realizes that there must be a problem going on, so he must check it out. Meanwhile, it seems that the Qian Sao sect is standing against the Hyman faction. In response, the Qian Sao leader replies that he'd like to give them gifts to congratulate them on the wedding. Worried, as the Hyman faction opens the gifts, they find the severed heads of several Hainan soldiers who had crept into the Qian Sao sect's territory. Well, that got dark real quick. Talking like a sick freak, the Qian Sao leader tells them that he still wanted them to hold funerals, so he covered them in salt to protect them from rotting. Clenching his fists and grunting his teeth, Hong Yeon tells them to take their leave as they've accepted their gifts. In response, the Qian Sao leader tells the Hainan faction that he didn't travel so far just to deliver three heads is only right that they are fed. Plus, he didn't pay all the Japanese raiders fighting the Hyman faction as of now for nothing. Hearing this, Hong Yim is shocked and tells the Qian Sao sect that things won't turn out like they hope. Ominously grinning, the Qian Sao sect leader orders his troops to attack. As the forces collide, Hong Yim slits the throat of his opponent. From the sidelines, Yuk Jian's daughter Yan also enters the fight and begins shooting her arrows. Oh Gam, she is the perfect bride for Hiso, uses the bow and everything. However, one of the Qian Sao sect's soldiers catches sight of Yan and manages to close the gap between them. Grasping Yan's hand, the sick freak tells her that they can have a little fun before he kills her. As the scarred-faced man tries to lick Yan, he so enters the frame and grabs him by his tongue. Confirming Yan's safety, he so tells the sick freak to not show such a vile thing and yeets him away. After making sure that Yan is now safe, he so borrows some arrows from her and shoots the soldiers of the Qian Sao sect. Diverting their attention to Hiso, all of the Qian Sal sects try to go after him. However, they are quickly stopped in their tracks by his arrows. Seeing this, the Qian Sal leader grinds his teeth in frustration, but suddenly he sees a flicker of hope when Hiso runs out of arrows. Capitalizing on this opportunity, he asks them all to attack at once, but little do they know our guy has formless firing in his arsenal. Drawing his bow, Hiso shoots several key arrows, taking down the enemy. Watching this, the Hyman faction also sees a chance of winning and decides to get in on the fun. Telling Yan to stay back, Iso unstrings his bow and also rushes into the crowd to fight one-on-one. -on -one. One -on one-on-one didn't go well for So Moon against Man Doc Mun, so I hope nothing happens. Meanwhile, the other elders are also on their way to the Hyman faction headquarters at full speed. However, things are advancing pretty quickly as Iso is now facing the Qian Sao leader. The two give each other a chance to give up but having full confidence in their power, they turn each other's offers down. Enraged at this, Chidan Sal's leader commands his troops to go after Hiso. But using his emperor's sword arts, he easily manages to slash all the incoming soldiers. Forced to reveal his trump card, Chidan Sal's leader asks his soldiers to show Hiso their final move and take him down. However, Hiso easily ducks and punches the soldier in the gut. Whilst the other soldier is kicked in the head, as the soldiers fall, the Qian Sao leader grunts, but things don't get any easier for He So either since a Qian Sao sect elder gets a hold of Yan and threatens to kill her if He So doesn't stop. However, He So tells them that if anything happens to the girl, then all of them will be six feet under. As He So utters these words, an insane amount of bloodlust pours out of him. Drawing his bow, He So tells the Qian Sao sect that he guarantees none of them will make it out alive if there's even so much as a scratch on Yan. As he says these words, he shoots an enormous key arrow into the sky and scatters it, making it rain key arrows from the sky. Falling prey to the arrows, almost all of Qian Sol's soldiers either die or are grievously injured. Crying out of frustration, the Qian Sol sect leader asks he so to end his life here since he wants to die with his men here. However, another old man of the Qian Sol sect begs he so calling him Yulji to spare their lives. Hearing this, he so wonders how he knows his last name. In response, the old man claims that he saw the phantom archer in action, and the technique just used along with the iron bow are both something the phantom archer used. Accepting the old man's request, 
Iso decides to let them go. Meanwhile, Yan slowly wakes up and inquires about the Qian Sao sect. In response, Hong Yum tells her that Sir Yulji took them all out. Hearing this, with teary eyes and blushed cheek, Yan softly says, You saved me. Smiling softly, Iso replies that he's glad he was able to repay for the meal he was fed. Just then, the elders of the Hainan faction arrive at the headquarters and ask where the Qian Sao sect is. Calming them down, Hong Yum tells them that even though there were over 200 enemy soldiers, due to he so stepping in at the last moment they were saved. Hearing this, Yuk Qian Qian thanks he so for saving the Hyman faction. In response, he so tells him that it's nothing compared to what he did at the wedding. However, Yuk Qian tells him to leave it in the past and inquires about his full name. After hearing his full name is Yul Jia Hiso, Qian Qian asks him about his relationship with the Phantom Archer and in response, he so tells him that the Phantom Archer happens to be his father. Hearing this, Qian Qian is left baffled as he asks him if So Moon instructed him to come here. Shouting excitedly, he so tells him yes. His father sent him here all the way from Mount Pektu so that he may meet his bride. He so getting so easily married just because of his father's name, my man So Moon endured so much. So Moon walked so he so could speedrun life. As Yun hears this, she immediately blushes and with this, the story of So Mu and ultimately his son comes to a close. For those who didn't understand, the line implies that Hiso got married to Yan. 